Stalin and Khrushchev, Lev Balayan, 2006. Preface by Sysok, this is content that has yet to be translated, to our knowledge, into English. We are using Google Translate to share this document. You will hear errors and mistranslations. Google Translate turned Pug into Pog for example. In light of this, if you hear something you want to check, check the original to cross-reference the original Russian, and figure out what is being said from there. Regardless, in this book, you will come to hear things seldom heard by Western audiences. Enjoy. Word to the reader. The book you are holding in your hands is a reliable source. I carefully analyzed the latest declassified documents about IV. Stalin, published in the open press, and this helped me to expose a number of fakes and false stereotypes, which in the 50 years that have elapsed since the death of Joseph Vissarionovich, a great many have accumulated in reactionary anti-Soviet historiography. Mass public consciousness is currently largely clogged and vulgarized. To clear these Augean stables from the myths and purities accumulated there for half a century, the whole brigade of Hercules, even if it worked in three shifts, would need more than one year. Did the leader die a natural death, or was he helped by faithful disciples? What is hidden behind V.I. Lenin, who actually organized the mass repressions? And what was more then, empty slander or real conspiracies? Why did Khrushchev attribute his sins to I.V. Stalin, who is responsible for the murder of S.M. Kirov? Why did I.V.'s wife commit suicide? Stalin needs de Lilu Iva. Were the conspirators in the Workers' and Peasants' Red Army really such innocent sheep? And did the leader really destroy the major military leaders on the eve of the Great Patriotic War? Khrushchev blamed the Supreme Commander IV, Stalin's own military failures. Why? Why we never managed to build communism, although we could live under this system already in the mid-60s of the 20th century. According to whose culinary recipes was the myth of Katyn created? Who shot the Polish officers in the Katyn forest, the Germans, the NKVD? or the Red Army soldiers under the command of Voroshilov, as Sergei Beria claimed. Why did the Soviet Union have the most casualties in the Great Patriotic War? And what, in general, is the price of victory? How did the so-called the creative intelligentsia who unconditionally accepted Khrushchev's slanderous report, and what was the reaction to it from the illustrious commanders of the Great Patriotic War? The price of victory? How did the so-called the creative intelligentsia who unconditionally accepted Khrushchev's slanderous report, and what was the reaction to it from the illustrious commanders of the Great Patriotic War? The price of victory? How did the so-called the creative intelligentsia who unconditionally accepted Khrushchev's slanderous report, and what was the reaction to it from the illustrious commanders of the Great Patriotic War? The book in your hands answers all these and many other difficult questions of history. The materials included in it have already been warmly received by the readers of the Almaty newspaper Let's Live Until Monday, for which I am grateful to the editor-in-chief of this newspaper, Eric Nershian. I am also grateful to the screenwriter and documentary film director Vladimir Pantelevich Tnko and the associate professor of the Almaty State University named after a bay. Candidate of Historical Sciences Sergei Vasilyevich Timchenko for a critical analysis of the materials published in the newspaper and valuable advice that was taken into account in the preparation of this publication, to his wife Violetta Dmitry Evna Galkina, son Jan and daughter Yuliana, who gave me moral support, my close friend and colleague, a fiery Bolshevik revolutionary, now deceased Eugen Gusmanovich Kabaziev and all my like-minded people to the true Leninists Stalinists, who seek for this first book of mine to be published by the anniversary date, the 50th anniversary of the death of I.V. Stalin. And she got out. Good luck, dear reader. Preface to the second edition. The first edition of my book Stalin and Khrushchev was an undoubted success with readers. The book was published in a small edition, only 1,000 copies, but sold out in record time. How can this be explained? The roots of the increased interest in the truthful historical and documentary research of the activities of I.V. Stalin, in the realization that the frantic critics of the leader, from Khrushchev to Gorbachev and beyond, actually sought not so much to destroy I.V. Stalin, how much to eliminate his favorite offspring, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, to destroy the dictatorship of the proletariat to establish a mafia oligarchic regime throughout the USSR. Enemies of the people, with whom I.V. Stalin, threw off the masks of communists-Leninists, which they never were, 
and appeared before the whole world in their true disgusting guise of blood-sucking parasites. It is precisely the striking contrast, the deepest contradiction between what was under Stalin and what is now that is the main reason for the ever-expanding interest in the Stalin era in general, and in the personality of Comrade Stalin, in particular, on the part of a huge mass of dissatisfied people, in whose category today includes not only the defeated working class and the robbed peasantry, but also a significant number of representatives of the working intelligentsia and that part of the creative intelligentsia that retained a civic conscience, and therefore did not begin to look for its niche in the new socio-economic conditions, in a word, those whose social expectations were not confirmed, and will not be confirmed in the future, by the course of the historical development of the new independent states. On the other hand, the role of Khrushchev, who was the first to throw a heavy piece of dirt on the good name of the deceased leader, is of a certain public interest. And to the main question, what made Khrushchev so mercilessly slander I.V. Stalin? No definitive answer has yet been found. And until now, the insidious version of the crimes of Stalin, invented by a political pygmy who has been in power for almost 11 years, finds its adherents among a significant number of people who are so entangled in the web of Khrushchev's lies that they have no way to escape from it without outside help. In the first edition of the book Stalin and Khrushchev, an attempt was made to take an objective and reasoned approach to highlighting the contradictions between the political giant IV Stalin and the political pygmy Khrushchev with the involvement of a large number of reliable historical facts declassified over the past decade of the latest archival documents statements and memoirs of I.V. Stalin, famous generals, scientists, artists and cultural figures, people's commissars, assistants and security officers of the leader, foreign statesmen and public figures, that is, people whose honesty and decency cannot be doubted. And on the other side of the scale, one anti-hero, Nikita Khrushchev. Perhaps the success of the book with the reader was partly determined by the fact that it, written in the genre of literature of fact, is frankly offensive, sharply counter-propaganda. Immediately after the publication of the first edition, I sat down for the second, as interest in my book inspired me and gave rise to the hope that I would be able to discover some more new signs to the Stalin and Khrushchev problem. How far I have succeeded is for the reader to judge. Chapter 1, Four Palace Coups Quote, the criminal actions of Khrushchev and his henchmen will have long-term consequences. They will lead to the rebirth and then to the destruction of the USSR and the CPSU, Mao Zedong and Enver Hoxha. Joint Statement on the Birthday of I.V. Stalin of December 21, 1964, Coup No. 1, Conspiracy Against the Leader Putting Forward the Version of the Violent Death of I.V. Stalin as a Result of a Palace Coup on the Night of February 28 to March 1, 1953. The venerable Western anti-communist Sovietologist Abjurak Manavtrkhanov in the book The Mystery of Stalin's Death correctly names the accomplices of this crime, quite convincingly substantiates his arguments, but at the same time mistakenly believes that the, the head of the conspiracy was Lavrin Tiberia. In fact, he was just a political scarecrow, an unprincipled executor of the evil will of such successors I.V. Stalin, like Malenkov, Khrushchev, who, over the four years of work in Moscow after Ukraine, had not yet managed to acquire sufficient authority for himself, and partly Bulganyan. Moreover, Georgi Malenkov played the first violin in this political quartet at that stage. In fact, by October 1952, this four had so infiltrated the leader's confidence that the political reporting report at the 19th Party Congress IV, for the first time, Stalin did not do it himself but instructed Malenkov to do it, and Khrushchev to do the report on the new charter of the CPSU. And the conspirators sat together on the podium at this congress, like lovebirds. Actually, in this alliance Bulganian played the role of an extra, feeling offended by I.V. Stalin for removing him from the post of Minister of the Armed Forces in 1949, he dreamed of taking revenge and taking his seat in the event of the leader's imminent death and perhaps even rising higher. Khrushchev at this stage remained in the background, but very skillfully weaved his behind-the-scenes dark intrigues. The anti-Stalinist group Malenkov, Beria plus Ignatiev was active. It was they who initiated the isolation of I.V. Stalin in the last period of his life. Subsequently, the former long-term head of the leader's security guard N.S. Vlasic, 
who himself was subjected to the most severe persecution by the four, or, in Khrushchev's words, Lenin's corps in the Politburo, LB, wrote, I was severely offended by Stalin, but never, not for a single minute, no matter what state I was in, no matter what bullying I was subjected to while in prison. I did not have anger in my soul against Stalin. I perfectly understood what kind of atmosphere was created around him, how difficult it was for him. He was an old, sick, lonely man. Vlasikenes, quoted from, Lajana v. Shadows of Stalin, M. Severmanic, 2000. By the way, the arrest of Vlasik was associated with the so-called doctor's case, initiated specifically so that at the hour of X the leader would be left without qualified medical care. Them a few months before the death of IV, Stalin was arrested on charges of deliberately killing his favorite, Andrei Zhdanov. In 1948, the leader predicted him to be his successor, LB. And in order to obtain IV, Stalin's sanction for their arrest, the conspirators just used this circumstance to to the fullest, at the same time slandering Vlasic, his deputy Linko, Fidesiev, who was previously the commandant of the Kuntzevskia, near, Dacha, and, Finally, the personal secretary of IV, Stalin, A.N. Pazkurbyshev, that is, all those who were devoted to IV Stalin and could come to his aid at the right time, L. B. Dot. The conspirators managed to temporarily remove the professors of the medical and sanitary department of the Kremlin, who had been treating IV for a long time, Stalin. A month after his death, they will be released with the wording, as it turned out. The 15 doctors involved in this case were arrested by the former MGB incorrectly, without any legal grounds. They will be released, while the demoted General Vlasic will still be kept in prison for a long time. Subsequently, the case of killer doctors will be safely attributed to Stalin's paranoia, to his morbid suspicion and even to his anti-Semitism, although here it is, an obvious, lying literally on the surface explanation of the real reason for all this dirty fuss around the leader. A conspiracy. About the fact that IV Stalin initiated the case of doctors, testifies the employee for instructions IV Stalin v. Tukov. Once we are driving in a car, Stalin says, what to do? Zhdanov, Dmitrov, Choibelson died one after another, and earlier, Menzingsky, Gorky. It cannot be that statesmen die so suddenly. Apparently, it is necessary to replace the old Kremlin doctors and recruit young ones. I said, Comrade Stalin, the old doctors have a great medical practice, and the young ones are nothing but green, without experience. Stalin, no, we need to replace. There are reports of poisoning of comrades in arms with medicines from the Kremlin hospital. The NKVD insists on the arrest of some of the old doctors who treated Dmitrov, Zhdanov and others. Grubinov's Hostages of Time. M. Military Publishing House, 1992. S.59-60. From this passage it is clear that I.V. Stalin doubts, consults with Tukov, talks about incoming messages from the Kremlin hospital, referring to Time Ashuk's letter five years ago, which was presented to him as a fresh denunciation, and, the NKVD insists, and here is what the daughter of I.V. Stalin's Vetlana Liluiva about this period of the leader's life. The case of doctors took place in the last winter of his life. Valentina Vaslovna, the sister hostess at the near dacha of V. V. Stoman, L.B., told me later that my father was very upset by the turn of events. She heard it discussed at the table during dinner. She served on the table, as always. Father said that he did not believe in their dishonesty, that this could not be. After all, only the denunciations of Dr. Timashuk served as evidence, all those present as usual in such cases, were only silent. Aliluiva S. 20 Letters to a Friend, Moscow, Zakharov, 2000, pages 182 to 183. If we take into account the story of Svetlana I. Zdefevna, then I. V. Stalin considers Dr. Timashuk's denunciations to be weak evidence of the guilt of the doctor's saboteurs. But the historian's brothers Zyrs and Roy Medvedev, unknown Stalin, M. Human Rights, 2001. p. 32. Rightly note, Timashuk's letter, addressed not to Stalin, but to the head of the security department of the MGB and Vlasic, was written on August 29, 1948. It concerned the diagnosis made by H. Donoff and was quite justified. 
given that Zhdanov was still alive then. IV, Stalin was informed that there were some denunciations of Dr. Timashuk, that is, the leader was deliberately misinformed. And what kind of lies did the old storyteller Khrushchev throw into history at the 20th Congress? Let's also remember, he said, the case of pest doctors, animation in the hall. In fact, there was no case, except for the statement of the female Dr. Timashuk, who, in all likelihood, was influenced, or simply ordered. By the way, she was an unofficial employee of the state security organs, where, I wonder if Khrushchev has such confidence about Timashuk. L.B., write a letter to Stalin, in which she stated that the doctors allegedly used illegal methods. Such a letter was enough for Stalin to come to the immediate conclusion that there were pest doctors in the Soviet Union. He gave instructions to arrest a group of prominent Soviet medical specialists. Yuri Mukhin claims, it is possible that Stalin himself learned about the additional arrest of Jewish doctors from the newspapers, because they did not treat Zhdanov, but those who treated him, Yagrov and Vinogradov, had already been arrested. The direct executor of the dirty work on the now attributed to I.V. Stalin, the fabrications of the case of doctors, the Leningrad case and the case of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, whose members were shot under him, was a party functionary. The minister of the MGB Semyon Ignatyev, first a friend of Malenkov, then a friend of Khrushchev, who was literally saved from the arrest of his fellow accomplices Malenkov and Khrushchev, organizing the hasty arrest of Beria, which revealed all the abuses of Ignatyev. After the 20th Congress, all these cases were reviewed, the victims of the arbitrariness of the former MGB were rehabilitated, and the organizer of this arbitrariness, Ignatyev was sent by Khrushchev to Bashkiria, no, not into exile, but, Secretary of the Bashkir Regional Committee of the CPSU, December 1953, and four years later, as if nothing had happened, he becomes the Secretary of the Tatar Regional Committee. That ice criminal Ignatyev was saved, and was saved by Khrushchev. Here is Sadiplatov's opinion on this matter. The whole truth about the doctor's case was never made public even during Gorbachev's glasnost. The reason is that it was a dirty struggle for power that unfolded in the Kremlin before Stalin's death and captured, in fact, the entire leadership, Sadiplatov PA Special Operations, Lubyanka and the Kremlin. M. Olnipress, 1997. P. 307. Let's see what arguments in favor of his version of the violent death of I.V. Stalin is put forward by Avtrakhanov in the book The Mystery of Stalin's Death. I cite only those that deserve attention, L.B., and there are very contradictory, sometimes polar opposite opinions about the nature of the conversation, the behavior of its participants. So, in his memoirs Khrushchev emphasizes her peaceful and even friendly character, and Volkogonov, on the contrary, claims that I.V. Stalin was annoyed, his words sounded ominous, he did not hide his displeasure. However, both authors do not hesitate to use the method of fiction in their historiographical work, and therefore cannot be considered sources of reliable information. L.B. Semicolon B. On the evening of March 1st, the guards of I.V. Stalin reported to the four about the leader's illness, but they did not call the doctors, did not raise the alarm. Moreover, they refused to see the patient and went home. C. The doctors who were called too late were not known to anyone. I explain, neither to relatives, the testimony of S.I. Stalina and Lilu Iva, nor to the guards, the testimony of bodyguard A.T. Ribbon, L.B., all the doctors who treated I.V. Stalin, were replaced by, D. Beria openly mocked the dying I.V. Stalin, that is, he was sure that his hours were numbered, and although after Kanov, and today Yuri Mukin, the assassination of Stalin and Beria, M. Krimsky most. 9D Forum, 2002, and Vladimir Karpov, Generalissimo, M. Vetch, 2003, give logically well-founded arguments in favor of the version of poisoning the leader either during dinner or later by injection. I am still more inclined to believe that the crime of the four was to artificially create such conditions under which IV it was impossible for Stalin to provide emergency, or, in any case, timely, medical care and this was done in the expectation that delay would certainly hasten the death of the leader. Finally, they, comrades in arms, L.B., 
left. The clock chimed the passing time. And it became more and more obvious, doctors are not in a hurry to help. Ribbonet. Next to Stalin. Bodyguard notes. M. Iris Press, 1994. S. 45. Here I realized that there was a betrayal of Beria, according to the quite convincing version of Yuri Mukin, instead of Beria one should read Khrushchev, L.B. here, and Malenkov, who dreamed of the imminent death of comrade Stalin, Las Geshev P. Last Days of Stalin slash slash dossier, appendix to the Glasnost newspaper, 2001, December 13th, faithful disciples help the teacher to depart to another world, after all, IV. Stalin's first medical aid came too late, only on March 2nd, after 13 hours, a team of doctors led by cardiologist P.E. Lukomsky, a full member of the Academy of Medical Sciences, was admitted to the patient, who had been unconscious all this time. The head of the sanitary department Kuperin, having shown Tukov during the autopsy of IV. Stalin, the place where the cerebral vessel burst, said, this blood should be immediately eliminated the person would still live, Ribbon 18 next to Stalin. Notes of a Bodyguard. M. Iris Press, 1994. P.50. However, I by no means insist on the version that I.V. Stalin died of natural causes, too much conflicting evidence in the descriptions of the death of I.V. Stalin, requiring a special study, or a special investigation, just, as is usually the case with a successfully carried out conspiracy, you will not find the ends of the crime, L.B. Maybe someday the words of Khrushchev, uttered by him at the very end of his chaotic reign on July 19, 1964, at a reception in honor of the Hungarian party and government delegation headed by Jean Oskater will be deciphered. These words did not get into our newspapers, but were broadcast on all union radio only in live mode, and during retransmissions they were cut out, while in the West, greedy for sensations. They were slandered this way and that, L.B. Colin Stalin shot at his own. For veterans of the revolution, we condemn him for this arbitrariness. In the history of mankind there were many cruel tyrants, but they all died from the axe just as they themselves supported their power with an axe. When the son of I.V. found out about the circumstances of his father's death, Stalin, Vasily, who in hot pursuit found out for himself from the guards and servants the true state of affairs, he threw an angry four to the four, bastards, murderers, ruined their father. And with this carelessly thrown phrase, he will cause the fury and anger of the conspirators, whose revenge will be terrible. Just 21 days after the death of the leader, Lt. Gen. Vasily Stalin was unceremoniously demoted and deprived of all awards, and on April 28, without trial or investigation, he was thrown into the second Vladimir prison, where he was given a new name. Vasily Pavlovich Vaslev. Under this name, he, the Iron Mask of our time, served eight years earlier. Through sophisticated and monstrous slander, the four achieved the sanction of I.V. Stalin and dealt with two of his likely successors, N.A. Voznesensky and A.A. Kuznetsov. History has preserved the original words of I.V. Stalin which he said a few months before the so-called Gosplan case and the Leningrad case when discussing the candidacy of a successor, we need to nominate a person who could lead the state for at least 20 to 25 years. Now I will offer you a candidate for a person who can and should head the state after me. He must be well trained in all state matters. I consider Voznesensky to be such a person. He is a brilliant economist. He knows the state economy perfectly and knows management well. I think that we don't have a better candidate for him. Quoted from Lajanov v. Shadows of Stalin. M. Severmanik, 2000. Regarding the attitude of I.V. Stalin to the candidacy of A.A. Anastas Mikoyan wrote to Kuznetsov, pointing to Kuznetsov. Stalin said that future leaders should be young. He was 42 to 43 years old, and in general. Such a person could someday become his successor in leadership of the party in the Central Committee. Emilianov.v. Stalin. At the top of power. M. Vetch, 2002. P. 459. By the way, at the same time I.V. Stalin categorically and without any explanation rejected the candidacies of G.M. Malenkov and L.P. Beria. About V.M. Molotov IV, Stalin responded as a worthy person in all respects, except for one fundamental but, 
Molotov is as old as he is. Neither Bulganian nor Khrushchev were ever considered by I.V. Stalin as leaders of the first plan. And the thought of the latter, as a successor, simply did not occur to him. Makita is a jester. Makita can famously dance Hopak, but leading a huge country, the Soviet Union, is not serious. And here is Khrushchev's testimony. In this case, you can trust him, since his testimony is confirmed by a number of authors. However, at the same time, as always, he diligently avoids talking personally about his role. Stalin knew to treat Voznesensky very well, cherished he has a lot of trust and respect. Yes, and to Kotygin, and to Kuznetsov, to all this trio, how exactly they managed to dig, undermine confidence in new people, said Stalin on them, his own nominees. It's hard for me to say now, I got the impression that it was Malenkov and Beria who made every effort to drown them. A number of documents aimed to direct Stalin's anger against the group of young people. Everyone knew in advance how Stalin would react. As you can see, Khrushchev categorically excludes himself from the number of conspirators. L.B. Vihalilu-Iev writes, and that team of four that gathered at the leader's bed did not come together by chance. They were Beria's allies against Stalin. Their political biographies, especially those of Malenkov, Khrushchev, and Beria, intersected more than once. They were connected by common affairs. Beria was appointed first deputy People's Commissar of Internal Affairs in 1938 on the recommendation of Malenkov. Khrushchev, along with Beria and Malenkov, took an active part in uncovering the conspiracy of Voznesensky, Kuznetsov and Rodionov. Aliluev vf. Chronicle of One Family, Aliluevs, Stalin. M. Mall, Gartz, 1995. p. 237. These are the nets the conspirators wove against Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin. And they got their way. Regarding the question of Khrushchev's role in this conspiracy, Doc Kuchev writes, Of course, there is no direct evidence that Khrushchev contributed to the physical death of Stalin. But the fact that he was the subsequent initiator of the struggle against the dead Stalin, the gravedigger of his political and civil personality, human dignity, discrediting him as an outstanding leader of the party and the Soviet people, the leader of international communism, and even desecrated his grave, all this does not honor Khrushchev and puts him on a par with those who wanted to remove Stalin long before his death. Doc Kuchev MS History Remembers. M. Sober, 1998 p. 390. Does not honor Khrushchev. Right, that's too mild. Flip number two. How Comrade Beria lost his trust. After the death of I.V. Stalin Khrushchev was the chairman of the Commission for Organizing the Funeral. In the future, this duty will be an unmistakable indicator for the Soviet person who will be the next general secretary. In the meantime, a fight was coming for the Stalin's chair, not for life, but for death. The first scapegoat was Beria. Khrushchev, whom the four underestimated, turned out to be not so simple. He processed all the members of the Presidium of the Central Committee, persuading them to joint action against Beria. While this bastard is among us, none of us can feel calm, he urged. In his dictations, he says, Our duty with Bulgonian has come, during the illness of I.V. Stalin, L.B., I was more frank with Bulgonian then than with others, trusted him with my innermost thoughts and said, Nikolai Alexandrovich, apparently, now we are in such a position that Stalin will die soon. He obviously won't survive, and the doctors say he won't survive. Do you know what post Beria planned for himself? Which? He will take the post of Minister of State Security. We cannot possibly allow this. If Beria gets state security, this will be the beginning of our end. He will take this post in order to destroy us all. And he will do it. Bulganian agreed with me. And we began to discuss how we would act. I told him, I'll talk to Malenkov. Something must be done. Otherwise there will be a catastrophe for the party. That is, there was a conspiracy against Beria. And Khrushchev was the initiator of this conspiracy. LB. All the details of this conspiracy. Negotiations with Malenkov, Molotov, and Voroshilov. The interested reader can find in the book, N.S. Khrushchev, Memoirs, Selected Fragments, Moscow, Vagrius, 1997. Chapter After Stalin's Death, Beria was arrested on June 26, immediately after returning from the GDR, where he pacified the impudent sortie of the unfinished Nazis, 
and this happened in the office of I.V. Stalin, where earlier meetings of the Politburo of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks usually took place. And although everything was prepared, and Marshal Zhizhukov and his people were involved, as well as Generals K. Moskalenko and P. Batinsky, future Khrushchev marshals, the risk was still great. Subsequently, Khrushchev said, everyone is sitting, but Beria is still absent and absent. Well, I think I got it. After all, do not demolish our heads then. But then he came, and the briefcase in his hands. He sat down and asked, well, what issue do we have on the agenda today? And I push Malenkov with my foot and whisper, open the meeting, give me the floor. He turned white, I look, he cannot open his mouth. Then I jumped up myself and said, there is one question on the agenda. On the anti-party, splitting activities of the agent of imperialism, Beria. There is a proposal to remove him from the Presidium, from the Central Committee, expel him from the party and bring him to a military court. Malenkov was still at a loss and did not even put my proposal to the vote, but immediately pressed the secret button and called the military in this way. Soldiers waiting there came out of the next room. They were holding revolvers in their hands. Most of those sitting at the table froze in surprise. George Izhukov commanded Beria, get up, you are under arrest. Hands up. Beria reached for his briefcase which he had left on the windowsill. I decided that there was a weapon there and with a sharp movement knocked the briefcase out of his hands. Falling to the floor, the briefcase opened. It was completely empty. Encyclopedia for Children. History of Russia. 20th Century. V.5. M. Ovnt plus. P. 578. However, I am not inclined to trust this version, since this is Khrushchev's version and therefore there is a large share of the risk that it is unreliable. In any case, neither in the near nor in the distant future will it be possible to establish where and how Beria was arrested, and whether he was at the trial, according to which he was allegedly shot in December of that year. Or he was vilely killed during his arrest, without trial or investigation, as his son Sergo and Yuri Mukin, who painstakingly investigated this issue, claim. There are many conflicting and mutually exclusive versions of this. However, if you follow the official version, the investigation into the case of Beria, Merkulov, Dukhanazov, Kabulov, Goglids, Meshuk and Vladzimirsky lasted six months. On December 23, 1953, Beria was allegedly convicted and shot, and his corpse was burned. From prison, he seemed to be sending desperate notes to Malenkov, Agor, don't you know? Some random people took me away. I want to personally report the circumstances. When will you call? Agor, why are you silent? Agor, such and such, you know me, we are friends. Why did you believe Khrushchev? I know he knocked you out. Beria still believed that the first violin was in the hands of Agor. He did not understand that with his arrest the political quartet had disintegrated, and in the trio the role of Paganini was transferred to Makita and Khrushchev. G. Malenkov was silent. Like Han Bulganyan, when the prisoner of the second Vladimir prison, Vasily Stalin, turned to him for clarification, for what kind of sins he was driven into a solitary cell for many years. So the four turned into a troika, Khrushchev, Bulganyan, and Malenkov. Coup number three, the defeat of the old guard, the rejection of the dictatorship of the proletariat a year and a half after the 20th Congress. Malenkov will attempt to push Khrushchev aside, but he will not succeed. Malenkov caught that on the part of the Stalinist guard, in the person of, first of all, Molotov and Kaganovich, opposition to the excessively uncontrollable Khrushchev, who often made ill-considered and reckless decisions, made mistakes and blunders, was growing. Among the dissatisfied were also K. Voroshilov, M. Pervukin, M. Sabarov, D. Shipilov, yes, and Amy Kayan too. Although, by the way, Anastasy Ivanovich, who occupied the position of a wise minnow, diplomatic Anastasy Ivanovich had to hold out, as they said later, from Ilyich to Ilyich without a heart attack and paralysis, so there was no need to hope for him. And, on the other hand, Khrushchev himself wanted to get rid of the old guard, since he needed new people to carry out his crazy projects. After the anti-Soviet speeches in Poland and Hungary, where the counter-revolutionary forces, Capitalizing on Khrushchev's policy of destalinization, brazenly imagined that the hour of their class revenge had struck, 
Following these countries, similar destructive processes began in the Soviet Baltic republics, Ukraine and other parts. LB, the positions of the first secretary of the CPSU within our country were noticeably shaken, and he had to urgently put forward the adventurous and unpopular slogan among the people catch up and overtake America in the production of meat milk and butter per capita within three to four years. The common people then sang such ditties, quote, We caught up with America in terms of milk yield, and in terms of meat we fell behind, horseradish broke at the bull. End of quote. The dissatisfaction on the Kremlin Olympus was mutual, and the collective leadership decided to call the presumptuous Nikita to the carpet. On June 18, a meeting of the Presidium of the Central Committee of the CPSU opened. The balance of power was like this. Absent were Kirchenko, Khrushchev's nominee, Sabarov and Sislav, at that time Khrushchev's supporter, of the members of the Presidium, Nikita Sergeyevich, in fact, found himself completely alone. Against him were all the other members, Voroshilov, Molotov, Koganovich, Mikoyan, Pervukin and, above all, those two from the original quartet. Malenkov and Bolgonian. The first day of the meeting brought defeat to Khrushchev. He was moved from the post of first secretary of the Central Committee of the Party to the post of Minister of Agriculture. However, Marshal G.K. saved the situation. Zhukov, who declared his disagreement with the decision, and promised that if Khrushchev was removed, he would appeal to the army. After these words in the former office of I.V. Stalin, there was deathly silence which was broken by a sigh of relief that escaped from Khrushchev. Approaching Zhukov during the break, he said, Georgi, save me. I will never forget this for you. Do whatever you think is right. And the marshal agreed with the Air Force on the issue of allocating military aircraft for urgent delivery to Moscow of members of the Central Committee, to the plenum, and, in case of unforeseen actions on the part of the conspirators sitting in the Kremlin, ordered to move tanks to Moscow. Khrushchev will keep his promise, he will heartily thank the faithful marshal exactly 120 days later, when G.K. Zhukov will be sent on a mission to Yugoslavia, then he will be unexpectedly recalled, and directly from the airfield, as if from a ship to a ball, he was taken to the Kremlin, to a meeting of the Presidium of the Central Committee, where the 60-year-old marshal will be sent to retire with the official wording, sought to withdraw the armed forces out of party control. Khan never called, I was then Zhukov's first deputy. Khrushchev is calling me. How are you? He asks. How is Zhukov? Without suspecting anything, I say, everything is fine. Zhukov is inspired by his election to the Presidium of the Central Committee. Works 10 to 12 hours a day. In response, Matri Matt, you don't know a damn thing and don't notice. Zhukov is an adventurer, a dangerous person. We are preparing the plenum of the Central Committee. We will cut it to pieces. You must also perform. The next day, Zhukov arrives. I'm going to meet him. I go up to him. Next to him is his wife. Apparently, the rumors about the plenum had already reached him. We greeted each other. I was heading to my car, and he followed me. What, do you already disdain to ride in the same car with me? I answer, well, what are you, comrade marshal? It's the way it's supposed to be. We've always traveled that way. But I understand his condition. Overcoming himself, he asks, who is appointed instead of me? They say Malinovsky. Well, thank God, I was afraid. Furtz. The meeting was opened by Khrushchev, who tried to prove in his speech that G.K. Zhukov Bonaparte's manners and that he does not recognize the leading role of the party in the army. As an example of the fact that the cult of personality G.K. Zhukov in the army is planted by Zhukov himself. Khrushchev named the huge portrait of the marshal on a white horse, which hung in the house of the Soviet army. He turned to the members of the Presidium of the Central Committee with the question, what would you like to call it? And he himself answered his own question, of course, Zhukov's personality cult. They say, pray for me. I am George the Victorious. Such a detail, Khrushchev himself saw this picture many times, approved and even admired it in public. LB. Dot. Khrushchev Marshal Bagramian was especially zealous against Zhukov, who said, I have known Zhukov for a long time, he always strove for personal glory and power. He is a man of a special breed in matters of vanity. He's just a sick person. Lust for power is in his blood. Zhukov had many merits, but no less awards, perhaps more than he deserves.
Zhukov is to blame for the mistakes of 1941 to 1945 no less than Stalin, on whom all the blame cannot be shifted. Quoted from, Pizikov A.V. Khrushchev Thaw. 1953 to 1964. M. Olmipress, 2002. P. 99. And soon the famous commanders of the Great Patriotic War, Marshals of the Soviet Union, I.S. Konev, A.M. Vasilevsky, V.D. Sokolovsky and S.K. Timashenko. No, not for health reasons, as the official wording lied, but for disagreeing with Khrushchev's arbitrariness in army affairs, for disagreements in connection with the removal of G.K. Jukov and in connection with Khrushchev's reduction in official salaries and additional cash benefits that officers received. On this occasion, G.K. Jukov directly told Khrushchev, I don't want my servicemen to become beggars. Once they become poor, they will not want to fight. A man in uniform will become a laughingstock. A Soviet officer must eat well and more or less provide for his family. In response, Khrushchev clumsily objected, they got fat. We cannot and should not breed such intellectuals, such capitalists. The persecution of Zhukov will force him to turn to Khrushchev and Mikoyan with a letter with the following content. What kind of labels have not been pasted to me, starting from the end of 1957 to this day, i.e., four years later, LB. I am not even given the opportunity to attend meetings dedicated to the anniversaries of the Soviet Army, as well as parades on Red Square. To my appeals to the Central Committee of the Party and to Glavpur, they answer me, you are not on the lists, but all this will happen later, but for now. The meeting in the Kremlin lasted all day on June 19th and all day on June 20th, 1957, so the country's top leadership knew nothing about movements, aircraft and tanks. At this third meeting of the Presidium of the Central Committee of the CPSU, the question was already raised of the abolition of the very post of First Secretary of the Central Committee. Khrushchev behaved self-confidently as he received hourly data on the progress of preparations for the plenum of the Central Committee which was carried out by his people outside the walls of the Kremlin. Almost all the members of the Central Committee, the secretaries of the regional, regional and Republican Party committees, all Khrushchev's nominees, that is, the elite of the party nomenclature that was created and corrupted by him, and for whose support Nikita Sergeyevich, not without reason, hoped, immediately flocked like a crow into Moscow. The questions of the meeting and arrangement of the arriving members of the Central Committee were in charge of the chicks of Khrushchev's nest, Brezhnev, Ignatov, Fertva, later received the ironic nickname Catherine III, LB. Finally, on Monday, June 22, 1957, the plenum convened, where the first word was given to faithful Marshal Zhukov, who made such a philippic against Malenkov. Molotov and Kaganovich that the question of Khrushchev's removal was not even raised by a single speaker. How blind was the Stalinist marshal, helping Khrushchev for the second time, for the first time during the arrest of Beria, and this time in the dispersal of the majority of the Presidium of the Central Committee, declared an anti-party group of Malenkov, Molotov, Kaganovich, Vogershilov, Sibirov, Pervukin and Shepilov who joined them. Subsequently, at the 22nd Congress of the CPSU, Minister of Culture E. Fertva, criticizing the so-called anti-party group, flatteringly said, What happiness for our entire party, what great happiness for our Soviet people, that at that moment the central committee of our party, headed by our dear Nikita Sergeyevich turned out to be at the height of his position. 22 Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Verbatim Report M. Pulitzer, 1961 Yes. Indeed, there was great happiness for our Soviet people, nowhere else, the beginning of nomenclature lawlessness, the beginning of the end quote, now it's not hard labor and exile, where once a year there is one parcel, but a preserved dacha, in the encyclopedia there are columns, and you can, about the fate of the gossip, grow at least cucumbers. Boris Slutsky, repentant K.E., Vogershilov, the oldest member of the leadership, losing, however, its former activity, Khrushchev will hold until 1960 as the formal head of state, chairman of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. So far, he will not touch Bulgania neither, although he will retain an evil memory of his words uttered at the first meeting of the Presidium of the Central Committee on June 18, 
unbearable. We are headed for disaster. Everything began to be decided individually. And just because of these words, he will send him a year later for economic work, depriving him of the title of Marshal of the Soviet Union, and usurping the post of Chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR. The main result of this Kremlin coup is that Khrushchev managed to completely renew the presidium of the Central Committee with his protégés, who, as he believed, would not hinder him. Finally, he managed to bring the CPSU to the forefront, subjugate the Council of Ministers of the USSR, Malenkov, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, Beria, and the Army, Zhukov, and establish total control over all power structures. It was from this Black Monday. From this end to the 41st infamous date, June 22, 1957, that is, from Khrushchev's victory over the supporters of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which has since been called the anti-party group and sheep hill of who joined it, the nomenclature lawlessness in the Soviet Union, which ultimately led the country to decline and disaster. The enthusiastic troubadour of the Khrushchev thaw, literary critic Korny Chukovsky, in his diary entry, described the medical care of party apparatchiks in comparison with the treatment of ordinary people. The workers of the Central Committee and other nobles built a paradise for themselves. They don't give a damn about the people. The people are in hospital beds, on starvation rations, in the dirt, without the necessary medicines, at the mercy of rude nannies, cloaked sisters, and for bureaucrats and their wives, over nutrition, over healing, over courtesy. The Greatest Comfort Tchaikovsky K.I. Diary, 1938-1969 M. 1994 P. 371 Spy Oleg Bankovsky, a rotten product of the Khrushchev era and an excellent witness to it, who rotated in the highest circles and knew firsthand the life of the highest party nomenclatura, wrote about those who worked under Khrushchev in the Central Committee the Council of Ministers, the KGB and various ministries, sons, daughters, sons-in-law and other relatives of our party leaders and high-ranking government officials study at the most prestigious universities, and upon graduation they get good jobs, although some of them are absolutely not suitable for it. All roads are open to them. They are quickly promoted. And this is done through connections through friends and family ties. From the pages of newspapers there are constant calls to put an end to nepotism and protectionism in the service. And what? Yes, there are shifts in this area. Some factory director is being punished for that he hired his niece, and immediately the message about it appears in the press. But what is happening at the very top, no one seems to notice. Bankovsky O notes from the cash. M. 2000. S. 355. Khrushchev created such a heavenly life for his nominees, party nobles, who made it clear to them at the 20th Congress, Stalin himself did not sleep and did not let others. I am not Stalin. From now on, you will sleep and live in peace, I guarantee. And, indeed, the principle of impunity of the highest party nomenclature was put into effect, for which, naturally, she was grateful to Khrushchev, ready to support him and help him stay in power. Since then, the motto, in the name of the people, everything for yourself, has been raised to the absolute. And in order to deceive the hard workers already betrayed by them, in the nomenclature newspeak, this disparaging term began to designate the hegemonic class, the working class of the land of Soviets, LB. An extremely hypocritical slogan was put forward, the people and the party are united. At the same time, a campaign to praise Khrushchev unrestrainedly grew and he liked such flattery. But as soon as he hurt the acquisitive vein of the party nomenclatura, encroached on its privileges, in particular, to close special distributors and transfer party apparatchiks to service through a regular trade network, to drastically reduce the list of persons who had the right to use personal state cars, L. B. As his throne staggered, the party mafia, which owed Khrushchev the very fact of its prosperity, was ready to overthrow and trample him. Stalinologist Mikhail Lobanov writes, Whatever the attitude towards Stalin, one thing is beyond doubt, his unwavering loyalty to ideological principles. It seems that under him, in the post-war period, it was impossible to imagine that the partocrats, who had been operating at the pinnacles of power for decades, 
up to members of the Politburo, would suddenly go over to the side of those whom they themselves branded as class enemies only yesterday. Now it has become a fact. Once upon a time, the Stalinists themselves, today these werewolves are already accusing others of Stalinism, all those who, like them, have not renounced their history, from everything that has been done, experienced, over the years of the new, it would be necessary, Soviet-pound, Russia, before the notorious perestroika. Lobanov M. Stalin, in the Memoirs of Contemporaries and Documents of the Era. M. Exmo Algorithm, 2002, p. 630. And that today we are in such shit, we must humbly thank the highest compartment nomenclature from the beginning of the Khrushchev era to the end of the Gorbachev era. Thank you, dear ones. Flip number 4. Fiasco in the last struggle for power. In just over seven years, the party nomenclature turned, according to M. Gelas, into a new class, so powerful that it was not difficult for the party apparatchiks to eat Nikita Khrushchev, who had become uncontrollable. April 17, 1964 was Khrushchev's 70th birthday, and although he never got a chance to receive a marshal's baton, he was nevertheless awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union that day. It is known that the day after the parade, meaning the victory parade in June 1945, L.B., by the decree of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR IV, Stalin was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Malenkov took the initiative in this, but Stalin refused this high honor, and even spoke coolly with Kalinin, who signed the decree. They say, I did not take part in hostilities, did not perform feats. I'm just a leader. Alilowev vf Chronicle of One Family, Alilowevs, Stalin. M. Moldat Gvardia, 1995. p. 195. For what feats was this title awarded to Nikita Sergeyevich? You just delve into it, reader, for services to the CPSU and for exceptional services in the fight against the Nazi invaders. For services to, and for exceptional services to, not for an unparalleled feat but simply for some mythical merits. It doesn't matter that this wording, neither from the right, nor from the left, and from any other side, did not correspond to the regulations on conferring the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. It doesn't matter that there were no special merits for the political pygmy in the fight against the Nazi invaders. Rather, on the contrary, and, in any case, no one believed in these merits, Zhukov, Khrushchev, together with Timoshenko, draped. They brought one group of Germans to the Volga, and the other group to the Caucasus, quoted by Gordienko A. N. Marshal Zhukov. Minsk, Literature, 1998, p. 216, Opankovsky. But it was necessary to loan Akita's vigilance, since a conspiracy was already ripening against the autocrat, headed by Secretary of the Central Committee of the CPSU Brezhnev. First Deputy Chairman of the Council of Ministers Palansky, former KGB Chairman Shilipin, current KGB Chief Semikasny, a conspiracy that, six months later, would lead to new party revolution. Taking into account the experience of the defeat of the anti-party group in 1957, Khrushchev's nominees were able to force him to sign the abdication of the party throne in October 1964. The nomenclature mafia nurtured by Khrushchev has already grown strong enough as a class to replace the unruly Nikita Sergeyevich with the quite predictable, accommodating and quietist Leonidovich, who will not prevent them from enriching themselves beyond measure, will not prevent them from messing around and mocking ordinary people until they will not lead the world's first country of workers and peasants and the entire Eastern European socialist community to collapse, in order to establish their dominance over the cattle forever, which they without a twinge of conscience considered the Soviet people. Secretary of the Central Committee of the CPSU N. Podgorny recalls how frightened Del Brezhnev was when Khrushchev somehow casually threw, something you, friends, are plotting against me? Leonid Ilyich then said to Podgorny, Kolya, Khrushchev knows everything, we'll all be shot. Information about the conspiracy, of course, reached Nikita, but he did not take it seriously. Khrushchev's sobering up occurred only at a meeting of the Presidium on October 13. At first, he behaved in his usual manner, self-confidently, assertively, interrupted the speakers, through caustic and derogatory remarks, but when it became clear to him that his end was predetermined, he drooped, 
and sat until the end of the meeting at the presidium table, his head bowed. Only after everyone unanimously voted for his dismissal, he said, Here you have smeared shit around me, but am I a cult? To which Brezhnev replied, You, Nikita, fought against the personality cult of Stalin after his death, but we defeated the cult of your person during your lifetime. Anti-Stalinists accuse Brezhnev of actually taking the path of cleansing the name of I.V. Stalin. But it is not. On the contrary, L.I. Brezhnev and his entourage themselves did not understand all the greatness of the Stalin era, and resisted any attempts to go beyond the resolution of the Central Committee of the CPSU of June 30, 1956 on overcoming the cult of personality and its consequences in which I.V. Stalin was presented as both a villain and a hero. Having taken the position of a man in a case, the Brezhnev leadership deliberately overslept the anniversary date, the 100th anniversary of the birth of I.V. Stalin, when it was possible to pay Caesar what is Caesar's. And in the West, they quickly realized what a gold mine is the Stalinist theme for subversive work against the USSR and other socialist countries. In the psychological war against the Soviet Union, she promised to play the same role that she played in the victory over Nazism Katyusha during the Second World War. In foreign Sovietological centers, a deep study of literature about I.V. Stalin, his biographies, Sovietologists invented various myths and versions of well-known historical events in order to discredit I.V. Stalin. False documents of the era were fabricated, pseudo-scientific studies of the leader's biography and his time were published. The famous Russian historian U.V. Emelianov cites on this occasion the statement of the prominent American Sovietologist Stephen Cohen, the Stalinist question, is relevant to the entire Soviet and even Russian history, permeates and sharpens modern political issues. The Stalinist question intimidates both the upper and lower strata of society, sows strife among leaders, influencing their political decisions, causes noisy disputes and families, among friends. At public meetings, the conflict takes on a wide variety of forms, from philosophical polemics to fisticuffs. Further U.V. Yemelianov argues that under the influence of such assessments, U.S. foreign policy strategists viewed Stalin's history as a Soviet battlefield on which the decisive battles of the Cold War were played out. In the works of American and Western Stalinist researchers in general, Stalin is presented as the leader of a totalitarian regime as monstrous as the Nazi one. Accordingly, the authors of such portraits of Stalin tried to use all the slanders expressed by Stalin's political opponents, from Trotsky to Khrushchev, as well as the victims of the repressions of the 1930s, 1950s and their children. Mounted for the needs of the Cold War, the image of Stalin began to be actively used to instill in the minds of Soviet people through radio propaganda and other channels. Stalin at the pinnacle of power. M. Vetch, 2002. p. 522. So, while not a single positive study on the Stalinist theme was carried out in the Soviet Union during the 18 years of Brezhnev's rule, the West during the same period already had a solid negative bibliography on this issue, which in 1987 to 1991 was a muddy stream poured out on the pages of our newspapers and magazines and also poured through radio and television channels, poisoning and vulgarizing the consciousness of the Soviet people. The only thing that hell I, Brezhnev, and for that we thank him very much, this is that he put a bust on the grave of I.V. Stalin, whom the sentimental Leonid Ilyich even kissed at the opening, and also gave the marshals of the Soviet Union G.K. Jukov, A.M. Vasilevsky, K.K. Rokossovsky, K.A. Mertskov, A.I.S. M. Shtmenko and other generals of the Great Patriotic War to publish their memoirs, and film director U. Reality. It was here that for the first time martial blows were dealt to Khrushchev Smiths, but only those that concerned the role of I.V. Stalin in the organization of the Great Victory. There was still a whole huge pile of Khrushchev nonsense, which was superimposed by the lies of the end of the Gorbachev era about I.V. Stalin and which is not so easy to clean up. But we have to. The cult needs a personality. Leonid Ilyich did not know then that flatterers and sycophants would give him exorbitant honors, undeservedly award high military orders and ranks, including the marshal's baton in the order of victory, and after his death they would forget just as they forgot Khrushchev. 
It is significant that accusing Khrushchev of creating a cult of his own personality, and putting forward against him, in fact, the same arguments with which the political pygmy smashed IV Stalin, M. Sislav cited such interesting figures. For the whole of 1963, the portrait of Khrushchev appeared 120 times in the central newspapers, and for nine months of 1964 to 140 times, while the portraits of IV Stalin, victims of Khrushchev's insinuations, were published no more than 10 to 15 times a year. It is impossible to create a cult from above. And evidence of this is the inescapable love and living memory of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin among the people themselves, who loved him and composed poems, songs and tales about the leader, and not obscene anecdotes and ditties, with which he rewarded his successors. Chapter 2 The Great Leap Nikita Khrushchev Quote, a star fell from the sky dash pure crystal. We disliked Khrushchev for slandering Stalin, folk ditty of the 50s. Round triple in one of the June issues of the Verzian newspaper for 2000, for the first time, a document was published from the personal file of Nikita Khrushchev, the Commissar of the Reserve. Here it is, quote, certification for the period from June 21st to September 1st, 1930. Personal data, energetic and decisive, disciplined. The trips were rated satisfactorily. Official data, military training, small arms learned satisfactorily, firing performed, political studies our western neighbors learned with a satisfactory assessment. Tactical training, he understands the situation completely, has a language, there is no system in thinking for assessing the situation and making decisions. Company commander foreman of the political staff Strashenenko. September 3, 1930 I agree with the attestation and the conclusions. Beginning under. Division. Sanko. October 17, 1930 inches. End quote. So, from this description, we see that the commissar of the reserve of the stars from the sky was clearly not enough and did not even reach the excellent student of combat and political training in his personal and official data. The Golden Key by Nikita Khrushchev But in the same 30th year, being a student of the Industrial Academy named after I.V. Stalin in Moscow, he is elected, that's what it means to have a language, L.B. Secretary of the Party Committee of the Industrial Academy. Khrushchev soon learned that his 29-year-old classmate Nadezhda Liluiva, although she did not advertise it, was, who would have thought, the first Red Lady of the Soviet state, the wife of Comrade Stalin himself, who was as much as 22 years older than his wife. Realizing that this is a unique chance for his career, Khrushchev uses the energy and determination noticed in him by the foreman of the political staff Strashnenko as well as the ability to fully understand the situation and takes a course towards rapprochement with Nadezhda Sergeyevna, in whom he now sees Golden Key, that magical sesame, open that will lead him to the corridors of supreme power. And he was not mistaken in his calculations. He managed to ensure that Nadezhda and Lilu Iva put in a word for him, and maybe more than one, in front of the leader. And from that moment begins Khrushchev's rapid ascent to the political Olympus. From January 1931, Khrushchev was secretary of the Bauman and then Kranoprasinsky district committees of the party in Moscow, and already in his personal file a new piece of paper appears, special remark of the attestation commission, where our round three is translated as who grew up on party work in the highest group of political staff. Professor of the Industrial Academy named after I.V. Stalin, Alexander Solovyovin's in his diary in January 1931 made an entry. I and some others are surprised by Khrushchev's rapid leap. I studied very poorly at the Industrial Academy. Now the second secretary, together with Kaganovich, but surprisingly narrow-minded and a big sycophant. The big toady was in the forefront of those glorifying the tried brilliant leader and leader of the party and all the working people, Comrade Stalin, thereby creating a cult of his personality, which he himself would then overthrow. And as for the nearness, as he noticed Khrushchev's son-in-law, about whom all of Moscow was talking, don't have a hundred friends, but get married like a Juby. He just seemed like a simple-minded person and even wanted to look like that. The secret of Khrushchev's great leap is that I.V. Stalin believed his beloved wife, not knowing what kind of pig she planted on him, at the mausoleum on the eve of the tragedy. However, on November 7, 1932, there was still no place for Khrushchev on Olympus. The government tribune, 
and he humiliatedly stood in a group of party activists away from the mausoleum. Khrushchev recalls this episode as follows, Nadia Liluiva was next to me, we talked. It was cold. Stalin at the mausoleum, as always, in an overcoat. The hooks of the overcoat were unbuttoned. The floor swung open. A strong wind blew. Nadezhda Sergeyevna glanced at her and said, Here, I didn't take my scarf. I'll catch a cold and we'll get sick again. It turned out very homely and did not fit in with the idea of Stalin, the leader, who had already grown into our consciousness. Dot. The next day, N.S. Aliluiva committed suicide. In his report at the 20th Congress and later in his memoirs he will accuse I.V. Stalin in this too. She committed suicide under mysterious circumstances. But no matter how she died, some actions of Stalin were the cause of her death. There was even a rumor that Stalin shot Nadia, special merits of faithfully Algo. In any case, the death of Anna Liluiva did not affect the further career of Nikita Sergeyevich. Perhaps even the opposite, IV. Stalin brought the faithfully Iago even closer to him. In 1934, at the Congress of Winners, Khrushchev, already on the rights of a tried son of the Bolshevik party, an outstanding party worker, a pupil and closest ally of comrade Stalin, was introduced to the membership of the Central Committee of the CPSU, B. And, pouring tubs of slops on the good name of I.V. Stalin 22 years later, reviling him for the reprisal of the so-called Leninist Guard, the delegates of the 17th Party Congress, he did not bother to explain to the dumbfounded audience for what such special services to the motherland and the party he personally was not repressed. The largest statesman of the Stalin era L.M. Koganovich recalled that immediately after the 20th Congress in 1956, V.M. Molotov told him, It is now Khrushchev who opposes repressions, and when he was the secretary of the Moscow City Committee, he sent over 50,000 party members to prison. In 1938, after the removal of Kozier, I.V. Stalin sent Khrushchev to Ukraine. Many delegates to the Congress of the Communist Party of Ukraine voted against his election as first secretary. So he put them all in. The fatal mistake of Joseph Stalin. In the report on the cult of personality and its consequences, Khrushchev falsely testifies that in the speeches of a number of members of the Central Committee at the February to March plenum of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks in 1937, Doubts were expressed about the correctness of the course towards mass repressions, Stalin oriented the party, oriented the NKVD organs towards mass terror. This terror turned out to be actually directed not against the remnants of the defeated exploiting classes, but against honest cadres of the party in the Soviet state, who were presented with false, slanderous, senseless accusations of double-dealing, espionage, preparation of some fictitious assassination attempts, the latter, it seems, already from the personal key of experience of the most honest cadre of the party in the Soviet state, Nikita Sergeyk, L.B. Dot. We need to destroy these scoundrels. Destroying one, two, a dozen, we are doing the work of millions. Therefore, it is necessary that the hand does not waver, it is necessary to step over the corpses of the enemy for the benefit of the people. Khrushchev said in May 1937 at the plenum of the MGK of the party. However, in that report IV, Stalin, which was titled On the Shortcomings of Party Work and Measures to Eliminate Trotskyist and Other Double Dealers, which was read by him on March 3, 1937, not only did not contain any orientation of the party towards masterer, but, on the contrary, demands were put forward in this issue, as in all other issues, to observe an individual differentiated approach. You cannot cut everyone with the same brush. Such an indiscriminate approach can only harm the cause of the fight against real Trotskyist wreckers and spies. The word T. Art. 149. In the same speech, Khrushchev, who was present at that plenum of the Central Committee in 1937, heard, but for some reason did not take personally such words of I.V. Stalin. The fact is that some of our party leaders suffer from a lack of attention to people, to party members, to workers. Moreover, they do not study party members, they do not know how they live and how they grow, they do not know the workers in general. Therefore, they do not have an individual approach to the members of the party, to the workers of the party. And precisely because, in general, such leaders try to think in tens of thousands, 
not worrying about units, about individual members of the party, about their fate. They consider it a trifling matter to expel thousands and tens of thousands of people from the party, consoling themselves with the fact that our party of two million and tens of thousands of those who have been expelled cannot change anything in the position of the party. But only people who, in fact, are deeply anti-party, can approach party members in this way. As a result of such a soulless attitude towards people, towards party members and party workers, discontent and anger are artificially created in one part of the party, and the Trotskyite double dealers deftly pick up such embittered comrades and skillfully drag them along into the swamp of Trotskyist sabotage. Yes, IV. Stalin warned that it must be remembered. No success can annul the fact of the capitalist encirclement. As long as there is a capitalist encirclement, there will be sabotage, terror, sabotage, and spies sent into the rear of the Soviet Union. We must smash and discard the rotten theory that with each of our advances our class struggle will fade away. We lack the readiness to liquidate our own carelessness, our own complacency. Shall we not be able to get rid of this ridiculous idiotic disease? We who have overthrown capitalism have basically built socialism and raised high the banner of world communism? In the speech of I.V. Stalin, as we see, there is no call for mass repressions, but a demand, quite expedient for protecting the cause of revolutionary transformation from both external and internal enemies, is put forward to mobilize all the forces of Soviet power, including punitive organs, to fight against Fifth Column subject to strict observance of socialist legality, an individual, differentiated approach in each individual case, as Stalin himself put it, do not cut everyone with the same brush. Mass repressions were precisely the result of sabotage actions and the cause of the inglorious fall of many party leaders who consider themselves to be part of the so-called Leninist Guard, who in fact were a deeply conspiratorial underground of comrade Trotsky, acting on the principle the worse the better. In his memoirs years later, Khrushchev writes, justifying Trotskyism, oppositional sentiments do not mean anti-Soviet, anti-Marxist, anti-party sentiments. No, these people just wanted to replace Stalin in the leadership. But this is what Lenin wanted. Consequently, these are not anti-Leninists, but people who stood on the positions of Lenin, believing that Stalin, by his nature, could no longer remain in his former post and should be replaced and Stalin destroyed them. Why? Because he considered himself indispensable. It is unlikely that this nonsense needs comments. Elsewhere in his memoirs, he directly writes, We decided not to raise the issue of open trials in my report at the 20th Party Congress. There was undoubtedly a certain ambiguity in such a position. But the meetings of the trial of Rykov, Bukharin and other leading figures, which ended in their condemnation, were attended by representatives of the fraternal communist parties. These representatives, having returned home to their countries, testified that the accusations were justified. We did not want to discredit the representatives of the fraternal parties who were present at the open trials. Therefore, they decided to postpone indefinitely the rehabilitation of Bukharin, Zinoviev, Rykov and the others. Now I am aware that this decision was erroneous. Why lie? Then, Khrushchev publicly stated more than once that I.V. Stalin played a positive role in the fight against the Trotskyists, Zinovievists and Bukharinites, L.B. It is permissible to ask, and who, at that plenum of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks in 1937, demanded the most furiously to shoot Bakharin and Rykov? and then boasted that he had revealed more pests in their party organizations. These are the real double-dealers and Jews, Pavel Postyshev, Stanislav Kozier, Robert Yick, Vlas Chubar, Alexander Kozarev and the unexposed Trotskyite Nikita Khrushchev, perhaps the only fatal political mistake of the infallible leader. Well, I didn't manage to discern behind the mask of external complacency the shirt guy and the feigned stupidity of an insidious and extremely vicious and vindictive enemy. The initiators of mass repressions One of the main instigators of mass repressions in the USSR, which after the notorious report at the 20th Congress will be referred to as Stalinist repressions, was Nikita Khrushchev himself. Back in January 1936, he stated in one of his speeches, only 308 people have been arrested, for our Moscow organization, this is not enough. In his speech at the February to March, 
1937, plenum of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, he said, sometimes a person sits, enemies swarm around him, almost climb on his feet, but he doesn't notice and puffs up, they say, in my apparatus there are no strangers. This is from deafness, political blindness, from an idiotic disease, carelessness. He is echoed by one of the first rehabilitated victims of political repression, Robert Yick, since 1929 the first secretary of the Siberian and West Siberian Regional Committees and the Novosibirsk City Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, a candidate member of the Politburo of the Central Committee. It was he who said, we have uncovered many pests in western Siberia. We uncovered sabotage earlier than in other parts of the world. By the way, it was this excessive zeal, the mass nature of unjustified arrests, the encouragement of denunciation and falsification of criminal cases on the ground, that was blamed on them, which is especially evident in the example of the same double-dealing Trotskyite Pavel Postyshev, who dissolved 30 district committees in the Kubyshev region whose members were declared enemies of the people and were repressed only because they did not see the image of the Nazi swastika on the covers of student notebooks in the ornament. How could Postyshev not be repressed, despite all his past merits? In a word, our hero, the then new promoter Nikita Khrushchev, who with great joy took the place of Kozier in Ukraine and a place in the Stalinist Politburo, turned out to be the winner. Already in June 1938, that is, exactly six months after the appointment of Khrushchev, one of the delegates to the Congress of the Communist Party of Ukraine, the future head of the Soviet from Borough, Colonel General Sherbakov, remarked, The real merciless defeat of the enemies of the people in Ukraine began after the Central Committee sent Comrade Khrushchev to lead the Bolsheviks in Ukraine. Now the working people of Ukraine can be sure that the defeat of the agents of the Polish lords and German barons will be brought to an end. Speaking at this Congress, Khrushchev recalled the words of Teres Bolba about the traitor son, I gave birth to you, I will kill you. To this he added, and now we will not let any traitor Andrews breathe. They will be destroyed, one and all. In February 1940, Khrushchev made the following statement, Our enemies have not yet died and will not rest as long as the capitalist encirclement exists. This must be remembered. In Ukraine, we cleaned up the enemies very well, but some still remain. They feel lonely, they are afraid to raise their heads, but they are there. So you have to look at both. Children. Page 595. And here are excerpts from another document that was first published in the first issue of the Bulletin of the Archive of the President of the Russian Federation for 1995. Since January 1938, Khrushchev headed the party organization of Ukraine. In total, 167,565 people were arrested in 1938 to 1940, that is, even after the new head of the NKVD, Lavrin Tiberia, with the sanction of IV, Stalin, began his activities with rehabilitation, as a result of which 327.4 thousand people were released as illegally convicted, and among them were previously repressed military men, who, on the eve of the war, were again returned to the army. In the independent Khrushchev Ukraine, repressions continued almost right up to the very beginning of the Great Patriotic War, LB. Khrushchev personally authorized repressions against several hundred people who were suspected of organizing a terrorist act against him. These are exactly the delegates to the Congress of the Communist Party of Ukraine that VM Molotov mentioned, LB. In the summer of 1938, with the sanction of Khrushchev, a large group of senior officials of the party, Soviet, economic bodies was arrested, including the deputy chairman of the Council of People's Commissars of the Ukrainian SSR, People's Commissars, and secretaries of regional party committees. All of them were sentenced to capital punishment and long terms of imprisonment. In the newspaper Arguments and Facts, No. 25, June 2003, one can find the following passage, already in our days. The words of A.N. Yakovlev, a figure of the Gorbachev era, an ardent anti-Stalinist and anti-communist, L.B., head of the Commission for the Rehabilitation of Victims of Illegal Repressions, there is no less blood on Khrushchev's conscience, but in comparison with someone, a hint at I.V. Stalin, L.B., and more, the question of whether there were political repressions or not, is not worth it, they were, 
and this is a fact that received its historical justification during the Great Patriotic War, when the state of the dictatorship of the proletariat survived, including because it isolated and liquidated their fifth column, potential traitors to the motherland. But to the question of whether it is legitimate to say that these were precisely Stalinist repressions, and why they became mass, Khrushchev himself answered at the 20th Congress, using Stalin's installation that the closer to socialism, the more and enemies, using the resolution of the February to March plenum of the Central Committee on the Report of Yezhov, provocateurs who made their way into the state security organs, as well as unscrupulous careerists, highlighted by me. L.B began to cover up in the name of the party in the Soviet state, read, in the name of Stalin, mass terror against the cadres of the party in the Soviet state, against ordinary Soviet citizens. Suffice it to say that the number of those arrested on charges of counter-revolutionary crimes increased in 1937 compared to 1936 by more than 10 times. 355. But who is to blame for this, I.V. Stalin, in whose name lawlessness was covered up, or provocateurs Trotskyists and unscrupulous careerists terrorists? No matter how much Nikita Sergeyevich would like to hide that he himself was one of these unscrupulous careerists, no matter how much he cleaned the archives, already in power, he failed to keep the secret of his participation in the organization of mass repressions, which with complete law can be called not at all Stalinist but Khrushchev's mass political repressions. In particular, a note from Khrushchev from Kiev addressed to I.V. Stalin, six months after the election, on the recommendation of the leader who did not recognize his dirty essence, as the first secretary of the Ukrainian party organization, dated June 1938, remember. It was in the summer of 1938 that the rise, but not yet peak, of Khrushchev's repressions in Ukraine. LB, colon Dear Joseph Vissarionovich, Ukraine monthly sends 17 to 18,000 repressed, and Moscow approves no more than 2 to 3,000. I ask you to take urgent action. Loving you and Khrushchev. A word to Comrade Stalin. P.355. From this note follows, contrary to the false statements of Khrushchev at the 20th Congress, it was not IV who initiated repressions in the USSR, or controlled them. L.B. Stalin, if he is asked to take urgent measures, the urgent measures that Khrushchev proposed could mean only one thing, they say, enemies of mass repressions have dug in Moscow, which impede the conduct of large-scale punitive operations, and I.V. Stalin had to order that these enemies be identified and punished. That the loving dear Joseph Vissarionovich, the unscrupulous careerist Khrushchev, with his indefatigable zeal wanted to create a favorable impression of his work with the leader. And when I.V. Stalin reproachfully asked our hero if he found too many enemies in Ukraine, he, modestly downcast, replied that in fact, there are many more. Chuev Molotov P.513. Khrushchev was such a dodger that I.V. Stalin hung noodles on the ears. Just in January 1938, when Khrushchev successfully took the place of the Secretary General of the Ukrainian Party Organization and in the Politburo of the Central Committee of the All Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, the plenum of the Central Committee of the Party met in Moscow, where I.V. Stalin decree of the plenum of the Central Committee of the All Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks on the mistakes of party organizations in the expulsion of communists from the party on the formal bureaucratic attitude to appeals expelled from the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks and on measures to eliminate these shortcomings, it is time to expose such, so to speak, communists and stigmatize them as careerists who are trying to curry favor with expulsions from the party, trying to play it safe with the help of repressions against party members, such a disguised enemy, a vile double-dealer, in every possible way seeks to create an atmosphere of excessive suspicion in the party organizations, in which every member of the party who spoke in defense another communist slandered by someone, they are immediately accused of lack of vigilance and of having links with the enemies of the people. Such a disguised enemy, a vile provocateur, in those cases when a party organization begins to check a statement filed against a communist, in every possible way creates a provocative environment for this check creates an atmosphere of political distrust around the communist and thus, instead of an objective analysis of the case, organizes a stream of new statements against him. Dot. 
former Stalinist Minister of Agriculture I.A. Benediktov writes in his memoirs, Stalin, no doubt, knew about the arbitrariness and lawlessness committed during the repressions, and took concrete measures to correct the mistakes made and release innocent people from prisons. Even the January plenum of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks in 1938 openly admitted that lawlessness had been committed against honest communists and non-party people, adopting a special resolution on this issue, published in all central newspapers. See Appendix No. 1. The harm from unjustified repressions was also openly discussed before the whole country at the 18th Congress of the CPSU, B, in 1939, immediately after the January plenum, thousands of illegally repressed citizens were released from the camps, including prominent military leaders. All of them were officially rehabilitated, on November 17 of the same 1938 signed by the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars V. Molotov and the secretary of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks I. Stalin addressed to the People's Commissars of Internal Affairs of the Union and Autonomous Republics, the heads of the UNCVD of the territories and regions, the heads of the district, city and district branches of the NKVD, as well as the decree of the Council of People's Commissars of the USSR and the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks was sent to the prosecutors of the Union and Autonomous Republics, territories and regions, district, city and district prosecutors, as well as to the secretaries of the Central Committee of the National Communist Parties, regional committees, regional committees, district committees, city committees and district committees of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, b, on arrests, prosecutorial supervision and the conduct of investigations, which condemned numerous facts of the grossest violation of socialist legality and expressed strict demands for the immediate elimination of existing serious shortcomings in the methods of conducting an investigation, in particular condemned, the launch of intelligence and information work, the use of the practice of mass arrests, the low quality of the investigation, a simplified investigation procedure, in which the investigator is limited to obtaining a confession of guilt from the accused and does not at all care about supporting this confession with the testimony of witnesses, expert reports, material evidence, etc. This decree stated, the NKVD workers are so unaccustomed to painstaking, systematic intelligence work and have so entered the taste of a simplified procedure for the proceedings that, until very recently, they raise questions about granting them so-called limits for mass arrests. This kind of irresponsible attitude to investigative proceedings and a gross violation of the procedural rules established by law were often skillfully used by enemies of the people who made their way into the bodies of the NKVD and the prosecutor's office both in the center and in the localities. They deliberately perverted Soviet laws, committed forgeries, falsified investigative documents, prosecuting and arresting them on trifling grounds, and even, without any reason at all, created cases against innocent people with a provocative purpose. In total, in 1938, as many as six resolutions of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks were adopted on the facts of violation of socialist legality. In addition to the above, these were, on changing the structure of the GUGB of the NKVD of the USSR, March 28, on changing the structure of the NKVD of the USSR, September 13, on the structure of the NKVD of the USSR, September 23, on accounting verification and approval workers of the NKVD, November 14, on the procedure for coordinating arrests, together with the Council of People's Commissars of the USSR on December 1st. V. Nukrasov. P. 226. Troikas and twos under the NKVD were abolished by order of the People's Commissar of Internal Affairs of the USSR, L. P. Beria, L. B., on November 26, 1938. Massacre Procurators Fate M. Jurid, Lit. 1990. P. 314. On February 1, 1939, the USSR prosecutor Ray Dacia Vishinsky reported to I.V. Stalin and V.M. Molotov that the chief military prosecutor's office, at the request of the secretary of the Vologda Regional Committee, revealed facts of especially dangerous crimes committed by a number of employees of the Vologda Ungvd. As it was established, 
falsifiers of criminal cases drew up false protocols of interrogations of the accused, who allegedly confessed to committing the gravest state crimes. To savagery, applying all sorts of tortures to those being interrogated. It got to the point that during the interrogations by these persons, four interrogated were killed. This case of the gravest crime against social law was heard in a closed session of the military tribunal of the Leningrad military district in the presence of a small number of operatives of the Vologda department of the NKVD and the Vologda prosecutor's office. The accused Vlasov, Lebedev, and Roskryakov, as the initiators and organizers of these egregious crimes, were sentenced to capital punishment, execution, and the other seven accomplices, to long terms of imprisonment. Elm Lechen, Death Street South, 215. And there were 11,842 such Vlasovs, Lebedevs and Roskryakovs throughout the country repressed villains, whom even at the time of Gorbachev's reckless forgiveness, the notorious commission of Alexander Yakovlev did not consider it possible to rehabilitate. Irashkovits. Non-judicial bodies. In book, Massacre. Prosecutor's Fortunes, C317. M.90. It is on the conscience of these falsifiers of criminal cases, accused of making unjustified mass arrests, using illegal methods of investigation, i.e. torture, L.B., who even half a century later were denied rehabilitation by the decree of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR dated January 16, 1989. The responsibility lies for those very thousands and thousands of innocently repressed whom Khrushchev, and then his nominee and student Gorbachev, safely hung on the late IV. Stalin. Let us return again to the 20th Congress of the CPSU. We hear from Khrushchev that there was allegedly a telegram to the secretaries of the regional committees, regional committees, the Central Committee of the Communist Parties of the National Republics dated January 10, 1939 signed by I.V. Stalin. The Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks explains that the use of physical force in the practice of the NKVD was allowed from 1937 with the permission of the Central Committee. The Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks considers that the method of physical influence must continue to be applied, as an exception, against obvious and undisarmed enemies of the people, as an absolutely correct and expedient method. When in one of the conversations with V.M. Molotov, the poet and publicist Felix Chuev asked him directly the question of sanctions for torture. I heard such a conversation that Stalin and you gave a directive to the NKVD bodies to use torture, V.M. Molotov answered in the negative, not recognizing this sin for himself. L.B. Molotov P.469 I do not undertake to state categorically whether there was such a telegram in nature or not. But you can take my word for it, no matter how many times and wherever I came across this cipher text, it always had a footnote with it, which referred to the same source, you guessed it right, to the report of N.S. Khrushchev at the 20th Congress of the CPSU, at least once, for the sake of decency. An archive was indicated where even a single copy of the original of such a document of particular importance is stored. Never. There is no original, not even a fake. And this proves, Khrushchev blatantly lied. Chapter 3, The Quote-Unquote Evil Stalin Quote, Khrushchev began a fight with the dead man and came out of it defeated. Winston Churchill They say that academician P.F. Uden, a philosopher, Speaking at one of the Khrushchev plenums of the Central Committee of the CPSU, somehow, having made a reservation, said, the party of Lenin, Stalin. And having realized it, he began to make excuses, and, in fact, why? Why didn't the communists then understand that the cause of Lenin-Stalin was indivisible, that it was impossible to oppose the infallible Lenin to the sinful Stalin, because in this case, in the final analysis, the cause itself, cemented by the great names of these two luminaries of world history, would perish. But it was precisely on such a primitive black and white contrast that Khrushchev's secret report at the 20th Party Congress was built. In an effort to oppose the evil Stalin to the good Lenin, Khrushchev, following Trotsky, did not disdain anything. But if the latter, resorting to lies and deceit, tried to destroy his main rival as a politician, by the way, according to Khrushchev, it turned out that, they say, Lenin always adhered to the principles of collective leadership, 
and Stalin showed complete intolerance for collectivity and leadership and work, and also demanded to unconditionally obey his opinion, and this was said by a member of the Politburo, who knew, like everyone else delegates sitting in the meeting room that the Stalinist style of communication when discussing any issue was completely different, what do you think, comrade Rokossovsky? Or come on, let our Makita shy away something, LB. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, convinced, educated, showed tolerance for dissidents, and Stalin used mass terror against party cadres, and we already know that one of the most active organizers of those mass repressions was our Makita, LB. Here, they say, Lenin was a man who had a sweet affection for a comrade, and Stalin, they say, even the wife and faithful friend of Lenin, an active fighter for the cause of our party from the moment of its inception, Kripskaya, was rude on the phone. True, at the end of his life, sclerosis will make Khrushchev forget the cause of the conflict between Stalin and Kripskaya, which will be reflected in his memories. Stalin told us a lot about Lenin. He often resented the fact that when Lenin lay ill and he quarreled with Kripskaya, Lenin demanded that Stalin apologize to her. I can't remember exactly what the reason for the quarrel arose. It seems that Stalin broke through to Lenin, and Nadezhda de Konstantinovna guarded Ilyich so as not to overload him and not to excite him, as the doctors recommended. Or something different. Stalin said something rude to Nadezhda de Konstantinovna, and she passed it on to Lenin. Lenin demanded that Stalin apologize. I don't remember what Stalin did whether he obeyed Lenin or not. I think that in some form he nevertheless apologized, because Lenin would not have reconciled with him otherwise. Khrushchev N. T.2 C.120 But then, at the 20th Congress, Khrushchev remembered everything perfectly and presented to the dumbfounded delegates the so-called political testament of V.I. Lenin and a couple of sensational notes concerning an unpleasant incident between I.V. Stalin and N.K. Kripskaya. After reading all this and catching the movement in the hall, Khrushchev said, Comrades, I will not comment on these documents. They speak eloquently for themselves. And why not comment? Didn't the Commissar of the Reserve read the Bolshevik magazine at one time? where in number 16 of September 1, 1925, a remark was published in connection with the publication in America of Eastman's book after the death of Lenin, under the guise of a testament in the emigrant and foreign foreign press, one of Vladimir Ilyich's letters is usually mentioned, which included organizational advice. All talk of a hidden or violated testament is an evil fiction. The author of this remark was, alas, not I.V. Stalin, and L.D. Trotsky. So. What happened at the time of Ilyich's illness? Disease VI, Lenin, sclerosis of cerebral vessels, can be divided into three large periods. The first blow came on May 25, 1922, the second, in December 1922, and, finally, the third, from which the leader never managed to recover, in March 1923. After March 9 and until his death, which followed on January 21, 1924, V.I. Lenin could no longer take part in the political life of the party in the country. Feeling the approach of death, seriously ill V.I. Lenin thought a lot about a successor, who could replace him and continue the work of October. A galaxy of comrades in arms passed before his mind's eye in the order in which they were listed in the minutes of the plenums of the Central Committee for 1918-1920, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Stalin, Rudzutak, Tomsky, Rykov. Priobrazhinsky, Bukharin, Kalinin, Grestinsky, Jerzinsky, Radek, Byadokov. From the mood of the sick Lenin, it was clear that he was going to leave Trotsky as his successor. Lenin wanted to be replaced by a figure well known to the international labor movement. He wanted his successor, if necessary, to become chairman of the Council of People's Commissars not only in Moscow, but also in Berlin, Paris or London. Only Trotsky could be such a person. For everything to be exactly like this, and not otherwise, Trotskyist Gregory Bisadovsky, a diplomat in the Chitrinsky People's Commissariat of Foreign Affairs, who fled abroad in 1929 for political reasons, would very much like to. Bisadovsky GZ on the way to Thermidor. M. Severmanik, 1997. S. 352 353. Ah. If only it were that easy. Each of the possible successors had its undoubted advantages, 
but there were also negative points. This was especially true of political mistakes. So, Trotsky, Vi Lenin appreciated him, but only within certain limits. Ilyich understood very well that Trotsky was not the person who could be placed at the head of the Bolshevik party in the country of Soviets, most of all in Trotsky Virgin Islands. Lenin was irritated by his non-Bolshevism, he could, say, for the sake of a red word, throw to Lenin, the cuckoo will soon crow the death of the Soviet Republic. It has been calculated that in his letters, telegrams and articles, Lenin called Trotsky 219 times a windbag, a pig, a scoundrel, a scoundrel of scoundrels, a Judah and a prostitute. But Stalin, never. And there was nothing to stick labels on IV. Stalin, he simply never gave a reason for this. Ilyich did not forget the October episode of Zinoviev and Kamenev when, at an expanded meeting of the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party on October 20, 1917, IV. Stalin criticized their strike-breaking position in connection with the publication in Novyazhizn of an article by Kamenev, supported by Zinoviev, in which the decision of the Bolsheviks on the course towards an armed uprising was widely publicized. Bukharin Ilyich, although he considers him the favorite of the party, also notes that his theoretical views can very doubtfully be classified as completely Marxist, because there is something scholastic in him, he never studied and, I think, never understood dialectics. And Pyatikov, a man of undoubtedly outstanding will and outstanding abilities, cannot be relied upon on a serious political issue. So, only IV, Stalin, of all the leaders of the party and state, Vladimir Ilyich had every reason to trust only IV, Stalin, who always supported him, never betrayed him, had a bright head, an iron will, remarkable organizational skills, exceptional devotion to the October Revolution an impeccable Bolshevik revolutionary past, was specific, short, clear, businesslike, frank, true, his assessments were sometimes harsh and critical, but always fair. IV, Stalin was next to VI. Lenin from the very day which arrived in Russia, on April 3, 1917, Koba met the leader of the world proletariat at the Belustrov station, from July 7 VI. Lenin is hiding in the room of IV, Stalin at the Aliluyevs. July 11th, IV, Stalin sees off VI, Lenin in Reslev, at the VI Congress of the Party, July 26 to August 3, 1917, which was held without the participation of VI, Lenin, IV, Stalin delivers two reports to the Central Committee, reporting and on the political situation. Their offices in Smolny are nearby, so IV, Stalin is always at hand with VI, Lenin. In 1919, the family of IV, Stalin was allocated a dacha in Zyubilov. His young wife, Nadezhda Liluiva, worked in the secretariat of the Council of People's Commissars and in the personal secretariat of VI. Lenin, was his duty secretary in Gorky, in 1921, during the purge. She was expelled from the party with the wording, for insufficient social activity. It is only thanks to the intercession of Ilyich that she is left in the party. In a note to A.S. Yanukids dated February 13, 1922, V.I. Lenin, among other things, writes, Stalin's apartment. When? Here is the red tape. On this note the next day, February 14, Yanukids informed V.I. Lenin that the apartment for I.V. Stalin is ready. Nobody so often visited V.I. Lenin and Gorky during his illness, as General Secretary I.V. Stalin. So, only for the period from July 11 to December 24, 1922, 32 such meetings were officially registered. We talked about different things. For example, talking with I.V. Stalin on August 30, 1922, V.I. Lenin was interested in how things were going with the harvest, the state of industry, the budget the exchange rate of the ruble, the international position of the Soviet republics, the anti-Soviet activities of the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries, etc. We talked mainly about work, but not only. Vladimir Ilyich was keenly interested in the health of his ailing comrades, Dzerzhinsky, Tsyarupa, and discussed the health of I.V. Stalin, having previously talked on the phone with the attending physician I.V. Stalin. V. A. Buck, Lenin V. I. Complete Collection of Works, V. 55, Volume 5th, Ed. M. Bulatizdat, 1979, Volume 45, S. 681. Lenin's sister Maria Lenigna Alianova, 
talking about the attitude of V.I. Lenin to I.V. Stalin, testified, they parted and did not see each other until V.I. Lenin did not begin to get better. At this time, Stalin visited him more often than others. He came first to V.I. Ilyich met him in a friendly manner, joked, laughed, demanded that I treat Stalin, bring wine, etc. A Lyonova M. Slash slash a news of the Central Committee of the CPSU. 1989. Number 12. P. 198 to 199. It is known that for the post of General Secretary of the Central Committee IV, Stalin was nominated on the initiative of V.I. Lenin. This happened on April 3, 1922, but only nine months later, Vladimir Ilyich, for some reason, for no apparent reason, strongly recommends that IV. Stalin from this position, without proposing any other specific candidate. This looks, at least, strange, illogical atypical for V.I. Lenin, but it is. This is how the entry in the supplement to the dictation letter of December 24th will sound, under which is the date January 4th, 1923, Lenin, and this can now be said with certainty, already knows about the incident between I.V. Stalin and N.K. Kripskaya. This knowledge is indicated by the key word rudeness, which is inclined in all the documents of Lenin, Kripskaya and others. Molotov, for example, believed. What Lenin wrote about Stalin's rudeness was not without the influence of Kripskaya, quoted by Chuev F. Molotov, semi-powerful ruler. M. Olnipress, 2000, L.B. Quote Stalin is too rude, and this shortcoming, which is quite tolerable in the environment and in communications between us communists, becomes intolerable in the position of general secretary. Therefore, I suggest that the comrades consider a way to move Stalin from this place and appoint another person to this place, who in all other respects differs from comrade Stalin with only one advantage, namely, more tolerant, more loyal, more polite and more attentive to comrades, less capriciousness, etc. End quote. As for the letter itself dated December 24, 1922, it contained the following lines about IV. Stalin, comrade Stalin having become general secretary, has concentrated immense power in his hands, and I am not sure whether he will always be able to use this power carefully enough, dot end quote. But this uncertainty of V.I. Lenin speaks out only in connection with the consideration of such an alternative to I.V. Stalin as L.D. Trotsky, on the other hand, comrade Trotsky, as his struggle with the Central Committee in connection with the question of the NKPS. People's Commissariat of Communications, L.B., has already proved, is not only distinguished by outstanding abilities. Personally, he is perhaps the most capable person in the present Central Committee, but he also boasts successively of self-confidence and excessive enthusiasm for the purely administrative side of things. These two qualities of the two outstanding leaders of the modern Central Committee are capable of inadvertently leading to a split. And if our party does not take measures to prevent this, then the split may come unexpectedly. T.45, P.345. According to the memoirs of Maria Ilinigna Alyanova, it was extremely difficult to maintain a balance between Trotsky and other members of the PB, especially between Trotsky and Stalin. Both of them were extremely ambitious and intolerant people. Their personal moment outweighs the interests of the case. And what kind of relationship they had in the early years of Soviet power is evident from the surviving telegrams of Trotsky and Stalin from the front to V.I. Alyanova M. Slash slash a news of the Central Committee of the CPSU. 1989. Number 12. P. 194. Ilyich rightly feared that the psychological incompatibility of the two central figures of the then Central Committee might, after his death, cause a split in the party. But what he proposed, to increase the number of members of the Central Committee to 50, to 100 people, was also not a panacea. Nevertheless, the concern of the sick V.I. Lenin, who felt the breath of death, can be understood. At the same time, one cannot rule out such a version that the addendum of January 4th was written under the dictation of N.K. Kripskaya, and not at all V.I. Lenin. Then everything falls into place. This document will be securely hidden by Kripskaya from prying eyes for almost a year and a half, and will emerge into the light of day after the death of V.I. Lenin, when the next Congress convenes, which simply does not dare not fulfill the last will of Vilyich.
or is it his wife, LB? And instead of IV, Stalin will elect to the post of General Secretary the most capable person in the present Central Committee, Trotsky, to whom Kripskaya favored and whose views she shared. The behavior of Kripskaya herself that day is described in the notes of Vladimir Ilyich's sister, Maria Linigna Alyanova, found after her death. Nades Konstantinovna was extremely excited by this conversation, she was completely unlike herself, sobbed, rolled on the floor, etc. Alyanova M. Slash slash a news of the Central Committee of the CPSU. 1989. Number 12. The complex of Caesar's wife, who, as you know, is beyond suspicion, could induce the offended Kripskaya. Oh, Vissarion each, how dare you, LB, and take such a desperate step. Khrushchev commented on this letter at the 20th Congress as follows, concerned about the future fate of the party in the Soviet state, Lenin gave a very true characterization of Stalin, indicating that it was necessary to consider the question of removing Stalin from the post of general secretary due to the fact that Stalin is very rude not considerate enough of others, capricious and abusing power. In his memoirs, Khrushchev from time to time will repeatedly duplicate the same slander, after all, Stalin exceeded what Lenin warned about, and he warned very clearly. Despite his warning, Stalin nevertheless got into the confidence of the people, ah ah ah, Nikita Sergeyevich, LB, and then quickly returned to those methods of action that Lenin mentioned warning that abuse could occur power. And so it happened, all this confirmed Lenin's assumption that Stalin was capable of abusing power and therefore it was impossible to keep him in the post of general secretary. Well, this was an obsession with Nikita Khrushchev, but vi. Lenin such words. All he said was, I'm not sure if he, i.e. I.V. Stalin, L.B., will always be able to use this power carefully enough. Is it the same thing? As a lawyer, Ilyich knew that abuse of power is a criminal offense that requires the most serious substantiation of a bunch of all kinds of evidence. But V.I. Lenin had absolutely no reason to believe that I.V. Stalin abuses power. At the same time, Khrushchev not only commits a criminal act, slandering I.V. Stalin, but also, distorting Lenin's words, is trying to make V.I. Lenin. What was the reason for the letter to the Congress? which was so cleverly manipulated by the enemies of I.V. Stalin, first of all, Trotsky, Zeno V.F., Kamenev and their last Khrushchev. And so it was. In the decision of the plenum of the Central Committee of the RCP, B., of December 18, 1922, it was noted, Comrade Stalin shall be personally responsible for the isolation of Vladimir Ilyich in relation to both personal relations with workers and correspondents. News of the Central Committee of the CPSU. 1989. Number 12. P. 191. That is, the Secretary General, because of his official duties, first of all, was personally responsible for compliance with the treatment regimen for V.I. Lenin. It so happened that a few days later, on December 21st, just on the birthday of I.V. Stalin, V.I. Lenin, in violation of the regime, Dictates to N.K. Kripskaya wrote a letter to Trotsky on the question of the monopoly of foreign trade, after which on December 22 Trotsky called Kamenev, about which Kamenev informed I.V. Stalin in a note, in response to which he wrote, 22-12-1922-T Kamenev received a note. In my opinion, we should confine ourselves to a statement and your report, without demonstrating to the faction, how could the Starik, one of the party pseudonyms of V.I. Lenin, which was used by his close comrades, L.B., organize a correspondence with Trotsky with the absolute prohibition of Forster, German neuropathologist, since March 1922 consulted doctors who treated V.I. Lenin, L.B. I. Stalin. News of the Central Committee of the CPSU. 1989. Number 12. P. 192. On the same day. The same so-called rude conversation of I.V. Stalin with N.K. Kripskaya on the phone. The reaction of I.V. Stalin, the person who is now responsible for the life and health of Vladimir Ilyich, was not only adequate to the circumstances, but also quite justified by any standards. After all, just on the night of December 22nd to 23rd, V.I. Lenin, the second blow occurs, paralysis of the right arm and right leg sets in. 
It was precisely the violation of the treatment regimen of Ilyich through the fault of Kripskaya that led to a sharp complication of the disease. Nevertheless, as if justifying herself, as if relieving herself of responsibility for the committed criminal oversight, on December 23 Kripskaya wrote letters to Kamenev and Zinoviev complaining about IV Stalin, one of which, namely, a letter to Kamenev. Khrushchev brought at the 20th Congress without explaining the circumstances of the case. Lev Borisic, about a short letter I wrote under dictation from Vlad Ilyich, with the permission of the doctors, Stalin allowed the most rude trick towards me yesterday. I'm in the party for more than one day. In all 30 years I have not heard a single rude word from a single comrade. The interests of the party and Ilyich are no less dear to me than to Stalin. Now I need maximum self-control. I know better than any doctor what can and cannot be discussed with Ilyich. I know what worries him, what does not, and in any case, better than Stalin. I am addressing you and Gregory, Zinoviev, LB, as VI, question mark, LB, and I ask you to protect me from gross interference in my personal life unworthy abuse and threats. I have no doubts about the unanimous decision of the Control Commission, which Stalin allows himself to threaten, but I have neither the strength nor the time that I could waste on this stupid squabble. I am also alive and my nerves are tense to the extreme. V. I. Lenin. PSS. T. 54. S. 674 to 675. Having received these letters, Kamenev and Zinoviev had a conversation with I.V. Stalin, who told them that he had spoken to N.K. Kripskaya is not like with his wife V.I. Lenin, but as with a member of the party that violated the prohibition of doctors on the isolation of V.I. Lenin from political activity and that he really told her that he intended to submit a report about this fact to the Central Control Commission of the party, and nothing more and that he was ready to apologize to Kripskaya if she regarded his call as gross interference in personal life. What IV? Stalin did it immediately. And on the morning of December 24, I Stalin, L. Kamenev and N. Bakharin discussed the situation. They cannot force Ilyich to remain silent, but all precautions must be observed, and most importantly, maximum peace. And the decision is made like this. 1. Vladimir Ilyich is given the right to dictate every day for 5 to 10 minutes, but this should not be in the nature of correspondence, and Vladimir Ilyich should not wait for an answer to these notes. Dates are prohibited. 2. Neither friends nor family should tell Vladimir Ilyich anything from political life, so as not to give material for reflection and unrest. Quoted by, Doc Kuchev M. History Remembers, M. Colin Sober. 1998. During the illness next to V.I. Lenin were constantly on duty secretaries, Anna Lilu Iva, M. Volodysheva, M. Glyaser, S.H. Manuturians, L. Fodva, S. Flakserman. However, someone, apparently one of the personal secretaries, informed V.I. Lenin about this incident, just like the content of the secret letter to the Congress, which was supposed to come to light after the death of V.I. Lenin. It became known in the same period to all interested parties, except for the reliably conspiratorial addendum of January 4, 1923, which confirms the version of the falsification of this document. LB, although there was a strict order from Vladimir Ilyich, on the letter, do not know one should know before my death. He knew, but in order not to give out the source of this information, he waited for the right opportunity. And now the moment has come, which will be discussed below. The moment recorded in the memoirs of Secretary N.K. Kripskaya v. Dridzo, when Kripskaya deliberately went to tell Lenin about this incident. El Fodva, Secretary V.I. Lenina, for example, claims that Kripskaya herself could have informed the leader about the telephone incident. Nadezhda Konstantinovna did not always behave as she should. She could have spoken to Vladimir Ilyich. She used to share everything with him. And even in those cases when it was impossible to do this. El Fodva. Quoted from, Beck A. On the history of Lenin's last documents. From the archive of the writer who spoke in 1967 with Lenin's personal secretaries slash slash mosque. Novosti. 1989. April 23rd. Number 17. P. 8-9. The Bulgarian researcher of this issue, scientist Mikhail Kailev, cites the following considerations in his book Khrushchev and the Collapse of the USSR regarding the letter to the Congress. 
It is incredible that V.I. Lenin dictated thoughts that were alien to his tolerant attitude towards his comrade in arms and comrade, which he had for a long time before the October Revolution and after it. It is incredible that V.I. Lenin made such a judicial and prosecutorial decision to remove I.V. Stalin from the post of General Secretary and suggest that the same Central Committee of the RCP B. Consider only a way to do this. It is incredible that V.I. Lenin suggested that the comrades from the Central Committee of the RCP B. Appoint another to the post of General Secretary instead of electing him as it should be according to the party rules. This means that V.I. Lenin is credited with violating the charter of the party and with an administrative command attitude to the question of the elective post of General Secretary of the Central Committee of the RCPB. It is incredible that V.I. Lenin did not propose the most suitable member of the Central Committee of the RCPB, who, on his recommendation, would replace I.V. Stalin in his post, if V.I. Lenin, indeed proposed to move I.V. Stalin. It is incredible that V.I. Lenin made a decision on such an important issue and at the same time would have asked N.K. Kripskaya to hand over to the Central Committee of the RCP. B. Is his decision after his death, when it will be too late and pointless. And so it happened, this addendum to the dictation letter of January 4, 1923 will get to the Central Committee of the RCP. B. Only after one year and four months. It is incredible that V.I. Lenin, who knew that I.V. Stalin, not only the general secretary, but also personally responsible for observing the regime of his treatment, proposes to remove him from this post only because he was rude to N.K. Kripskaya, that is, because of an insignificant emotional episode. Moreover, without meeting with I.V. Stalin to clarify this issue, all of the above, writes M. Kailev raises serious doubts about the existence of such an edition of January 4, 1923 to V.I. Lenin with exactly the same content. It is impossible to agree with the last remark of the Bulgarian scientist. Letter to the Congress, as well as supplement to it, included in the complete works of V.I. Lenin, the fact is historically reliable, but all the contradictions and absurdities noted by M. Kylev in the text can be interpreted either as falsification on the part of I.V. Stalin say, Trotsky, Zinoviev or Common F, L.B., with the direct support of N.K. Kripskaya, or, which is much more likely, as a sad manifestation of the most serious illness of V.I. Lenin. From the memoirs of Secretary N.K. Kripskaya v. Dryzo, now, when in some publications the name of Nadezhda Konstantinovna Kripskaya and Stalin's attitude towards her are increasingly mentioned, I want to talk about what I know for certain. Why V.I. Lenin only two months after Stalin's rude conversation with Nadezhda Konstantinovna wrote him a letter in which he demanded that Stalin apologize to her? Perhaps only I know how it really was, since Nadezhda Konstantinovna often told me about it. Tormented by conscience, L.B. It was at the very beginning of March 1923. Nadezhda Konstantinovna and Vladimir Ilyich were talking about something. The phone rang. Nadezhda Konstantinovna went to the telephone. The telephone in Lenin's apartment was always in the corridor. When she returned, Vladimir Ilyich asked, who called? This is Stalin, we made up with him. This was not a reservation. Kripskaya quite deliberately uttered these words, foreseeing that Ilyich would have to tell everything, LB. So how? And Nadezhda Konstantinovna had to tell everything that happened when Stalin called her, spoke very rudely to her threatened the control commission. Nadezhda Konstantinovna asked Vladimir Ilyich not to attach importance to this, since everything was settled, and she forgot about it, by the way, forgetting to say that Stalin had already apologized to her, LB. But Vladimir Ilyich was adamant, he was deeply offended by the disrespectful attitude of I.V. Stalin to Nadezhda Konstantinovna and dictated on March 5, 1923 a letter to Stalin with a copy to Zinoviev and Common F in which he demanded that Stalin apologize. Stalin had to apologize, but he did not forget this and did not forgive Nadezhda Konstantinovna, and this influenced his attitude towards her. Dridzo v. Memoirs slash slash Communist. 1989. Number 5. Chapter 4. Communism like Khrushchev. Quote, what is communism? These are pancakes with butter and sour cream. Marxism is not chicken, you can't put it in soup from Khrushchev's maxims. Well said, honestly. But, having chatted for eleven years, 
What did Khrushchev's dictatorship lead to? There is Marxism, but there is no chicken. Ilya Selvinsky. If the historical merit of K. Marx and F. Engels was that they turned communism from faith into knowledge, from utopia into science, into a doctrine, then developed by V. I. Lenin and I. V. Stalin, then the historical merit of Nikita Khrushchev was the reverse transformation of communism from a coherent doctrine and reality into a utopia, into an object of ridicule for ignoramuses and wise men. Thus, Khrushchev, who, on behalf of the revisionist CPSU, solemnly proclaimed that the current generation of Soviet people will live under communism by the beginning of the 1980s, can in fact be considered a real gravedigger of communism. It is known that it was precisely from the beginning of the 1960s that the growth rates of the Soviet Union's economy dropped sharply in comparison with the 1930s, and that gross industrial output decreased. In the countryside, the liquidation of small-scale peasant farming was actively going on, mass slaughter of livestock was encouraged, and it was not taken into account that this leads to a sharp reduction in its livestock. Khrushchev's goal to catch up and overtake America in the shortest possible time in the production of meat and milk per capita, and at a price, while exactly in the 60s, if life in the country was built according to the precepts of I.V. Stalin we would have achieved the most powerful development of productive forces and come close to communism in terms of the level and quality of consumption, the transition to the communist principle, to each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. The very adventurism and volunderism that caused Khrushchev's inglorious dismissal in October 1964, to some extent, manifested itself in the architect of the thaw during the life of I.V. Stalin. So, even when Khrushchev was in Ukraine, he put forward the slogan Shpalians subjugate time, about the initiative of the workers of the Shpaliansky district of the Kiev region to implement the three-year plan for the development of animal husbandry 1949-1951 in one year. Ten years later, in 1959, Khrushchev from the rostrum of the 21st Congress consecrated another, the so-called Ryazan initiative, when the leadership of this region undertook and again in one year, to increase meat production three times. The promise was fulfilled by the barbaric slaughter of all livestock, including dairy cows. But when this was not enough, they began to secretly buy meat in neighboring regions and export it to the Ryazan region. Newspapers enthusiastically praised the feat of the Ryazan livestock breeders. But even in this situation, the state failed to fulfill the triple rate of delivery of meat for the year. This led to the fact that the first secretary of the regional party committee, Larionov, shot himself in his office in 1960. Meanwhile, the people sang ditties, quote, We caught up with America in terms of milk yield, and in terms of meat we fell behind dash horse radish broke at the bull. End quote. The Russian State Archive of Sociopolitical History, Personal Archive of I.V. Stalin, or Gaspi, stores a letter from Khrushchev to IV villages. In this letter, Khrushchev explained to dear and beloved comrade Stalin the essence of his initiative to evict peasants from the villages of Ukraine, individual parasitic and criminal elements stuck to the collective farms, use the benefits provided to the collective farmers, but do not take any part in the work of the collective farms. Such elements, using the collective farms as a front, are engaged in speculation, theft, moonshining and commit other crimes. The draft resolution attached to the letter proposed that collective farmers' assemblies be given the right to expel undesirable elements for up to eight years. In Pravda Ukraine of May 28, 1948, Khrushchev's speech was published at the plenum of the Central Committee of the Communist Party B, of Ukraine, where, in particular, it was said, fighting loafers, malicious violators of discipline, and parasitic elements. Rural communists clear the way for more successful progress on the road to communism. At the same time, Khrushchev was not at all embarrassed that he was informed about the numerous facts of the eviction of law-abiding citizens, disabled people with disabilities, pensioners and families in which they were unemployed. On March 4, 1951, the Pravda newspaper published an article by Khrushchev on the construction and improvement of collective farms, in which the author, suffering, According to the apt remark of I.V. Stalin, the mania of eternal reorganizations, mistakenly proposed the forced mass resettlement of villages into large collective farm settlements, agro-cities, 
as well as the reduction of household lands of collective farmers to 10 to 15 acres. IV. Stalin was extremely dissatisfied with Khrushchev's article, and already on March 6, the pygmy wrote a letter where he humbly asked the giant for leniency. I quote this eloquent document in full, without cuts, quote, Dear Comrade Stalin, you quite rightly pointed out the mistakes I made in the article published on March 4 this year. Speech on the construction and improvement of collective farms. Following your instructions, I tried to think more deeply about these issues. After thinking it over, I realized that the whole speech as a whole is fundamentally wrong. By publishing the wrong speech, I committed a grave mistake and thereby damaged the party. This damage to the party could have been prevented if I had consulted the Central Committee. I did not do this, although I had the opportunity to exchange opinions in the Central Committee. I also consider this my gross mistake. Deeply experiencing the mistake made, I think how best to correct it. I decided to ask you to allow me to correct this mistake myself. I am ready to appear in the press and criticize my article published on March 4 to analyze and detail its erroneous positions. If I am allowed to, I will try to think over these questions well and prepare an article criticizing my mistakes. I ask you to look at the article in the Central Committee before publication. I ask you, Comrade Stalin, to help me correct the gross mistake I have made and thereby, as far as possible, reduce the damage that I have inflicted on the party by my incorrect speech. End quote. N. Khrushchev, March 6, 1951 inches, v. Sukhod, p. 125 to 126. Well, the sword does not cut a repentant head. In a letter to I. V. Stalin put his resolution in the archives of the Central Committee Street and generously forgave Khrushchev. Forgive, as always. Already retired, in his memories, Khrushchev. This, according to V. M. Molotov, a shoemaker in matters of theory. He is also an opponent of Marxism-Leninism, he is also an enemy of the communist revolution, hidden and cunning, very veiled, finally tore off the mask of communist number one, stating the following, the socialist system can win in the world provided that they achieve a higher productivity of labor than under the capitalist system. Our labor productivity is now lower than in Germany, France, England, the USA and Japan. We have been struggling with this for so many years. We have such open spaces, such resources, and we cannot create the necessary reserves in any way. It is impossible to captivate the people with us only by reasoning about the Marxist-Leninist teachings. If the state and the promised system do not give people material and cultural benefits anymore, but this is a declaration of its own insolvency, of its own bankruptcy. No one prevented the worthy successor of Lenin's work from organizing this business in such a way that labor productivity would be higher than in capitalist countries, so that natural resources would be used rationally, and sufficient reserves would be created. Moreover, I.V. Stalin taught, including Makita, L.B., it is necessary that certain reserves be accumulated in the hands of the state, necessary to ensure the country against all kinds of accidents, lack of crops, to feed industry, to maintain agriculture, to cultural development, etc. It is now impossible to live and work without reserves. T.8P.127 Especially for a society moving towards communism. But it is precisely here that the main difference between the giant and the pygmy is rooted. The first was able to organize and inspire the masses to great deeds. And the second believed that the state, read, the nomenclatura, is on its own, and the masses are on their own, that the people approach the state and the promised system from a purely Philistine, consumer position. Oh, you can't provide a decent living, then roll to hell with your communism. After all, you yourself say that you cannot captivate the people only with arguments about Marxism-Leninism, that Marxism is not chicken, you cannot put it in soup. This is how the people builder, the people creator, the heroic Soviet people, who lived their grounded life, without higher demands, without ideals, were corrupted, while the state, red, nomenclatura, parasitizing on socialism, grew fat due to the super-exploitation of the working class. This was already the unconditional surrender of the shoemaker in matters of theory to imperialism. The granddaughter of Khrushchev's son, Leonid, who was executed for treason during the Great Patriotic War, who considered Nikita Sergeyevich her grandfather, 
since the truth about the shameful page of the family biography was carefully concealed, now a U.S. loyalist, like Khrushchev's son Sergei, a graduate of Princeton University Nina Khrushchev went even further, in her application for granting her American citizenship at one time she had the audacity to say, History has clearly shown that my grandfather was wrong when he said that the grandchildren of Richard Nixon would live under communism. Communism, in the sense that he had in mind, has never been built anywhere, and it is unlikely that anyone will ever build it. But the society that Nikita Khrushchev called the citadel of imperialism has proved its vitality and is desirable for many today. Nina Khrushcheva was born in 1963, that is in the year when the Great Stalin Plan for the Transformation of Nature, approved on October 20, 1948, for 15 years, was to be completed, according to which it was planned in the USSR to create the most technologically advanced irrigated agriculture on the area, exceeding the territory of England, Belgium, Holland, Switzerland and Denmark combined, eight large forest belts, with a total length of over 5,300 kilometers protective forest plantations on the fields of collective farms and state farms on an area of 5,709,000 hectares, 44,228 ponds and reservoirs. An integral part of this grandiose plan was the large-scale construction of industrial power plants and canals, which were called the Great Construction Projects of Communism. For almost half a century, Ignoramuses and wise men will wonder what I.V. Stalin to build a lot of large and small canals, which forced him to insist on turning the waters of the mighty Siberian rivers Yenisei and Ob, flowing into the Arctic Ocean, into the Aral and Caspian basins. And the answer is simple, the implementation of these works was to ensure the maximum increase in soil fertility and the receipt of exceptionally high and stable crops in order to create a genuine abundance of food in order to implement the principle of communism, to each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. If the Stalinist plan for the transformation of nature, which for the first time in the history of mankind, on a large scale put the tasks of protecting the environment on a scientific basis, and at the same time aimed at solving the problem of achieving an abundance of food, had been implemented, then Soviet people would have lived under communism already in 1964, in the year when Khrushchev, who was too presumptuous, left his nominees, representing the interests of the emerging Soviet bourgeoisie, created in 1949-1951. 570 forest protection stations were mercilessly liquidated by Khrushchev, several thousand ponds and reservoirs that were intended for breeding fish were abandoned, new fish farms were not created, the grassfield farming system of outstanding Russian scientists V.V. Dokuchva, P.A. Kostichev and their student, the Soviet scientist V.R. Williams, which underlay the plan for the transformation of nature, was ruined, as a result of which, just in the year when Nina Khrushcheva was born, nature took great revenge on her grandfather, an ecological catastrophe occurred associated with soil erosion virgin lands, and a terrible food crisis erupted in the country. In the fall of 1963, bread and flour suddenly disappeared from store shelves. Sugar and butter shortages began everywhere. Numerous queues lined up in bread shops throughout the Union. White bread was given out strictly according to certificates certified by the seal of educational institutions and medical institutions only to certain categories of patients and preschoolers. That year, the Soviet Union imported bread from abroad for the first time in its history. The people joked, Khrushchev sowed in the virgin lands, and harvested in Canada. And the poet Selvinsky composed a caustic epigram, Khrushchev has achieved the purest azure in these ten great years. There is no anti-Semite phobia, there is no censorship, even bread is not even there. In general, Grandfather Nikita had an obsessive idea that the food problem can be solved in only one way, by cultivating corn from Moscow to the outskirts, from the southern mountains to the northern seas. With this idea, he rushed about even in the pre-war years and even devoted a whole report to it at a meeting of party. Soviet and collective farm assets of the Kiev region on January 28, 1941, where he, in particular, said, I have repeatedly heard from Comrade Stalin an instruction to pay attention to corn, to develop this crop in every possible way, to increase its productivity. Ah, yes, Nikita, and here he referred to I.V. Stalin, 
who, in general, correctly assessed the dignity of this crop, recognizing, however, the priority still belongs to wheat and without calling to cultivate it almost at the North Pole, LB. In June 1954, at the plenum of the Central Committee, proposing to increase corn crops throughout the country, Khrushchev stated that this cereal should be introduced without hesitation and forcibly, as potatoes were introduced under Catherine. In January 1956, he said, This year we will definitely grow corn in Yakushia, and maybe in Chukotka. Since potatoes grow there, corn must also grow. Queen of the Fields has become the heroine of many evil anecdotes and ditties. Here is one of them. I would love Khrushchev, marry him. But I'm afraid that instead of horseradish he has corn. His son-in-law Zubai said that during one of his trips around the country, Nikita Sergeyevich discovered that, without having time to harvest the corn and knowing that Khrushchev would pass through here, they brought tractors into the field, steel rails, like dragging, crushed the stems to the ground in order to disguise unharvested crop. Having told this story at one big conference on agriculture, Khrushchev sadly lamented that in the 1930s, they say, the old communists would never have deceived the party like that. But Khrushchev had no one to take offense at, except for himself. After all, it was he, Nikita Khrushchev, who committed the gravest crime against the Soviet people when he crossed out from the charter of the CPSU adopted at the 19th Party Congress according to his own report, IV. Stalin's words, Stalin's political precepts. The untruthfulness of a communist before the party and the deception of the party are the gravest evil and are incompatible with being in the ranks of the party. The current corruption of the new bourgeoisie is rooted in fraud, postscripts, inflated figures, frauds and other forms of deception of the party and people, which during the years of the Khrushchev thaw became the norm, encouraged from above, when the truthfulness and honesty of a communist was not only excluded from the charter but even persecuted from the circle of his rights and duties, and, more broadly, also his communist essence, communist authenticity. Dot. Here is the second Stalinist testament, which was also unceremoniously removed from the charter. There should not be two disciplines in the party, one for the leaders, the other for the rank and file. Just the elimination of this provision led to the emergence of a class of marketers, a party bureaucracy antagonistic in essence to the masses of working people, who grossly violated all norms of social justice, who lived according to the principle, in the name of the people, everything for themselves, a class of nomenclature exploiters who, without a twinge of conscience, committed a counter-revolutionary coup that began with Yeltsin's ban on the CPSU and the liquidation of the USSR in 1991, and ended with Yeltsin's dispersal of the Soviets in 1993. LB. Dot. But the greatest evil was caused to our people by the exclusion of the Third Stalinist Testament, the selection of personnel on the basis of kinship and nepotism, compatriotism, personal loyalty is not allowed. Violation of these norms, the selection of workers on the basis of friendly relations, personal loyalty, compatriotism and kinship are incompatible with being in the ranks of the party, just according to these criteria and not on the basis of political and business qualities, the central and national elites of the ruling party nomenclature class since the Khrushchev era, they, who were engaged only in personal enrichment, had no time for the construction of communism, LB. Dot. I repeat once again, all these three points were entered into the charter of the CPSU personally by I.V. Stalin and crossed out personally by Khrushchev. Analyzing the reasons for the failure of the plan of Khrushchev's full-scale construction of communism, one cannot help but admit that the ill-conceivedness of many of his reforms in the economic field, in particular, the creation of economic councils, and then the division, at the suggestion of Khrushchev, party bodies into industrial and agricultural, are to blame in the field of military affairs, failures in foreign policy, but mainly due to the fact that Khrushchev grossly violated the basic economic law of socialism, formulated by I.V. Stalin in 1952 in his work Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR, ensuring maximum satisfaction of the ever-growing material and cultural needs of the whole society, only party nobles were supplied to the maximum, but not the whole society. LB. Through the continuous growth and improvement of socialist production on the basis of higher technology, 
Khrushchev and his successors, the process of entry of human civilization into the post-industrial world, the scientific and technological revolution, which allowed the West to break far ahead on the basis of higher technology, overslept. IV. Stalin would not and the evidence of this is the success of the nuclear defense program and the space program, which was being prepared in the depths of the deeply secret design bureaus of the Stalin era. LB. Dot. Khrushchev abandoned the plan for building communism, thought out to the smallest detail, which IV. Stalin since the adoption of the Stalinist constitution of the USSR, on the eve of the 18th Party Congress, and which, no doubt, would have been carried out in the USSR if the war had not prevented. In the post-war years, 1946 to 1952, the ideological doctrine of the deployment of communist construction was again put forward with the definition of its specific terms. Speaking on February 9, 1946 at the Bolshoi Theater at an election meeting of voters, IV, Stalin recognized the steady increase in the material standard of living of the people as the most important task of the day and indicated ways to achieve this goal, through the widespread deployment of the production of consumer goods, the all-round development of all industries directly related to this, and the systematic reduction in retail prices for products and essential goods. And the government decrees that followed this speech aroused enormous labor enthusiasm of the masses because the people saw that these words of the leader were backed up by the real concern of the Soviet state. The transcript of the 19th Congress of the CPSU is imbued with a sense of the approaching communist tomorrow. The great idea had one great author and one great organizer, and had he lived for another 15 years, we would certainly have lived under communism, because he knew exactly what to do and how to do it, in order to prepare a real, not declarative transition to communism at least three basic preconditions must be met. It is necessary, fiercely, to ensure not a mythical rational organization of the productive forces, but a continuous growth of social production with a predominant growth in the production of means of production. It is necessary, secondly, by means of gradual transitions carried out to the benefit of the collective farms and, consequently, of society as a whole, to raise collective farm property to the level of public property and to replace commodity circulation, also by means of gradual transitions, with a system of product exchange. It is necessary, thirdly, to achieve such a cultural growth of society that would provide all members of society with the comprehensive development of their physical and mental abilities. It is necessary to raise the real wages of workers and employees at least twice, if not more, both by directly raising money wages and and especially by further systematic price reductions. Stalin IV Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR. M. 1952. P. 66-69. And the people because our plans loved the Hulk that IV. Stalin was responsible for every word he said. People believed in the feasibility of these plans and responded to the calls of the leader with labor enthusiasm. However, Already at the July 1953 plenum of the Central Committee, that is, only four months after the death of I.V. Stalin, Malenkov, who replaced him as chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR, stated literally the following, It is a provision on product exchange, if it is not corrected, it can become an obstacle to solving the most important task for many years to come, the all-round development of trade. Having revised the economic views of I.V. Stalin, Malenkov thus laid the foundation for the dismantling of socialism and strengthened the position of the specter of capitalism already wandering around the Union. Soviet society in the post-Stalin period in general began to rapidly degenerate morally and spiritually, becoming more and more defenseless against the powerful onslaught of petty bourgeois consumer psychology, and, of course, the resuscitation of the idea of building communism already thoroughly vulgarized by the Khrushchev thaw, is nothing but bitter irony and bitterness, could not evoke among the masses. Suffice it to recall that it was after the death of I.V. Stalin, during the period of the Khrushchev thaw, such speech cliches as work is not a wolf, it will not run away into the forest, hand washes its hand, work is not hell, it stood and will stand, work our friend, and we don't touch her. Vodka is our enemy, and we are destroying it. Forty years since there are no lackeys, 1957, the model of the Brigade of the Communist Labor Force, 
who should carry it, what, where. 1959, unthinkable for the victorious people, the working people, the Stakhanovite people, who were proud of their labor achievements in the Golden Stalin era. About the party apparatchiks in the year of the 40th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution in the midst of the people they taunted, until the 17th year there was exploitation of man by man, but now it's the other way around. The following example of folk art speaks best of all about the moods that prevailed in society at the time, communism is already on the horizon. What is a horizon? It's a line that moves away as you get closer to it. A rapidly enriching new class of swaggering proprietors, the party nomenclatura, who abandoned the ideological and theoretical guidelines of V.I. Lenin and I.V. Stalin, who supported Khrushchev at the 20th Congress and in July 1957, by the mid-60s began to be burdened by the excessively uncontrollable Khrushchev and found a replacement for him in the person of the quietest L.I. Brezhnev. But even under him, communism was not remembered. On the contrary, the so-called Kosygin's market reforms led farther and farther away from Stalin's socialism, from the realization of mankind's centuries-old bright dream of communism as a society of social justice. The rotten anti-communist elite of the CPSU grew stronger and more impudent, putting forward from its midst the genetically damaged Gorbachev with his notorious perestroika that ruined the USSR. IV. Stalin was right when he called on the party and the people to political vigilance and to the understanding that, as we move forward, the class struggle does not die out, but, on the contrary, intensifies, and that achievements and successes do not nullify sabotage. Quote, the peculiarity of modern wreckers, Stalin emphasized, is that they have a party card, they play on political trust in them as members of the party, they use the political carelessness of the Soviet people. End quote. We can appreciate the justice of this situation today, when people who pretended to be communists took off their sheepskins and bared their disgusting wolf mouths, appropriated everything that was created by many generations of Soviet people, playing well on political trust and rather, on the political carelessness and theoretical illiteracy of the majority, LB, to them from the rank and file members of the Communist Party. But although capitalism rejoices today, communism will still win. Vladimir Ilyich was absolutely right when he said that to imagine world history going smoothly and accurately forward, without sometimes gigantic leaps back, is undialectical, unscientific, theoretically wrong. Lenin VIPSS v.30 s 6 believe there will be a holiday on our street chapter 5 the belisi novichirkovsk orenburg bloody sunday in the homeland of the leader when blinded by pathological hatred for his benefactor iv nikita khrushchev spoke to stalin from the rostrum of the 20th party congress he could not even imagine what bloody consequences the anti-Stalinist campaign unleashed by him would lead to. The first to react to the secret report was the Georgian youth, who were outraged by the shamelessness with which Khrushchev defiled the memory of the late Stalin, although during his lifetime he himself was among the first sycophants and flatterers who created the cult of the leader. On March 2, 1956, Thousands of students and high school students gathered at the monument to Stalin in Tbilisi demanding to restore the good name of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin. The protesters came out with slogans down with Khrushchev, Mikoyan, Bolgonyan, rehabilitate Stalin and Beria, form a government of Molotov. This was the first unrest during the years of Khrushchev's rule, but not the last, and, as it will happen more than once in the future, it was shot and brutally suppressed. After three days of mourning, a wave of thousands of rallies and demonstrations from March 5 to 9, the days of memory of I.V. Stalin, L.B., swept across Georgia. Tbilisi, Badami, Sukumi, Rostavi. In Tbilisi, the demonstrators tried to break into the central telegraph building in order to send appeals and protest resolutions to Moscow. A large crowd of people gathered at the hotel where Zhuda, Mao Zedong's deputy, who was on a visit to the USSR, stopped and chanted slogans calling on the People's Republic of China to intercede for I.V. Stalin. The demonstrators surrounded the building of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Georgia, 
temperamentally demanding that the first secretary Veems of Inads come out to the people and give intelligible explanations of what was nevertheless said at the Congress about IV Stalin. So we didn't wait. On the other hand, the troops that entered Tbilisi on March 9 fired at unarmed people and dispersed a crowd of thousands with tanks. Innocent blood was shed. Dozens of people were killed, hundreds were injured. It seems that it is the memory of these tragic events that will make Vims of Anads, a delegate of the 22nd Congress, sick in five years and not come to the 23rd meeting, where he was supposed to support the grave diggers IV at the request of Khrushchev, Stalin, Spiridonov, Demikhev. Lazurkin, Podgorny. And he did the right thing. Givi Javakishvili, the Prize Minister of Georgia, who spoke at this Congress in support of the proposal to remove the body of IV Stalin from the mausoleum, soon burned down a house in Tbilisi. It was difficult for Khrushchev to dismantle the monuments to IV Stalin in the capital of Georgia. The population, embittered by the bloody massacre of the authorities with unarmed people, established a round the clock watch near them and was ready to lay down with bones at the pedestals. The authorities had to resort to a military trick. An atomic air raid was announced, and at that time, while the naive Georgians were hiding in bomb shelters and the streets were depopulated, all three monuments were dismantled with the help of helicopters. The only monument to I.V. Stalin, who managed to defend then and which has survived to this day, stands in Gori, in the homeland of the leader. We will catch up with America. We will strangle the population. If the unrest in Georgia, the first during the reign of Khrushchev, was an unprecedented historical fact in the sense of its pro Stalinist orientation, then their suppression became the norm for Khrushchev, who tasted blood during events of this kind, regardless of the reasons that caused them. So, there were victims during the pacification of workers employed in construction in Tamir Tau on October 3 to 5, 1959 in class protests in connection with the increase in prices for a number of food products in Donetsk, Kemerova, Ivanova. The population of the city of Ivanova demanded that their city be supplied in the same way as Moscow. They were indignant. What is this being done? Why can Muscovites and Leningraders eat their fill, while we have at least a rolling ball? An indignant crowd of people gathered near the building of the Regional Party Committee and the Regional Executive Committee, and in order for them to retreat, the police began to shoot at their feet. A fight broke out, as a result of which many troublemakers were arrested. Other worries about unbearable living conditions created by Khrushchev, ranting that communism is just around the corner, were riots in the North Caucasian cities of Mineral Nivodi and Grozny. In a skirmish with an angry crowd, several policemen fell. In the city of Alexandrov, near Moscow, the discontent of a large crowd of starving citizens was expressed in an attack on the police and beatings of policemen. And in the city of Morham, the opposite happened, there the police opened fire on the crowd, as a result of which there were casualties, but the top of Khrushchev's punitive policy was the suppression of the uprising of the population of the city of Novichirkovsk in June 1962. The Soviet people accustomed in the seven post-war years to Stalin's annual reductions in prices for food and industrial goods and did not grumble about the fact that after his death prices remained at the same level, suddenly on June 1, 1962, in a country whose leader is the whole world has been saying that we will overtake and overtake the United States in meat, butter and milk production per capita in the next few years, they read in the newspapers about raising government prices for meat meat products and butter by about 25 to 30 percent. The people did not accept Khrushchev's innovations, expressing their protest in evil anecdotes and ditties. And Nikita Sergeyevich boastfully declared, that's the kind of life I created, everyone can grind with their tongue what they want and where they want, even in a common bath, without fear that they will put him in jail for it. But when the abusive free thinking reached a critical point, Stop the jokes about Nikita Sergeyevich before it's too late. The increase in prices was reported in a special appeal of the Central Committee of the CPSU and the Council of Ministers of the USSR to the Soviet people. As the newspapers wrote at the time, our people speak favorably of the decision of the party and the government, they say that this is a necessary and good measure. For example, while reading this appeal, Tokarev, a mechanic at the depot of the Kursk station, emphasized, a good event. But we have cheap bread, sugar, flour, 
cereals and other products. This is the main thing. As for the increase in prices for butter and meat, this is a temporary phenomenon. When there are more of them in the country, prices will immediately be reduced. However, the State Security Committee also received data on politically incorrect, Philistine and hostile statements. So, on June 2, the chairman of the KGB, Semi Kasny, in a top secret note, informing Khrushchev about the troubles in Novocherkovsk, cites several politically harmful statements of Muscovites to have livestock in suburban settlements and in some villages. If the workers and peasants had been allowed to have cattle and breed them, then this would not have happened. There would be enough meat products now. The foreman of the mechanical workshop of the All Union Electrotechnical Institute, named after Lenin Zanov, said, Individual cows were slaughtered, calves are not raised. Where will the meat come from? There's some miscalculation here. Azovsky, the operator of the Moscow carbon dioxide plant, said, Our government distributes gifts, feeds others, but now we ourselves have nothing to eat. Now, at the expense of the workers, they want to get out of the situation. Honored artist of the RSFSR Zaslavsky said, We will not die from this event, but it is a shame in front of foreign countries. If only they were silent that we are already overtaking America. It's disgusting to listen to our loudspeaker all day long about what we are, we are, we are. All this is an endless boast. Was it like that under Comrade Stalin? Belilovskia, an English teacher, noted, I don't know what to say to the members of the circle where I conduct classes. All the time in my conversations with the audience I relied on our wonderful program and talked about the continuous growth of the well-being of the working people. What will I say now? I just stop believing. Senior engineer Glavmis Promstrol and materially Mesteshkin said, Everything bad is blamed on Comrade Stalin. They say that his policy ruined agriculture. How then did prices go down? And really? During the time that has passed since his death, it was impossible to restore agriculture. In Tombov, Chelyabinsk, and Donetsk, leaflets were distributed and inscriptions were made against the Soviet government. In the Oktyabrsky district of Leningrad, nine posters of anti-Soviet content were found. In Donetsk, there were cases of distribution of leaflets and inscriptions against the Soviet government. In the Oktyabrsky district of Leningrad, Nine posters of anti-Soviet content were found. In Donetsk, there were cases of distribution of leaflets and inscriptions against the Soviet government. In the Oktyabrsky district of Leningrad, nine posters of anti-Soviet content were found. Khrushchev cracks down on the working class. From the note of the chairman of the State Security Committee under the Council of Ministers of the USSRV, Semikastny in the Central Committee of the CPSU. June 2, 1962. Special Folder. Top Secret. Undesirable manifestations continue to take place in the city of Novocherkovsk at the electric locomotive plant. By about 3 in the morning on June 2, after the intervention of military units, the crowd, which by that time numbered about 4 to 5,000 people, was forced out of the plant, and gradually it dispersed. The plant was taken under military protection. A curfew was set in the city. Twenty-two instigators were detained, but after questioning, twenty of them were released so as not to cause unnecessary complications. Two instigators are being held in Shakti. The calm atmosphere continued until 7.30. By 8 o'clock the first shift, with the exception of three workshops, started work, but then, under the influence of disorganizing elements stopped it. By 9 o'clock a crowd of up to 5,000 gathered at the plant administration and about 1,000 people, on the territory of the plant and again began to rally. At the same time, about 400 workers at the Neft Mesh plant stopped working. They left the enterprise, declaring that they could not work at gunpoint, and 100 of them broke into the territory of plant number 17 and found support among some of the workers there. At 9.50 a.m., all the pipers, as the troublemakers strikers were called, a word that was invented for the hegemonic working class, LB. About 5,000 people left the territory of the factories and moved towards Novocherkovsk, leaking through the first tank barrier. Ahead of the main column is a portrait of V.I. Lenin and fresh flowers, dot. This breaks the record. Evidently, Semikastny was waiting any minute for further information. But it was already clear that reason prevailed over emotions and people's discontent entered, as they say today, 
into a civilized channel. And then events developed like this. The workers marched with red flags and sang the international. They carried slogans, give meat, butter, we need apartments, Khrushchev for meat. On the eve of the workers on the factory square burned the portraits of Nikita Sergeyevich collected at the factory, LB. Some of the demonstrators went to the city police department, demanding the release of their comrades who had been arrested the day before. But many went to the building of the city party committee, in which none of the cowardly partocrats turned out to be. Speakers began to speak from his balcony. Each of the speakers urged not to go to work until the previous rates were restored. The all-union price increase coincided in the Vichirkosk with a one-third decrease in work rates. LB and will not reduce the price of meat, butter and milk. The participants of the rally put forward a demand to release those arrested, as well as to invite members of the Presidium of the Central Committee to Novichirkovsk, not knowing that two members of the Presidium, secretly seconded by Khrushchev to suppress the Novichirkovsk uprising, Mikoyan and Kozlov had already secretly arrived in Novichirkovsk and instead of going out to the protesters, to listen to them and demonstrate that the people in the party are united, from the window of one of their residential buildings they cowardly watched the development of events and gave orders to pull tanks into the square from there. The soldiers fired their first machine gun bursts over the heads of the crowd, down the trees, from which killed and wounded teenagers began to fall, watching what was happening in the square. This was recalled by General Alexander Lebed, who himself at that time was among those teenagers. He then managed to jump off the tree and run away, thanks to which he survived. From the information of the Prosecutor General of the USSR Entrobin about the popular unrest in the city of Novichirkovsk, June 1962, as a result of the use of weapons for the purpose of self-defense, of course, of course, exclusively for the purpose of self-defense. But how could it be otherwise? LB. On June 2nd, internal troops killed 22 and wounded 39 participants in the square and near the city police department unrest. Two more people were killed on the evening of June 2nd under unclear circumstances. The dead were buried secretly. And in August, visiting sessions of the Supreme Court of the RSFSR took place over the instigators of mass riots. Of the 14 defendants, Seven were sentenced to death and shot. A total of 105 people were convicted. For the first time in the history of the Soviet state, the working class found itself in the dock. From note of the head of the Department of Propaganda and Agitation of the Central Committee of the CPSU for the RSFSR VI, Stupikovit to the Central Committee of the CPSU about the trial in Novichirkovsk. August 24, 1962. Top Secret. On August 20th of this year, an open trial of the Judicial Collegium for Criminal Cases ended in Novichirkovsk, which considered the case on charges of gangster actions on June 1 to 3, 1962. Kuznetsov, Trupanov, Zaitsev, Sotnikov, Makrasov, Karkak, Shuvev, Levchenko, Chernik, Goncharov, Sluzenko, Dementiva, Katkova, and Strubin. At the trial, the vile role of the defendants, who led the criminal hooligan elements, was completely exposed, and all their criminal activities were shown. The trial revealed the disgusting moral face of each defendant, comprehensively showed the social danger of the crime they committed. The guilt of the defendants was fully proven in the court session. All the criminals, with the exception of Dementiev, pleaded guilty and declared their remorse for the grave crimes they had committed. The court, taking into account the special social danger of the defendants, as the main organizers and active participants in the gangster actions, sentenced Trupanov, Makrasov, Kuznetsov, Sotnikov, Zaitsev, Karkak and Shuvev to capital punishment, execution. The rest of the defendants were sentenced to long terms of imprisonment and strict regime corrective labor camps. One of the participants in the Novichirkovsk distemper Pyotr Syuda, who served six years from start to finish was killed under unclear circumstances on May 5, 1990. He was killed for conducting his own investigation and poking too hard into the circumstances of the Novichirkovsk tragedy. Khrushchev-style justice. On the margins of this document there are visas of members of the Presidium of the Central Committee of the CPSU Voronov, Brezhnev, Kozygin, Shilipin, Kosinin, Alishev, Soslov, Mikoyan, Palansky, Grishin. There is only the signature of the executioner himself, Khrushchev. However, 
There is such a postscript of the assistant to the first secretary of the Central Committee, Comrade Khrushchev and S. Reed. 26. 08. 62 v. Lebedev. This note also talks about the punishment suffered by the real culprits. Novichirkovsk tragedy. The director of the Budionny Electric Locomotive Plant Kirochkin was expelled from the party and removed from his post. The secretary of the plant's party committee, Purushev, was released from his duties and received a severe reprimand with registration on the registration card. The same punishment was received by the delegate of the 22nd Party Congress, the first secretary of the city committee Lajinov and the chairman of the city executive committee Zamula, although at the trial. In the testimony of witnesses, numerous facts were cited that testified to the direct fault of the provocateur Kurochkin, to the callous attitude of the city authorities to the needs and demands of the workers, disgusting supply of food and industrial goods, neglect of housing construction, serious shortcomings in the cultural and community services for the workers of the plant and residents of the Okjabrsky settlement. At the trial, for example, the following episode surfaced. On the 1st of June, Excited workers surrounded the director of the plant and asked how they could now make ends meet, when wage rates for workers were cut by a third, and prices for meat and dairy products were raised by a third. Director of Nevs then, Kirochkin brazenly cut off beauty on the, if there is not enough salary for meat and sausage, eat liver pies. It was these words, which quickly spread through the shops that became the detonator of class actions in Novichirkovsk. Demands were heard for reprisals against the administration of the enterprise, and the first secretary of the Rostov Regional Committee of the CPSU, Basov, who arrived at the plant on the same day, well fed and clean, went out onto the balcony of the plant management to calm the protesters, the workers threw bottles, stones, sticks and other objects. The workers were indignant, yes, they are still mocking us. Bastards. They is a symbolic word. A word that Soviet people will increasingly use when talking about those in power. A word that shows that the working class, for the first time in Novichirkovsk, realized in its own skin all the charm of the nationwide state, proclaimed only six months ago, at the 22nd Congress in the revisionist program of the CPSU, for the first time realized that with the abolition of the dictatorship of the proletariat, Society split into two antagonistic classes, two we are the working people and they are the actively emerging class of the Soviet nomenclature of bourgeoisie, which in words led to communism, but in reality led away from it. The Brezhnev clique that overthrew Khrushchev, which left its autographs on the execution note, will not only not correct the course of the state ship in the direction of the Leninist-Stalinist plans, but will also greatly increase the gap between the tops, which, in the figurative expression of Nikita Sergeyevich, they ate dumplings with butter and sour cream, and Niza, who had only to suck their fingers. The separation from the masses, about the perniciousness of which I.V. Stalin warned the party more than once or twice, citing even a figurative comparison with the cause of Andy's death, deepened more and more. There is no doubt that Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin, who headed the state of the dictatorship of the proletariat, would have shot not seven workers, but seven party functionaries. And I would be a thousand times right. Or Renberg tragedy. Having made Georgi Zhukov the Minister of Defense for the capture of the hardened spy and executioner Beria, Khrushchev, as the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, insisted that he give the order to conduct regular exercises with testing of atomic weapons on living people. In this episode, Khrushchev's adventurism. Hardness of heart and thoughtlessness were fully manifested. There was no such need, because all the tragic consequences of the atomic explosion over nine years were thoroughly studied using the textbook example of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And yet, on September 14, 1954, the order to organize the next exercise was signed by the Minister of Defense. Only two knew about the true purpose of these exercises, Khrushchev and Zhukov, biographer G. Zhukov A.N. Gordienko writes, at the Totsk test site near Orenburg, 40,000 servicemen were thrown into nuclear hell. Three quarters of the soldiers died quickly from burns and radiation sickness. Another 10,000 remained disabled for the rest of their lives. The writer researcher Vladimir Karpov also writes about this fact. On the eve of the explosion, the families of servicemen were evacuated to Sorochinsk, and after the explosion, 
they immediately returned to their damaged Finnish houses, began to clean up, swept away radioactive dust with ordinary rags, and the wives washed the clothes of their husbands who returned from the exercises. And after some time it began, hair and teeth fell out, bones ached, strength left. Thirty-year-old, recently powerful men turned into decrepit ruins, probably. All the participants in these exercises have already died out. In the cities mentioned above, new cemeteries have been opened, and now they are full. The results of these exercises, as well as the tragic consequences, were kept under the stamp of secrecy and non-disclosure. So on whose conscience lies the blood of 40,000 innocently killed Soviet soldiers, victims of the Totsk training ground? On the conscience of Khrushchev? Or on the conscience of Zhukov? And calling in his memoirs IV. Stalin as a criminal, did Khrushchev really never remember this grave crime of his against humanity, a war crime worthy of Nuremberg or The Hague? Chapter 6, Baltic Syndrome. Quote, the role of Khrushchev is very bad, he let such a beast break out which is now causing great harm to society. Molotov An alarming consequence of the fight against the cult. Twenty-party Congress with its condemnation of the cult of personality IV. Stalin was received with an enthusiastic squeal by all the world's anti-communist and anti-Soviet forces. In the Soviet Union, he opened the floodgates for militant bourgeois nationalism and separatism in a number of republics but primarily in the Soviet Baltic republics. It is from the time of the Khrushchev thaw that all manifestations of the so-called Baltic syndrome begin their countdown, a contemptuous, arrogant and hostile attitude towards other Soviet peoples, hatred of everything Russian, a spiritual craving for Nazism and its paraphernalia. It was from the time of the Khrushchev thaw that the counter-revolutionary nationalist rabble in the Baltics began to crawl out of the underground and advocate for the withdrawal of these three republics from the USSR, contrary to the fundamental interests and will of their peoples. It was Khrushchev's policy, aimed at rehabilitating the innocent victims of Stalin's arbitrariness that returned former members of armed nationalist gangs from exile and allowed them to take many responsible state and party posts. It was during the Khrushchev thaw that the Riga City Party Committee, infected with dense nationalism, adopted discriminatory decisions that infringe on the rights of people who did not belong to the indigenous nationality. In particular, there was a point according to which non-Latvians were ordered to study the Latvian language in full within two years, and if this was not done within the specified period, such persons were recommended to be released from work with a proposal to leave the republic. In addition, Restrictions were imposed on the registration of non-Latvians. Today, when the enemies of the people came to power, a violation of human rights in the Baltic states, and in particular, in Latvia, took frankly rude forms. The number of blacks, that is, the so-called non-citizens with the status of permanent residents for a long time and much more than half a million, plus more than 150,000, who, under far-fetched pretexts, are refused to be entered in the register of permanent residents of the country. Non citizens are even deprived of the right to vote in elections to local governments. On May 9, manifestations of former policemen, traitors, and defectors, SS legionnaires take place along the streets of the Baltic cities, and the authorities have taken a course not only to infringe on the non indigenous population but also to directly prosecute veterans of the great patriotic war and law enforcement agencies of the Soviet period. And all this is a sad result not only of the inept management of the Soviet Union by the post-Stalinist leaders of the country, from Khrushchev to Gorbachev, but also of their direct betrayal of the true interests of the Soviet people. LB. Dot. Things were no better in Lithuania and Estonia. The anti-Soviet revolt in Hungary found ardent support in these Baltic republics. So, on November 2, 1956, demonstrations of Catholic believers took place in Kaunas and Vilnius, which had a sharply marked political and nationalist overtones. But the originality of the understanding of freedom of conscience by politicized Catholics was manifested by them in hooligan actions, in singing bourgeois Lithuanian anthems and nationalist songs. In using slogans, Hungary is an example for us, Russians, get out of Lithuania. This demonstration ended in a pogrom, which was perpetrated by 4,000 thugs fooled by chauvinistic propaganda on the same day in the same Kaunas, who spoke immediately after the believing fanatics with even more extremist slogans, 
down with Moscow, death to the communists. All these unrest and unrest forced the Khrushchev leadership to take a number of steps to purge nationalist-minded senior officials in the Republican Party organizations of the Baltic states. But at the same time, it was necessary to take into account the mood of the part of the indigenous population that was in opposition to the Soviet regime and allowed discrimination against the Russian-speaking population, and these were active supporters and participants of former pro-fascist organizations as well as members of nationalist gangs, which under I.V. Stalin suffered well-deserved punishments, and under Khrushchev, and especially after the 20th Congress, they were illegally returned from exile and camps and rehabilitated. Now they began to set the tone and more and more impudently demand for themselves some special privileges that infringe on the rights of people of other nationalities annexation or return to the family of nations? If we consider the Baltic countries in a historical aspect, then it should be said that Estonia became part of Russia in the Peace of Nystad in 1721, at the same time Latvia was annexed to Russia, and in 1795, Lithuania. In Estonia, Soviet power was established at the end of October 1917, from November 29, 1918 to June 5, 1919. The Estonian Soviet Republic, called the Estland Labour Commune, existed, in Latvia, on December 17, 1918, in most of the territory of Lithuania, in December 1918, January 1919, in February to August 1919, this republic was part of the Lithuanian Belarusian SSR, LB. Having granted independence to these three republics at the beginning of 1920, Soviet Russia found it possible in the conditions of the most difficult period of the war with Poland, to transfer 4 million rubles. Gold of Latvia, 3 million rubles, Lithuania and 15 million rubles of the gold reserves of Tsarist Russia, Estonia. But having given independence to these republics, the Bolsheviks hoped that they would find states friendly towards Soviet Russia in their person. At first it was, but then in each of them the legitimate power was overthrown by a coup d'état. Dictatorial regimes were established, parliaments were dissolved, all political parties were banned. All this could not but cause I.V. Stalin of concern, since the pro-fascist circles in these countries bordering the Soviet Union were clearly striving to get closer to Nazi Germany with all their might. At the same time, knowing well the terrorist nature of the occupation regime of the Nazis, the peoples of the Baltic states saw in the USSR a reliable guarantee against the threat of fascist enslavement. For example, according to one of the statesmen of bourgeois Latvia, who described the mood in the armies of the Baltic states, it was necessary to choose between Hitler and Stalin. Basically, all army officers believed that if you really have to go with someone, it's better with the Russians, LB, and under pressure from the broad masses. The governments of these countries were forced to turn to the Soviet government for military assistance. Since this corresponded to the state interests of the Soviet Union, on September 28, 1939, the Soviet Estonian, October 5, Soviet Latvian and October 10, Soviet Lithuanian Agreement on Mutual Assistance was concluded. According to these treaties, the Soviet side undertook obligations to these countries in the event of an attack or threat of attack by any European power, to provide assistance by all means, including military ones. IV. Stalin diplomatically, without the use of force, achieved the deployment of Soviet military, naval and air bases in the territories of these countries, thereby providing a serious strategic benefit for the USSR. It created the possibility of using the Baltic republics as a springboard in a future inevitable war against the Soviet Union. Of course, the bourgeois nationalists did not like this turn of affairs, which led to an intensification of the class struggle in the Baltic states in 1940 between the national bourgeoisie and the internationalist proletariat and peasantry of the Baltic states. Pro-fascist organizations in the Baltic states perpetrated brazen provocations against the military personnel of the Soviet bases, and it is natural that the Soviet punitive authorities did not ignore a single fact of criminal offenses of this kind. The working masses of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, inspired by the support of the Soviet Union, expressed their will in the elections of July 21, 1940 by electing the People's Siemis of Latvia and Lithuania and the State Duma of Estonia, 
which proclaimed their country's Soviet Socialist Republics and adopted a declaration on their entry into the Soviet Union. Union. This historical fact refutes the conjectures of modern demagogues who maliciously accuse the Red Army of allegedly occupying these countries and forcibly Sovietizing them. LB. Dot. As is known, the Lithuanian SSR was the first Union Republic whose Supreme Council, unfortunately, today adopted the Act of Independence on March 11, 1990, and on July 20 of the same year, the half-century anniversary of the entry of the Soviet Baltic Republics into the USSR, LB, the Pravda newspaper published an article by the head of the former Communist Party of Lithuania, M.M. Buroki Vasius, who stated that in the Baltic states the revolutionary situation began to take shape in 1935 and by the beginning of 1940 it had fully matured. When in mid-June 1940 the people's government headed by J. Palikis was established in Lithuania, a social revolution began peacefully. Buroki Vesius believes that it was socialist in content and at the same time anti-fascist, anti-Hitler, and in form, popular. The author of the article also considers strange the reproaches that the elections in July 1940 were held in Lithuania at a time when units of the Red Army were deployed in it under the contract. Citing the example of the FRG, where after the war elections were held in conditions when U.S., British and French troops were stationed on its territory, Bureaukivisius asks, but we are not saying that the elections there are invalid. So why such a negative attitude towards the elections to the People's Seamus of Lithuania in 1940? The Secretariat of the Interim Central Committee of the Communist Party of Lithuania, on the platform of the CPSU, spoke in the same spirit in the statement on the decree of the Supreme Council of the Lithuanian SSR of February 7, 1990 on the Soviet-German treaties of 1939 and the elimination of their consequences for Lithuania, reasoning about occupation and annexation of Lithuania in the summer of 1940 are untenable and unjustified because the Soviet troops were brought into Lithuania on the basis of an agreement and the consent of both parties. Soviet troops did not interfere in the internal affairs of Lithuania and did not establish an occupation regime. Speaking at the seventh session of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR on August 1, 1940, VM, Molotov highly appreciated the desire of Estonia. Latvia and Lithuania to join the Soviet Union. He declared that their entry into the USSR would provide them with a rapid economic upsurge and an all-round flourishing of their national culture, and their security would be strengthened. Molotov also drew attention to the military strategic benefits for the Soviet Union from the entry of the Baltic countries into the USSR, an increase in the population of the population by 6 million people. It is of paramount importance for our country that from now on the borders of the Soviet Union will be transferred to the coast of the Baltic Sea. At the same time, our country has its own non-freezing ports in the Baltic Sea, in which we had such a need. In the book New Lithuania, published in New York in 1941, the American journalist A. L. Strong, in front of whom all these events unfolded, wrote in hot pursuit. The culminating moment of the election campaign was a large meeting of workers and peasants on July 10, 1940 in Kaunas. All day the peasants went to the city, groups of girls in national costumes, young people on bicycles from distant farms. Old Lithuanian songs, sad from the hopelessness of peasant life, were mixed with new, cheerful songs of the Red Army, which were sung by the Kaunas workers. I stopped near the trucks of the Penicentris Dairy Cooperative. Where are you from? What do you say about the elections? Are you for Soviet Lithuania? I asked. For the 13th Soviet Republic. The girls screamed. Everybody? I asked. They shook their heads. No, old people, not all. They don't know what they want. But we know. By evening, everyone gathered in a large green field on a hill near Kaunas. There were long rows of peasant carts that smelled of dung and horse sweat, adorned with garlands of car flowers. Here are bearded men and women in headscarves, and soldiers in high boots, and peasant women with bare tanned legs, shod in rough shoes with wooden soles. Crossing the huge field, a column is coming from the city, carrying portraits of Stalin, Voroshilov, President Palakis, Dottis Vestia. 1990, March 7. In the July days of 1940, 
Similar events took place in Latvia and Estonia. The active participation of the population in the elections held in the Baltic republics in July 1940 and the absolute victory of the bloc, Union of the working people in each of them leaves no shadow of doubt and is the best proof that the masses supported the principles of social justice contained in, in the election programs of the left forces and expressed their desire to join the Soviet Union. The United States, like other Western countries, for a long time refused to recognize the inclusion of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia in the USSR calling this historical fact the Soviet annexation of the Baltic states. And these are the same United States which now, having buried the Soviet Union, not without the help of internal enemies, the so-called Fifth Column, seek to win world domination with the help of the armed forces, declaring the entire planet the sphere of their vital interests. Among the countries that are strategically beneficial for the United States in the event of a nuclear conflict with Russia, which today enjoy the special patronage of America, in addition to Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, alas, are the former Soviet republics of the Baltic states. Such are the devastating consequences of Khrushchev's struggle against Stalin's personality cult. This is sad. Chapter 7, Pug Complex When he was there, no one saw him. If Khrushchev had limited himself only to an anti-Stalinist report at the 20th Congress, then this would have been enough to erase all memory of this deceitful and unjust Nikita Sergeyevich forever. The peculiarity of his inflamed imagination when he thought about IV. Stalin, consisted in the fact that he took his most incredible perverted fantasies and his own fabrications at face value and until the end of his days believed in their authenticity and inspired the whole world that this was the pure and only truth. It is very easy to expose Khrushchev, because what he says contradicts not only authoritative and reliable sources, but also the logic of his very fiction, deprived of any elementary plausibility. Any of his statements essentially refutes itself. Here Nikita Sergeyevich is trying to convince the whole world that IV. Stalin had a persecution mania. Khrushchev understands that he has only one merit, after all, a living witness, and even from his inner circle. Khrushchev believes that readers are simply obliged to blindly believe his every word. And so he writes the following passage, I once witnessed such a fact. And it was very unpleasant for me. Stalin went to the restroom. Security, the man who literally followed him on his heels, remained in place. Stalin came out of the restroom and attacked this man in our presence, began to scold him. Why are you not fulfilling your duties? You guard, so you must guard, and you are sitting here, lounging. He justified himself. Comrade Stalin, I know that there are no doors there. Here is one door. So behind this door is my man who is guarding. Stalin rudely attacked him, you must go with me. It is unbelievable that they even followed him to the toilet. Stalin was even afraid to go to the toilet without security. This, of course, is the result of a diseased brain. This vile lie took the trouble to comment on the personal bodyguard of IV. Stalin A.T. Ribbon, who reacted to Khrushchev's last remark with the words, that's right, a sick brain. Only Khrushchev's denying that such a fact could have taken place at all. The guards spoke of Stalin's character as follows. Stalin was sometimes quick-tempered, but quickly retreated. He only admitted the truth. Even the most bitter one. At work and at home, he had an equally even character. Until his last days, he had an excellent memory, wit and resourcefulness. As for Khrushchev's toilet fantasy, it is refuted by the words of Ribbon, near Stalin's former bedroom there was a bathroom with a wash basin and a bathtub. When he was there, no one saw this world eater Besos Yugashvili, the house where I.V. Stalin, and to this day is the most visited house museum in Georgia. Here is the entrance to the family's apartment right in front of us. Stalin spent his early childhood here. This is the only small room with three windows. A simple dining table covered with a linen tablecloth with a grayish-blue border. Only four people can sit at the table. When guests came, the hostess raised an additional folding board. Four unpainted wooden stools. On the table is an earthenware plate and a yellowish-brown earthenware jug for water. Nearby is an old copper kerosene lamp. It was she who shone for the little student of the Gori school, Sosos Yugashvili who has now become Stalin for the world. Here is a bed covered with two peasant handmade bedspreads. One is red with black, patterned, the other is light. There is a carpet pillow and two carpet rollers. A velvet shoe hangs on the wall. In it, 
the mother of Joseph Vissarionovich held threads, needles, a thimble. Here is a small chest. It contained almost all the property of the family, a table, four unpainted stools, a bed, a chest, a bread box, a sideboard, a samovar, that's all the furnishings, all the decoration. Versus Vyshnevsky, House in Gori, Newspaper Dawn of the East. Number 297 of December 27, 1937. The Dzugashvili family ate poorly. These were dishes common for the Gori poor, red Libya, beans, for the first and boiled potatoes for the second, or Georgian greens, badgerjani, or vegetables with minced meat, for example, tomatoes with rice or peppered meat. They ate lavash, bread, with onions. Written down from the words of G.I. Lizabdashvili. In the magazine Young Guard, 1939, number 12. Kaminsky v. Virshchigan I Childhood and Youth of the Leader. His father, Vissarian Ivanovich Dzugashvili, came from the peasants of the village of Didi Lilo, not far from Tiflis, where his parents, like their ancestors, worked on the land. Vissarian chose the profession of a shoemaker. In 1870 he moved to Gori, where in 1874 he married Ekaterina Georgievna Gelads, the daughter of a serf from a neighboring village. She was 18 years old, five years younger than her husband. They were hard-working people, poor and illiterate. Both settled in Gori, in a modest house at 10 Kranogorsky Street, the former quarter of Rusa Subani. In this house, Catherine gave birth to two sons. Mikhail and George, who died in infancy. The third child was Joseph, and to him, her Soso or Sozolo, a diminutive of Joseph, she gave her love and care. Indeed, for the first five years, the Baso workshop flourished, orders grew, and two assistants appeared in the workshop. The names of the apprentices are known. These are David Gassitashvili and Vano Kutsishvili, Ragaspi. F. 558. Opus 4. D. 619. L. 173. However, soon Beso's affairs went from bad to worse. He stopped providing for his family, and Stalin's mother had to do daily work for pennies herself. On January 6, 1890, first grader Soso's Yugashvili was hit by a phaeton for the second time. The first time he was hit by a phaeton at the age of six as a result of which he injured his left hand. The Russian carriage knocked Joseph to the ground and ran over his leg, which he injured so much that his father had to take him to Tiflis to a hospital, where Joseph stayed for a long time, as a result of which he was forced to interrupt classes for almost a whole year. Having settled down as a worker at Adel Kanov's shoe factory, Vissarian's Yugashvili decided that he would not return to Gori, that he would leave his son with him and that he would follow in his footsteps and become a shoemaker. According to the memoirs of S.P. Goglichids, materials of the Tbilisi branch of Imil, for some time little Soso worked at the factory. He helped the workers, winding threads, serving the elders. However, Ekaterina Georgievna came to Tiflis for her son and took him to Gori, where he continued his education. In one of his early ideological and theoretical works, Anarchism or Socialism, IV. Stalin illustrates the Marxist situation with the example of his own father. Imagine a shoemaker who had a tiny workshop, but could not compete with large owners, closed the workshop and, say, was hired by Adel Kanov in a shoe factory in Tiflis. He entered the Adel Kanov factory, but not in order to become a permanent hired worker, but in order to save money, make capital, and then reopen his workshop. As you can see, this shoemaker's position is already proletarian, but his consciousness is still not proletarian, it is petty bourgeois through and through. Stalin IV works in 13 volumes. Volume 1. p. 314 to 315. And further IV. Stalin traces on the example of our shoemaker how his petty bourgeois consciousness evolves into proletarian consciousness. Here, our shoemaker realizes that in order to improve his position, it is necessary to fight with the owners, and not open his own workshop. Ibid, p. 316. In June 1937 IV, Stalin will question the correctness of waging a struggle exclusively against class alien elements that have penetrated the party. When they talk about the nobles as a class hostile to the working people, they mean class, estate, stratum 
But this does not mean that some individuals from nobles cannot serve the working class. Lenin was of noble origin. Engels was the son of a manufacturer, non-proletarian elements. Engels himself managed his factory and fed Marx with it. Marx was the son of a lawyer, not the son of a laborer and not the son of a worker. And vice versa. Serebriakov was a worker, and you know what a scoundrel he turned out to be. Lifshitz was a worker, an illiterate worker but turned out to be a spy. I.V. Stalin, condemning in his report the practice of mass exclusions from the party on the basis of social origin, continued, During this time, 1935 to 1936, L.B., we excluded tens, hundreds of thousands of people, we showed a lot of inhumanity, bureaucratic heartlessness in relation to the fate of individual members of the party. Let's pay attention to the fact that, by saying we, I.V. Stalin does not relieve himself of responsibility, although he himself did not sanction such a thing, and immediately switching to you, he throws it into the hall where Khrushchev was also sitting, all these outrages that will you load it, all this is water for the mill of our enemies, all this creates a situation for the enemies, both for the rights, and for the Trotskyists, and for the Zinovievists, and for anyone else. This soulless policy, comrades, must be put an end to. But Khrushchev's brains worked in the topsy-turvy, sideways mode, and he gives out in his memoirs his version of the social origin of the leader. I don't know what is written in Stalin's biography about his father, what cunning. L.B., but when he began his career, I had to hear talk that his father was not at all a simple shoemaker, but had a workshop where at least 10 people worked for him, which means at least, maybe 15, 25, or maybe 100, or maybe even the father of I.V. Stalin had a shoe factory, the Dzugashvili factory, L.B. At that time it was considered a big undertaking. If during the period of purges such a fact was revealed in the biography of any person, he would be subjected to such interrogation, from which his bones would crack. After the revolution, special attention was paid to the issue of origin. If it was found that a person did not come from the working environment, then he was considered as a second-class citizen. At the end of his tale, Khrushchev added a zest, it was with this compromising evidence that Beria kept Stalin on the hook. If we consider the year 1898 as the beginning of Stalin's revolutionary career, when, as a seminarian, he joined the first Georgian social democratic organization, Mesame Dasi, third group, then it is probably not difficult to imagine the four-year-old Nikai Tushka, with intense attention absorbing disturbing children's imagination, the conversations of the peasants of the native village of Kalinovka, Kursk province, that in the distant Georgian town of Gori there is a world eater shoemaker, a certain Baso Ivanovich, also from former peasants, who exploits as many as ten people, but his son, who claims the title protector of the people, has the intention to hide this shameful fact of his tarnished biography. If Stalin, at the age of fourteen, being, by his own admission, kicked out of an orthodox theological seminary for promoting Marxism, began revolutionary activity at the same time, then Khrushchev, at the age of 14, who moved in 1908 with his parents near Yuzovka, now Donetsk, passed sheep and calves and cleaned the boilers in the mines. Meanwhile, IV, in the same 1908, Stalin organized workers' strikes in Baku. From March to November he was a prisoner of the Bayo prison, and in November he was exiled to Solvichgodsk, Volgda Oblast, for a period of two years. And such an eloquent fact to the biographies of the giant and the pygmy, in 1912, I.V. Stalin, who was in Volgda exile, was elected in absentia at the 6th, Prague, All-Russian Party Conference a member of the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party, he escaped. He was again arrested and sent to Naryamsky Edge, and, again escape and illegal revolutionary activity. All the revolutionary activities of Nikita Khrushchev, an apprentice locksmith at the boss factory, are limited to collecting donations for the families of those killed at the Lena mines in April 1912 and distributing the Pravda newspaper in 1914. And that's it. Dmitry Shepilov writes in his memoirs. Everything that was said about Khrushchev's revolutionary activity from the age of 14 is a lie. And all Khrushchev's talk about supposedly bones cracking from torture about concealing the fact of unearned origin, and about the social egoism of the working class, shot by him in Novichirkovsk, is nothing more than the vicious class revenge of an enraged plebeian, 
who, in a conversation with D. Shipilov, was proud of that all his education, studied with the priest for only one winter for a bag of potatoes. As for Khrushchev's phrase, it was with this compromising evidence that Beria kept Stalin on the hook. I think it can be left without comment. How many times has the leader been seen drunk? The most honest Shubin writes, what is the main discovery we made after reading Khrushchev's book? It turns out that Stalin was a drunkard. Of all the discussions on this subject, for the sake of brevity I will limit myself to one, even in his youth, he had a penchant for drunkenness. Apparently it was hereditary. Bodyguard IV. Stalin. What a surprise. And we didn't even know about it. So that gullible readers do not take seriously another joke, for which Khrushchev was a master, I clarify. Stalin preferred only Tsunandali and Kiliani wines. It happened that he drank cognac, but was simply not interested in vodka. From 1930 to 1953, the guards saw him in weightlessness only twice, at the birthday party of S.M. Shtmenko and at the wake of A.A. Zhdanov. Everyone saw that Stalin treated Zhdanov with special warmth. Therefore, after the funeral, he arranged a commemoration at the dacha. Leaving home in the evening, Molotov punished Star Austin. If Stalin is going to water the flowers at night, do not let him out of the house. He can forgive. Yes, the years have already taken their toll. Stalin easily caught a cold, often had a sore throat. Therefore, Star Austin drove the key into the well so that Stalin could not open the door. Groaning around her in vain, Stalin asked, Open the door, it's raining outside. You can catch a cold, get sick, Star Austin objected. I repeat, open the door. Comrade Stalin. I can't open the door for you. Tell your minister to second you. Stalin exploded. I don't need you anymore. There is. Star Austin saluted, but did not move from his place. Having made an indignant noise that some guard was not obeying him, the generalissimo, Stalin went to bed. In the morning, Star Austin doomedly carried his things into the car. Then he was summoned to Stalin, who peacefully suggested, forget what they talked about yesterday. I didn't speak. You didn't hear. Relax and get back to work. Anatoly Rubin rightly notes, if Stalin still wanted to water the flowers and even remembered the whole night conversation, then he was not very drunk, right? Last moments of life. March 5, 2003 marks half a century since that black memorable day when the heart of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin stopped beating. In Khrushchev's memoirs. The episode of Stalin's illness and death is presented so distortedly that a person familiar with other sources involuntarily imagines that Khrushchev had something to reap into before the leader. Having embarked on the path of Stalin's betrayal, Khrushchev could not stop until the end of his life, and composed more and more dirty tricks, and blindly believed in the truth of the fruits of his unbridled imagination and read as many as four thick volumes of memoirs precisely because his conscience was unclean before the deceased. Rubin says, if you dispel verbosity, it is easy to notice the main thing, Khrushchev hid more than he said. He hid Malenkov's order to Star Austin not to tell anyone else about Stalin's illness. Beria hid the dressing, who also ordered Lazgeshev not to disturb them anymore, when comrade Stalin is fast asleep. In a word, Khrushchev concealed that they in every possible way delayed the call to Stalin of doctors, who were brought only at about 9 o'clock in the morning on March 2nd, that is, for about 24 hours the leader was left without qualified medical care, alone with his terrible illness, LB. And at the same time, he habitually lied, we did everything to raise Stalin to his feet, here, for example, is how IV describes the farewell scene. Stalin's own daughter Svetlana, the agony was terrible. She choked him in front of everyone. At some point, he suddenly opened his eyes and looked around at everyone who was standing around. It was a terrible look, either insane or angry. This look went around everyone in a fraction of a minute. And then, it was incomprehensible and scary. I still don't understand, but I can't forget. Then he raised his left hand, which was moving, up and either pointed upwards with it, or threatened all of us. The gesture was incomprehensible, but also threatening and it is not known to whom and to what it referred. S. Iva. Novi Mir. 1991. Number 5. P. 218. And here is how Khrushchev describes the same scene. He raised his left hand and began to point either at the ceiling or at the wall. Something like a smile appeared on his lips. Then he began to shake hands with us, 
I gave him a hand, he shook it with his left hand. He communicated his feelings with a handshake. The kindest. Well, what can I say? Chapter 8, quote unquote cult of personality. Quote, the big fuss raised by the Khrushchevites around the so-called personality cult of Stalin is a dirty slander, a bluff. And Verhoxa, memories. Quote, the cult of personality is devoid of grandeur but the cult of crackling phrases is in force. And the cult of philistinism and impersonality, perhaps, has grown a hundred times. Boris Pasternak, what Khrushchev called at the 20th Congress the phrase cult of personality, and which gave a powerful impetus to anti-Stalinist attacks on the infallible leader throughout the second half of the 20th century, urgently needs to be comprehended and deciphered, since it was in it, in this term that a huge the destructive power of a mind that had already blown up more than a decade ago, the favorite brainchild of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin, the USSR. What is meant by this expression, the cult of personality? If love, the huge authority of the charismatic personality IV, Stalin, then yes, such deepest popular love not only existed, but still exists, despite the fact that in 2003 it was already half a century. Comma that Stalin was gone and despite the Niagara Falls of slops that were poured in his good name during this period. View from the ocean. The American anti-Stalinist scholar Robert K. Tucker, in his work Stalin as a Revolutionary, argues that the personality of Stalin is a decisive factor in understanding the course of Soviet history in the Stalin era until 1953, the year of his death. When he died, the external components remained for a very long time, but Stalin's personality was absent. She ceased to be an acting factor, which Nikita Khrushchev and his team very skillfully took advantage of. Another American anti-Stalinist scholar, Dieran Court Laferriere, author of the infamous book The Psyche of Stalin, nevertheless believes that the grandiose titles used by the media in relation to Stalin during his lifetime reflect the true greatness of Stalin. Stalin really was transformer of nature and great master of bold revolutionary decisions and sharp turns, successor of the cause of Lenin and creator of the Stalinist constitution, and only because of his real power, millions of people believed in him as in God. Let's not forget that attempts to artificially create a personality cult from above Khrushchev, and then Brezhnev, who did not have even a thousandth of Stalin's authority and influence, and therefore relied on the parasitic class of the party nomenclature that they had nurtured, failed. LB, speaking about the cult of personality IV, Stalin, Khrushchev pursued only one goal, to spoil the name of IV, Stalin. It is a pity that Khrushchev did not live to see the consequences of his struggle with the cult of personality IV, Stalin. But it turned out that, following IV, Stalin, the name of V.I. Lenin was also defiled, and the current generation, which, according to Khrushchev's utopian forecasts, should have lived under communism for a long time, did not have any moral values and guidelines, no spiritual authorities. But even Friedrich Engels said, authority is especially needed, moreover, authoritative authority, on the high seas. There, at the moment of danger. The life of all depends on the immediate and unquestioning submission of all to the will of one. And it was precisely such authorities for the Soviet people of previous generations that V.I. Lenin and the authority of I.V. Stalin, who confidently steered the ship of socialism in the raging ocean of a world hostile to the proletariat, leader of the CPSU, B. The publishing house Young Garden 1928 published a novel by Sergei Malashkin with a rather long title works of Yevlapis Avlishin about the People's Commissar and about our time, where there are such lines about the work of the 15th Congress of the CPSU, B, which took place at the end of 1927, the speaker stepped forward, holding in his hand a small bundle of paper, no larger than an eighth of a sheet, and began to wait for the end of the ovation, which, when he appeared, turned into a continuous rumble, similar to the surf of the sea. The speaker was of medium height, with steep shoulders raised upwards, with a pale yellow and slightly pockmarked face, with shiny eyes that now and then flashing black fire, with drooping black, with a barely noticeable grain mustache, hair, he was dressed simply, as usual, as always, he was wearing not that light green, not that light blue military jacket, but without any military signs, fastened with all buttons, he was wearing military trousers of the same color, but not riding breeches, 
and were tucked into soft light boots high to the very knees. Now he stood straight, motionless as a rock, waiting for the end of the applause. There seemed to be no end to this hum. What was the reaction of the party Congress delegates to the end of the report? which was read with a slightly oriental accent. The applause merged into one loudly boiling storm, which lasted for a long, long time, resembled a sunny sea with heavy waves, just disturbed by a joyful spring thunderstorm. It was. And you can't get away from this. And knowing that this is exactly how the party masses perceived Comrade Stalin, it is difficult to seriously consider the allegations that he had some kind of alternative to the post of general secretary. There was no alternative to I.V. Stalin. Our people are following Stalin. According to the testimony of the writer Ray Pesmini, who spoke about his personal feelings at the age of 25, people were seized by a sincere feeling of joy even when they simply managed to see I.V. Stalin. Today, in the Hall of Columns at the ceremonial meeting dedicated to the opening of the Metro, Stalin spoke. There were many cars at the entrance to the House of the Unions, and people crowded at the tram stop, as quick-witted as I am, waiting for them to come out. Two people in leather appeared. Then Stalin, Molotov, Voroshilov, Yagoda came out in a close group. They walked slowly to the metro station at the corner of Dmitrovka and Okhotny Ryad, obviously heading towards the Bolshoi Theater. Then I and the whole audience from the tram stop ran after them. They walked calmly and slowly, and, happy. Stalin seemed less tired than he looked in the newsreel filmed in 1933. The overcoats sat perfectly on them, especially on Stalin. On Stalin, the overcoat sat as if cast, exactly the same as on the statues depicting him. I noticed Yagoda's attentive, wary look. Obviously, he understood that Stalin was in danger. Someone applauded. I shouted, hurrah. All of this was out of order. Stalin smiled and raised his hand to his cap. We started screaming again. They all smiled, and Stalin saluted. Goosebumps ran down my body from relevant delight in front of Stalin, approaching the Bolshoi Theater. They smiled again, and the crowd around them yelled hurrah. The rejoicing at Theater Square was nationwide. There was a desire to pick him up and carry him. How I saw all this, I do not know. And after they passed, the crowd did not disperse for a long time, shouting hurrah. I cited this lengthy declaration of love for the leader as a typical phenomenon of Soviet reality in the 30s. In the vast expanses of the Soviet Union for millions of people there was no higher authority than I.V. Stalin. All the victories of socialism, real changes in their lives for the better, ordinary people associated with this name and with this personality. In 1946, hero of socialist labor Maria Denisovna Koshvina, a leader of the Red Giant Collective Farm in the Kharkov region, wrote in the Ogonyak magazine, Why do I vote for Stalin? Because I, an illiterate woman, raised three sons, one of whom died a heroic death in the battles for the Soviet motherland being in the rank of colonel, the second graduated as an agronomist, works on our collective farm. The third teaches in the city. In what capitalist country can the children of a simple peasant woman get out into the people on their own, without parental help? This is possible only under Soviet power, only under socialism. With Stalin we defeated fascism. With Stalin we will build communism. I believe in Stalin. And that's why I vote for Stalin. You could say more beautiful, easier and more convincing, impossible. The Hungarian biographers of I.V. Stalin, Laszlo Bilotti and Tomasz Kraus, cite in the book Stalin, M. Dead, 1989. p. 203, Ilya Ehrenborg's description of his impressions of the presence at the first all-union conference of the Stakhanovites, suddenly everyone got up and started frantically to applaud, Stalin came out of the side door, which I did not see, followed by members of the Politburo. The hall applauded, shouted. This went on for a long time, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Stalin also clapped his hands. When the applause began to die down, someone shouted, hurrah for the great Stalin. Dash and it all started all over again. Finally, everyone sat down, and then a desperate female cry was heard, glory to Stalin. We jumped up and applauded again. Ehrenborg notes a little later, I caught myself listening badly, I was always looking at Stalin. Looking around? I saw that others were doing the same. We believed you so much, Comrade Stalin, as perhaps we did not believe ourselves. Mikhail Zakovsky will say in the poem a word to Comrade Stalin. 
and having undermined faith in IV. Stalin as a symbol of socialism, Khrushchev, only ten years later will undermine the faith in the party and faith in communism among the broad masses. Six years Vladimir Bukovsky writes, of course, after the shock that the exposure of Stalin gave us all, not a single communist leader will ever be loved by the people and will deserve nothing but ridicule and anecdotes. But no one, apparently, will cause such unanimous and fierce hatred as Khrushchev. Everything about him annoyed people. And his inability to speak, illiteracy, and his thick grinning mug, there is not enough money all around, lack of food, and he grins, he found time to have fun. Before him, too, there was hunger, there was hopelessness, but there was faith in the mustachioed God, which obscured everything. He took away this faith. And all the bitterness, all the hatred caused by the death of God fell upon Khrushchev, depriving people of illusions. He immediately turned out to be guilty for everyone. We are all from Stalin's overcoat. Not a single ego in the history of mankind has been praised so highly and by so many people, writes Rencourt Laferriere, for example, at the 17th Party Congress. Stalin's name sounded 1,580 times, and Ju Khrushchev said this name 28 times, and Khrushchev Mikoyan as many as 49 times, and at the same time, great and brilliant were not the strongest epithets in their speeches, LB. Tuck admits, now that I have lived through the events of the 1930s with Stalin, trying to recreate his actions as they formed in his mind, I believe that I know him well enough to be able to think for him and, in this sense, to be Stalin in the search for key decisions and their implementation. In us, who have ever had a deep scientific interest in Stalin, there is a need to be Stalin because through this person we know ourselves to some extent. The Yugoslav statesman Milo Vangelos, in his book Conversations with Stalin, also noted something similar. Stalin is a ghost that roams and will roam the world for a long time to come. Everyone renounced his heritage, although there are many who draw strength from there. Many, even against their own will, imitate Stalin. Khrushchev, while blaming him, admired him at the same time. Today's Soviet leaders are not enthusiastic, but they bask in the rays of his son. And Tito, 15 years after the break with Stalin, revived a respectful attitude towards his statesmanship. And don't I myself suffer, trying to understand what it is, my thinking about Stalin? Is it not caused by his tenacious presence in me? And in this sense, Khrushchev. Volkogonov, Antonov Avsinko and other overthrowers of Stalin are just as sick with this personality as any current Stalinist who is attempting to cleanse this great name from the dirt of slander and slander, but only with a negative sign. We all came out of Stalin's overcoat. Or not? Did Stalin need a cult of personality? In August 1930, an exchange of letters took place between Stalin and party member Shitinovsky, critically assessing the situation in the country. The latter could not resist glorifying the general secretary. How did Joseph Vissarionovich react to the phrase about devotion to him personally? This is not Bolshevik. Have loyalty to the working class, its party, its state. But don't confuse it with loyalty to individuals, with this empty and useless intellectual trinket. On June 2, 1933, the head of the propaganda group of the main archives director at Teslashevich turned to the assistant of I.V. Stalin, A.N. Poskarbyshev with a request, on behalf of the old Bolsheviks, to provide them with materials, photo-archival documents, for organizing an exhibition in their club on the activities of Comrade Stalin during the Civil War. I.V. Stalin imposed a resolution that condemned the cult of personality, in a letter, he wrote in a sweeping way, I against underlined twice, LB, since such undertakings lead to incompatibility with the course of our party. Speaking with Stalin in 1937, Lion Fuktwanger told him about the tasteless, exaggerated admiration for his personality. To this IV, Stalin shrugged his shoulders. He excused his peasants and workers for being too busy with other things to develop good taste and joked lightly about the hundreds of thousands of enlarged portraits of a man with a mustache portraits that flash before the eyes during demonstrations. The writer was not satisfied with the joke, and he said that even people who undoubtedly have taste exhibit his busts and portraits in completely inappropriate places, for example, at the Rembrandt exhibition. In response to this, 
Stalin became serious and angrily spoke about toadying fools who do more harm than enemies. He endures all this hype, he declared, only because he knows what a naive joy the festive bustle brings to its organizers, and knows that all this applies to him not as an individual, but as a representative of a trend that asserts that the construction of a socialist economy in the Soviet Union is more important than a permanent revolution. February 16, 1938 IV, Stalin wrote a well-known letter to debt his dad of the Central Committee of the All-Union Leninist Young Communist League, I am strongly against the publication of tales of Stalin's childhood. The book is replete with a mass of distortions, exaggerations, undeserved praises. The author was misled by the hunters of fairy tales, liar, sycophants. Sorry for the author. But the fact remains, the book tends to implant in the minds of Soviet children, and people in general, the personality cult of leaders, infallible heroes. It's dangerous, harmful. I advise you to burn the book. In December 1938, in a letter to the playwright Afanijanov IV, Stalin makes a postscript. You shouldn't talk about the leader. This is not good and, perhaps, indecent. The point is not in the leader, but in the collective leader in the Central Committee of the Party. Looking through the layout of the volume on the history of the Civil War, IV, Stalin gave a directive to include photographic portraits of Dzerzhinsky, Frunz, Ritsky, Volodarsky, Kulbyshev, Yafi, Urgenyikidze, Slutsky, Anton Alvavsinko. There is also such a postscript, we need a portrait of Trotsky, who played a role in the October Revolution, Kamenev, Zinoviev, Lashevich. He played a positive role. Budnov, portraits of members of the Central Committee elected at the April Conference, at the Vice Congress. Aircraft designer Ray Yakovlev recalled, sometimes Stalin received business papers, the authors of which considered it not only appropriate, but also permissible to add all sorts of outpourings of feelings and assurances of their devotion to the end of the letter. When reading such a letter aloud, having reached the end, Stalin either skipped it or said, well, here, as it should be, hurrah, hooray, long live the CPSU, B, and its leader, the great Stalin. And, slyly narrowing his eyes, he added, thinks to bribe me with this, enlist support. A lot of vile demagogy was splashed out by Khrushchev and his followers about IV. Stalin as author editor, one of the main compilers of his laudatory biography. Recently, a recording of a conversation between the authors of this work and Stalin made by the historian V. Makalov on December 23, 1946 was opened, Stalin IV Sok.t. 16, pages 70 to 90, says IV, Stalin, a lot of mistakes. The tone is not good, socialist revolutionary. I have all sorts of teachings, up to some kind of teaching about the constant factors of war. It turns out that I have a doctrine about communism. As if Lenin, you see, spoke only about socialism and did not say anything about communism. And I, you see, said about communism. Further, as if I had a doctrine about the industrialization of the country, about the collectivization of agriculture, and so on, etc. In fact, it was Lenin who had the merit of raising the question of the industrialization of our country, as well as with regard to the question of the collectivization of agriculture, and so on. There is a lot of praise in this biography, exaltation of the role of the individual. What should the reader do after reading this biography? Get on your knees and pray for me. With regard to Baku, it is said that, before my arrival, the Bolsheviks had nothing there, and as soon as I arrived, everything immediately changed. If you want, believe. If you want, do not believe. How was it really? We had to create shots. Such cadres of Bolsheviks have developed in Baku. I listed the names of these people in the appropriate place. The same applies to the other period. After all, people like Dzerzhinsky, Frunz, Kubyshev lived, worked, but they are not written about. They are absent. The same applies to the period of the Patriotic War. It was necessary to take capable people, gather them tempered them. Such people gathered around the main command of the Red Army. Nowhere is it clearly stated that I am a student of Lenin. In fact, I considered and still consider myself a student of Lenin. I clearly said this in a well-known conversation with Ludwig. I am a student of Lenin. Lenin taught me, and not vice versa. He paved the way, and we are walking along this beaten path. IV. Stalin, as we see, repeatedly stopped attempts to praise his personality 
and therefore to assert, as Khrushchev and his followers did, that he himself contributed to the exaltation of his own personality, is, according to Enver Hoxha, a dirty slander, a bluff. E. Hoxha writes in his memoirs, Reliable information and the practice of communicating with the Khrushchevites allow me to give them a generally correct political assessment, to trace the fundamental direction of their counter-revolutionary activities. The strength of the party and its leaders lies in their close, inseparable connection with the masses of the people. During Comrade Stalin's lifetime, the Khrushchevite revisionists failed to call Stalin's well-deserved prestige and sincere respect for him on the part of the working masses a cult of personality. In all his speeches, Comrade Stalin always addressed the Soviet people and always emphasized the decisive role of the working masses in the fate of the proletarian country and the vanguard role of the political party never separated the leaders of the party from its rank and file members. This is documented by his numerous performances. The meaning of Stalin's understanding of the situation with the cult of personality is revealed as well as possible in a scene, perhaps even fictional, when I.V. Stalin scolds his son Vasily, who allowed himself a lot of superfluous things. You think you are Stalin? Dash in the hearts asks the father. Do you think I'm Stalin? He points to his portrait and says, Stalin is him. And Joseph Vissarionovich himself tried to be worthy of this bright name, commensurating his every step and every word spoken with the eternity to which he belongs. Chapter 9, The Mystery of Kirov's Death Quote, Khrushchev hinted that Kirov was killed by Stalin. Some people still believe in it. The grain was thrown. The commission was established in 1956. There were 12 different people. They looked at many documents. They did not find anything against Stalin. The commission came to the conclusion that Stalin was not involved in the murder of Kirov. Khrushchev refused to publish it, not in his favor. V. Molotov from the dossier, quote, Kostrykov Sergei Miranovich, March 27, 1886, December 1, 1934. Party nickname, Kirov. Place of birth, Urzim, Vyadka province. Profession. Revolutionary, an ardent fighter for the happiness of the working people, a prominent participant in three Russian revolutions and the Civil War. He was repeatedly arrested and imprisoned. Bolshevik experience, 30 years, since 1904. An outstanding figure of the Communist Party and the Soviet state, a faithful disciple of V.I. Lenin, the closest associate and friend of Comrade I.V. Stalin. Since 1921, Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, B. of Azerbaijan, after the 14th Congress of the CPSU, B. 1925, together with V. M. Molotov, K. E. Vogershilov, M. I. Kalinin, G. K. Urgenyik Yidzi was sent to I. V. Stalin to Leningrad to expose the double dealing, treacherous policy of the Trotsky Zinoviev group. Since 1926 to first secretary of the Leningrad Provincial Committee and the City Party Committee and the Northwestern Bureau of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, at the same time since 1930, a member of the Politburo of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks. Since 1934, secretary of the Central Committee of the CPSU, B. December 1, 1934 S.M. Kirov was villainously murdered by supporters of Trotsky, Zinoviev and Kamenev who had made their way into the NKVD. However, the shot in Smalny, like any high-profile political murder, still excites the minds and causes unhealthy speculations of unscrupulous researchers of the issue. End quote. Traces on the map of the motherland, Kirov, former Vyatka, Kirov in the Kaluga region. Kirovabad in Azerbaijan, Kirovakan in Armenia, Kirovgrad in the Sverdlovsk region, Kirovigrad in Ukraine, Kirovsk in the Murmansk region, Kirov Bay in the Caspian Sea. There are three versions of the death of S.M. Kirov. 1. He was killed by a lone terrorist Nikolev out of personal revenge. 2. Kirov was killed on direct orders or with the knowledge of I.V. Stalin, version of Khrushchev and his minions. 3. The terrorist act against Kirov was organized by Trotsky through the internal opposition, which understood that the only way to power lay through the physical destruction of the tried and tested Leninist guard, represented primarily by I.V. Stalin and S.M. Kirov, raised by the leader to the level of the second person in the state, 
I mean the election of S. M. Kirov at the 17th Congress in 1934 as secretary of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, a fact that will also be vilely distorted by the falsifiers of the Khrushchev School, the so-called Olga Shatinovsky Commission, LB. And although only one, namely, the third version, is actually true, the falsifiers of history claim that it has as few supporters as it has evidence. On the contrary, there is plenty of evidence. It's just that falsifiers have no reason to bring them. It's much easier to blame the late I.V. Stalin. Based on the presumption of guilt, you are to blame for the fact that I want to eat, in the hope that no one will intercede for him. Here in the same crazy memoirs Khrushchev stirs up clean water with poisonous slops. At that time, the secretary of the North Caucasian Regional Party Committee, Sheboldev, occupied a prominent place in the party. This Sheboldev, an old Bolshevik, during the 17th Party Congress came to Comrade Kirov and said to him, the old people are talking about returning to Lenin's will and implementing it, that is, moving Stalin, as Lenin recommended, to some other post, and in its place put forward a person who is more tolerant of others. The people say that it would be nice to nominate you for the post of General Secretary. I don't know what Kirov answered this. But it became known that Kirov went to Stalin and told about this conversation with Sheboldev. Stalin allegedly replied to Kirov, Thank you, I will not forget you. In a word, Khrushchev is back in his repertoire LB. VM Molotov, in one of his conversations with F. Chuev, said, To talk about Kirov as some kind of his deputy in this matter is such an absurdity for every literate knowledgeable communist. This was so contrary to the relationship between Stalin and Kirov and, above all, to the opinion of Kirov himself about his capabilities. This was so contradictory that only such a criminal type as Nikita could agree to the point that Stalin allegedly had a special goal to put an end to Kirov. Ch.f. S.554. But there exists in nature such an exceptionally important document of the era as the closed letter of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks on the terrorist activities of the Trotskyist Zinoviev counter-revolutionary bloc, which cites their own confessions of the leaders of terrorism in the USSR. From the Protocol of Interrogation of G. Zinoviev dated July 23 to 25, 1936. I really was a member of the United Trotskyist Zinoviev Center, organized in 1932. The Trotskyist Zinoviev Center set as its main task the assassination of the leaders of the CPSU, B, and above all the assassination of Stalin and Kirov, through members of the center IN. The Smirnov and Mrachkovsky Center was connected with Trotsky, from whom Smirnov received instructions to prepare for the assassination of Stalin. I also acknowledge that the members of the organization Bakhev and Karev, on behalf of the United Center, were entrusted by me with the organization of terrorist acts against Stalin and Kirov in Leningrad. This instruction was given by me in the fall of 1932 in Ilensky, at Zinoviev's Dacha, where the founding meeting of the Trotskyist Zinoviev Center was held, a meeting in which Zinoviev and his supporters participated, Kamenev, Evdekimov, Bakhev, Kuklin as well as the Trotskyist leaders I.N. Smirnov, Mrachkovsky, Tervaganyan, and where it was decided that the only means by which they could hope to come to power was to organize terrorist acts against the leaders of the CPSU, b. primarily against Stalin. Leon Trotsky, who was in exile in Constantinople, insisted on the physical elimination of Stalin, whose hatred for him was no less strong and persistent than that of his successor Nikita Khrushchev. So, a person close to Trotsky, who at one time carried his personal guard, Dritzer admitted during the investigation that in 1934, before the 17th Party Congress, he received Trotsky's directive to eliminate Stalin and Voroshilov. Then there was no talk of Kirov. Here is the content of Trotsky's letter directive. Dear friend, tell me that today we are facing the following main tasks. The first is to remove Stalin and Voroshilov. The second is to launch work on organizing cells in the army, and the third is to use all sorts of failures and confusion in the event of war to capture the leadership. Dritzer. Protocol of Interrogation of July 23, 1936. Why, then, precisely after the Congress of Victors did Trotsky give the command to liquidate Kirov? There are several reasons for this, but there are two main ones. The first is that he and his supporters, 
whom Trotsky could not ignore, insisted on the quickest elimination of the person who occupied the chair in Smolny, in which their leader Zinoviev sat until 1926, and the second, this is what, C.M. Kirov had the imprudence to say words from the rostrum of the Congress that caused a storm of indignation among the demon of the revolution, comrades, once Trotsky. You pronounce this name, and you immediately get in a bad mood, be damned three times to commemorate him at such our Congresses, accuse our party of national narrow-mindedness, of betraying internationalism. Now more than ever it is clear what this counter-revolutionary chatter is worth. All practical work on organizing the attempt on the life of Sergei Miranovich, in accordance with the decision of the United Trotsky's NOVF bloc, was entrusted to Bakhov and Karev. Several terrorist groups were organized in Leningrad, including the group of Rumyantsev, Kotelinov, Nikolev, which committed the villainous and vile murder of Kirov. It is this truly historical fact that modern researchers of the issue ignore, giving preference to Khrushchev's lie, which, however, exposes itself. Khrushchev, who came up with the thesis that the assassination of Kirov is a Stalinist provocation to unleash a great terror, had to prove at all costs that the liquidation of Kirov was the work of I.V. Stalin. To this end, he created a special commission headed by Olga Shitnovskia. By obsession, this lady can only be compared with the notorious Valeria Novodvorskia, L.B. However, no compromising evidence on I.V. Stalin Shitnovskia could not be found, although she dug the earth with her nose to get at least something, as you know. Arguments based on conjectures cannot be sewn into the case. Nevertheless, this does not stop Khrushchev, and in his memoirs he writes, while confirming the official vision of the circumstances of the case, although he himself is not aware of this. First of all, it turned out that Nikolev was detained near Smolny shortly before the murder of Kirov. He aroused some suspicion of the guards and was searched. A pistol was found in his possession. In those days, they were very strict about this. But despite this and the fact that he was detained in an area that was especially guarded, Nikolev was immediately released. I especially pay attention to these circumstances and to the fact that Nikolev did not shoot Kirov in the street. No, he penetrated the Smolny, moreover, into the entrance, which was used only by Kirov, and killed him when he climbed the stairs. This immediately gave rise to a suspicion, in Khrushchev and in the Olga Shitinovskia Commission, of course, L.B that Nikolev was sent to commit a terrorist act by people occupying a high position. And he was detained by guards who were not informed about anything and should not have been, but this person simply seemed suspicious. They detained him, but released him on orders from above. More than that, then this Nikolev got access to Smolny, to the stairwell of the regional party committee, where Kirov worked dots without the help of people in power. This could not be done, impossible if only because all approaches to Smolny were guarded, and especially the entrance used by Kirov. Regional Committee of the Party, LB. They began to investigate further. The Commission, Olga Shitnovskia, of course, LB, reported that there was data on the interrogation of Nikolev by Stalin. One of the old Bolsheviks, told about this, but, of course, there could be no documentary evidence in this regard. Allegedly, when Nikolev was brought to Stalin, he threw himself on his knees and began to say that he had killed Kirov on behalf of the party. One way or another, before talking with Stalin, Nikolev refused to answer the questions of the investigators and demanded that he be handed over to representatives of the central apparatus of the NKVD. He claimed that he was not guilty of anything, and why he did this, they know in Moscow. Many historians who are not familiar with the transcripts of the open trial on March 2nd to 13th. 1938 of the participants of the anti-Soviet right-wing Trotskyist bloc, where the former NKVD chief General Kigoda was among the accused, but Khrushchev himself, carefully who followed the process, of course, could not help but know about the unseemly role of Yagoda in all this dirty business, and years later he simply had no moral right to cast a shadow over the wattle fence. From the interrogation of the defendant Bulanov, Evening session on March 8, 1938. At the beginning of 1936, I learned for the first time that at one time Yagoda was aware of how the murder of Kirov was organized. He said that in Leningrad he had a faithful person dedicated to everything. The deputy head of the NKVD department for the Leningrad region Zaporozhets, 
and that he organized the case in such a way that the murder of Kirov by Nikolev was facilitated. In other words, it was done with the direct connivance, and hence the assistance of Zaporozhets. He was responsible for organizing the security of the secretary of the regional committee of Kirov, and, as publicist Eric Kotlier writes, second deputy head of the NKVDFT, Faman, about whom we will speak below, having appeared at the scene of the crime and detained the murderer, was quite impressed by the slovenliness and negligence that reigned in Smolny. Or is it malicious sabotage? LB. There was a case of almost failure when, by mistake, the guards, a few days before the murder of Kirov, detained Nikolev, and a notebook and a revolver were found in his briefcase, but Zaporozhets released him in time. Yagoda further told me that Borisov, an employee of the Leningrad NKVD department, was involved in the assassination of Kirov. When Stalin and other members of the government arrived in Leningrad and summoned this Borisov to Smolny to interrogate him as a witness to the assassination of Kirov, Zaporozhets, alarmed by this and fearing that Borisov would betray those who stood behind Nikolev, decided to kill Borisov. On Yagoda's instructions, Zaporozhets arranged for the car that was taking Borisov to Smolny to crash. Borisov was killed during this accident and in this way they got rid of a dangerous witness. From the interrogation of the defendant Yagoda, evening session on March 8, 1938, it became known to me that the Trotskyite Zinoviev's terrorist groups were conducting specific preparations for this assassination. Because of this, I was forced to suggest to Zaporozhets not to hinder the commission of a terrorist act against Kirov. Khrushchev, pretending to be a lace who allegedly does not know all this, writes, During the stay of Stalin, Molotov and Voroshilov in Leningrad in connection with the investigation into the murder of Kirov, as we know, Stalin demanded that a commissar be brought to him. Khrushchev speaks of Borisov, L.B., who guarded Kirov that day. But, as they explained to the asset, that is, the Olga Shitinovsky Commission, L.B., when this commissioner was taken for interrogation, as a result of a steering malfunction, the car hit the corner of the house, and he died. They took him in a truck. We instructed the commission, Olga Shitinovsky, of course, L.B., to interrogate those who drove this commissar so that they could tell under what circumstances this accident occurred and how the commissar, the head of Kirov's security, was killed in the accident. They started looking for people. There were three of them. The names are known. Two were sitting in the back of a truck with a commissar, and the third was in a cab with a driver. All three were not alive. They were shot. This aroused even greater suspicion that everything was organized, that the car accident was not accidental. Indeed. It was not accidental, but it was organized by the conspirators, as they themselves admitted, LB. However, Olga Shitinovska still managed to find the driver. Khrushchev recalls the testimony of this driver, a Czechist was sitting next to me and urged me all the time to go faster, to deliver the arrested person as soon as possible. On such and such a street, when turning, he grabbed the steering wheel from my hands and directed the car to the corner of the house, but I was strong young, and tore the steering wheel away from him, twisted around and only crushed the fender of the car. There was no accident, but I heard some knocking upstairs. Then they announced that this commissar had died in the accident. According to the driver Kuzin, Borisov was killed with a stone on the head. However, Khrushchev himself was well aware that his shaky version was weak and unproven. Yes, translating this story into modern language. We can say that this political assassination was carried out by special services, enemies of the people who dug in in the NKVD bodies. During interrogation, Nikolev told Stalin that the NKVD officers had persuaded him to kill him for four months. But who was the customer? Khrushchev, who had an excellent memory, could not forget their names, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev. But he really wanted to blame their crime on Stalin. Failed. Eric Kotlier who studied this tragedy, writes that the former second deputy head of the Leningrad department of the NKVD, one of F.E. Jerzynski Fedor Timofeevich Faman, after serving 10 years in the Karelian camps. Does this mean that not everyone involved in the murder of Kirov was destroyed? L.B. and having fallen into the field of view of the Olga Shitinovska Commission, 
became such a desirable object of her harassment that he got an appointment with Soslav at the Central Committee and at the mansion with the then secretary of the Leningrad Regional Committee Kozlov, where he, a widower, was introduced to a friend of Kozlov's wife, on which soon the former Czechist got married, and everyone in chorus at home persuades Fomin to help the Olga Shitnovska commission to confirm Khrushchev's version of the murder of Kirov. But the respectable Dzerzinets insists on his own. I don't have such evidence, and I don't know how to lie. When Khrushchev was informed about the stubborn Fomin, who did not want to distort the historical fact, the enraged pygmy called him an old fool and ordered him to be deprived of the general's pension, leaving only the old Bolshevik's personal one, as a result of which Fomin's financial situation immediately deteriorated sharply. Eric Kotlier cites such an interesting fact. Fomin offered him co-authorship. And they turned to Pilatiz Dat with a wish to write a truthful pamphlet called A Shot at Smalny, but their proposal was not supported by the Central Committee of the CPSU. So Khrushchev didn't need the truth. He needed his own vision of history, distorted by hatred for IV. Stalin. An indirect confirmation of the guilt of the conspirators from the camp of Trotskyists and Zinovievists can be the fact that in 1989 the gorbachev yukovlev Commission for the Rehabilitation of Victims of Political Repressions did not find it possible to rehabilitate General Kagoda, and in December 1990 the plenum of the Supreme Court of the USSR acting on the principle neither your, nor ours decided that the terrorist act against S.M. Kirov was conceived and accomplished by Nikolaev alone. Now a few words about the first version. About a lone terrorist who killed Kirov out of personal revenge. Its supporters, realizing the principle of Solzhenitsyn that everyone can write about Stalin whatever he pleases, replicate the following nonsense of their sick imagination. Kirov made the beautiful wife of the instructor of the regional committee Nikolev his secretary. They talked about their relationship. Nikolev made a scandal in the regional committee, and he was arrested. He did not stay long. Stalin met with him. Question mark. LB, he said, the fact that Kirov is a big man does not mean anything. You have the right to revenge and we will understand you as a man. November 30, 1934 Kirov was in Moscow. Sergo Urgenyuk Yidzi tried to persuade him to stay, but he rushed to Leningrad. When he went by car to the station, the car broke down. Kirov changed to a tram and nevertheless got to the station. In the morning he was in Leningrad. And in the evening, in the corridor adjacent to the government box, where the entrance to outsiders was closed, Nikolev discharged his pistol into him. At the same time, someone detained Kirov's bodyguard at the entrance. So, then, after all, the killer did not act alone. Having fired, Nikolev threw down his pistol and allegedly said, so it will be with everyone who wants to sleep with my wife. Such vile hacks truly need not only strict censorship, but all the might of the state of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Chapter 10, Suicide of Hopaliluva. Quote, after the death of Nadia, of course, my personal life is difficult. But, nothing, a courageous person must always remain courageous. IV. Stalin. Mothers, for example Dzugashvili. March 24, 1934 On November 10, 1932, a short report appeared in the Pravda newspaper, N.S. Aliluva. On the night of November 9, an active and devoted member of the party, Comrade Nadezhda Sergeyevna and Lilu Iva, Central Committee of the All Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks. In the same issue of the newspaper, under the heading Dear in Memory of Friend and Comrade Nadezhda Sergeyevna and Liluva, an obituary signed by Ekaterina Varosheluva, Polina Zemchuzina Malatova, Zinida Urgenyukidze, Dora Kazan, Maria Koganovich, Tatyana Postisheva, Ashkin Mikoyan, Kavo Urshilov, V. Molotov. S. Urgenyukidze, V. Kulbyshev, M. Kalinin, L. Koganovich, P. Postyshev, A. Andreev, S. Kirov, A. Mikoyan, A. Yanukids. A dear, close comrade to us, a man of a beautiful soul, has not become a young Bolshevik woman, full of strength and infinitely devoted to the party and the revolution, left us. Growing up in the family of a revolutionary worker, she connected her life with revolutionary work from an early age. Both during the years of the Civil War at the front, and during the years of the expanded socialist construction, Nezda Sergeyevna selflessly served the cause of the party, always modest and active in her revolutionary post. Demanding of herself, 
In recent years she has worked hard on herself, walking in the ranks of the most active comrades in her studies at the Industrial Academy. The memory of Nadezhda Sergeyevna as the most devoted Bolshevik, wife, close friend and faithful assistant to comrade Stalin will always be dear to us. On November 18, Pravda published a telegram from I.V. Stalin. I offer my heartfelt gratitude to organizations, institutions, comrades and individuals who expressed their condolences on the death of my close friend and comrade Nadezhda Sergeyevna and Lilu Iva Stalina. End quote. Mother ran the household. The head of the main directorate of the Kremlin Guard, Lt. Gen. N.S. Vlasic, in his notes, recalls, Stalin's wife, Nezda Sergeyevna and Lilu Iva, a modest woman, rarely made any requests, dressed modestly, unlike the wives of many responsible workers, she studied at the Industrial Academy and paid much attention to children. In 1932, she died tragically. Joseph Vissarionovich deeply experienced the loss of his wife and friend. The children were still small. Comrade Stalin could not pay much attention to them due to his employment. I had to transfer the upbringing and care of children to Karolina Vasilyevna, K. Vitil, the housekeeper of the Stalin family, L.B. She was a cultured woman, sincerely attached to children. Until 1929-1930, According to the memoirs of the daughter of I.V. Stalin Svetlana Lilu Iva, her mother ran the household herself, received rations and cards. There was a normal life in the house, which was led by the mistress of the house. Nadezhda Sergeyevna was born on September 22, 1901 in Baku. In the family of a revolutionary worker Sergei Yakovlevich Lilu Iev, with whom I.V. Stalin had a long-standing warm relationship, so, even while in Trukhinsk exile, Comrade Stalin kept in touch with the Aliluayevs, from whom he received parcels with warm clothes and money, and in the July days of 1917, V.I. hid in the Aliluayevs' apartment for several days. Lenin, who was given a small room by the schoolgirl Nadia. In 1918, Nadezhda Aliluayeva married I.V. Stalin, whom she idolized. Then she joined the party, went with her husband to the Zaritsyn front then worked in the secretariat of the Council of People's Commissars and Lenin's personal secretary, was his secretary on duty in Gorky during Ilyich's illness. She was an avid theater-goer. Confessions of a nanny, or how was it? Anna Sergeyevna, Nezda's sister, said that in the very last weeks before her suicide, when Stalin's wife was graduating from the Industrial Academy, Nezda Sergeyevna had a plan to go to Kharkov to find a job and live there. For Nadia, this became an obsessive thought, because she really wanted to free herself from her high position, which for some reason began to oppress her. And soon came the tragic denouement. According to Svetlana's memoirs, the occasion itself was insignificant and did not make a special impression on anyone. Just a small incident at a celebratory banquet in honor of the 15th anniversary of October. Stalin told her, Hey, you, drink. And she suddenly cried out, I don't hey. She got up and left the table in front of everyone. About how it all happened, Svetlana was told by her nanny shortly before her death. Svetlana Liluiva writes, She did not want to take this with her, she wanted to cleanse her soul, to confess. The housekeeper Karolina Vasilvna till always woke up Nadezhda in the morning, who was sleeping in her room. IV. Stalin went to bed in his office or in a small room with a telephone, near the dining room. He slept there the night too returning late from the same celebratory banquet from which Nadezhda had returned earlier. Early in the morning Karolina Vaslovna, as always, prepared breakfast in the kitchen and went to wake Nadezhda Sergeyevna. Seeing that Aliluiva was lying covered in blood near the bed itself, and that in her hand she had a small, almost silent Walter pistol, which her brother had once brought from Berlin. Shaking with fear and unable to utter a word, she ran to the nursery and called the nanny. Decided IV. Stalin did not wake up and went together to the bedroom. Both women put the body on the bed, put it in order. Then they ran to call those who were closer to them. The head of security, Yenu Kids, Polina Malatova, a close friend of Nezda. Soon everyone came running. Molotov and Voroshilov also came. Nobody could believe it. Finally, IV. Stalin went into the dining room. Joseph, Nadia is no longer with us. They told him, this happened on the night of November 8th to 9th, 1932. Stalin was shocked. He said that he himself did not want to live anymore. According to Svetlana, 
This story of the nanny can be trusted more than anyone else, fiercely, because she was an absolutely ingenuous person. Secondly, because this story was her confession, and a simple woman, a real Christian, can never lie in this case. But the professional gossip Khrushchev, who always rehearsed from other people's words, never took the trouble to fully understand the issue before throwing it into history, writes, then people said that Stalin came to the bedroom, where he found Nadezhda Sergeyevna dead, not one came, but with Voroshilov. Whether this was the case is hard to say. Why is it suddenly necessary to go to the bedroom with Voroshilov? And if a person wants to take a witness, then, then, he knew that she was no longer there? In a word, this side of the matter is still dark. Then there were still deaf gossip that Stalin himself killed her. There were such rumors, and I personally heard them. Apparently, Stalin knew about it. Since there were rumors, then, of course, the Czechists wrote down and reported. Chr. T.1. S.52-53. Then people said, is it really so? It's hard to say. This side of the matter is still obscure, yes. Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev turned out to be an ideal perjurer of history. You can't put a scarf on every mouth. On November 9, 1932, Professor Alexander Solovyov wrote in his diary, Today is a hard day. When I came to the Industrial Academy to give a lecture, I found myself in great confusion. At night, the wife of Comrade Stalin, N.S., tragically died at home. Alilu Iva, she is much younger than him in her thirties or something. She became a wife after the revolution, working as a young employee of the Central Committee. Now she studied for the last year at the Industrial Academy at the Faculty of Chemistry. She attended my lectures. At the same time she graduated from the Mendeleev Institute at the Faculty of Artificial Fiber. And this mysterious death. There are a lot of talks and assumptions among the pro macadamians Some say that Comrade Stalin shot her, long after midnight. He sat alone in his office writing papers. He heard a rustle behind him at the door, grabbed a revolver and fired. He became very suspicious. Everything seems to be an attempt on him. And this is the wife. Immediately on the spot. Others say they had big political differences. Alilu Iva accused him of cruelty to the opposition and dispossession. During the argument and passion, Comrade Stalin shot at her. Still others claim that the misfortune was due to a family quarrel. Alilu Iva stood up for her father, an old Leninist, and for her older sister, a party member. She accused her husband of inadmissible heartless persecution of them for some disagreement with him. Tov. Stalin could not stand the reproaches and fired. I found many other rumors and gossip. They called from the Central Committee, to stop all conjectures and fabrications. Do what you have to do, study. Quoted from the book by Elm Lech and the Death of Stalin. M. 2003. S. 264-265, as Vialilu Iev writes, as for rumors and speculation regarding the death of Nadezhda, they swirled even at that time. My mother often talked about this with Stalin, but he only shrugged his shoulders and answered, you can't put a scarf on every mouth. The conjectures of the exile Trotsky. But here Leon Trotsky gives his interpretation of the reason for the suicide of Nadezhda and Lilu Iva, on November 9, 1932. Alilu Iva died suddenly. She was only 30 years old. As for the reasons for her unexpected death, the Soviet newspapers were silent. In Moscow, they whispered that she shot herself, and talked about the reason. At the evening at Voroshilov's, in the presence of all the nobles, she allowed herself a critical remark about the peasant policy that led to famine in the countryside. Stalin loudly responded to her with the most rude abuse that exists in the Russian language. The Kremlin servant drew attention to the excited state of Alilu Iva when she returned to her apartment. After a while, a shot rang out from her room. Stalin received many expressions of sympathy and moved on to the agenda. However, Khrushchev will also adopt the political version of Olilu Iva's death. In the complete four-volume edition of Khrushchev's memoirs, V.2. S. 436-437, we find the following lines. It was 1932, when Stalin launched a giant all-Russian meat grinder, forced collectivization, when millions of peasant families were sent to concentration camps in inhuman conditions for extermination. Students of the academy people who came from the localities, saw with their own eyes this terrible rout of the peasantry. Of course, having learned that the new listener was Stalin's wife, 
they firmly closed their mouths. But it gradually became clear that Nadia was an excellent person, a kind and sympathetic soul. They saw that she could be trusted. Tongues loosened and they began to tell her. Nadia was horrified and rushed to share her information with Stalin. I imagine how he accepted her, he never hesitated to call her a fool and an idiot in disputes. Stalin, of course, claimed that her information was false and that it was counter-revolutionary propaganda. But all the witnesses say the same thing. Everybody? Stalin asked. No, answered Nadia. Only one says that all this is not true. But he obviously prevaricates and says this out of cowardice. This is the secretary of the academy cell, Nikita Khrushchev. Stalin remembered this surname. In the ongoing disputes at home, Stalin, arguing that the statements quoted by Nadia were unfounded, demanded that she name the names, then it would be possible to verify that their testimonies were true. Nadia gave the names of her interlocutors. If she had any more doubts about what Stalin was, then they were the last. Shocked, Nadia finally understood with whom she connected her life. Yes, probably, and what communism is, and shot herself. Of course, I was not a witness to what was told here, but I understand its end according to the data that have come down to us, highlighted by me to show what a dreamer the political pygmy Nikita Khrushchev was. LB. Dot. Why not assume that Nikita Khrushchev was the true culprit in the death of Nadezhda and Lilu Iva? Let us assume that the facts of dissatisfaction with the policy of collectivization and industrialization really took place in the Industrial Academy and that Lilu Iva, out of the simplicity of her soul, shared this information with Stalin. But it was not Nadia who named the names of her interlocutors. Only one person could do this, the secretary of the party cell of the Academy, Nikita Khrushchev whose name has already stuck in the memory of I.V. Stalin, as the name of a person cowardly and who can prevaricate. It is clear that the dissidents believe that Lilu Iva surrendered them, but she shot herself, and the true informer made himself a dizzying political career. Dirty truth of fiction. About Khrushchev, one of his contemporary wrote, The history of the question did not exist for him. He usually saw one, two sides of the subject, quite random, but somehow attractive. He did not suspect about a whole tangle of connections. He kept forgetting and omitted something that seemed impossible to miss or forget, all the time exaggerated or underestimated such things, the true dimensions of which were obvious. The fact that Khrushchev was a man of a narrow-minded mind is also evidenced by the fact that in the same memoirs, in addition to the version described above, where Khrushchev explains Ililu Iva's suicide with political reasons, he gives another. Perhaps the most vile version, we buried a Lilu Iva. Stalin looked satin as he stood at her grave. I do not know what was in his soul, but outwardly he mourned. After Stalin's death, I learned the story of a Lilu Iva's death. Of course, this story is not documented in any way. Vlasic, Stalin's head of security, said that after the parade everyone went to dine with the military commissar Klimant Voroshilov in his large apartment. After parades and other similar events, Everyone usually went to Voroshilov for dinner. The parade commander and some members of the Politburo went there directly from Red Square. Everyone drank, as usual on such occasions. Finally everyone dispersed. Stalin also left. But he didn't go home. It was too late. Who knows what time it was. Nadezhda Sergeyevna began to worry. She began looking for him, calling one of the dodges. And she asked the duty officer if Stalin was there. Yes. He replied, Comrade Stalin is here. Who's with him? He replied that a woman was with him, called her name. It was the wife of a military man, Guzv, who was also at that dinner. When Stalin left, he took her with him. I was told that she is very beautiful. And Stalin slept with her at this dacha, and Aliluiva learned it about it from the officer on duty. In the morning, when, I don't know for sure, Stalin arrived home, but Nadezhda Sergeyevna was no longer alive. She didn't leave any note. And if there was a note, we were never told about it. Later, Vlasic said, that officer is an inexperienced fool. She asked him, and he took it and told her everything. Then there were rumors that perhaps Stalin killed her. This version is not very clear. The first one seems more plausible. Chr. T.1 is.53-54 And the pure truth of the fact, the plausible, that is, like the truth version is not the truth itself. And most often it is in the toga of plausibility that the most malicious lies are dressed up. From beginning to end, 
the so-called memoirs of Khrushchev, who had some kind of pathological hatred of IV, seemed to me like that. Stalin, and even expressed much deeper than that of the greatest antagonist IV, Stalin Trotsky, although the latter can rightfully be considered the founder of anti-Stalinism. Here is Lebel Bronstein, a.k.a. Trotsky lives in 1932 and is engaged in subversive activities abroad against the Soviet state, its leaders and personally IV, Stalin. He feeds on gossip and rumors circulating in Moscow among his like-minded people. They told him about the political nature of the public scandal in the family of the general secretary, and he believed, well, what to take from the exile. But with Khrushchev, the demand is different. How can one believe him that he learned the story of Ililuiva's death only after the death of Stalin, when it was to her, Nadezhda Sergeyevna, and Stalin's respect for her memory, that he owed his dizzying rise to the political Red Olympus? Unknown to anyone, young Khrushchev, a worker from the Donbass, having become the secretary of the party cell of the Industrial Academy, managed to impress the listener Ililuiva, and then get the favor of Stalin himself. LB. Dot. Khrushchev could not help but know how shocked the leader was by the death of his beloved Tadka, to whom he wrote such tender letters, receiving no less touching answers. Khrushchev could not help but know that after that fateful day, at the request of Stalin, he and Bakharin exchanged Kremlin apartments, since the leader could not live within the walls, where everything reminded him of the recent tragic event. Khrushchev could not help but know that until the end of his life, Stalin kept in a conspicuous place photographs of Nadezhda Sergeyevna, one in the Kremlin apartment and two, in the country, in the dining room and in the office. Khrushchev could not have been unaware that Iosif Vissarionovich, who suffered from chronic insomnia, sometimes at night asked the driver to quietly drive him to the Novodoviki cemetery, where the ashes of his wife were buried, and sat for a long time, indulging in inconsolable grief, on a marble bench which is still stands opposite the magnificent marble monument erected by his order, built by the famous symbolist I. Shadr. V.M. Molotov recalled her funeral, I never saw Stalin cry. And here, at the coffin of Alilu Iva, I see how tears rolled down from him. Stalin wrote to his mother in March 1934, after Nadia's death, of course, my personal life is hard, but nothing. A courageous person must always remain courageous. According to Khrushchev, this fateful event did not take place on the night of November 8th to 9th, that is, in fact, on November 9th. By the way, Trotsky also mentions this date, but on the morning of November 8th, since the banquet at Voroshilov, according to Khrushchev, took place immediately after a festive demonstration in honor of the 15th anniversary of October. The dirty scene, when, in front of her husband, an officer of the Red Army, an authoritative politician, a world-class personality, the great leader of the Soviet people, like a depraved merchant, takes his beautiful wife to bed. This is the fruit of Khrushchev's sexual fantasies. The fictitious conversation of the inexperienced fool of the officer on duty with Nadezhda Sergeyevna and Liluiva is also unconvincing, and the reference to Lt. Gen. N.S. Vlasic, whom, According to Stalin's bodyguard Dayrubin, in 1952, Khrushchev, together with Beria, put him behind bars, and after his release he settled in a communal apartment, where the dishonored old man soon died of grief. Well, not in prison and not in a communal apartment, Vlasic could tell Khrushchev juicy details of events more than 20 years ago. Laughter, and more. In the same book next to Stalin we can read such evidence of the relentless shadow of Stalin. Alexei Trofimovich Rubin, in moral terms, the leader was pure like no other. After the death of the wife, lived as a monk. V.I. Lenin's assistant, who fled abroad, the author of the book Memoirs of the Former Secretary of Stalin, wrote that after the death of his wife one more was added to his many phobias, Sikhsophobia. There is a similar testimony of Vyacheslav Mkhailovich Molotov on this score, that is, people who perfectly knew the leader every step of his life. And here are some K and T. Yenko, under this pretentious pseudonym the father and son of Kachenko are hiding, in the book The Private Life of Leaders. Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky to Rubin's last phrase, not without malicious intent, they added a simple denial of not, and the meaning changed to the opposite. After the death of Anna Lilu of his wife in 1932, Stalin, according to the testimony of his guards, did not, 
Come live a monk, specified book. M. 2000. P. 148. And this, in turn, gave K and T. Yenko the opportunity to widely quote from the foul-smelling fictional book from beginning to end of the Terry anti-Stalinist Helgendlin Confession of Stalin's Mistress, which, like Khrushchev's memoirs, like Uspensky's book Privy Advisor to the Leader, debunked by A. Rubin, is an example of a captivatingly plausible dirty lies, which have nothing to do with the pure truth of the fact. Chapter 11. About the Sons of Khrushchev without Rouge. Quote, an apple does not fall far from an apple tree Russian folk proverb immediately after the 20th Congress of the CPSU. He walked around Moscow and the verse was popular among the supporters of I.V. Stalin, who were really indignant at the impudent slander that Nikita Khrushchev raised against the national leader. Quote, we didn't believe him. An avalanche rushed past the words, and there was distrust in that, and more than one reason. They whispered, his son was captured. In the midst of the war, he surrendered without a fight. Having crossed the threshold high, Khrushchev tried to save him, and Stalin flashed with yellow eyes and touched the tip of his mustache. I didn't save my ORLA, and you came to ask for a coward. End quote. The author of these lines preferred to remain anonymous, and although they were signed, L. Registan, to the co-author of the Stalinist hymn of the Soviet Union Gabriel Yoreklian, who had this pseudonym, this verse has nothing to do. Since the real L. Registan died back in 1945, perhaps Khrushchev never uttered this phrase, but if you believe the rumor, then one day he inadvertently threw in front of his entourage, Lenin at one time took revenge on the royal family for his brother, and I will show dead Stalin for my son where Kuzkin's mother lives. And he showed, and so he showed that we still cannot clear the Augean stables of his most shameless slander and slander against a person who, regardless of the lies that Trotsky and his successors, Khrushchev and Gorbachev, tried to stick to him, according to the international rating of great people of all times and peoples, he is in the first hundred, as are the now scolded K. Marx, F. Engels, V. I. Lenin, Mao Zedong, F. Castro, but they, detractors, are not in this series and never will be. But what kind of story happened to Khrushchev's son, if it unleashed such destructive forces that eventually destroyed the Soviet Union, a fact that even the tragedy of Hiroshima and Nagasaki pales in front of? No one will ever know the truth, complete and documented, about Senior Lieutenant Leonid Nikitich Khrushchev, since his father in 1953 and 1954, having gained access to the archives cleaned them up and removed from his son's personal file interrogation protocols in German captivity and other compromising Leonidas documents. This is stated by the authors of publications about Khrushchev's son, in particular, Nikolai Ned, who is interested in, why are the pages relating to those war years when questions arose and the fate of his Lenka from his son's personal file, and in return, albeit hastily, but surely torn out, from which, however, shreds remained. 10 to 15 years after the war, new one suddenly appeared, dated already in the 60s. It turns out that there was something in him that did not give Khrushchev rest for the rest of your life. However, as always happens in such cases, there are more than enough versions. One of them seems to be the most plausible. This is the version of a retired KGB major general who served in counterintelligence for 37 years, a participant in the Great Patriotic War, Vadim Udalov who wrote the book for which Khrushchev avenged Stalin, a fragment of which was published in the Zavizim Gazeta on February 17, 1998. And already on April 4 of the same year, the same newspaper publishes material received from the United States from the granddaughter of Leonid Khrushchev, Nina Khrushchev. Why are the Stalinists taking revenge on Khrushchev? But the arguments that the 27-year-old graduate of Princeton University cited from across the ocean were unconvincing and did not refute the version of the knowledgeable former senior state security officer. We are talking about the fact that Leonid Khrushchev at the beginning of 1941 committed a criminal offense on the basis of alcohol abuse. He had to stand trial, but thanks to his father he escaped not only punishment but also trial. Khrushchev 2s.342 The second crime of Leonid Khrushchev was the murder of a colleague during a drinking bout, after which, according to Stepan Mikoyan, who was friends with Leonid, he was tried and given eight years to serve at the front. According to V. Udalov, 
confirmed by other sources, a fighter plane piloted by Khrushchev's son went towards the location of the Germans and disappeared without a trace. So Leonid ended up in the clutches of the Nazis. Most likely, he went for it voluntarily, since he had nothing to lose. So, Leonid went to the same conspiracy with the German fascists. Convinced of this, IV. Stalin set the task of stealing El Khrushchev and delivering him to Moscow for the Smirsh military counterintelligence. The special task of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief was completed. Together with El Khrushchev, documentary evidence was delivered to Moscow, testifying to his treacherous activities. The military tribunal sentenced him to capital punishment, execution. Having learned about the verdict of the military tribunal, Nikita Khrushchev appeals to the Politburo with a request to cancel the harsh punishment. IV. Stalin agreed to discuss the fate of Leonid Khrushchev at a meeting of the Politburo. The head of the Smirsh counterintelligence, Colonel General Abakimov, presented the materials of the case, the verdict of the military tribunal and left. The first to speak at the meeting was the secretary of the Moscow Regional Committee and City Committee. He is also the head of the heads of the Red Army PER and a candidate member of the Politburo, Alexander Sherbakov, who in his speech emphasized the need to observe the principle of equality of all before the law. It is impossible, he declared, to forgive the sons of eminent fathers if they have committed a crime, and at the same time severely punish others. What will the people say then? Sherbakov proposed to leave the verdict in force. Then Beria took the floor who was aware of the previous misdeeds of Khrushchev's son, recalled them and that Khrushchev's son had already been forgiven twice. After that, Molotov, Koganovich, Malenkov expressed their points of view. The opinion of all members of the Politburo was unanimous, to leave the verdict in force. The last speaker was I.V. Stalin. It was by no means easy for him to make a decision, after all, his Yakov was also in captivity. By his decision, he thereby signed the verdict to his own son. As you know, Stalin's son, Yakov Dzugashvili, flatly refused to take any part in the propaganda activities of the Nazis, which bore the code name of Operation Zeppelin, and in general to cooperate with the Nazis in any form. And the decree of the permanent presidium of the Congress of People's Deputies of the USSR on conferring the title of Hero of the Soviet Union's Yugashvili Yakov Iazifovich for the heroism and personal courage shown posthumously during the Great Patriotic War is not only a tribute to the memory of I.V. Stalin, but also an act of historical justice, because Jacob really deserves it. He preferred death to betrayal, and it became the feat of his life. As Vialiluayev writes, there are eyewitnesses to such words of the legendary General D.M. Karbyshev, which he said to Yakov. In April 1942, the general was taken to Hamburg. Yakov Iazifovich should be treated as an unshakable Soviet patriot. This is a very honest and humble friend. He is a man of few words and keeps to himself, because he is constantly watched. He is afraid to let down those who will communicate with him. Yudalev was told what I.V. Stalin, closing the meeting, he said, Nikita Sergeyevich needs to strengthen himself and agree with the opinion of his comrades. If the same thing happens to my son, I will accept this just sentence with deep fatherly bitterness. Leonid's granddaughter Nina Khrushcheva, who zealously followed all the publications about her clan, did not react in any way. Reading versions in which her named grandfather Nikita Khrushchev was depicted in an extremely humiliating situation when he crawled on his knees in front of I.V. Stalin tearfully begging him to spare his son, fought on the carpet in convulsions, but could not pity the tyrant. And then she showed such an inadequate reaction to a completely sensible and truthful material. Nina's main trump card is that the version of the ex checkist is undocumented. However, this is not surprising, given the impudence with which her named grandfather Nikita gutted the archives seizing everything that could compromise him. But there is also such a thing as circumstantial evidence. And this, above all, is his deep personal dislike for I.V. Stalin, which, judging by his memoirs, he kept until his death. This is then the reprisal against all participants in that meeting of the Politburo, starting with Beria, then Colonel General V.S. Abakimov. Arrested in the case of killer doctors, he, by order of Khrushchev, remained in prison even after the doctors were released. In December 1954, according to the fabricated so-called Second Leningrad case, he was sentenced to death and shot an hour and a quarter. After the verdict was announced, 
although the law required a two-week period for filing a petition for pardon. Immediately after the end of the process, Prosecutor General Rudenko, in the presence of the Secretary of the Military Collegium of the Supreme Court of the USSRN, M. Polyakov, called from Leningrad to Moscow, reported to Khrushchev that the task had been completed. This only says that Khrushchev's clear and unambiguous instruction regarding Abakumov was, Vyudilov gives a list of persons subjected to repression under Khrushchev. This, in addition to the sons of Stalin, Vasily, Lieutenant General of State Security Pavel Sudapletov, whose people participated in the abduction of Leonid Khrushchev. It is not known why he served 15 years from start to finish in the same Vladimir prison where Vasily Stalin was imprisoned. Sudapletov was rehabilitated as early as 1992. Malenkov, Molotov, Kaganovich were sent into exile under the strictest operational police supervision. The only one whom the punishing right hand of the vengeful and vindictive Khrushchev could not get was Alexander Sherbakov. He died in 1945, L.B., but judging by the epithets that he awards the deceased in his memoirs a quarter of a century later, it is clear how much Mikita hated him. The poisonous, snake character of Sherbakov, we all resented Sherbakov, vile inclinations of Sherbakov, this malicious sycophant Sherbakov, Sherbakov continued his vile activities, I evaluate Sherbakov according to his merits, and from a very bad side, etc. According to the writer Ivan Stanyuk, after the 20th Congress, the Rehabilitation Commission, the so-called Shvernik Commission, tried to prove, for the sake of the all-powerful father, that Khrushchev's son, convicted during the war, was a pilot who accomplished a heroic feat, and that he was not guilty of anything. However, the military collegium of the Supreme Court of the USSR did not find it possible to remove his criminal record. Nevertheless, in the book of Khrushchev's memoirs there is a photograph of his son with the inscription, Leonid Nikitich Khrushchev, pilot, died in battles for the motherland. Sergei Khrushchev, the Khrushchev clan, with tenacity worthy of a better use, does not want to admit the obvious facts and tries to deny the betrayal of Leonid. Rumors that my brother did not die while performing his military and patriotic duty, but allegedly surrendered, gave out military secrets to the enemy and that after the war, L.B., he fell into our hands and a deserved punishment awaited him, were clearly invented. For what? This becomes clear from the version that was in circulation that, they say, Khrushchev went to Stalin to beg for indulgence for the criminal, to grant his son life. And the noble leader, they say, with contempt rejected the unworthy, saying, I did not help my hero son and your coward should get what he deserves. These words were uttered by 66-year-old Sergei Khrushchev, doctor of physical and mathematical sciences, a designer of rocket technology, who was more needed by the new homeland, the USA, solely as Khrushchev's son, and therefore, from the very beginning, he began to strive for the position of professor of political science at American Brown University, glorifying world imperialism and slandering our past. It was Sergei Nikitich who encouraged his father to commit a state crime at that time, the publication in the USA of his crazy memories and at the same time in Pravda, a refutation of the rumors about this. Here is this false statement, as can be seen from the press reports of the United States of America and some other capitalist countries, the so-called memoirs or memoirs of N.S. Khrushchev. This is a fabrication and I resent it. I never handed over any memoirs or materials of a memoir nature to anyone, neither to Time, nor to other foreign publishing houses. This is the whole Nikita Sergeyevich L.B. Therefore, I declare that all this is a fake. The venal bourgeois press has repeatedly been convicted of such lies. And Khrushchev. This is quite in Khrushchev's style. After the closing of the 20th Congress, he twice publicly stated that he had not read any report on the cult of Stalin's personality at the Congress, that such a document does not exist and did not exist in nature. So he refuted the comments on this report when soon this report is word for word published abroad, and L.M. Kaganovich raises the question head on at a meeting of the Presidium of the Central Committee, Khrushchev without admitting that this was the work of his hands, will say, as for publications, let's think about how to get out of the situation. Bolganian's proposal was, 
we need to check how it could happen that the documents of the Central Committee in just a few days appear in the press abroad and the whole world knows about it. Serov must be instructed to investigate and report. So what? Did Serov investigate? Did he report? And if so, what? If he knew for sure that the leak of such important information was carried out personally by him on behalf of the faithful Leninist, so faithful that there is nowhere else to go, Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev L.B. In the preface to Khrushchev's memoirs, named as the word of the son, Sergei Nikitich, as one of the copyright holders of the memoirs, together with Rada Nikitichny and a certain V. Evrinov, writes, I do not flatter myself with the hope that everyone will agree with my assessments, some will consider me biased. Of course, my opinion about those times, about my father is subjective. It cannot be otherwise. And are there any non-subjective opinions at all? Is that what we're talking about? We are talking about objective reality, which no one is allowed to distort and distort. I do not share the widely held opinion that it was the tragedy of his son that was the only motive for Khrushchev's behavior after he came to power, in particular, his pathological hatred of I.V. Stalin. Obviously, here it is necessary to take into account a complex of such reasons, of which the main one is the revenge for the son. Of the other moments, the following can be identified with a certain degree of probability. Revenge for the premature death of Nadezhda Liluiva, about which he retained the best memories to the end. The Sawyeri complex, envy of the unusually high authority of I.V. Stalin, the cult of personality. Inferiority complex. I cannot rise to his level, which means that I must debunk his image in the minds of people at any cost. I leave the future inquisitive researchers of this issue the opportunity to supplement this list of motives for the political assassination of I.V. Stalin Nikita Khrushchev. Chapter 12, The Tragedy of Vasily Stalin. Quote, you are to blame for the fact that I want to eat, i.a. Krulov, wolf and lamb. Children of great parents are a special article of public interest. If they are alive and can add something, even some insignificant touch to the already seemingly well-known portrait of their outstanding parent, this is always valuable. True, there is a danger here, which I.V. knew very well. Stalin, when he noted that the worst witnesses are eyewitnesses, as a rule, after the death of big parents, some kind of myth-making arises in society to one degree or another. And here it is very important that native children do not end up in the role of the most ordinary myth-makers, so that, first of all, they carefully and relevantly treat the memory of the person closest to them, observing at least elementary principles of historicism and a sense of proportion, without giving vent to personal grievances, ambitions or fantasies. Here is an example. About the biggest parent, I.V. His daughter, Svetlana Stalin and Lilu Iva wrote a lot to Stalin, who at one time, contrary to the will of her brother Vasily, refused, perhaps under pressure from Khrushchev, or the moral and psychological atmosphere of intolerance towards the very name of I.V. Stalin created by him, from her father's surname in favor of the surname mother. Unfortunately, along with valuable memoirs, there are many moments in them that cannot be considered reliable, are of the nature of deep subjectivism, although for many, and, above all, foreign bourgeois Sovietologists Stalinologists, S. Liluyev is considered an indisputable authority. Well, my own daughter I.V. Stalin, she herself saw, or peeped, she herself heard, or overheard, she thought of something or rethought after the fact, often after many years. Even such an extraordinary moment as the death of Joseph Vissarionovich, when, the moral persecution of Svetlana herself, organized by Khrushchev, began in February 1956, that is, immediately after the 20th Congress, when, on his Jesuit order, Mikoyan sent a car for Stalin's daughter, which delivered Svetlana to the house of Anastasi Ivanovich, where she was handed for review secret report by Khrushchev and where she spent several hours reading this, as we now absolutely know, slanderous document. And a couple of days later, with Jesuit sadism, she was forced to attend a meeting at the Institute of World Literature, where this most notorious document was discussed at a confluence of people and vilified her father. Of course, those present knew that the daughter of I.V. Stalin was in the hall, they whispered, pointed at her with their eyes, but nevertheless they did not moderate their passions. And yet, it is hardly possible to compare her stormy, 
full of extraordinary events fate with the tragic fate of her brother Vasily, a 32-year-old lieutenant general, former aviation commander of the Moscow Military District, who was arrested just a month and a half after the death of his father, stripped of all ranks and awards, kept under investigation for more than two years in a solitary confinement cell and, in the end, on a fabricated false charge, they were imprisoned for a long eight years in the Vladimir prison. That the reprisal against the son of I.V. Stalin was the work of Khrushchev exclusively, is evidenced by the fact that after the execution of Beria, all his victims were released from prisons and camps. However, Vasily Stalin continued to sit, whom, well, why not a Jesuit reception? He was interrogated on Victory Day on May 9, 1953, by order of Khrushchev, Lieutenant General Vladimirsky, who was shot in connection with the Beria case on December 23 of the same year on charges of abuse of office and falsification of criminal cases. In the interrogation protocol of May 9, Vasily categorically rejects the accusation, I did not commit theft of state funds and state property for the purpose of personal enrichment and I cannot plead guilty. But after the arrest of Vladimirsky, the new Khrushchev Minister of the Interior S.N. Kruglov, in a letter to the Kremlin, repeats word-for-word -word nonsense that during the investigation Stalin V.I. pleaded guilty to the fact that he systematically allowed illegal spending, squandering state property and public funds. He also used his official position for personal enrichment. True, below he gives the real reason for the arrest of Vasily Stalin. He made hostile attacks and anti-Soviet slanderous statements against the leaders of the CPSU and the Soviet state, and also expressed his intention to establish contact with foreign correspondents in order to give an interview about his situation after the death of Stalin IV. In letters to a friend, Stalin's daughter writes that when he saw his father dead, Vasily immediately expressed his guess, a rumor about which swept through Moscow. His father was poisoned. He repeated this statement later, in a variety of companies. It is clear that the accomplices of the anti-Stalinist conspiracy had no choice but to isolate the dangerous Vasily for many years, and, in the end, when Khrushchev managed to knock out all his political competitors from the game, eliminate Stalin's son, Vasily. A.S. Malinin, a former employee of the Vladimir prison, recalled how Vasily Stalin appeared in this institution. He was brought in late at night, I was on duty then. He was dressed in a summer leather jacket, thin, with a mustache. We already knew that he would be listed in the prison case as Vasilya Vasily Petrovich. This was the wish of the Kremlin, read, Khrushchev. A month later, he was transferred to the third building on the third floor, in a corner cell. There he served the entire term, until the autumn of 1959 when he was again taken to Lefortovo. Officially, they concealed from everyone that this was Stalin's son, but almost all of us knew this and called him simply Vasily. He was sick twice, his leg was dry, he walked with a cane, he lay in our infirmary, I can't say anything bad about him. He behaved calmly, correctly, and we treated him the same way. I remember the head of the prison calling me, it's your wife's birthday today, take it and send congratulations. They give me a basket and there are 35 scarlet roses in it. At first I did not understand why it was such a concern for my wife. And then it turned out, on March 24, Vasily turned 35 years old in prison. They handed him a basket of flowers, but he refused to carry them to the cell. They will wither quickly, he says, without light. Give it to one of the women. My wife still cannot forget this bouquet. No one had ever given her such flowers in her life. Vasily Stalin repeatedly wrote to the top leadership of the country, and, in particular, Khrushchev. But none of them received an answer. Here are excerpts from a letter dated April 10, 1958. Nikita Sergeyevich. Today I listened to you on the radio from the Sports Palace and I am writing to you again. I know that I'm tired, but what should I do? But what should I do? Nikita Sergeyevich. I look at real enemies, they easily endure imprisonment, they are proud of it, their hatred gives them strength. But what kind of hatred can I have and to whom? I will be frank to the end, Nikita Sergeyevich. There were and there are moments when I scold you in my soul. Because it is impossible not to swear, looking at the four walls, the people and the hopelessness of your existence with all these tests, work, content, etc. Indeed, according to all laws, on February 4, 1958, 
I should have been at home, he takes anger, wild anger, Nikita Sergeyevich, at the one who introduced me to you in such a form that you agree, even beyond the term, to keep me in prison, because I enemy. Well, how can I convince you otherwise? Having cited this litter in full, and Zankovich asks, did you read? N.S. Khrushchev is this message? Read. No one knows how he felt at the same time. Gloat. Satisfaction? If the version is true that Stalin did not spare his son Leonid, asking for whom Khrushchev almost crawled on his knees in front of him, then, probably, a sense of revenge can also be assumed. About how the new owner of the Kremlin dealt with the son of I.V. Stalin. Two documents sent in the name of Khrushchev by the Prosecutor General of the USSR Rudenko and the Chairman of the State Security Committee Shilipin on April 7, 1961 and almost a year later, on March 19, 1962, by the new Chairman of the KGB, Semikastny. Both messages are labeled top secret. Document number 1. On April 28, 1961, Stalin V.I. is to be released from prison in connection with the completion of his sentence. During the period of stay in places of detention V.I., Stalin has not reformed, behaves defiantly, spitefully, demands for himself the special privileges that he enjoyed during his father's lifetime. To the proposal made to him that, after his release from prison, to leave for permanent residence in the years. Kazan or Kubyshev, V.I. Stalin declared that he would not go anywhere voluntarily from Moscow. On the proposal to change his surname, he also categorically refused and stated that if the appropriate conditions were not created for him, dacha, apartment, pension, etc., then he would not be silent, but would tell everyone that he had been convicted in due time unreasonable and that arbitrariness is being committed against him. In repeated conversations with him, he constantly emphasized that after leaving prison he would seek an appointment with Comrade Khrushchev and other members of the Presidium of the Central Committee of the CPSU, as well as write letters and applications to various authorities. At the same time, he expressed the idea that he might again turn to the Chinese embassy with a request to send him to China, where he would be treated and work. The USSR Prosecutor's Office and the State Security Committee are convinced that V.I. Stalin, having been released, will again behave as before incorrectly. In this regard, we consider it expedient to send V.I. Stalin after serving his sentence in exile for a period of five years in Kazan. Foreigners are prohibited from entering this city. In case of unauthorized departure from the specified place, according to the law, he can be held criminally liable. So. We will exile in violation of socialist legality, in the order, so to speak, of exception, and punish for resistance to arbitrariness, in full accordance with the law, dash pound. In the city of Kazan, provide him with a separate one-room apartment, and brought to disability, his leg was dry, he walked with a stick, LB, to the son of IV, Stalin, she was provided, in a five-story block house number 105 on Gagarin Street on the top floor, L, B, dot. According to the conclusion of the doctors, the state of health of V.I. Stalin is bad and he needs long-term treatment and pensions. As V.I., who served in the army for over 25 years on a preferential basis, Stalin was given a pension of 300 rubles, new money. However, taking into account that by his actions he discredited the high rank of the Soviet general, it is proposed to establish for him a pension in the amount of 150 rubles per month through the Ministry of Defense of the USSR. As his health improves, he could be employed at one of the aircraft factories in Kazan. We also consider it expedient when issuing VI. Stalin of the passport indicate a different surname. Before being released from prison, volumes. Rudenko and Shilipin to have an appropriate conversation with him. Document number 2. March 19, 1962. Top secret. To Comrade Khrushchev and S. The State Security Committee under the Council of Ministers of the USSR reports that on March 19, 1962, at 1 p.m., Dzugashvili, Stalin, Vasily Iosifovich, died in Kazan. According to preliminary data, the cause of death was alcohol abuse. Zugashvili V.I., despite repeated warnings from doctors, systematically drank. We consider it expedient to bury V.I. Zugashvili in Kazan without military honors, 
about the death of V.I. Zugashvili inform his next of kin. We ask for consent. Chairman of the State Security Committee, V. Zemikastny. The opinion of Nadezhda Vasilovna, daughter of Vasily Stalin. The death of my father is a mystery to me to this day. There was no confirmation of his death. The opinion of a retired colonel, a veteran of two wars I.P. Travnikova. Vasily was removed due to the malicious intent of Khrushchev. Vasily knew a lot about him and his environment, about their shortcomings. The opinion of the famous Sovietologist A.F. Jarkanov, his sister thinks that he died of alcoholism, but, alas, there is another, more ruthless disease in the world, politics. He died from it. Until now, members of the family of Vasily Iazifovich Stalin are convinced that he was helped to die by his last, Kazan wife who managed to illegally register a marriage with him, an agent of the Khrushchev KGB, Nurse Masha, Maria Nusberg. Chapter 13, The Myth and Truth About Katyn How was the myth of the Katyn tragedy created? The 20th Congress had devastating consequences not only within the USSR, but also for the entire world communist movement, because Moscow lost its role as a cementing ideological center and each of the people's democracies, with the exception of the PRC and Albania, began to look for its own path to socialism, and under this actually took the path of eliminating the dictatorship of the proletariat and restoring capitalism. The first serious international reaction to Khrushchev's secret report was the anti-Soviet speeches in Poznan, the historical center of Wielkopolska chauvinism, that followed shortly after the death of the leader of the Polish communists. Boleslaw Birut. Soon, the turmoil began to spread to other cities in Poland and even spread to other Eastern European countries, to a greater extent, Hungary, to a lesser extent, Bulgaria. In the end, the Polish anti-Sovietists, under the smoke screen of the fight against Stalin's personality cult, managed not only to free the right-wing nationalist deviator Vladislav Gomułka and his associates from prison, but also to bring them to power. And although Khrushchev tried at first to somehow oppose, in the end, he was forced to accept the Polish demands in order to defuse the current situation, which was ready to get out of control. These demands contained such unpleasant moments as the unconditional recognition of the new leadership, the dissolution of collective farms, some liberalization of the economy, guarantees of freedom of speech, meetings and demonstrations, the abolition of censorship, and, most importantly, the official recognition of the vile Nazi lie about the involvement of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in the Katyn execution of Polish prisoners of war. Officers In the heat of giving such guarantees, Khrushchev recalled the Soviet Marshal Konstantin Rokossovsky, a Pole by origin, who served as Minister of Defense of Poland, and all Soviet military and political advisers. Perhaps the most unpleasant for Khrushchev was the demand to recognize the involvement of his party in the Katyn massacre, but he agreed to this only in connection with the promise of Viga Mukhe to put on the trail of Stepan Bandera, the worst enemy of the Soviet government, the head of the paramilitary formations of Ukrainian nationalists who fought against the Red Army during the Great Patriotic War and continued their terrorist activities in the Lviv region until the 50s of the 20th century. The Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, OUN, headed by S. Bandera, relied on cooperation with the intelligence services of the USA, England, Germany, on permanent contacts with various underground circles and groups in Ukraine. To do this, its emissaries penetrated there illegally, with the goal of creating an underground network and transporting anti-Soviet and nationalist literature. It is possible that during his unofficial visit to Moscow in February 1959, Gomelka reported that his secret services had discovered Bandera in Munich, and hurried with the recognition of Katyn's guilt, one way or another, but on the instructions of Khrushchev on October 15, 1959, the KGB officer Bogdan Stashinsky finally eliminates Bandera in Munich, and the trial that took place over Stashinsky in Karlsruhe, Germany will consider it possible to determine the killer with a relatively mild punishment, only a few years in prison, since the main blame will be placed on the organizers of the crime, the Khrushchev leadership. Fulfilling his obligation, Khrushchev, an experienced tripper of secret archives, gives appropriate orders to the KGB chairman Xi Lipin, who moved to this chair a year ago from the post of first secretary of the Komsomil Central Committee, 
and he begins feverishly working on creating a material justification for the Hitlerite version of the Katyn myth. First of all, Schiliepen starts a special folder on the involvement of the CPSU, this one puncture already speaks of the fact of gross falsification, until 1952 the CPSU was called the CPSU, B, LB, to the Katyn execution, where, as he believes, should be stored four main documents, A, lists of executed Polish officers, B, Beria's report to Stalin, C, Resolution of the Central Committee of the Party of March 5, 1940, D. Schilipin's letter to Khrushchev, the motherland must know its heroes. Today, anyone can get acquainted with the contents of the secret documents hastily concocted by A. Schilipin from this special folder. They were published in the first issue of the journal Vapersi Istory in 1993. It was this special folder, created by Khrushchev on the order of the new Polish leadership that spurred on all the anti-people forces of the PPR, inspired by Pope John Paul II, former Archbishop of Krakow and Cardinal of Poland, as well as Assistant to U.S. President Jimmy Carter for National Security, Permanent Director Research Center called the Stalin Institute at the University of California, a poll by birth, Zbigniew Brzezinski to more and more brazen ideological diversions. In the end, after another three decades, the story of the visit of the leader of Poland to the Soviet Union repeated itself, only this time in April 1990 the President of the Republic of Poland V. Jaruzelski arrived in the USSR with an official state visit demanding repentance for the Katyn atrocity and forced Gorbachev to make the following statement, recently, documents have been found, meaning Khrushchev's special folder, LB which indirectly but convincingly indicate that thousands of Polish citizens who died in the Smolensk forests exactly half a century ago, became victims of Beria and his henchmen. The graves of Polish officers are next to the graves of Soviet people who fell from the same evil hand. Given that the special folder is a fake, then Gorbachev's statement was not worth a penny. Having achieved from the mediocre Gorbachev leadership in April 1990 a shameful public repentance for Hitler's sins, that is, the publication of the TASS report that the Soviet side, expressing deep regret over the Katyn tragedy, declares that it represents one of the grave crimes of Stalinism. Counter-revolutionaries of all stripes successfully took advantage of this Khrushchev time bomb explosion, false documents about Katyn, for their base subversive purposes. The leader of the notorious Solidarity Lech Wałęsa was the first to respond to Gorbachev's repentance. They put a finger in his mouth. He bit his hand, LB, he proposed to resolve other important problems, to reconsider the assessments of post-war Polish-Soviet relations, including the role of the Polish National Liberation Committee created in July 1944, the treaties concluded with the USSR, because they were allegedly based on criminal principles, to punish those responsible for the genocide, to allow free access to the burial places of Polish officers, and most importantly, of course, to compensate for material damage to the families and relatives of the victims. On April 28, 1990, a representative of the government spoke in the same of Poland with information that negotiations with the government of the USSR on the issue of monetary compensation were already underway and that at the moment it was important to compile a list of all those claiming such payments. According to official data, there were up to 800,000 and the vile action of Khrushchev Gorbachev ended with the dispersal of the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, the dissolution of the Military Union of the Warsaw Pact countries, and the liquidation of the Eastern European Socialist camp. Moreover, it was believed, the West would dissolve NATO in a response, but, figs to you, NATO is doing drong na asen, brazenly absorbing the countries of the former Eastern European Socialist camp. However, Back to the kitchen of creating a special folder. A. Shilipen began by breaking the seal and entering the sealed room, where records were kept for 21,857 prisoners and internees of Polish nationality since September 1939. In a letter to Khrushchev dated March 3, 1959, justifying the uselessness of this archival material by the fact that all accounting files are of neither operational interest nor historical value. The newly minted Czechist comes to the conclusion, based on the foregoing, it seems appropriate to destroy all accounting files on persons, attention, 
shot in 1940 for the said operation. This is how the lists of executed Polish officers appeared in Caden. Subsequently, the son of Lavrin Tiberia reasonably remarks, during Joruzelski's official visit to Moscow, Gorbachev handed him only copies of the lists of the former main director for prisoners of war and internees of the NKVD of the USSR found in Soviet archives. The copies contain the names of Polish citizens who were in 1939 to 1940 in the Kozelski, Astashkovsky and Staroblsky camps of the NKVD. None of these documents mentions the participation of the NKVD in the execution of prisoners of war. The second document from the Khrushchev Shilipin special folder was not at all difficult to fabricate, since there was a detailed digital report by the People's Commissar of Internal Affairs of the USSR Alberia. IV. Stalin about the Polish prisoners of war. Shilipin had only one thing left to do, to come up with and print out the operative part where Beria allegedly demands execution for all prisoners of war from the camps and prisoners held in prisons in the western regions of Ukraine and Belarus without summoning those arrested and without bringing charges. The benefit of typewriters in the former NKVD the USSR has not yet been decommissioned. However, Shilipin did not dare to forge Beria's signature, leaving this document in a cheap anonymous litter. But his operative part, copied word for word, will fall into the next document, which the literate Shilipin will call in his letter to Khrushchev decree of the Central Committee of the CPSU, of March 5, 1940, and this lapses Kalamai, this the typo in the letter still sticks out like an all from a bag, and, indeed, how can one correct archival documents, even if they were invented two decades after the event? LB. Dot. True. This main document itself on the involvement of the party is designated as an extract from the minutes of the meeting of the Politburo of the Central Committee. Decision dated May 3, 1940. The Central Committee of which party? In all party documents, without exception, the entire abbreviation was always indicated in full. Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, LB. Most surprising of all. This document was left unsigned. And on this anonymous letter, instead of a signature, there are only two words, Secretary of the Central Committee. And that's it. This is how Khrushchev paid the Polish leadership for the head of his worst personal enemy Stepan Bandera, who spoiled him a lot of blood when Nikita Sergeyevich was the first leader of Ukraine. Khrushchev did not understand another thing, that the price he had to pay Poland for this, in general, irrelevant by the time, terrorist attack was immeasurably higher, in fact, it was equal to the revision of the decisions of the Tehran, Yalta and Potsdam conferences on the post-war structure of the state of Poland and other Eastern European countries. Nevertheless, the false special folder fabricated by Khrushchev and Shilipin, covered with archival dust, waited in the wings three decades later. Gorbachev, the enemy of the Soviet people, pecked at her. As we have already seen, the ardent enemy of the Soviet people, Yeltsin, also pecked at her. The latter tried to use the Katyn fakes at the meetings of the Constitutional Court of the RSFSR, dedicated to the case of the CPSU initiated by him. These fakes were presented by the notorious figures of the Yeltsin era, Shakrai and Makarov. However, even the accommodating Constitutional Court could not recognize these fakes as genuine documents and did not mention them anywhere in its decisions. Khrushchev and Shilipin did a dirty job. A paradoxical position on the Katyn case was taken by Sergio Beria. His book My Father is Lavrin Tiberia was signed for publication on April 18, 1994, and the documents from the special folder were, as we already know, made public in January 1993. It is unlikely that Beria's son was not aware of this, although he makes a similar appearance. But his all from the bag is an almost exact reproduction of the figure of the Khrushchev number of prisoners of war shot in Kaden, 21,857, Khrushchev, and 20,857, S. Beria. In his attempt to whitewash his father, he recognizes the fact of the Katyn massacre by the Soviet side. But at the same time he blames the system and agrees that his father was allegedly ordered to hand over the captured Polish officers of the Red Army within a week, and the execution itself was allegedly entrusted to hold the leadership of the People's Commissariat of Defense, that is, Klimvor Shilov, and adds that this is the truth that is carefully hidden to this day. The fact remains. 
The father refused to participate in the crime, although he knew that saving these 20,857 lives was already unable to. I know for sure that my father motivated his fundamental disagreement with the execution of Polish officers in writing. Where are these documents? The late Sergo Lavrentievich correctly stated that these documents do not exist because there never was. Instead of proving the inconsistency of recognizing the involvement of the Soviet side in the Hitlerite Gubal's provocation in the Katyn case and exposing Khrushchev's cheap stuff, Sergo Beria saw this as a selfish chance to take revenge on the party which, in his words, always knew how to put a hand to dirty things and at an opportunity to shift the responsibility to anyone, but not to the top party leadership. That is, Sergo Berio also contributed to the big lie about Caden, as we see. A careful reading of the report of the head of the NKVD Lavrenti Berio draws attention to the following absurdity. The report gives digital calculations about 14,700 people from among the former Polish officers, officials landowners, policemen, intelligence officers, gendarmes who are in prisoner of war camps, siegemen and jailers. Hence, Gorbachev's figure, about 15,000 executed Polish officers, LB, as well as about 11,000 people arrested and in prisons in the western regions of Ukraine and Belarus, members of various counter-revolutionary and sabotage organizations, former landowners, manufacturers and defectors. In total, therefore, 25,700. The same figure also appears in the allegedly mentioned above extract from the meeting of the Politburo of the Central Committee, since it was rewritten into a fake document without proper critical reflection. But in this regard, it is difficult to understand Shilipin's statement that 21,857 records were kept in the secret sealed room and that all 21,857 Polish officers were shot. First, as we have seen, not all of them were officers. According to Lavrenti Beria's estimates, in general there were only a little over 4,000 army officers proper, generals, colonels and lieutenant colonels, 295, majors and captains, 2,080, lieutenants, second lieutenants and cornets, 604. This is in prisoner of war camps, and there were 1,207 former Polish prisoners of war in prisons. In total, therefore, 4,186 people. In the Big Encyclopedic Dictionary of the 1998 edition, it is written that, in the spring of 1940, the NKVD destroyed over 4,000 Polish officers in Katyn, and then, executions on the territory of Katyn were carried out during the occupation of the Smolensk region by Nazi troops. So who, in the end, carried out these ill-fated executions, the Nazis, the NKVD, or, as the son of Lavrenti Beria claims, parts of the regular Red Army. Secondly, there is a clear discrepancy between the number of shot, 21,857 and the number of people who were ordered to be shot, 25,700. It is permissible to ask how it could happen that 3,843 Polish officers turned out to be unaccounted for, which department fed them during their lifetime. On what means did they live? And who dared to spare them if the bloodthirsty secretary of the Central Committee ordered to shoot all the officers to the last? And the last. In the materials fabricated in 1959 on the Katyn case, it is stated that the Troika was the court for the unfortunate. Khrushchev forgot that, in accordance with the decree of the Central Committee of the All Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks of November 17, 1938, on arrests, prosecutorial supervision, and investigation, judicial troikas were liquidated. This happened a year and a half before the Katyn massacre, which was incriminated to the Soviet authorities. The truth about Katyn After the shamefully failed campaign against Warsaw, undertaken by Tukhashevsky, obsessed with the Trotskyist idea of a world revolutionary fire, the western lands of Ukraine and Belarus were ceded to bourgeois Poland from Soviet Russia under the Riga Peace Treaty of 1921. And this soon led to the forcible polonization of the population so unexpectedly acquired for free territories, to the closure of Ukrainian and Belarusian schools, to the transformation of Orthodox churches into Catholic churches, to the expropriation of fertile lands from the peasants and their transfer to the Polish landowners, to lawlessness and arbitrariness, to persecution on national and religious grounds, to the brutal suppression of any manifestations of popular discontent.
That is why Western Ukrainians and Belarusians, having drunk on bourgeois Greater Poland lawlessness, longing for Bolshevik social justice and genuine freedom, as their liberators and deliverers, as relatives, met the Red Army when it came to their region on September 17, 1939, and all its actions to liberate the Western Ukraine and Western Belarus lasted 12 days. Polish military units and formations of troops, with almost no resistance, surrendered. The Polish government of Kozlowski, who fled to Romania on the eve of the capture of Warsaw by Hitler, actually betrayed his people, and the new Polish government in exile, headed by General V. Sikorsky, was formed in London on September 30, 1939, i.e. two weeks after the national catastrophe. By the time of the perfidious attack of fascist Germany on the USSR, 389,382 Poles were kept in Soviet prisons, camps and places of exile. From London, the fate of Polish prisoners of war, who were used mainly for road construction work, was very closely followed, so that if they were shot by the Soviet authorities in the spring of 1940, as the false Goebbels propaganda trumpeted to the whole world, it would be timely known through diplomatic channels and would cause a great international outcry. In addition, Sikorsky, seeking rapprochement with IV, Stalin, sought to present himself in the best possible light, played the role of a friend of the Soviet Union, which again excludes the possibility of a massacre perpetrated by the Bolsheviks over Polish prisoners of war in the spring of 1940. Nothing indicates the presence of a historical situation that could be an incentive for such an action by the Soviet side. At the same time, the Germans had such an incentive in August to September 1941 after the Soviet ambassador in London, Ivan Maisky, concluded a friendship treaty between the two governments with the Poles on July 30, 1941, according to which General Sikorsky was to form from prisoners of war compatriots in the Russian army under the command of a prisoner of war Polish general and years to participate in hostilities against Germany. This was the incentive for Hitler to liquidate Poles as enemies of the German nation, who, as he knew, had already been amnestied by the decree of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR of August 12, 1941 to 389,041 Poles, including future victims of Nazi atrocities, shot in the Katyn forest. The process of forming the National Polish Army under the command of General Anders was in full swing in the Soviet Union, and in quantitative terms it reached 76,110 people in six months. However, as it turned out later, Anders received instructions from Sikorsky, in no case should Russia be helped, but use the situation to the maximum advantage for the Polish nation. At the same time, Sikorsky convinces Churchill of the expediency of transferring Anders' army to the Middle East, about which the British Prime Minister writes to I.V. Stalin, and the leader gives his go-ahead, not only for the evacuation to Iran of the Anders' army itself, but also for the family members of military personnel in the amount of 43,755 people. It was clear to both Stalin and Hitler that Sikorsky was playing a double game. As tensions increased between Stalin and Sikorsky, there was a thaw between Hitler and Sikorsky. The Soviet-Polish friendship ended with a frank anti-Soviet statement by the head of the Polish government in exile on February 25, 1943, which said, that it does not want to recognize the historical rights of the Ukrainian and Belarusian peoples to unite in their national states. In other words, there was the fact of the brazen claims of the Polish emigre government to the Soviet lands, Western Ukraine and Western Belarus. In response to this statement, IV, Stalin formed from the Poles loyal to the Soviet Union, the Tadeusz Kościuszka division of 15,000 people. In October 1943, she was already fighting shoulder to shoulder with the Red Army. Division named after Tadeusz Kościuszka numbering 15,000 people. In October 1943, she was already fighting shoulder to shoulder with the Red Army. Division named after Tadeusz Kościuszka numbering 15,000 people. In October 1943, she was already fighting shoulder to shoulder with the Red Army. For Hitler. This statement was a signal to take revenge for the Leipzig process he lost to the communists in the case of the Reichstag fire, and he intensifies the activities of the police and the Gestapo of the Smolensk region to organize the Katyn provocation. Already on April 15, 
The German Information Bureau reported on the Berlin radio that the German occupation authorities had discovered in Kaden, near Smolensk, the graves of 11,000 Polish officers shot by Jewish commissars. The next day, the Soviet Information Bureau exposed the bloody machinations of the Nazi executioners, and on April 19, the Pravda newspaper wrote in an editorial, the Nazis invent some kind of Jewish commissars who allegedly participated in the murder of 11,000 Polish officers. It is not difficult for experienced masters of provocation to come up with several names of people who never existed. Such commissars as Lev Ryback, Avram Borisovich, Pavel Brodninsky, Chaim Finberg, named by the German Information Bureau, were simply invented by the Nazi swindlers since there were no such commissars either in the Smolensk branch of the GPU, or in general in the NKVD bodies and no. On April 28, 1943, Pravda published a note of the Soviet government on the decision to break off relations with the Polish government, which, in particular, stated that this hostile campaign against the Soviet state was undertaken by the Polish government in order to use the Hitlerite slanderous fake to put pressure on the Soviet government in order to wrest territorial concessions from it at the expense of the interests of Soviet Ukraine, Soviet Belarus, and Soviet Lithuania. Immediately after the expulsion of the Nazi invaders from Smolensk, September 25, 1943, IV. Stalin sends a special commission to the crime scene to establish and investigate the circumstances of the shooting of Polish officers of war by the Nazi invaders in the Katyn Forest. The commission included, a member of the Extraordinary State Commission, CHGK investigated the atrocities of the Nazis in the occupied territories of the USSR and scrupulously calculated the damage caused by them. LB, Academician Annen Burdenko. Chairman of the Special Commission for Kaden, members of the CHGK, Academician Alexei Tolstoy and Metropolitan Nikolai, Chairman of the All Slavic Committee, Lieutenant General A.S. Gundrov, Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Union of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies S.A. Kolnikov, People's Commissar of Education of the USSR, Academician V.P. Potemkin, Head of the Main Military Sanitary Directorate of the Red Army. Colonel General Lee Smirnov, Chairman of the Smolensk Regional Executive Committee R.E. Melnikov, to fulfill the task assigned to it, the commission attracted the best forensic experts in the country, the chief forensic expert of the People's Commissariat of Health of the USSR, director of the Research Institute of Forensic Medicine V.I. Prozirovsky, head, Department of Forensic Medicine of the 2nd Moscow Medical Institute V.M. Smolyaninov senior researchers of the Research Institute of Forensic Medicine P.S. Simonovsky and M.D. Shveikov, chief pathologist of the front, major of the medical service, Professor D.N. Virpeva, day and night, tirelessly, for four months, the authoritative commission conscientiously investigated the details of the Katyn case. On January 26, 1944, the most convincing report of a special commission was published in all the central newspapers, which did not leave a stone unturned from the Hitler myth of Katyn and revealed to the whole world a true picture of the atrocities of the Nazi invaders against Polish prisoners of war officers. However, in the midst of the Cold War, the U.S. Congress again makes an attempt to revive the Katyn issue, even creating the so-called A Commission to Investigate the Katyn Case headed by Congressman Madden. On March 3, 1952, Pravda published a note to the U.S. State Department dated February 29, 1952, which, in particular, stated, Thus generally recognized Nazi criminals, it is characteristic that a special Katyn Commission of the U.S. Congress was created simultaneously with the approval of the appropriation of $100 million for sabotage and espionage activities in Poland, L.B. The note was accompanied by the republished in Pravda on March 3, 1952, the full text of the message of the Burdenko Commission, which collected extensive material obtained as a result of a detailed study of the corpses recovered from the graves and those documents and material evidence that were found on the corpses and in the graves. At the same time, the Burdenko Special Commission interviewed numerous witnesses from the local population whose testimony accurately established the time and circumstances of the crimes committed by the German invaders. First of all, the message gives information about what the Katyn Forest is. For a long time, 
The Katyn Forest has been a favorite place where the people of Smolensk usually spent their holidays. The local population grazed cattle in the Katyn Forest and procured fuel for themselves. There were no prohibitions or restrictions on access to the Katyn Forest. Back in the summer of 1941, the pioneer camp of Promstrak Kassa was located in this forest which was closed only in July 1941 with the capture of Smolensk by the German invaders. The forest began to be guarded by reinforced patrols, in many places there were inscriptions warning that persons entering the forest without a special pass were subject to shooting on the spot. Particularly strictly guarded was that part of the Katyn forest, which was called the Goat Mountains, as well as the territory on the banks of the Dnieper where at a distance of 700 meters from the discovered graves of Polish prisoners of war there was a summer house, a rest house of the Smolensk department of the NKVD. Upon the arrival of the Germans, a German military institution was located in this dacha, hiding under the code name headquarters of the 537th Construction Battalion, which also appeared in the documents of the Nuremberg Trials, LB. From the testimony of the peasant Kaisliov, Born in 1870, the officer stated that, according to the information available to the Gestapo, the NKVD officers shot Polish officers in 1940 at the Kozy Gori section, and asked me what evidence I could give about this. I replied that I had never heard of the NKVD carrying out executions in the Kozy Gori, and it was hardly possible at all, I explained to the officer, since the Goat Gori is a completely open crowded place and if they were shot there then about this would be known to the entire population of nearby villages. Kaislyov and others told how false testimony was literally knocked out of them with rubber truncheons and threats of execution, which later appeared in a book superbly published by the German Foreign Ministry, in which materials fabricated by the Germans on the Katyn case were placed. In addition to Kaislyov, Godezov, aka Godnov, Silverstov, Andreev, Zigulev, Krivozertsev, Zakharov were named as witnesses in this book. The Burdenko Commission found that Godezov and Silverstov died in 1943, before the liberation of the Smolensk region by the Red Army. Andreev, Zigulev and Krivozertsev left with the Germans. The last of the witnesses named by the Germans, Zakharov, who worked under the Germans as a headman in the village of Novi Batek, told the Burdenko Commission that he was first beaten until he lost consciousness, and then, when he came to, the officer demanded to sign the protocol of interrogation, and he, faint-hearted, under the influence of beatings and threats of execution, he gave false testimony and signed the protocol. The Nazi command understood that for such a large-scale provocation witnesses were clearly not enough, and it distributed among the inhabitants of Smolensk and the surrounding villages an appeal to the population, which was published in the newspaper New Way published by the Germans in Smolensk. Number 35, 157, of May 6, 1943, you can give data about the mass murder committed by the Bolsheviks in 1940 over captured Polish officers and priests, this is something new, LB, in the Goat Mountains Forest, near the Nizdovo Katyn Highway, who observed the vehicles from Nizdovo to Goat Mountains or who saw or heard the executions, who knows the residents who can tell about it, every report will be rewarded, to the credit of Soviet citizens, no one pecked at the reward for giving the false testimony needed by the Germans in the Katyn case, of the documents discovered by forensic experts relating to the second half of 1940 and spring-summer 1941. The following deserve special attention. 1. On Corpse No. 92 Letter from Warsaw, addressed to the Red Cross in the Central Bank of Prisoners of War, Moscow, Street, Kubishova, 12. The letter is written in Russian. In this letter, Sofia Zygon asks for the whereabouts of her husband, Tomasz Zygon. The letter is dated 12.09. 1940. The stamp on the envelope is Warsaw. 09.1940 in the stamp, Moscow, Post Office, Expedition 9, 8.10. 1940, as well as a resolution in red ink. Uck. Set up a camp and send for delivery, November 15, 1940. Signature is illegible. 2. On the corpse number 4 postcard, custom number 0112 from Tarnopol with a postmark Tarnopol 12. 11.40 The handwriting and address are discolored. 3. 
on the corpse number 101, receipt number 10293 dated December 19, 1939, issued by the Kozelski camp about the acceptance of a gold watch from Lewandowski Edward Adamovich. On the back of the receipt there is an entry dated March 14, 1941 about the sale of this watch to Uvler Torg. 4. On corpse number 53, unsent postcard in Polish with the address, Warsaw, Bagatla 15. Apartment 47, Irina Kuczynskia, dated June 20, 1941. It must be said that in preparation for their provocation, the German occupation authorities used up to 500 Russian prisoners of war to work on digging graves in the Katyn forest, extracting documents and material evidence incriminating them, who, after doing this work, were shot by the Germans. From the message of the Special Commission for the Establishment and Investigation of the Circumstances of the Execution of Polish Officers of War by the Nazi Invaders in the Katyn Forest, conclusions from the testimony and forensic medical examination about the execution of Polish prisoners of war by the Germans in the autumn of 1941 are fully confirmed by material evidence and documents extracted from the Katyn graves. This is the truth about Katyn, the irrefutable truth of the fact. Chapter 14, Annika Warrior In his indomitable desire to slander the great personality of I.V. Stalin, oust him from the historical space and fill this space with his own person, Nikita Khrushchev, in fact, was the very first in the USSR who swung at the truth about the Great Patriotic War laying the foundation for the school falsifications and myth-making about this war. And although by now the historical truth has been documented for each item of the accusations of I.V. Stalin Khrushchev, the latest archival documents are opened, which are falling apart, like a house of cards. The notorious Khrushchev report at the 20th Congress, however, the mass consciousness, which also survived the second targeted attack of the anti-Stalinists of the Gorbachev era, is already so poisoned that only time can heal it. Khrushchev saw his most important task in reducing, if possible, to zero the role of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief and, as Radio Liberty would say in 1996 in a series of programs dedicated to the 40th anniversary of the 20th Congress and Khrushchev's report on the cult of personality and its consequences, looking at the best portrait of Stalin, draw his worst caricature? If only, if only, here are examples of Khrushchev's slander, scattered here and there on the pages of his memoirs, and now, the quote refers to 1966 i.e. ten years after the 20th Congress and five, after the removal of the body of I.V. Stalin from the mausoleum, L.B. There are people who literally tremble in front of Stalin's crap underpants, still stand in front of him. About Marshal of the Soviet Union I.S. Konev, I can't reconcile myself with how a cultured person could agree with the nonsense that was invented by Stalin. Marshal Zakharov opened the Stalinist movement in the mid-1960s. Marshal Konev walks along his path, and Gretschko trails behind them on his long stilts. It's a shame, or these pearls, if there had been no Stalin, then the war would have developed more successfully for us. Under different sauces, this verbal dish is Khrushchev's favorite in the kitchen, LB. Dot. On the alleged unpreparedness of the USSR for war, I explained this by the failure of Stalin's will, his demoralization. He was demoralized by the victories that Hitler won in the West, and our failure in the war with the Finns. He was already standing in front of Hitler, like a rabbit in front of a boa constrictor, he was paralyzed in his actions. Stalin before the war became, as it were, gloomier. There was more thoughtfulness on his face. He himself began to drink more and get others drunk, literally get drunk. If Stalin had died by the beginning of the Second World War, that is, by 1939, then the Great Patriotic War could have gone in a different direction. If we had listened to Lenin's advice and removed Stalin from power, then the war to save the USSR would have cost us many times less than it cost under the dear father, the greatest and brilliant leader. Khrushchev's memoirs are literally crammed with sentences in the subjunctive mood and, by the number of if only, if only could enter the Guinness Book of Records. But the last conclusion is very curious. And what if V.I. Lenin, indeed, proposed in his testament to elect to the post of General Secretary instead of I.V. Stalin, a young, promising political instructor of the Yuzovsky Mining College, where he never managed to master his studies, and a greater Leninist than Lenin himself? 
Nikita Khrushchev, than in the USSR in the war there really would not have been such losses, Khrushchev would have surrendered the Soviet Union to Hitler with giblets without a fight. How Kiev passed? How did Kharkiv pass? In the days of great tribulations, during the 34 years that have passed since the 20th Congress, with millions of copies of books, numerous articles in newspapers and magazines, on radio and television, as the ultimate truth, the anti-historical version of Khrushchev, who all the troubles of the beginning of the war associated with the inaction and paralysis of the will of the leader, and all the victories in the great patriotic war either shamefully hushed up, or blasphemously claimed that they were committed by the Soviet people not thanks to, but contrary to the will of Stalin. Finally, in the sixth issue of the journal Izvestia of the Central Committee of the CPSU for 1990, a publication appeared under the heading from the Notebook of Recording Persons Admitted by I.V. Stalin on June 21, 28, 1941, which completely refuted Khrushchev's slanderous fabrications about prostration confusion and inaction of I.V. Stalin in the first days of the war. Here is an entry dated June 22, 1941. A total of 15 response workers visited this Gremlin office, but there were 29 entries in the notebook that day, since some were accepted by Stalin several times. Table removed, see original. The head of the Comintern, Georgi Dimitrov, made the following entry in his diary on June 22, 1941. Molotov. Vogar Shilov, Kaganovich and Malenkov were at the meeting in the office of I.V. Stalin. Amazing calmness, firmness and confidence in Stalin and everyone else. M. Kyilev S.43 L.B. Table removed, see original. Like this, the technical secretary was sitting at the table and, looking at his watch, noted in the journal every minute who and when in the office of I.V. Stalin came in, who and when left. And thanks to him because it helps a lot in exposing the big lie, which, with the light hand of Khrushchev, piled up around the name and deeds of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin. This was the way it was done, and in 1994 to 1997, the Historical Archives magazine published the notebooks of visitors to I.V. Stalin's Kremlin office for all the years of his reign, which will help future Stalinist researchers crush the bastions of lies, which, saying in the words of I.V. Stalin, they guard the truth. LB. Dot. The result of the work of the first day of the war is the directive of the People's Commissar of Defense of the USSR to the military councils of the Leningrad, Baltic, Kiev and Odessa military districts on repelling an attack from Germany on the USSR. Sent at 7.15 a.m. Signed by People's Commissar of Defense Tymashenko, member of the main military council Malenkov and chief of the general staff of the Red Army Zhukov. Deputy Chairman of the Council of People's Commissars and People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs VM, Molotov, who left the office at 12.05 and returned at 12.55, spoke on the radio with an appeal to the Soviet people prepared in Stalin's office, in which he informed citizens and citizens of the Soviet Union that the Soviet government and its head, comrade, Stalin instructed him to make a statement that today, at 4 o'clock in the morning, Without presenting any claims against the Soviet Union, without declaring war, German troops attacked our country. Molotov ended his speech with the words of I.V. Stalin, which became the motto of the Great Patriotic War. Our cause is just. The enemy will be defeated. Victory will be ours. On the same day, June 22, the regulations on military tribunals in areas declared under martial law were prepared. So, on June 22, on the first day of the war, I.V. Stalin worked continuously for 11 consecutive hours, after which he left to rest, and at 3 a.m. on June 23 he again began work in his Kremlin office, where he held a three-hour night meeting with members of the Politburo, Molotov, Vogershilov, Beria, Kaganovich and with the military, Tymoshenko, Vachutin, Kuznetsov, and Zagrev. The result of this meeting is the preparation and signing by I.V. Stalin of the resolution of the Council of People's Commissars of the USSR and the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks on the creation of the headquarters of the High Command of the Armed Forces of the USSR as part of the People's Commissar of Defense Marshal Tymoshenko, Chairman, Chief of the General Stazhukov, Stalin, Molotov, Marshal Voroshilov, 
Marshal Budiani and People's Commissar of the Navy Admiral Kuznetsov. But this body and this composition will not last long, until July 10. Already on June 30, IVLB, in the evening of the same day, i.e. on June 23, he again came to the Kremlin and from 18.45 to half past one on the night of June 24, he hosted the military, people's commissars and members of the Politburo. On the same day from 16.20 to 21.30 he received 20 people. From 1 in the morning on June 25 until almost 6 a.m., he spent at work in his office. Then he rested until 19.00. And at 19.40 the technical secretary let IV, Stalin Molotov and Vo Rishilov, the last two visitors, Voznesensky and Vyshinsky, left the office at 1 in the morning. June 26 IV, Stalin with LM, Koganovich entered the office at 12.10. Half an hour later they were joined by Malenkov, Budiani, Zagrev, and Vo Rishilov. In total, IV, Stalin 28 people, the last ones left at 23.20. The most intense day of IV, Stalin spent Friday, June 27, working without a break for 10 hours, he held meetings and discussions with 30 response workers. The day ended at about 3 a.m. The leader left for the near dacha only at dawn. June 28 IV, Stalin entered the office along with Molotov, Malenkov and Budiani at 19.35. Ten minutes later they were joined by the Minister of State Security Merkulov. On this day, the leader received 21 people. And at 0.50 minutes Molotov, Beria and Mikoyan left the office together with Stalin. Remember that N.A. Voznesensky was at the reception of I.V. Stalin, according to the notebooks on June 23, 24th, 25th and 27th and in total communicated with the leader for 8 hours and 15 minutes. This will come in handy for us, LB. June 29th and 30th IV, Stalin did not receive in the Kremlin. On this day, he prepared a document of particular importance, the directive of the Council of People's Commissars of the USSR and the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks to the party and Soviet organizations of the frontline regions on the mobilization of all forces and means to defeat the fascist invaders, which played a huge role in organizing the rebuff to the Nazis. Many provisions of this document will form the basis of IV. Stalin on July 3, 1941. Another event on Sunday, June 29th and this was the seventh day of the war, is the story of Anastas Mikoyan to the historian G. Kumenev that Molotov, Malenkov, Beria and I gathered at Stalin's Kremlin. Everyone was interested in the situation on the Western Front, in Belarus, but detailed data on the situation on the territory of this republic had not yet been received. It was only known that there was no connection with the troops of the Western Front. Stalin called Marshal Tymashenko to the People's Commissariat of Defense. It must be remembered that it was Marshal Tymashenko who was the chairman of the Stavka, LB. However, he could not say anything specific about the situation in the western direction. Alarmed by such a course of affairs, Stalin suggested that we all go to the People's Commissariat of Defense and deal with the situation on the spot. Tymashenko, Jukov and Vachutin were in the People's Commissar's office. Stalin kept calm, asking where the command of the front was what kind of connection he had with him. Jukov, chief of the general staff, LB, reported that the connection was lost and it was not possible to restore it for the whole day. Then Stalin asked other questions. Why did the Germans allow a breakthrough? What measures were taken to establish communications? And so on. We talked quite calmly for about half an hour. Then Stalin exploded. What kind of general staff? What kind of chief of the general staff? who is so confused that he has no connection with the troops, does not represent anyone and does not command anyone. Since there is no connection, the general staff is powerless to lead. Jukov, of course, was no less worried about the state of affairs than Stalin, and such a shout from Stalin was insulting to him. And this courageous man could not stand it, burst into tears like a woman and quickly went into another room. Molotov followed him. We were all in a dejected state. After five to ten minutes, Molotov brought Zhukov, outwardly calm, but still with moist eyes. Kumineves.28-29 This is Mikoyan's version. And Molotov told the writer Ivan Stadniuk this, a quarrel broke out the hardest, 
with swearing and threats. Stalin swore at Tymoshenko, Zhukov, and Vachutin, called them mediocrity, non-entities, company clerks, footcloths. Nervous tension also affected the military. Tymoshenko and Zhukov also said in the heat of the moment a lot of insulting things against the leader. It ended up that the white-faced Zhukov sent Stalin to his mother and demanded to immediately leave the office and not interfere with them to study the situation, which they did not own, LB, and make decisions, which they could not make, because they did not control the situation, L. B. Amazed by such impotence of the military, Beria tried to stand up for the leader, but Stalin, without saying goodbye to anyone, headed for the exit. Then he immediately went to the country. Early in the morning of June 30, 1941, Stalin arrived in the Kremlin with a decision. All power in the country passes to the State Defense Committee headed by him, Stalin. On the same day, People's Commissar of Defense Tymoshenko was removed from Moscow and sent to Smolensk, the commander of the Western Front. The first deputy chief of the general staff, Lt. Gen. Vachutin, was appointed chief of staff of the Northwestern Front. Of the three high-ranking military men who participated in yesterday's major quarrel, chief of the general staff Zhukov remained in Moscow for a short time. Such were the consequences of the scandalous incident in the building of the People's Commissariat of Defense late in the evening of June 29, 1941. Zankovich too writes about this, p. 115. If we take into account Zankovich's version that the leader returned early in the morning on June 30, then there was no trace of any visit of the retinue to the near dacha. More on this below, LB. From July 1st, working receptions in the Kremlin office of IV, Stalin resumed. And the most intense, in the most direct sense, days and nights lasted all 1,418 days of the Great Patriotic War. Here is how the writer Anatoly Marchenko describes IV. Stalin in the initial period of the war in his book Stalin, M. Armada 1997, p. 419 to 420, even in peaceful days. Stalin did not recognize any inaction. Now he has completely forgotten about rest. Every day he lived was filled with continuous action, continuous work of the brain, continuous decision making regarding the situation on the fronts, the situation in the rear, the situation in external relations. It was necessary to stop the enemy as soon as possible, in the shortest possible time to establish the production of tanks, aircraft. Weapons at factories evacuated from the European part of the country to the Urals and Siberia, in the shortest possible time to convince, and even force the Allies to open a second front in Europe, in the shortest possible time to forge new cadres, in the army, in industry, in the party. The doors of his office now practically did not close. The front commanders left the office, aircraft designers came, people's commissars left, tank designers appeared. Scientists left, foreign figures and diplomats appeared. Every now and then there were meetings, 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 sometimes in a narrow, sometimes in an expanded circle. Directives, orders and orders were born, subject to immediate execution, the violation of which was followed by the most severe punishment. Dot. Even Volkogonov was forced to admit that during the first period of the war, Stalin worked 16 to 18 hours a day. Dozens of documents of a military, political, ideological and economic nature were reported to him every day, which, after his signature, became orders, directives, resolutions, decisions. A lot of various operational, personnel, technical, intelligence, military economic, diplomatic, political issues were considered by Stalin daily in his office. Thousands of documents bearing Stalin's signature set in motion huge masses of people. D. Volkogonov. Stalin. Political Portrait. Book 2. M. 1997. P. 180 to 181. Such is the historical IV. Stalin, and not his caricature which his ill-wishers have created over half a century. Stalin through the eyes of Khrushchev and his followers. For a correct assessment of the report on the cult of personality and its consequences, it is important to remember that the section on the war is built mainly on gossip, from hearsay, since Khrushchev did not live in Moscow at that time, and therefore could not know how IV behaved Stalin in the early days of the war. N. Khrushchev found the beginning of the war in Kiev. Then, 
with the Red Army, he went all the way to Stalingrad, and then back to Kiev, where he remained until the celebration of the 70th anniversary of I.V. Stalin in December 1949, when the leader, to his misfortune, deciding to leave him near him, told him, you turn into an ordinary Ukrainian agronomist. It's time to go back to work in Moscow, i.e. the war for Khrushchev did not end on May 9, 1945, but much earlier, namely, on November 6, 1943, that is, on the day of the liberation of Kiev. The ungrateful Khrushchev, speaking of the fact of his recall to Moscow, will once again say nasty things about the leader in his dictations. The motivation for recalling me from Ukraine to Moscow in 1949, in my opinion, is the result of some kind of mental disorder in Stalin, LB. The main source of information for Khrushchev is usually, in his words, Beria, already soaked by him, who could neither confirm nor refute anything. I often recall Beria's story about Stalin's behavior on June 22, 1941 when he was informed about the start of the war. So often that in his book of memoirs Khrushchev almost verbatim cites it twice, once, in the chapter The Difficult Summer of 1941, the other time, in the chapter My Reflections on Stalin. Dot. So, the most important event for Nikita Sergeyevich about the war, which he often recalls, well, very often, much more often than it should be, not May 9, 1945, not the victory parade on June 24, 1945, not the liberation of Kiev, but stories about what Stalin did in the first days, weeks, months after Hitler's invasion, how he looked, what his moral and psychological state was. I would advise future researchers of Khrushchev's biography to conduct a small psychoanalytic examination of his relationship to I.V. Stalin, L.B. Khrushchev at the 20th Congress broadcast, it would be wrong not to say that after the first heavy setbacks and defeats on the fronts, Stalin believed that the end had come. In one of the conversations, he said, what Lenin created, we have irretrievably lost. After that, for a long time he did not actually direct military operations and did not start business at all and returned to leadership only when some members of the Politburo came to him. Visit of the Red New on June 30, L.B and said that it is necessary to take urgent measures in order to improve the situation. N.K.H. From a report at the 20th Congress, op, quoted from, News of the Central Committee of the CPSU. 1989. Number 3. Khrushchev allowed the juggling of facts, violated the sequence of events and chronology, and this was done deliberately, in order to mislead the masses of people for an indefinitely long time. L.B. But first of all, Let's give the opportunity to recall this episode to Khrushchev Mikoyan. Molotov said that Stalin in the last two days, meaning June 29th, Sunday, and June 30th, Monday, LB, in such prostration, that is not interested in anything, does not show any initiative, is in a bad state. Then Voznesensky, outraged by everything he heard, said, Vyacheslav, go ahead, we will follow you, that is, in the sense that if Stalin continues to behave this way, then Molotov should lead us, and we will follow him. Other members of the Politburo did not make such statements and did not pay attention to Voznesensky's statement. We had confidence that we could organize the defense and fight for real. However, this will not be so easy to do. We did not have any decadent mood. Let's analyze this text. Zinkovich, who is skeptical about this episode claims that I.V. Stalin arrived in the Kremlin after the showdown in the People's Commissariat of Defense early in the morning on June 30th with a ready decision to create a state defense committee. I accept another option. Excited members of the Politburo Molotov and Mikoyan and candidate members of the Politburo Malenkov and Beria, who were present at the incident in the People's Commissariat of Defense on the evening of June 29th, Dejected by the fact that I.V. Stalin left for the dacha in a depressed state, they decided to wait until the morning, so that later they could go to him and collectively decide what to do next. And Stalin returned to the Kremlin with a ready decision not in the morning, as Zankovich believes, but in the afternoon after the meeting at the dacha. Therefore, Molotov could not discover America in any way. Speaking of the prostration of I.V. Stalin, because he remained in Moscow on June 29 in the evening with the rest of Stalin's retinue, 
and the leader left for the dacha. Based on the logic of the text, Molotov was supposed to meet with Stalin after the incident at the People's Commissariat of Defense, which is impossible, because in this case Molotov had to accompany Stalin to the dacha. It can be assumed that Voznesensky joined the four named leaders, but Mikoyan's words in this part of the text cannot be recognized as reliable, because they blur time boundaries and the reader gets the impression that Voznesensky had not communicated with Stalin since June 22 and therefore was outraged by what he heard, that is, about the inaction of IV. Stalin from the beginning of Hitler's attack on the USSR. How could the active Khrushchevite, a delegate to the 20th Congress, Mikoyan, know that 12 years after his death, a document would appear that would irrefutably prove how closely Stalin and Voznesensky communicated all these days. Most likely, the figure of Voznesensky played the same role for Mikoyan's fantasy that the figure of Beria played for Khrushchev. He died long ago, and therefore there was no one to refute him, Mikoyan's lie. If, nevertheless, we allow Voznesensky's presence at Stalin's dacha that day, then to give political meaning to the common phrase, they say, you go first, and we will come in after you. Mikoyan had no reason, especially since, by his own admission, other leaders, including Beria himself, did not make such statements and did not pay attention to Voznesensky's statement. But this purely subjective perception of the overvigilant Mikoyan unexpectedly gave the effect of a time bomb, many years later. Historians of the Khrushchev school of falsifications, led by Volkogonov, composed a myth that members of the Politburo were determined and ready to nominate Molotov to the leadership of the party in the country if Stalin does not accept their plan. In the series of books Encyclopedia of Military Art in 1997, the book Generalissimo was published, wherein an article about IV, Stalin says, Stalin's confusion reached such an extent that he even expressed the idea of resigning. However, some of the modern researchers argue that such a trick of his was another trick. By this, he demonstrated to his associates his own greatness and indispensability. On June 30, members of the Politburo came to see him. According to one of the existing versions, he allegedly thought that they had come to arrest him. End of quote. Chapter 15 the conspiracy in the RKKA. Anatomy of a Big Lie. The main points of Stalin's accusation, put forward at the 20th Congress, revolved mainly around two points, repressions against army personnel, and around the supposedly bad organization of the country's preparation for war. Khrushchev said about the first moment at the 20th Congress. Very serious consequences, especially for the initial period of the war, had the fact that during 1937 to 1941, as a result of Stalin's suspicion, numerous cadres of army commanders and political workers were exterminated on slanderous accusations. Did Khrushchev, preparing for the rehabilitation of the head of the military Trotskyist Center in the Workers and Peasants Red Army, RKKA, that the conspiracy of Tukhashevsky and his associates in 1937 was by no means a falsified massacre of IV. Stalin over innocent victims, but took place in reality? Certainly he knew. The involvement of German intelligence in the reprisal of IV. Stalin over Marshal Tukhashevsky is a myth. If there had been such documents compromising Tukhashevsky and allegedly handed over to IV, Stalin. Khrushchev would have taken them out of the archives as one of the most powerful arguments in his fight against the cult of personality of IV. Stalin. All that he could present to the delegates of the 20th Congress was a slippery phrase, somehow a message slipped through the foreign press, as if, this document, supposedly secret, L.B. A fake, allegedly on the basis of which the gullible IV. Stalin began to carry out mass repressions in the Red Army which allegedly bled it on the eve of the war. But what a misfortune. There was no German fake, but there was a conspiracy. At a closed trial, it was established that Tukhashevsky had developed several options for a military coup, one of which provided for the penetration of the conspirators into the Kremlin and the liquidation of the leaders of the party and government. And having overthrown Stalin and the Soviet government, as well as all the organs of the party and Soviet power, the conspirators were to establish a military dictatorship in the future, to create an anti-communist national government associated with Germany and which had the goal of providing Germany with special privileges within the Soviet Union for her help and making territorial concessions to her in Ukraine. 
the existence of cooperation with the Germans was fully proven. And at the trial, the same Tukhashevsky told in detail that for a number of years there were constant contacts with the Reichs were both in Germany itself and in the USSR. Our military equipment was shown to the Germans. They had the opportunity to observe the changes taking place in the organization of troops, their equipment. And what significance could have the fact that all this, as Tukhashevsky said at the trial, was even before Hitler came to power. After all, the Fuhrer did not have a new general, and most of his generals who would participate in the war against the USSR were those friends of Tukhashevsky and his team whom the conspirators, being recruited by the AB, were intensively enlightened about the state of the defense of the USSR. In particular, at an expanded meeting of the Military Council under the People's Commissar of Defense of the USSR with the participation of members of the Politburo of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks, which took place from June 1 to 4, 1937 in the Kremlin, who spoke during the discussion of the report of K.E. Voroshilov on the counter-revolutionary conspiracy in the Red Army uncovered by the NKVD IV. Stalin said about Tukhashevsky. He handed over our operational plan, our operational plan, our holy of holies, to the German Reichs. Had meetings with representatives of the Reichs. Spy? Spy, LB. Similar testimonies were given at the trial by the former, candidate member of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks and member of the Central Executive Committee of the USSR, commander of the first rank, Yubarovich member of the Central Executive Committee of the USSR, head of the military academy named after M.V. Franz, commander of the second rank Cork, head of one of the main directorates of the Red Army, Commander Feldman, member of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks and the Central Executive Committee of the USSR, commander of the troops of the Kiev military district, commander of the first rank Yakir and military attaché in Great Britain until 1936 year, Commander Putna. In addition, Yakir studied in 1929 at the Academy of the General Staff of Germany, lectured there about the Red Army, and Cork for some time acted as a military attaché in Germany. All of them were recruited by the Abwehr and sent by their boss, the former leader of the Red Army Trotsky. Regarding participation in sabotage, Tukhashevsky, Yakir, Cork, Yubarovich explained that it was not without their knowledge, in fact, they organized sabotage, that the pace of construction of military facilities, the reconstruction of railway facilities, the formation of airborne units slowed down, there were many shortcomings and omissions in the combat training of the troops, in which they saw their direct fault in everything. It is known that Tukhashevsky was against the introduction of new models of military equipment, for example, the famous 76mm cannon by VG Gribben which forced the designer to seek help from I.V. Stalin, L.B. Dot. In the last word, the defendants declared their devotion to the cause of the revolution, the Red Army, and personally to Comrade Stalin. They repented. They asked for indulgence. But it all looked unconvincing. The last word of Commander Primakov, in essence, became an accusatory speech against the rest of the defendants, I must tell the last truth about our conspiracy. Neither in the history of our revolution, nor in the history of other revolutions, was there such a conspiracy as ours, neither in terms of goals, nor in composition, nor in terms of the means that the conspiracy chose for itself. Who is the conspiracy? Who was united by the fascist banner of Trotsky? It united all the counter-revolutionary elements, Everything that was counter-revolutionary in the Red Army, gathered in one place, under one banner, under the fascist banner of Trotsky. What means did this conspiracy choose for itself? All means, treason, betrayal, the defeat of one's country, sabotage, espionage, terror. For what purpose? To restore capitalism. There is only one way to break the dictatorship of the proletariat and replace it with a fascist dictatorship. What forces did the conspiracy gather in order to carry out this plan? I named more than 70 conspirators to the investigation, whom I myself recruited or knew in the course of the conspiracy. I made up my mind about the social face of the conspiracy, that is, what groups our conspiracy, leadership, 
Center of the conspiracy consists of the composition of the conspiracy of people who do not have deep roots in our Soviet country because each of them has his own second homeland. Each of them personally has a family abroad. Yeah, Kir has relatives in Bessarabia, Putna and Yubarovich have relatives in Lithuania. Feldman is no less connected with South America than with Odessa. Eidman is no less connected with the Baltic states than with our country. I made a judgment about the social face of the conspiracy, that is, what groups our conspiracy, leadership, center of the conspiracy consists of the composition of the conspiracy of people who do not have deep roots in our Soviet country because each of them has his own second homeland. Each of them personally has a family abroad. Yeah, Kir has relatives in Bessarabia, Putna and Yubarovich have relatives in Lithuania. Feldman is no less connected with South America than with Odessa. Eidman is no less connected with the Baltic states than with our country. I made a judgment about the social face of the conspiracy, that is, what groups our conspiracy, leadership, center of the conspiracy consists of the composition of the conspiracy of people who do not have deep roots in our Soviet country because each of them has his own second homeland. Each of them personally has a family abroad. Yeah, Kir has relatives in Bessarabia, Putna and Yubarovich have relatives in Lithuania. Feldman is no less connected with South America than with Odessa. Eidman is no less connected with the Baltic states than with our country. Dot. The Shvernik Commission, which dealt with rehabilitation issues on the instructions of Khrushchev, systematically informed its boss about the progress of its frills and acquainted him with the most important documents. As, for example, with this statement, written by Tukhashevsky himself to the People's Commissar of Internal Affairs Enai Yeshov, arrested on May 22, arriving in Moscow on May 24, interrogated for the first time on May 25, and today, May 26, I declare that I admit the existence of an anti-Soviet conspiracy and that I was at the head of it. I undertake to independently state to the investigation everything related to the conspiracy, without concealing any of its participants, not a single fact or document. The foundation of the conspiracy dates back to 1932. Participation in it was taken by Feldman, Alafyuzov, Primakov, Putna and others, which I will show in detail later. Tukhashevsky, 26. 5. 37. The application was selected by POM, beginning 5 Department of the GUGB, Captain of the State. Without Yushakov, signature. This statement was accompanied by Tukhashevsky's handwritten testimony on six and a half pages, where the former marshal admitted the presence in the army of a group of senior officers, selected by the personnel officer of the People's Commissariat of Defense Feldman and ready to carry out any order of Tukhashevsky. Contact with Trotsky was maintained through Primakov and Putna. The purpose of the conspiracy is the seizure of power in the army and in the country. The elimination of I.V. Stalin and K.E. Voroshilov. The next day, May 27, Tukhashevsky turned to investigator Yushakov with a request to give the stenographer an opportunity to dictate additions to his previous testimony, and he assured him with an honest word that he would not hide a single fact. And what happened on May 25, the day of the first interrogation of Tukhashevsky? On the first day, the former marshal, during face-to-face -face confrontations with Primakov, Putna, and Feldman, denied participation in the conspiracy. But he denied the charge in a very peculiar way. In a statement written by him immediately after the confrontations, we come across such amazing lines. I ask you to provide me with a couple more testimonies of other participants in this conspiracy, who also accuse me. I undertake to give frank testimony without the slightest concealment of anything from my own guilt in this case as well as from the guilt of other persons in the conspiracy. On the same day, a voting questionnaire was sent to members and candidate members of the Central Committee, in which I.V. Stalin proposed, on behalf of the Politburo, on the basis of incriminating data, to expel Tukhashevsky from the party and transfer their cases to the NKVD. All were in favor. J.V. Stalin personally followed the progress of the investigation in this case. Every day he received Yezhov. Read the protocols of interrogations of those under investigation. Feldman called Tukhashevsky, Yakir and Theranodnikov in his testimony, selected by investigator Yushakov, who wrote in a report to the NKVD, having taken Feldman's personal file and studied it, 
I realized that Feldman was connected by personal friendship with Tukhashevsky, Yakir and a number of major commanders. He summoned Feldman to the office, locked himself in the office with him, and by the evening of May 19, 1937, Feldman wrote a statement about a conspiracy involving Tukhashevsky, Yakir, Eidman and others. In the same statement, Yushakov accused the investigator Glebov, who began to knock Yakir to refuse to testify. I, writes Yushakov, restored Yakir. I returned him to his previous testimony, and Glebov was removed from further participation in the investigation. I was given the opportunity to interrogate Tukhashevsky, who already confessed to me on May 26. I also confidently went to Eidman and was not mistaken here either. Dot. Shvernik acquainted his boss Khrushchev with the contents of the note of the split arrested Commander Feldman to his investigator, to the assistant to the head of the 5th Department of the Gug Ben KVD of the USSR comrade Yushakov Zinovi Markovich. I wrote the beginning and ending of the statement at my own discretion. I am sure that you will call me to your place and personally indicate that it will not take long to rewrite. Thank you for your attention and care. On the 25th I received cookies apples and cigarettes and today cigarettes, where, from whom, they don't say, but I somehow know from whom. Feldman. May 31, 1937. There is other evidence in Feldman's case that he himself, without any coercion, gave sincere testimonies. And, finally, the last document, which was grossly falsified and made public at the 22nd Congress on the personal instructions of Khrushchev by the 43-year-old KGB chief Shilipin a document that made all 5,000 delegates, without exception, shudder with indignation and indignation, and thanks to which, to a large extent, they unanimously adopted a resolution on the removal of the body of I.V. Stalin from the mausoleum, as unworthy to lie next to the great Lenin. So what was Shilipin talking about at the 22nd Party Congress? And here's what, a number of cynical resolutions of Stalin, Kaganovich, Molotov, Malenkov and Voroshilov on the letters and statements of prisoners speak of a cruel attitude towards people, towards leading comrades who are under investigation. For example, at one time Yakir, the former commander of the military district, turned to Stalin with a letter in which he assured him of his complete innocence. Here, that he wrote, I am an honest and devoted fighter to the party, state, people, which I have been for many years. All my conscious life was spent in selfless, honest work in front of the party and its leaders, I am honest with every word, I will die with words of love for you, for the party and the country, with boundless faith in the victory of communism. On this litter, Stalin wrote, a scoundrel and a prostitute, Voroshilov added, a completely accurate definition, Molotov signed this, and Kaganovich attributed, traitor, bastards and b, one punishment, the death penalty. 21 Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Verbatim Report Gospel it is that. M. 1962. P. 403. Honest work in front of the party and its leaders, I am honest with every word, I will die with words of love for you, for the party and the country, with boundless faith in the victory of communism. On this litter, Stalin wrote, a scoundrel and a prostitute, Voroshilov added, a completely accurate definition, Molotov signed this, and Kaganovich attributed, traitor, bastards and b, one punishment, the death penalty. 21 Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Verbatim Report Gospel it is that. M. 1962. P. 403. Honest work in front of the party and its leaders, I am honest with every word, I will die with words of love for you, for the party and the country with boundless faith in the victory of communism. On this litter, Stalin wrote, a scoundrel and a prostitute, Voroshilov added, a completely accurate definition, Molotov signed this, and Kaganovich attributed, traitor, bastards and b, one punishment, the death penalty. 21 Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Verbatim Report Gospel it is that. M. 1962. P. 403. And now let's try to show that the reaction of I.V. Stalin and his associates was quite adequate to the content of the letter. For the sake of the triumph of historical truth, Yakir's letter had to be read at the Congress in full, 
without cuts. But did the historical truth then interest the gravediggers IV? Stalin, here it is, this litter, fully, without cuts, native, close comrade, Stalin. I dare to address you like that. For I have said everything, I have given everything, and it seems to me that I am again an honest and devoted fighter to the party, state, people which I have been for many years, all my conscious life was spent in selfless, honest work in front of the party and its leaders, then a collapse into a nightmare, into the irreparable horror of betrayal, the investigation is over, I was charged with high treason, I admitted my guilt, I completely repented, I believe infinitely in the correctness and expediency of the decision of the court and the government, now I am honest with every word, I will die with words of love for you, the party and the country with boundless faith in the victory of communism. H. A. Zankovich. Marshals and General Secretaries. Smolensk. Rusich. 1998. p. 594. The Khrushchev Shilip inversion found an unconditional supporter in the person of Volkogonov, who almost verbatim repeats this story about Yakir's absolute innocence. However, without citing either the letter itself, or even Shilipen's truncated part of it. Volkogonov, before lying, usually uses the verbal formula as is now established. Here, for example, he writes, as it has now been established, in relation to all these prominent Soviet military leaders, physical influence was applied in full. In fact, as we have just seen, neither in full, nor in the truncated Tukhashevsky, as well as his accomplices, no one tortured, he did not beat did not torture, and we have no reason to doubt the frankness of the testimony, which they themselves voluntarily gave, exposing each other in a race, we have no reason to doubt. The following passage can serve as an example of Volkogonov's shameless lies. In the Tukhashevsky case, the investigator for especially important cases, Ushakov, aka Ushiminsky, especially distinguished himself in his explanations which he gave after the 20th Congress of the Rehabilitation Commission, Yushakov wrote, dot. Stop, we will not go into what Yushakov allegedly wrote. Another thing is important here, fiercely, not Yushaminsky, but Yushamursky was the real name of Yushakov, and secondly, Yushakov wrote this for the NKVD in 1938, and not at all for the khrushchev Shvernik Commission in 1956. Well, I just physically could not write since by that time it had already been 17 years since his death. Elsewhere, Volkogonov, referring to the words of Gamarnik's daughter, who committed suicide, claims that this shot was a response to Stalin's proposal to become a member of the tribunal over his comrades in arms. Although Gamarnik appeared in the case, and the historian of Volkogonov's rank simply had to know, LB, as one of the participants in the counter-revolutionary conspiracy in the Red Army. As the Pravda newspaper reported on June 1, 1937, former member of the Central Committee of the RCP, B. Y.B. Gamarnik, entangled in his connections with anti-Soviet elements and apparently afraid of being exposed, committed suicide on May 31. Even Khrushchev writes about Gamarnik, he foresaw that he would be executed. They came to him to arrest him and he shot himself. The executioners came to drag him to the chopping block, and he decided that it would be better to commit suicide. The truth of fact and the truth of fiction. Since there is a lot of speculation on the issue of mass repressions in the Red Army, this should be considered in more detail. Volkogonov writes, according to available data, from May 1937 to September 1938, that is, within a year and a half. 36,761 people were repressed in the army. Some of them, however, were only dismissed from the Red Army. Before me is the report of the head of the department for the command staff of the Red Army of the People's Commissariat of Defense of the USSR. E. H. Chait and Co. Over the years, the report shows that in 1937 only 18,658 servicemen were dismissed from the Red Army, and in 1938, only 16,362 military personnel. In total, 35,020 people were dismissed, and not repressed, as legally illiterate General Volkogonov claims. Here, from among the dismissed, 9,506 military personnel were arrested, that is, repressed, for various crimes in 1937 to 1938, 
and 14,684 military personnel for ties with the conspirators. The rest were fired for drunkenness, moral decay, death, disability, and illness. In two years there were 6,692 such people in the Red Army. Citing these data, Shchedenko writes, in the total number of those dismissed both in 1936-37 and in 1938-39, a large number were arrested and dismissed unfairly. Therefore, many complaints were received to the People's Commissariat of Defense, to the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks and addressed to Conrad Stalin. In August 1938, I, of course, with the sanction of I.V. Stalin, L.B., created a special commission to analyze the complaints of dismissed commanders, which carefully checked the materials of the dismissed by personally summoning them going to the places of the employees of the directorate, requests from party organizations, individual communists and commanders who know the dismissed, through the organs of the NKVD, etc. The commission considered about 30,000 complaints, petitions and applications. As a result, 11,178 servicemen have been reinstated. News of the Central Committee of the CPSU. 1990. Number 1. P. 186 to 192. Since we are interested in the number of restored military personnel after their dismissal in connection with a conspiracy in the Red Army, we will try to clarify this figure. It is 7,202 people. Consequently, the true number of those convicted for association with the conspirators is 7,482 commanders. This is the true figure of the scale of repressions, not executions in the Red Army on the eve of the Great Patriotic War. These are my calculations, and they do not differ much from the data of the Deputy Chairman of the Military Collegium of the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation, Major General of Justice A.T. Uglov and Lieutenant Colonel V.I. Vkin. According to their alignment, published in the Military History Journal, 1993. Number 1.S. 57, 59, this figure is 7,211 that is, even less, L.B. Uglov and can come to the conclusion, the analysis of judicial statistics allows us to conclude that the number of victims of political repression in the Red Army in the second half of the 1930s is about 10 times less than modern publicists and researchers cite. At the same time, as I said, we are not talking about the executed, but only about those convicted of participating in a conspiracy. According to the archives of the Military Collegium of the Supreme Court of the USSR, 52 servicemen were sentenced to capital punishment in 1938, 112 in 1939 and 528 in 1940. Unfortunately, I do not have data on the number of people shot in 1937, but on the whole the picture is clear. We can talk about tens and hundreds not about thousands or tens of thousands of exterminated command personnel. It is well known that immediately after Hitler's treacherous invasion of the USSR, about 3,000 senior officers were released from prisons, among whom were future marshals K.K. Rokossovsky and K.A. Mertskov, future outstanding military leaders, A.V. Gorbatov, G.N. Kolosjakov, K.K. Bogdanov, New Mexico, Klebnikov, Biel, Vekov and many, many others. Relatives of K.K. Rokossovsky was recalled that I.V. Stalin, who, as you know, loved and appreciated the marshal very much, asked his forgiveness for 1938. As evidenced by the Minister of Agriculture in the government of Stalin, I.A. Benediktov, this was not the only such case when I.V. Stalin personally apologized to the rehabilitated military leaders, I.A. Benediktov. Tribuna. 1992. Number 22. The personnel were selected by the war. We have to state with regret that the opinion of many of our historians, created over half a century under the influence of Khrushchev Smith's about mass repressions, which allegedly became almost the main reason for the major defeats of the Red Army at the very beginning of the Great Patriotic War, is erroneous. Of course, it is difficult to admit it, but, in the end, it will have to be recognized since this is a fact of history, and you can't get away from the fact. Here is the view of the military historian A. Philip Pav on the readiness of the Red Army for a war in June 1941, 
The opinion that the repressed top commanders were the best and the worst remained in the army is unproven. The best of the repressed, Ementa Kashevsky and others, are often compared in the press with the worst of the remaining, but the ideas associated with the name of Tukhashevsky were not rejected, as they say, they were not always justifiably introduced into the army before the war, were reflected in the charters. In particular, the idea of strike back became the core of the war plan instead of the more appropriate idea of strategic defense for our army. The theory of deep combat and operations have obscured for our army the questions of defense, mobile warfare, counter operations. The consequences of the repressions of 1937 to 1938 against the command staff were partially overcome by the summer of 1941, so they cannot be attributed to the main reasons for the failures of our army at the beginning of the war. According to Winston Churchill, expressed in the book The Second World War, IV, Stalin did not weaken with his repressions, but, on the contrary, strengthened the Red Army. For Stalin, Tukhashevsky, Blucher and other military men, whose combat experience was limited mainly to participation in the Civil War, were not of particular value. They, as former supporters of Trotsky, were his political opponents, and he dealt with them according to the laws of the struggle of that time. Already in 1937, Stalin foresaw what for his less fortunate opponents became clear only seven years later, after the conspiracy of the military against Hitler, who, in the event of the defeat of Germany, were going to lay all the blame for this on the Fuhrer. The conspiracy of the German generals took place on July 20, 1944, that is, at the most critical moment for Germany, a similar fate could have awaited Stalin in October 1941, when it seemed that there was no force capable of stopping the Nazis near Moscow. However, this did not happen. The latest history of the fatherland. M. Vlados. 1998. V.2. S. 117 to 118. Konstantin Simonov in his famous book about IV, Stalin through the eyes of a man of my generation cites the view of Marshal of the Soviet Union I.S. Konev on the problem of destroying the head of the army before the war, to portray the matter in such a way that if these 10, 12, 5 or 7 people would not have died in 37 to 38, but would have been at the head of the army by the beginning of the war, then the whole war would look different. This is an exaggeration abstractly saying that if these 15 people were at the head of the army, then everything would be all right and the 41st is wrong. And one more thing, to answer which of the people who died then how would have fought with the Germans, how we would have defeated the Germans and in what time frame, if these people were alive, all these questions, unfortunately, are speculative. At the same time, there is an indisputable fact that those people who remained grew up during the war and ended up in the leadership of the army. I.S. Konev also talked about how, after the 37th year, I.V. Stalin looked at the remaining cadres and took note of the people he was going to nominate, on whom he was going to stake in a future war. He himself, Konev, by his own admission, felt himself one of such people, felt the care and attention of I.V. Stalin. The thought of Konstantin Simonov is remarkable and deep, the war selected and selected personnel, and people who led divisions. Armies and fronts retreated to Moscow, to Leningrad, to Stalingrad, but did not give up either one or the other, or the third, and then went on the offensive, learned to fight and eventually defeated the strongest army in the world, the German army, and those who reached Berlin. They, these people, do not need to be opposed to either Tukhashevsky or Yakir. K. Simonov, through the eyes of a man of my generation. M. APN. 1988. Chief Klinerkovo, blaming I.V. Stalin that he oriented the party, oriented the NKVD organs to mass terror, Khrushchev does not recognize his personal guilt in repressions, including repressions in the Red Army. Meanwhile, 1938 in the Kiev Special Military District, KOVO, began with a large-scale purge in the army. In the reporting document, called Resolution of the Military Council of the Kiev Special Military District, KOVO, on the state of the personnel of the command, commanding in political composition of the district and quoted by Volkogonov on pages 55 to 56 of his opus on Stalin, Book 2, the commander of the Kiev military district, commander of the second rank Tymashenko, member of the military council, 
Commander Smirnov and member of the Military Council, Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, B. Khrushchev reported I.V. Stalin that as a result of the merciless uprooting of Trotskyist Bukharin and bourgeois nationalist elements, on March 25, 1938, all commanders of nine corps, 24 out of 25 division commanders, 5 out of 9 brigade commanders, 87 out of 135 regiment commanders, all commanders of 4 rurs were replaced, 6 out of 9 chiefs of staffs of corps, 18 out of 25 chiefs of staffs of divisions, 3 out of 4 chiefs of staffs of the rurs, 78 out of 135 chiefs of staffs of regiments, 19 out of 24 chiefs of departments of the district headquarters. That's it. And given that he commanded the troops of the Kovo in 1937 before his arrest and left such a legacy to Khrushchev none other than the rehabilitated conspirator Iona Yakir, then only one can appreciate Khrushchev's perfidy in relation to the late I.V. Stalin. T's Gossip. F. 25880. Opus 4.d.1. L. 2 to 3. Volume. SD.2. P.56. In his memoirs Khrushchev, on almost every page where the war is discussed, speaks of low morale in the troops, which he also mentioned at the 20th Congress. However, in the aforementioned resolution of the Military Council of the Kovo, signed by Tymoshenko, Smirnov and the leader of Ukraine Khrushchev, and directed by I.V. Stalin. It was said that as a result of the great work to cleanse the ranks of the Red Army from hostile elements and the promotion from the bottom of commanders, political workers, chiefs selflessly devoted to the cause of the party of Lenin, Stalin, the cadres of the command, commanding and political staff are firmly rallied around our party, the leader of the people's comrade, Stalin and provide political strength and success in raising the combat power of the Red Army units. One of two things. Either Khrushchev led by the nose the leader of the people's comrade, Stalin in 1938, or hung noodles on the ears of the delegates of the 20th Party Congress in 1956. Paragraph 3 of this resolution of the Military Council of the Kovo says the following, The enemies of the people managed to do a lot of mischief in the field of personnel placement. The Military Council sets as the main task, to completely root out the remnants of hostile elements, deeply studying each commander chief, political worker upon promotion, putting forward boldly tested, devoted and growing cadres. On the second main point of the accusations of I.V. Stalin, about leading the preparation of the country for defense and the great patriotic war, Khrushchev said, here is another if only yes if only, L.B., if our industry was on time and truly mobilized to provide the army with weapons and the necessary equipment then we would have suffered immeasurably fewer casualties in this difficult war. And Khrushchev at the Congress cites the words of Malenkov, allegedly told to him by telephone, we cannot send weapons. We transfer all the rifles to Leningrad, and you arm yourself. It seems that Khrushchev, as the first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine and a member of the Military Council of the Kiev Military District, suddenly discovered that there was absolutely no mobilization stock of weapons in the warehouses and military units. But for such slovenliness, he himself had to bear the most severe responsibility. And in Khrushchev's memoirs, Malenkov also adds, instructions are given, by whom? Of course, I.V. Stalin, by whom else? L.B. To forge weapons, make lances, make knives, fight tanks with bottles, throw them and burn the tanks. Obviously. Khrushchev's crooked memory failed him again. He, one must think, remembered the episode that A.M. recalls Vasilevsky as I.V. Stalin, and not Malenkov at all, in a telephone conversation with Khrushchev said that he would take all measures to provide the Southwestern Front with any assistance, but at the same time ask them to rely more on themselves. It would be unreasonable to think that you will be given everything ready-made from the side. Learn to supply and replenish yourself. Create spare parts for the army, adapt some factories for the production of rifles, machine guns, move as you should. And you will see that much can be done for the front in the Ukraine itself. This is what Leningrad is doing at the present time, using its machine building basis, and in many respects it is succeeding. Leningrad has already managed to establish the production of Ares, Katyusha, LB, of course, 
the vindictive Khrushchev did not forget about the embarrassment that Stalin made him and Kirpano's experience when, in response to a confession that they were not familiar with the device of the air ace and a request to send them one sample of this weapon with drawings for organizing its production, they heard is, your people have drawings, and samples have been around for a long time, but your inattention to this serious matter is to blame. Okay, I'll send you a battery of air ace, blueprints, and production instructors. All the best, I wish you success, Dot. Having said, distorting reality that we were not ready for war, Khrushchev actually blamed not only I.V. Stalin. He talked about the failure of the program to strengthen the defense capability of the Soviet Union on the eve of the war. Meanwhile, just the merit of I.V. Stalin was that during the years of the pre-war five-year plans, 9,000 modern industrial enterprises were put into operation, and the development of the defense industry was a matter of special concern for the Soviet government, the Communist Party, the Soviet people, and personally I.V. Stalin. By the end of the 30s, and Khrushchev could not have been unaware of this, up to 300 divisions were under arms. The Red Army had 20,000 tanks, 15,000 aircraft, 220 submarines. The growth rate of the defense industry in the third five-year plan exceeded 39 percent. During the respite from the moment of signing the non-aggression pact with Germany until the moment of the Nazi invasion, i.e. in a year and a half, the IL-2 attack aircraft was created, at that time it was considered the best in the world, the Yak-1, MiG-3, Lodgy G-3 fighters, the Pay-2 dive bomber, the T-34 tank, which even of our opponents, was the best medium tank of World War II. From January 1939 to June 1941, our plants produced over 7,000 tanks including 1,861 of the new designs T-34 and KV. On the eve of the war with Germany, rocket launchers were created, a miracle of world technology, the famous Katyushas. In 1939, a new machine gun of the VDEG to Rev system entered service. In 1940, a self-loading rifle by Avtokarev was created, and G. Shpagin designed a machine gun pistol with high combat qualities, a simple device and trouble-free operation. Just, I repeat, IV. Stalin made full use of the respite to strengthen the defense capability of the Soviet Union, to arm the Red Army, which was given to him by the so-called Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Another thing is that IV. Stalin lacked some six months to complete the rearmament of the army. The invasion of the Nazi hordes thwarted his plans. But this is not Stalin's fault, but a misfortune. Our common problem. Chapter 16, Commander Joseph Stalin. Quote, Only the truth must be written about Stalin as a military leader during the war years. Marshal of the Soviet Union A.M. Vasilevsky. It was Khrushchev who initiated the discrediting of I.V. Stalin as the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, about whom Colonel General Volkogonov, who did not smell gunpowder, dared to speak as a man of an inflexible mind, who did not know military science and the theory of military art, did not have experience in organizing strategic defense and in the full sense of the word was not a commander, and about whom another ardent anti-Soviet writer, Astafiev, said, of course, Stalin is not a commander at all. This is the most insignificant man, Satan, sent to us for our sins. At the 20th Congress, Khrushchev slandered, Stalin was very far from understanding the real situation that developed on the fronts, did not know the nature of military operations, got in the way of the military. And in his memoirs, Khrushchev makes an awkward historical parallel with the Patriotic War of 1812. They say, then Alexander I left the front and went to St. Petersburg, appointing Kutuzov to command and, since at that time the means of communication were too limited, he was physically deprived of the opportunity to interfere directly in the affairs of the command. But Stalin, they say, while in Moscow, constantly intervened in everything and sometimes his intervention cost many lives at the front. Seeing what nonsense Khrushchev is talking about and foreseeing what a catastrophe this could turn out to be for the country in the future. Besides, the Stalin marshals of victory, humiliated by him, Khrushchev, sat down to write memoirs in order to protect the supreme commander-in-chief from slanderous attacks and attacks by the power of their authority. Word, to them the organizers of the glorious victory. From an interview unpublished at the time of Khrushchev, 
the chief quartermaster of the Red Army, the head of the logistics, general of the Army A.V. Krulova. Stalin pulled everything together. I didn't go anywhere myself. He came, for example, at four o'clock in the afternoon to his office in the Kremlin and began to call. He had a list of people to invite. Once he arrived, all the members of the GKO, State Defense Committee Dash Pound, were immediately called to him. No one was going ahead of time. He came, and then Paz Kurbyshev, Stalin's personal secretary, LB, began to call those who were needed at the moment. All members of the GKO were in charge of certain areas of work. So, Molotov was in charge of tanks, Mikoyan was in charge of quartermaster supply, fuel supply, lend lease issues, i.e., obtaining a loan or lease of weapons and food from the USA. LB sometimes carried out separate orders from Stalin to deliver shells to front. Malenkov was engaged in aviation, Beria, in ammunition and weapons. Everyone came to Stalin with their own questions and said, I ask you to make such and such a decision on such and such a question. What is a bet? It was Stalin, members of the headquarters, the chief or assistant chief of the general staff for operational affairs, and the entire People's Commissariat of Defense. There was no bureaucracy in both the headquarters and the State Defense Committee. These were exclusively operational bodies. The leadership was concentrated in the hands of Stalin. Life in the entire state and military apparatus was tense. The work schedule was around the clock. Everyone was in their official places. No one ordered that it should be this way, but it happened. Worth a a Novikov, commander of the Air Force, to give an order in which there was such a preamble to work at the same hours as Stalin, and the supreme commander immediately reacted, you never know that I work like that. Stalin began and ended work on different days in different ways. He could come one day at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the next, at 8 o'clock in the evening, he could finish work at 4 and at 7 o'clock in the morning. Stalin often signed documents without reading them. But that is until you compromised yourself. Everything was built on trust. Stalin had only to make sure that this person was a swindler, that he had deceived, that he was tricking. The fate of such an employee was immediately decided. I gave Stalin thousands of documents to sign, but when preparing these documents, I followed every letter, if they didn't call me. But there was an important matter, I came, went to Stalin's office, and if there was some kind of meeting. Then he sat down in anticipation of the right moment. I have never been kicked out. And no one was kicked out. New and Contemporary History. 1995. Number 2.C. 65-78. It is clear why Khrushchev did not like such a memory, and during the years of his autocracy it was never published. And here is what Marshal of the Soviet Union are. Ya yeah. Malinovsky, the future Minister of Defense of the USSR who replaced G.K. In the presence of Comrade Stalin, he decided many important issues, and each time he asked, what do you think about this issue? It was an exceptionally great lesson for our personal growth. It is clear that Comrade Stalin had his own deeply thought out and well-founded decision on each question that arose, but he still asked for the opinion of those present. With this, he taught us to listen to the opinion of subordinates when developing a decision, taught us, as military commanders, the ability to lead people, the style of working, fighting and winning. Zemya. 1950. Number 9.C.155. Of great interest is the opinion of the first deputy minister of defense in the Khrushchev government, Marshal of the Soviet Union A.M. Vasilevsky from his memoirs The Work of All Life. I had good relations with N.S. Khrushchev and in the first post-war years. But they changed dramatically after they did not support his statements that I.V. Stalin did not understand operational strategic issues and unskillfully directed the actions of the troops as the supreme commander-in-chief. I still don't understand how he could say that. As a member of the Politburo of the Central Committee of the Party and a member of the Military Council of a number of fronts, N.S. Khrushchev could not help but know how high the authority of the headquarters and Stalin was in matters of conducting military operations. He also could not help but know that the commanders of the fronts and armies had great respect for the headquarters, Stalin and appreciated them for their exceptional competence in leading the armed struggle. Dot. And further, in my deep conviction, I.V. Stalin, 
was the most powerful and colorful figure in the strategic command. He successfully carried out the leadership of the fronts and was able to exert a significant influence on the leading political and military leaders of the Allied countries in the war. Working with him was interesting and at the same time incredibly difficult, especially during the first period of the war. He remained in my memory as a stern, strong-willed military leader at the same time not without personal charm. IV. Stalin possessed not only a huge natural mind, but also surprisingly great knowledge. His ability to think analytically had to be observed during meetings of the Politburo of the Central Committee of the Party, the State Defense Committee and during his constant work at the headquarters. He slowly, slightly stooping, walks around, listens attentively to the speakers, sometimes asks questions, makes remarks, and when the discussion is over, he will clearly formulate the conclusions, sum up. His conclusions were laconic, but deep in content and, as a rule, formed the basis of the decisions of the Central Committee of the Party or the State Defense Committee, as well as directives or orders of the Supreme Commander. During his lifetime, he could not publish the manuscript of his very valuable memoirs and Chief Marshal of Artillery, Commander of Long Range Aviation A.E. Belivinov. I want to dwell on the figure of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, I.V. Stalin. He was at the head of the most difficult world war. Having studied this or that person and being convinced of his knowledge and abilities, he trusted such people, I would say, unlimitedly. But, as they say, God forbid that such people show themselves somewhere on the bad side. Stalin did not forgive such things to anyone. His attitude towards people corresponded, so to speak, to their work their attitude to the work entrusted to them, work with IV. Stalin, I must say frankly, was not simple and not easy. Possessing broad knowledge himself, he did not tolerate general reports, general formulations. The answers to all the questions posed had to be specific, extremely short and clear. The ability to speak with people, figuratively speaking, without any blunt words, saying directly to the eye what he wants to say, what he thinks about a person, could not arouse in the latter a feeling of resentment or humiliation. This was a special, distinctive feature of Stalin. The proportion of Stalin during the Great Patriotic War was extremely high both among the leaders of the Red Army and among all soldiers and officers of the armed forces of the Soviet Army. This is an indisputable fact that no one can oppose. Word. 1994. Number 9 to 10. C. 44 to 51. His deputy during the Great Patriotic War and literally colleague G.K. gave his highest assessment to the Supreme Commander, Zhukov, who, accepting the victory parade on June 24, 1945, said, We won because our great leader and brilliant commander marshal of the Soviet Union, Stalin led us from victory to victory. This assessment will not change in his famous memoirs Memoirs and Reflections, published after Khrushchev left the political scene. I.V. Stalin mastered the issues of frontline operations and directed them with complete knowledge of the matter. He knew how to find the main link in a strategic situation and, seizing on it, to counteract the enemy, to carry out one or another offensive operation. Undoubtedly, he was a worthy supreme commander. In addition, in supporting operations, creating strategic reserves, organizing the production of military equipment and, in general, everything necessary for the front. I.V. Stalin, frankly, proved to be an outstanding organizer. This is how I remember the bright image of I.V. Stalin to Marshal of the Soviet Union I. K.H. Bagramian. He was called to perjury by Khrushchev at the 20th Congress. Marshal Bagramian is present here, who can confirm what I will tell you now. L.B., knowing the enormous powers and truly iron authority of Stalin, I was amazed at his manner of leading. He could briefly command give up the core, and the point. But Stalin, with great tact and patience, ensured that the performer himself came to the conclusion that this step was necessary. Subsequently, I myself often had to talk with the Supreme Commander-in-Chief in the role of front commander, and I was convinced that he knew how to listen to the opinion of his subordinates. If the performer firmly stood his ground and put forward weighty arguments to substantiate his position, Stalin almost always conceded. I. K. H. Bagramian. This is how the war began. M. 1977. P. 402. Concerning the history of the development of the plan of the Belarusian Operation Marshal of the Soviet Union K. K. Rokossovsky, 
whom Stalin greatly appreciated and called my bagration, cites the following episode. The Supreme Commander-in-Chief and his deputies insisted on inflicting one main blow, and not two, as Rokossovsky suggested, LB, from the bridgehead on the Dnieper, Rogachev area, which was in the hands of the Third Army. Twice I was asked to go into the next room to think over the Stavka proposal. After each such thinking I had to defend my decision with renewed vigor. Convinced that I firmly insist on our point of view. Stalin approved the plan of operation in the form in which we presented it. The persistence of the front commander, he said, proves that the organization of the offensive is carefully thought out. And this is a reliable guarantee of success. K.K. Rokossovsky. Soldier's Debt. M. 1997. P. 313. Fleet Admiral N.G. Kuznetsov, who, as you know, he was distinguished by his firmness and independence of judgment. Already being retired, he wrote, during the years of the Great Patriotic War, Marshal G.K. Zhukov, and hardly anyone can better describe him, and he called him a worthy supreme commander. As far as I know, all military leaders who had to see and meet with Stalin agree with this opinion. Military History Journal. 1993. Number 4. C. 51. Many marshals and generals, like Fleet Admiral Kuznetsov at one time had a difficult and difficult relationship with I.V. Stalin. Khrushchev knew about this and tried to play on it. In his notorious report, he pettishly reminded Rokossovsky and Meritskov that they were under Stalin, but nevertheless, despite the heavy agony they endured in prisons, from the very first days of the war they showed themselves to be real patriots and selflessly fought for the glory of motherland. Thinking that by doing so he bought Rokossovsky, the schemer Khrushchev offered him the post of Deputy Minister of Defense. But when in 1962, after the reburial of I.V. Stalin, Khrushchev asked Rokossovsky to write something blacker about the leader, the marshal refused him this, saying, Nikita Sergeyevich, Comrade Stalin is a saint for me. The next day, Konstantin Rokossovsky, having come to work, as usual, saw in his chair the Khrushchev Marshal Moskalenko, one of Beria's executioners. But let's return to the 20th Congress. Here Khrushchev reaches Vasilevsky in his report and says, I am calling Vasilevsky and begging him, take a card, Alexander Mkhailovich, Comrade Vasilevsky is present here, show Comrade Stalin what kind of situation we have. And I must say that Stalin planned operations on the globe. Animation in the hall. Yes, comrades, he will take a globe and show the front line on it. Dot. The lie about the mythical Stalin's globe is refuted by the presence in the military archives of a mass of maps of different scales with notes made by I.V. Stalin, Memoirs of Marshal of the Soviet Union K.A. Mertskov in the service of the people. Yes, yes, the same Mertskov, on whose perjury Khrushchev counted so much, in some books, we received a version that I.V. Stalin led military operations on the globe. I have never read anything more ridiculous. An article in the Military History Journal, No. 3.1995, p. 30, of Army General A.I. Gribkov, who worked during the war years in the Operational Directorate of the General Staff, N.S. Khrushchev, debunking the cult of personality I.V. Stalin, claimed that, they say, he led the fronts on the globe. Of course, this is all lies. The military archives store maps of various scales with marks made by the hand of the supreme commander. A refutation of Khrushchev's spitefulness on the issue of the globe can also be found in Admiral N.G. Kuznetsov in his book On the Eve. The malicious assertion that he assessed the situation and made decisions on the globe is completely wrong. I could give many examples of how Stalin, clarifying the situation on the fronts with the military leaders, knew when necessary, right up to the position of each regiment. In the book by K.S. Moscow and Co. in the southwest direction, when Nikolai Fedorovich, Vachutin, commander of the front, clarifying with the military leaders the situation on the fronts, he knew when necessary, right down to the position of each regiment. In the book by K.S. Moscow and Co. in the southwest direction, when Nikolai Fedorovich, Vachutin, commander of the front, clarifying with the military leaders the situation on the fronts, he knew when necessary, right down to the position of each regiment. In the book by K.S. Moscow and Co. in the southwest direction, when Nikolai Fedorovich, Vachutin, commander of the front held. B. 
told us about his conversation with the Supreme Commander, I could not hide my surprise at the thoroughness with which the headquarters analyzed the military operations, and I involuntarily escaped. What kind of cards does the Supreme Commander follow our actions if he sees more and deeper than us? Nikolai Fedorovich smiled, two and five hundred thousand men behind the front and one hundred thousand behind each army. The main thing is that he is the Supreme, to prompt us, to correct our mistakes. Dot. But, perhaps, the most worthy rebuke was given to Khrushchev by Air Chief Marshal A. Novikov, what, for example, was Khrushchev's statement that Stalin planned operations during the war and directed them on a large globe that was in his office. This assertion of the author of the report alone provoked then a fairly wide, albeit tacit, protest, especially among military figures, and many ordinary veterans of the Great Patriotic War. Here's an explanation for the revival in the hall where the 20th Congress was held, LB. After all, it has long been known that none of the major wars of the past ended with the victory of the army, at the head of which, with all the high powers given to him, was a gray, silly, faceless and cowardly commander-in-chief. On this occasion, I would like to recall such a saying attributed to Napoleon, a herd of rams led by a lion is stronger than a herd of lions led by a ram. CIT. According to Cumanevs.325, in order to call the delegate of the 20th Congress, Deputy Supreme Commander-in-Chief, Marshal of the Soviet Union G.K. Jukov, who does not yet know what kind of pig he will be put in the very near future by the subverter of Stalin, a certain negative attitude, Khrushchev from the High Rostrum tells them nonsense invented by himself, attributing it to I.V. Stalin. Stalin showed great interest in my assessment comrade Zhukov as a commander. He repeatedly asked my opinion about Zhukov, and I told him, I have known Zhukov for a long time, he is a good general, a good commander. After the war, Stalin began to tell all sorts of fables about Zhukov. In particular, he told me, You praise Zhukov, but he doesn't deserve it. They say that Zhukov at the front, before any operation, will take a handful of earth, sniff it and say that. They say, it is possible to launch an offensive, or, conversely, they say, it is impossible to carry out the intended operation. I answer this then, I don't know, comrade Stalin, who invented it, but it's not true. Apparently, Stalin himself invented such things in order to belittle the role and military abilities of Marshal Zhukov. Subsequently, after the massacre perpetrated by Khrushchev over his Minister of Defense Zhukov, the enlightened Georgi Konstantinovich will say, Stalin removed me, lowered me, but did not humiliate me. If someone tries to offend me in front of him, Stalin will tear his head off for me. What did it cost the Supreme Commander himself to accept the surrender of the defeated monster, Nazi Germany? And he entrusted it to Zhukov? Take the victory parade, to him. Zhukov was given two orders of victory, three gold stars of the hero of the Soviet Union, for the only commander. And only his leader appointed his own, the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, as a deputy. A huge honor. It is known that not Stalin, but Zhukov, believed that he won the Great Patriotic War, and when the Politburo accused him of Bonapartism, he said, the comparison is incorrect, Napoleon lost the war, and I won. Of great interest in this regard are the reflections of Air Chief Marshal A.E. Golovinov. We place all responsibility for the suddenness of Hitler's unexpected attack on our country on IV. Stalin, for he was at the head of the state. Although S.K. Timashenko, as People's Commissar of Defense and G.K. Zhukov, as the Chief of the General Staff and a number of other comrades, as you know, there are no special claims against them. In the same way, it is legitimate to speak of strategic victories of world significance and also attribute them to those people who were at the head of certain campaigns or the war as a whole and were responsible for their outcome. This is logic. The great world historic victory in the Second World War was won by the country, the party and the army, led by Stalin. Stalin's marshals, without saying a word, destroyed the pyramid of lies that Khrushchev, without any hesitation, erected in the secret report on the cult of personality, most likely not realizing that under the guise of fighting the cult his heirs would bury communism and bring country to a terrible catastrophe making meaningless all the sacrifices that the Soviet people suffered in that war. The words of the narrow-minded Khrushchev, recorded in his memoirs, sound funny and sad today. Well, now that there is no Stalin, 
we fall under German, English or American influence? No, never, LB. So, until his death, Khrushchev did not understand why the generals of the victory were against that caricature of IV. Stalin, which he painted so diligently, I am surprised at some major military leaders who, in their memoirs, want to whitewash Stalin and present him as the father of the people, to prove that if not for him, we would not have won the war and fell under the heel of the Nazis. These are stupid arguments, slavish concepts. So thought the distorter of history Nikita Khrushchev. But here's an assessment of the role of Stalin in the Stalinist entourage, which, by the way, included Khrushchev, was given by Harry Lloyd Hopkins, advisor and special assistant to U.S. President F. Roosevelt during the Second World War, after the Yalta Conference. None of us could predict what the results would be if something happened to Stalin. We were sure that we could count on his mind, feelings and understanding, but we did not at all extend our confidence to those circumstances and those figures who were behind him there, in the Kremlin Saul, Suk 259 that is, in other words, if Stalin had died not in March 1953, but in February 1945, when the Crimean Conference was held, then the Allies would not yet have confidence in its successful outcome for the anti-Hitler coalition. And this idea was voiced just three months before the victorious end of the war. Like this. No, Stalin's marshals did not want to die with a load of Khrushchev's lies. They once again honorably fulfilled their soldiers' duty to history, leaving to posterity a collective realistic portrait of their supreme commander-in-chief, Generalissimo of the Soviet Union. Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin. Kudos to them for this. Chapter 17. The Price of Victory. Quote, the goal of every struggle is victory. I Stalin wise words were spoken by Marshal I.V. Stalin to the Prime Minister of Great Britain Churchill, when he, bargaining, referred to the possible heavy losses of the Allied troops. There is no war without losses. Moreover, the losses are huge, truly incalculable, when at the head of the enemy motorized hordes. Waging a war of extermination, is a maniac killer, obsessed with the bloodthirsty idea of the total destruction of subhumans. If I send the flower of the German nation into the heat of war, shedding precious German blood without the slightest pity, then, without a doubt, I have the right to destroy millions of people of an inferior race. Dot. It is not about the price of the victory that we must lament, following Khrushchev taking the astronomical figures of our losses directly from the ceiling, oh, our venerable professors and academicians, as well as writers and other scribblers, about the price of our inevitable, if not for I.V. Stalin, and this is not faith, but solid knowledge, of a shameful defeat in that very war. Where would we be today and would we be at all if the parade of their victory did take place, as the Fuhrer intended, in Moscow, on Red Square, on November 7, 1941? Maybe it's really time to end the mouse fuss around the price of victory, raised by Khrushchev at the 20th Congress. After all, it was precisely at his suggestion that the great blood that Stalin cost us became the subject of close attention and shameless brazen speculation of pseudo-historians who reasoned as follows, since Khrushchev himself, in a letter to Swedish Prime Minister Erlander, called the figure of our losses more than 20 million, it will do any number we name. Devil Koganov, for example, writes, in Khrushchev's assessment, only the word more is correct. And the satanic pandemonium began around that very big blood. And now Khrushchev's favorite, the unfinished enemy of the people Solzhenitsyn, who is also a sex worker of the Gulag with the Vetrov cliché, invents and puts into circulation the incredible figure of our losses, 31 million soldiers, and soon calls an even more impressive one. 44 million. He is not at all embarrassed that this is almost the entire male population of the country, according to the census. The population of the USSR on January 17, 1939 was 170,467,186 people. LB. Let's not forget that the same Khrushchev's protege buried another 66 million repressed in the pre-war years, a total of 110 million people. And who then built, who fought? who, finally, sat, was socialism built only by women, children and the elderly. The false prophet somehow didn't think about it. Such a monstrous lie to this day roams through various publications, is replicated in millions of copies, poisoning the mass consciousness and insulting public morality.
Although 10 years have passed since the official data on the number of casualties both on our side and on the other side were made public, everything calculated and verified. We are talking about a statistical study the classification has been removed, losses of the armed forces of the USSR in wars, hostilities and military conflicts under the general editorship of G.F. Krivoshev, M. 1993. S. 128-129. 182. 337-338.391.393. .391 According to these data, during the years of the Great Patriotic War, including losses in the Far East against Japan in 1945, the actual number of demographic losses of the Red Army, taking into account those killed, missing, who died from wounds, diseases and accidents, amounted to the entire war. Remember, exclamation mark comma 8,668,400 people, while the Wehrmacht lost 6,923,700 people on its eastern front. This means that for every four Fritz killed, there were five Red Army soldiers. And there is no need for la la, gentlemen, anti-Stalinists of all stripes, that we, they say, one because we filled up the Germans with the corpses of our guys that for every one killed German there were ten Soviet soldiers, how about this Victor Estefi of rights in his slanderous novel Cursed and Killed? First, they cheated IV Stalin with Khrushchev's thesis, it was not Stalin who won, but the people, and now the Soviet people themselves, who saved humanity from total genocide, have been forgotten. Khrushchev is long gone, but his heirs are alive and still in power. And it's scary. They and we. If we talk about the total losses, including civilians, on our part and on their part, then the ratio will be, alas, 10 to 1 not in our favor. These are precisely the results of Hitler's policy of genocide, the systematic extermination of the Soviet people, which the modern heirs of Khrushchev actually justify by slandering the history of the Soviet Union in general and the history of the Great Patriotic War in particular. And although in the most difficult periods of the war, Stalin did not object to the slogan kill the German, for him personally, an internationalist, throughout the war it was clear, and he repeatedly introduced this into the mass consciousness of his contemporaries, that the Nazis should not be identified with the German people, who gave the world of the greatest philosophers, scientists, composers, writers. In his speech on February 23, 1942, I. V. Stalin said, the Red Army is destroying the Nazis not because of their German origin, but because they want to enslave our motherland. The Red Army, like the army of any other state, has the right and duty to destroy the enslavers of their homeland, regardless of their nationality. Quickly organized food assistance to the population of Berlin, which included a set of food products for workers in hard labor and hazardous industries, workers in other industries, employees, children, dependents and other people, such as bread, potatoes, cereals, meat fats, sugar per day in such volume, in which our today's food basket did not even dream of. Decree of the State Defense Committee of May 8, 1945. But Khrushchev's heirs point-blank do not want to know history as it was. They need such a story that exists in their inflamed consciousness, in their sick imagination. Something about quote-unquote Stalin's cogs. One of these heirs, Volkogonov, says, Stalin was insensitive to the countless tragedies of the war. In an effort to inflict maximum damage on the enemy, what's wrong with that? I never really thought about what price the Soviet people would pay for this. LB, thousands, millions of lives for him have long become dry. Official statistics. On the occasion of the 53rd anniversary of the great victory, another Khrushchev heir, Viktor Estefiev, spoke in the Arguments and Facts newspaper. At that time the 72-year-old author of the novel Cursed and Killed, which depicts Red Army soldiers in the war in a disgusting light, victims of senseless cruelty Soviet repressive system. So, this ideological Vlasovite slanders in a newspaper article? Yes, we reached Berlin. But how? People, Russia was burned at the stake, covered in blood. They didn't know how to fight. Only in 1944 they put things in order and began to take into account the consumption of shells, cartridges, lives, and who, one wonders, beat the German near Moscow, in Stalingrad, on the Kursk bulge, in other offensive operations of 1941 to 1943, including in the liberation of Kiev, 
which for six years became the patrimony of Khrushchev, LB, and then Astafiev continues to rant. The availability of fuel, shells, and cartridges was in the first place, and the presence of people was in the last place. The hypocrisy of our class enemies lies precisely in the fact that, hating and deeply despising the Soviet people, labeling them like scoops, commies, they pretend to be their intercessors, and not from anyone, from them themselves leaders. V.I. also got it. Lenin, but it is I.V. Stalin who receives the most cones. With the light hand of the most important heir of Khrushchev, in the past also General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev, who tried to somehow explain to the figures of literature and art, where, by the way, a staff I have was also present, the reason for the repressions of the 30s and 40s by the fact that people, they say, they were treated like cogs, they broke it and threw it away. The Khrushchevite Gorbachev threw such a fake coin to the anti-Stalinists as Stalin's cogs, on which they began to race to make themselves dubious political capital. But it's time to give the floor to Comrade Pravda. On April 17, 1940, Stalin spoke at a meeting of the commanding staff of the Red Army, if you spare cartridges and shells, there will be more losses. You need to feel sorry for your people, save the strength of the army. If you want us to have a war with little bloodshed, do not spare minds. And during the Great Patriotic War, Comrade Stalin showed serious attention to the problem of losses in the Red Army. Aircraft designer Ryakovlev recalled, p. 466, Stalin could not calmly relate to the facts of the indifference of commanders to the needs of the fighters. Once, after listening to the reports of several top commanders who arrived from the front, and learning about the poor supply of food and uniforms for soldiers, Stalin flared up and said indignantly, Shame on you. You are communists. Look, he nodded at the portraits of Suvorov and Kutuzov hanging in his office, the nobles, the landowners Kutuzov. Suvorov showed more concern for their soldiers, knew their soldier more, loved him more than you, Soviet communist commanders. If they said about the leader, where Stalin is, there is victory. Then it would be fair to say about Mikita, where Khrushchev is, there is defeat. Here is an example, and a telegram to Tymashenko, Khrushchev and Bodin IV. Stalin wrote, The headquarters considers it intolerable and unacceptable that the military council of the front has not been giving information about the fate of the 28th, 38th and 57th armies and the 22nd tank corps for several days now. The Stavkin knows from other sources that the headquarters of these armies have retreated beyond the Don, but neither these headquarters nor the military council of the front inform the Stavka where the troops of these armies have gone and what their fate is, whether they continue to fight or are taken prisoner. There were, it seems, 14 divisions in these armies. The headquarters wants to know, where did these divisions go? Tizamo. F.3. Opus 11 556. D. 9.L.16. P.251. At the end of May 1942, when Kharkov turned into a meat grinder, where 20 Soviet divisions had already died, irritated by Tymoshenko's requests to strengthen the front, IV. Stalin dictated the following telegram to Tymoshenko, Khrushchev, and Bagramian. Over the past four days, the Stavka has been receiving from you more and more requests for weapons, for the submission of new divisions and tank formations from the Stavka Reserve. Keep in mind that Stavka has no new divisions ready for battle, that these divisions are raw, untrained, and to throw them now to the front means delivering an easy victory to the enemy. Keep in mind that our weapons resources are limited and keep in mind that we have other fronts besides your front. Is it time for you to learn how to fight with little bloodshed, as the Germans do? It is necessary to fight not by numbers, but by skill. Consider all this if you ever want to learn how to defeat the enemy, and not give him an easy victory. Otherwise, the weapons you receive from headquarters will pass into the hands of the enemy, as is happening now. 21.50 May 27, 1942 Stalin T. Zamo. F. 32. Opus 1. D. 16. L. 19. P. So who spared the soldier, I.V. Stalin or his detractors? This dispatch refutes, among other things, 
the myth that IV Stalin treated human losses with indifference. The question of Stalin's cogs is also of fundamental importance. Where and when could Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin speak so disrespectfully about ordinary Soviet people? Has there been such a fact? Is it characteristic of Comrade Stalin? On June 25, 1945, a reception was held in the Kremlin in honor of the participants in the Victory Parade, which was attended by famous marshals, generals and admirals, workers and artists, designers of all types of military equipment. Festive tables are set in the Georgievsky Hall of the Kremlin. One toast is replaced by another. Seeing that the main culprits of this celebration, the creators of the Victory, IV, Stalin rises and makes a toast. Don't think I'm going to say anything out of the ordinary. I have the simplest, most ordinary toast. I would like to drink to the health of people who have few ranks and an invisible title. For people who are considered cogs of the great state mechanism, but without whom all of us, marshals and commanders of fronts and armies, roughly speaking, are not worth a damn thing. Some screw went wrong and it's over. I raise this toast to simple, ordinary, modest people to the cogs that keep our great state mechanism in a state of activity in all branches of science, economy and military affairs. There are a lot of them, their name is Legion, because they are tens of millions of people. These are humble people. No one writes anything about them, they have no rank, few ranks, but these are people who hold us like the foundation holds the top. I drink to the health of these people, to our respected comrades. More than once J.V. Stalin spoke about people about caring for them. So, at the graduation of students of the military academies of the Red Army in 1935, he said, instead of studying people, people are often thrown around like pawns. We have not yet learned to value people, to value employees, to value personnel. These are the pawns and cogs comrade Stalin had. The words of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin are inscribed in golden letters in the tablets of history. Of all the valuable capitals available in the world, the most valuable and most decisive capital is people, personnel. There is nothing to blame on the mirror, if the face is crooked. Among the accusations put forward by Khrushchev against IV Stalin, concerning the period of the Great Patriotic War, was also this, Stalin decided everything on his own, regardless of the opinion of the Central Committee, Stalin showed absolute intolerance towards collectivity and leadership and work. Anyone who opposed this, or tried to prove his point of view, his rightness, was doomed to removal from the leadership team, and after the to moral and physical destruction. But the opinion of the Deputy Supreme Commander-in-Chief, Marshal G.K. Jukova, during the long years of the war, I became convinced that I.V. Stalin was not at all a man to whom risky questions could not be put or argued with and firmly defended one's own views. If someone claims the opposite. I will directly say that their statements are incorrect. The style of work was generally businesslike, without nervousness, everyone was free to express their opinion. So, two mutually exclusive statements, who to believe? Obviously, Marshal G.K. Jukov, who was next to Stalin throughout the war, while Khrushchev during the Great Patriotic War was far from Moscow, from the Supreme High Command and did not know any details about the behavior of I.V. Stalin at all and cannot be considered a reliable source. The words of G.K. Jukov are confirmed by the statements of such commanders as Marshal A.M. Vasilevsky, chief of the general staff of the Soviet Army S.M. Shtmenko and many other military leaders who had direct contact with I.V. Stalin and met with him several times a day. Here, for example, Khrushchev reports to the Congress delegates, Stalin acted on behalf of the Central Committee and even the Politburo of the Central Committee often without even notifying them of his individual decisions on very important party and state issues. According to the logic of Khrushchev, I.V. Stalin, even such an event as the question of the advisability of holding a military parade on Red Square on November 7, 1941, as a very important state issue, should not have been decided individually, but discussed and approved by the plenum of the Central Committee, L. B. Dot. In proof that I.V. Stalin behaved like an autocrat, a faithful Leninist Khrushchev says indignantly that in all the years of the war there was only one attempt to convene a collegial body, the plenum of the Central Committee in October 1941, i.e. when the enemy stood at the walls of Moscow, which was experiencing the most dramatic days in 800 years of its existence, 
LB, colon members of the Central Committee gathered from all over the country, but Stalin did not even want to meet and talk with them. Say, he treated the members of the Central Committee so arrogantly and contemptuously. For some reason, Khrushchev does not remember the only plenum of the Central Committee in the entire war, which did take place on January 27, 1944, that is, when the restoration of the liberated regions was in full swing, and the party had something to do. During the war, the CPSU, B, was considered a belligerent party and all power was concentrated in the GEKO, State Defense Committee. And according to that plenum that never took place, by the way, a special resolution of the Politburo of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks of October 9, 1941 was adopted in a timely manner, which our Makita, as a member of the Politburo, could not, of course, not know or not remember, despite the fact that exactly 15 years have passed since then. The resolution stated, to bring to the attention of all members of the Central Committee that the convening of the plenum of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks is being postponed in view of the recently created alarming situation on the fronts and the inexpediency of diverting leading comrades from the fronts, Benediktov testifies, contrary to popular belief, one could add with the light hand of Khrushchev, L.B., all issues in those years including personal replacements in the leadership, were resolved collectively in the Politburo. At meetings of the Politburo, disputes often flared up, and opposing opinions were expressed. There was no voiceless and uncomplaining unanimity. Stalin and his associates could not tolerate this. It is true that Stalin's opinion usually prevailed, but this happened because he thought about problems more comprehensively and more objectively. He saw further and deeper than others. He spoke very well about the respectful attitude of I.V. Stalin to his comrades in arms Vyacheslav Molotov. Stalin respected the people with whom he worked. I told him directly everything that I thought, both positive and negative. He was critical of everything. He respected members of the Politburo, scientists, and writers. But he simply loved Kirov and Zhdanov. And here is what the main ideologist of the Kremlin of that time, a member of the Politburo of the Central Committee of the CPSU Mikhail Soslov, will say about Khrushchev himself, when the 70-year-old faithful Leninist will be removed from all posts and sent to retire, comrade Khrushchev, having concentrated in his hands the posts of first secretary of the Central Committee of the Party and chairman of the Council of Ministers, did not always correctly use the rights and duties granted to him. Violating the Leninist principles of collectivity and leadership, he began to strive for the sole solution of the most important issues of party and state work. He imagined himself infallible, arrogated to himself the monopoly right to truth. To all the comrades who expressed their opinion, they made remarks that were objectionable to comrade Khrushchev. He arrogantly gave all kinds of disparaging and insulting nicknames that degrade human dignity. In recent years, we have practically not held real plenums of the Central Committee. It turns out that while accusing and exposing I.V. Stalin, Khrushchev attributed to him his own shortcomings, mistakes, blunders. As an example of the style of his boorish speech, such a passage from his speech at the 20th Congress can serve, when, tearing himself away from the text, he shouted, turning to K.E. Voroshilov, you, Klim. Finally give up your lies about the defense of Zaritsyn. Stalin fucked up Zaritsyn, like the Polish front, don't you, old and decrepit, really have the courage and conscience to tell the truth that you yourself saw and brazenly distorted in the vile little book Stalin and the Red Army? Unlike Iosif Vissarionovich, who apologized to Nadezhda Konstantinovna, Khrushchev to K.E. Voroshilov did not apologize for his insulting spit. Khrushchev School of Falsifications There is another problem in the topic the price of victory. Was there or was there no mass heroism among the Soviet people? Or, indeed, as the Khrushchevites assert, people were driven like a flock of sheep to slaughter, with the help of detachments? These questions are best answered by the dead heroes themselves. They are the word. Writer Yuri Krymov to his wife. I always felt that I would join the party in an atmosphere of fierce struggle. But reality surpassed all my premonitions. I joined the party at the moment when the entire formation was surrounded, that is, on the eve of a mortal battle for me and my comrades. September 19, 1941 Testament of the Red Army Soldier S. Volkov, 
Dear brothers in arms, if I die in this battle, call me a communist. Long live the great Soviet people, long live comrade Stalin. Say hello to your wife Marussia and daughter Danya. February 12, 1942 inches. A letter from a Red Army signalman Ona Chitovsky. Farewell, dear mother. This is my suicide letter, and if you receive it, know that you no longer have a son. I died as your son and as the son of the motherland. I did not spare my life for the good and happiness of people, for your peaceful old age, for the happy life of children. March 1944 inches. Is it possible to shamelessly and brazenly mock, as his heirs do with the light hand of Khrushchev, over their own history? Over the blessed memory of these morally pure people who went on the attack and met death with the exclamation for the motherland. For Stalin, as you know, the first major defeat of the Nazi hordes near Moscow was of decisive importance for the course and outcome of the entire Second World War. Historic military parade on Red Square in Moscow on the 24th anniversary of the Great October Revolution. When I.V. Stalin made a small but very capacious speech in which he admonished the soldiers leaving for the front, ending with the words, for the complete defeat of the German invaders. Death to the German invaders. Long live our glorious motherland, her freedom, her independence. Under the banner of Lenin, forward to victory. Received a huge response all over the world. Without the Stalinist authority at the time, wrote the well-known historian Wypolyakov, free thought. 1994. Number 11, p. 74. Without strict exactingness and discipline, it would hardly have been possible to keep from the collapse of the state machine and the whole country. This is the practical side. But there is another, psychological. In military conditions, Stalin was important as an organizer, in whose hands all the reins of government were concentrated, and he held them firmly enough. However, Stalin was no less important as a symbol of the inviolability of state power, the firmness of leadership, confidence in victory, determination to defeat the enemy, the unity of various peoples and various strata of the people. Anyone who is familiar with the situation in the first months of the war will not deny the significance of Stalin's speeches on November 6 and 7, 1941, with reference to the testimonies allegedly received from Beria, Khrushchev even during the years of his inglorious reign, tried to spread slanderous fabrications that supposedly I.V. Stalin suggested that Hitler stop the outbreak of hostilities by ceding the territories of the Baltic states, Moldova, a significant part of Ukraine and Belarus to the Fuhrer. This fake is refuted quite simply. Fiercely, the greedy beast Hitler, having managed to grab in two weeks all the new territories that became part of the USSR and crossed on July 3rd. When I.V. Stalin addressed the Soviet people with a historical mobilization speech, L.B., the old borders of the USSR, that is, the limits of our state until the conclusion of the Treaty of August 23, 1939, L.B., did not need any kind of peace with I.V. Stalin, but unrestrainedly rushed to Moscow in order to conquer the capital of the country and bring the entire Soviet Union to its knees. Secondly, according to General P. Sudipatov, who was engaged in covert operations abroad during the war, Stalin and the entire leadership felt that an attempt to conclude a separate peace in this unprecedentedly difficult war would automatically deprive them of power. Not to mention their genuinely patriotic feelings, of which I am quite sure, any form of peace agreement was unacceptable to them. I will add from myself, IV, Stalin was aware that Hitler needed only unconditional surrender, and in this case there was no need to hope for the mercy of the winner. And. Finally, thirdly, an accusation of this type requires quite weighty evidence, which, alas, false historians do not and cannot have, since this episode is a fiction of the purest water, with the aim of vilely denigrating the multifaceted military activities of the organizer of all the victories of the Soviet people, Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin whose personal contribution to the achievement of the great victory in the most terrible war in the history of mankind was truly grandiose. It's time to finally stop the vile fabrications about I.V. Stalin, give him his due. It is time, finally, to pay tribute to the Soviet military art, military leadership skills of military leaders, the heroism of the soldiers of the Red Army and the selflessness of home front workers. It's time, finally to return to the people his feet. Chapter 18, Khrushchev in Ukraine. Famine of 1946. The war aggravated the situation of the village, 
whose gross output in 1945 did not exceed 60 percent of the pre-war level. In addition, a severe drought in the summer of 1946, which hit Ukraine, Moldavia and the Volga region, caused severe famine. The rate of consumption of bread for rations in the city was reduced by 30 percent, and famine began in the village. It was one of the three famine years, 1921, 1933, 1946, in the 70 years of Soviet power, with which anti-Soviet reproached the communists, calling it genocide, monstrous crime, etc. History reference. According to the data of Doctor of Physical and Mathematical Sciences Ibor Eisenkov and Doctor of Historical Sciences V. Pesetsky, given in the book The Roar of Forgotten Storms, published in 1988, in pre-revolutionary Russia, from 1851 to 1911, that is, out of 60 years 40, we're poor and hungry. Compare, 40 out of 60 and 3 out of 70. LB. According to the official data of those years and foreign sources, in 1891 more than 2 million people died of starvation in Russia, in 1900 to 1903, 3 million, in 1911. The year of death in a terrorist attack of the author of agrarian reforms, now glorified Stilipin, L. B., up to two million people. O. Aaron. In a trap. What did the Tsarist government do to change the situation? This is evidenced by the decree of Nicholas II, the very name of which speaks of the helplessness of the Tsarist government, on the preparation of bread from bards and straw flour as they can replace the use of rye bread. No less eloquent is just the list of titles of books published in those years on the situation in the countryside. A. Shinkrev The Extinct Village, 1902, A. Prutevkin The Starving Peasantry, 1906, A. Pankratov Without Bread, 1913, for the USSR. Number 4, 97. 2002. These are the horrors of the Holodomor that the Stalinist collectivization saved the peasantry from. But having made a short digression into history, let's return to Khrushchev's memoirs. Here is how the first person of the Ukrainian Republic conveys the story of the then Secretary of the Odessa Regional Party Committee A.I. Kirchenko, since March 1953, who became the first Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine. LB, colon when he arrived at some collective farm to check how people spend the winter, he was told to go to such and such a collective farmer. He went in, I found a terrible picture. I saw how this woman cut up the corpse of her child, either a boy or a girl, and kept saying, we've already eaten manika, and now we'll pickle vanukka. This will be enough for a while. This woman went mad from hunger and slaughtered her children. Can you imagine it? I reported everything to Stalin but in response I evoked only anger, softness. You are being deceived, they are deliberately reporting to pity you and force you to use up your reserves. Stalin began to treat my reports with noticeable caution. In Kirchenko's story, the following absurdities attract attention, which I v. Stalin, the high authorities are coming to the village, interested in how people spend the winter, and, presumably, he hears, we are nothing, but go into this house where our landmark lives a cannibal collective farmer. She has already devoured one of her children, and she has two of them in total. So, it may very well turn out that she will eat the second one. Part Hygienos Kirchenko bursts into the house and sees how this woman cuts the corpse of her child before his eyes. Out of excitement, the secretary of the regional committee immediately could not even determine the sex of this child, whether a boy or a girl. I didn't realize even when the mother murderer began to say, We've already eaten manika, and now we'll pickle vanukka. Fiercely, party lord Kirchenko could only go to a village to which, as he knew for sure, assistance had already been provided. Secondly, the villagers could not be so indifferent to the murder of the first child, manika, and had to report to the competent authorities in order to isolate the mother killer, and not wait for the arrival of high authorities to poke at the door with indifference and murmur, You are welcome, come here. Another victim is planned here. Thirdly, at the moment when Kirchenko told Khrushchev this sentimental story, he could no longer be mistaken in the field of the child. Enough time has passed to realize to himself that the child who was gutted in front of him was a boy, Vanukka. Fourth, when Khrushchev told IV to Stalin, this bike, or even more so, brought it in his memoirs after many, many years, he could have corrected something, 
made appropriate clarifications to the expressions some kind of collective farm, to such and such a collective farmer, cut the corpse not a boy, not a girl. But for some reason he didn't. And he also wanted IV to believe him. Stalin. Biographer Khrushchev Vien. Shevelev states, Khrushchev turned to Stalin with a request for help. Such assistance was provided, which somewhat alleviated the severity of the food crisis in Ukraine. However, Khrushchev himself fell into disgrace. Stalin expressed his dissatisfaction with the fact that the Ukrainian leadership was not up to par. And this is a historical fact. Compare with what Khrushchev writes in his memoirs, I convinced that Ukraine needed help, but only aroused Stalin's anger even more. We received nothing from the center. The hunger is gone. Do you feel how Khrushchev justifies himself? Biographer, I asked for help, I got help, the severity of the crisis subsided. And, Khrushchev. I asked for help, I did not receive it. The famine has begun. There is nothing surprising in the fact that IV. Stalin in February 1947 signs the resolution of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks on the strengthening of party and Soviet work in Ukraine and sends L.M. Koganovich, who at the plenum of the Ukrainian Bolshevik Party organization in early March was elected the first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, B of Ukraine, and as a result, 1947 turned out to be fruitful. Koganovich did not get out of the village, Ukraine fulfilled the grain procurement plan ahead of schedule, and Lazar Moisevich was recalled to Moscow at the end of that year. And this was a sign of the fact, and Khrushchev himself says this in his memoirs, that IV Stalin, as it were, return his trust to Makita and 525 coils. In December 1945, Khrushchev sent in the name of IV Stalin's memorandum, in which he reported on the activation of Ukrainian nationalists in western Ukraine in connection with the approaching elections to the Supreme Soviet of the USSR and asked for help with the troops of the Carpathian and Glovov military districts. The Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, OUN, hostile to Soviet power, headed by Stepan Bandera, organized pogroms of state institutions, killed Soviet patriots organized terrorist attacks and arson, in a word, committed excesses. IV. Stalin this time also helped Khrushchev, instructing him to organize extermination battalions to fight against the Aun. But if IV. Stalin, and only he, could issue an order to continue hostilities against the Aun, then how shameful it was for Khrushchev to send a request to the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks addressed to IV. Stalin dated September 18, 1946 with a request to take on the support of the state of the fighter battalions operating against the Aun and to allocate 104,300 DTSM of tarpaulin for the tops of boots, 774 DTSM of yuft for the fronts of boots. 20,380 DTSM of plantar leather, 196,000 meters of calico for underwear and, 525 coils, Wolf C2C.632. Given Stalin's dissatisfaction with Khrushchev at that time, it is quite possible that he refused this economic request. Maybe even in an offensive way, which would be quite natural. How did relations between Khrushchev and Koganovich evolve after the former was forced to cede leadership in the Ukrainian party organization to the latter? About the mood with which Khrushchev spent his days from March 3 to December 1947, when he was forced to cede the palm to Lazar Moisevich, we find in his memoirs, Koganovich was looking for some opportunities to show himself, and here he unbelted, and gave vent to his rudeness, literally rudeness. I had a very bad relationship with Koganovich, well, just an intolerant relationship. He launched a frenzied activity in two directions, against the Ukrainian nationalists and against the Jews. Himself a Jew, and against the Jews? Or, perhaps, it was directed only in a targeted way against those Jews who were on friendly terms with me? Most likely so. And he also accused IV Stalin of paranoia, LB. After the defeat of the nationalist armed movement of the Aun underground nationalist militant groups continued to operate in western Ukraine for several more years and terrorist attacks continued against Soviet workers, against civilians who sympathized with the communists. Bandera himself fled to the west and relied on cooperation with the intelligence agencies of the United States, Great Britain and Germany and carrying out subversive work in Ukraine. However, Khrushchev also got him in Munich 
where he was eliminated. The former head of the Lviv regional wire of the Aun, Zastavny, rehabilitated by Khrushchev as a victim of Stalinist repressions, LB, taught his like-minded people, the period of fighting with a pistol and machine gun is over. Another period has come, the period of the struggle for youth, the period of growing into Soviet power with the aim of its rebirth under Bolshevik slogans. Our goal is to penetrate all kinds of posts, to be in the leadership of industry, transport, education as much as possible, in the leadership of youth, to instill youth everything national. Pizikov S.197 Well, Stepan Bandera would be glad today if he knew that his cause seemed to be triumphant, but only as if, because history has not yet said the last word. Chapter 19 I. V. Stalin and the Jewish Question in the USSR on the history of the struggle against cosmopolitanism. Quote, in order not to be branded as an anti-Semite, call a Jew a cosmopolitan. From the set of wit of the wise men of Zion, V.M. Molotov, whose wife Polina Zemchuzina was arrested for revealing long-standing ties to international Zionist circles, told writer Felix Chuev, Stalin was not the anti-Semite he is sometimes portrayed as. He noted many qualities in the Jewish people, efficiency, solidarity, political activity. Their activity is above average, of course. Therefore, they are very hot in one direction and very hot in the other. Under the conditions of the Khrushchev period, these second ones raised their heads. They treat Stalin with fierce hatred. In its desire to prove that state anti-Semitism allegedly existed in the USSR in the 1940s and early 1950s, World Zionism uses two historical facts. The struggle against cosmopolitanism after the victory of the Soviet people over Nazism and the case of killer doctors, which was initiated using a letter from the cardiologist of the Kremlin hospital Lydia Timashuk to the head of security IV. Stalin Vlasic, who had been written off to the archive for five years already, where, by the way, there was no talk of any Jews, and the main culprits in the death of A.A. Jdanov were Russian doctors. Vinogradov and Zelenin. This is the largest provocation of the conspirators Malenkov, Beria, Khrushchev, Bolganyan, who organized the arrest of doctors in order to deprive IV refers neither to the campaign against cosmopolitanism, nor to the organization of the persecution of the Jews, and not from any side, to J.V. Stalin himself. Nevertheless, International Zionism proclaimed the doctor's plot as the culmination of the anti-Jewish campaign in the Soviet Union. The author of the book In the Trenches of Stalingrad, Stalin Prize in 1947, Defector V. Nukrasov, in a dirty slanderous book published over the hill Saperlipipit, or if yes, if only mushrooms grew in your mouth, writes that to end of life IV. Stalin was obsessed with the idea of Zionist conspiracies and considered Hitler's final solution to the Jewish question correct and even brilliant. A. Antonov Ovsienko, D. Volkogonov R. Medvedev. You. If Stalin had died later, Soviet Jews would have been deported and genocide without exception. The same units that Stalin would have left in the central cities as a sign of special mercy would have to constantly wear yellow six-pointed stars on their sleeves as a sign that they are outlaws. There was a Stalinist scenario for the massacre of the killer doctors. The death penalty by hanging was to take place on Red Square with a large gathering of people. Some criminals were to be executed while others were allowed to be recaptured from the guards by the angry mob and torn to pieces on the spot. Then the crowd was supposed to carry out Jewish pogroms in Moscow and other cities. As if saving the Jews from the just wrath of the peoples of the USSR, they had to be gathered at concentration points and sent by echelon to Siberia. Dot. Khrushchev recounted to Aaron Borg his conversation with I.V. Stalin, who allegedly instructed him, it is necessary that cruel reprisals take place in all doorways during evictions. There is no need to pity them, you need to let the people's anger pour out. No more than half should reach the place. Dot. According to Stalin's plan, freight cars with Jews were to be sealed to their destination, and for 10 to 15 days of travel people had to travel without water, food and toilets. In 1993, the Novo Vremium magazine, knows. 2 and 3 published an outright fake, which claimed that the Minister of Defense Bolganyan allegedly received a secret order from Stalin in January 1953 to bring several hundred military men to Moscow and other major centers of the country.
trains to organize the eviction of Jews. And in order to deal with them on the way, as stated in the note, they planned to organize train wrecks, as well as spontaneous terrorist attacks on trains with Jews. All this nonsense has no factual basis, and is designed for the same idiot readers, which are the authors themselves. Take, for example, the question of Stalin's secret instructions to Bulganian. Yes, Bulganian became the Minister of Defense of the USSR in 1953, but only this happened in March, actually after the death of Stalin. After his death, Stalin could not give instructions to Bulganian about organizing the eviction of Jews. True, Bulganian was from 1947 to 1949 Minister of the Armed Forces of the USSR, but then was dismissed and by the end of Stalin's life, when the eviction of the Jewish population was supposedly planned, he did not have real power to carry out such a large-scale action. It would be better if the authors of the note said that Lavrendi Palich received a secret instruction, Beria did not endure such things. Khrushchev in his memoir said, I remember that in the early 50s there were some rough edges, something like bagpipes, among the youth at the 30th aviation plant. They reported this to Stalin through the party line. And the state security also reported, the instigators were attributed to the Jews. When we were sitting with Stalin and exchanging opinions, he turned to me, as to the secretary of the Moscow City Party Committee, we need to organize healthy workers, let them take clubs and, when the working day is over. Beat these Jews. Bulgaria is a good country, but Russia is the best. How did the campaign against cosmopolitanism begin? On what foreign policy background did it take place? Did the destroyed and devastated post-war Soviet Union, even already possessing an atomic bomb, really pose a threat to the West in those years and with its anti-Jewish actions incited it to unleash a third world war? On January 2, 1946, an outstanding Soviet physicist, a Jew by origin, academician P.L. Kapiet Sassenti V. Stalin wrote a letter in which, in particular, he wrote, It is clearly felt that now we need to strengthen our own original technology in an enhanced way. We must do our own way, and the atomic bomb, and jet engine, and oxygen intensification, and much more. We can do this successfully only when we believe in the talent of our engineer and scientist and respect him. And when we finally understand that the creative potential of our people is not less, but even more than others, and we can safely rely on it. That this is so, apparently, is also proved by the fact that for all these centuries no one has managed to swallow us. The answer to this letter came in April, after in March 1946, W. Churchill, in his tough confrontational speech in Fulton did not leave IV. Stalin and a shadow of doubt that all hopes for peaceful post-war cooperation collapsed. The termination of Allied relations with the USSR and the Cold War of the West with the Soviet Union had been planned by the White House since September 1945, when Harry Truman signed the Dropshot Plan, as the Yankees called their version of Hitler's Barbarossa Plan, according to which the United States was recognized the right to a first strike in the war with the Soviet Union. And at the same time it was planned to drop 300 atomic bombs on 100 cities of our country at the same time. However, the atomic diplomacy of the 33rd U.S. president failed when the first Soviet atomic bomb was tested in the Soviet Union on August 29, 1949. Under these conditions, when Churchill announced to the world that the USSR was being placed in a position of foreign policy isolation, the concept of the Iron Curtain. IV. Stalin gladly approved the line of the scientist P.L. Kopyatsa to strengthen the education of people in the spirit of Soviet patriotism. And precisely because IV. Stalin took a course to combat anti-patriotism, to combat servility, servility to the West, to fight for the priority of Soviet science. In October 1952 the first Soviet electronic computer was created, on June 27, 1954 already after the death of Joseph Vissarionovich, for the first time in the world, a nuclear power plant was put into operation in Obninsk. On October 4, 1957, the world's first artificial Earth satellite was launched. On December 5 of the same year, the world's first nuclear icebreaker Lenin was launched. On the same day, the world's most powerful elementary particle accelerator, the Synchrophysitron, created by a group of scientists led by academician V.I. Vexler, a Jew by nationality, a Soviet patriot. I.V. Stalin, 
unfortunately, did not manage to live up to these days of the triumph of Soviet science, did not happen to know the name of U.A. Gagarin, who made the first breakthrough into space in the history of mankind on the Vostok spacecraft, but he knew that these days would come, because he himself organized these successes of the Soviet motherland, which are directly related to the very struggle for the priority of our science, the struggle against cosmopolitanism on all fronts of public life. History has preserved another document of that era, which expresses the position of another major scientist of Jewish origin, academician L.D. Landau in this document refers to 1947. Landau wrote, The patriotic line will harm our science. We are even more fenced off from advanced scientists and technicians. I am an internationalist, but they call me a cosmopolitan. I do not divide science into Soviet and foreign. It makes absolutely no difference to me who made this or that discovery. Therefore, I cannot take part in that exaggerated emphasis on the priority of Soviet and Russian science, which is now being carried out. Regarding the exaggerated underlining in the set of witties of the wise men of Zion, a new sarcastic mockery arises. Yes, this question is not new, Russia is the birthplace of elephants. However, the wise men of Zion prefer not to remember that IV. Stalin, paying tribute to the Russian people, nevertheless, just in 1949, true, erroneously, under the influence of the slanders of the conspirators, gave the green light to the initiation of a major Leningrad case, the case of Russian nationalism, in which many more people suffered than Jews in the case of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, JAC, and the case of doctors, taken together, LB, the internationalist and cosmopolitan leave Landau of course, wanted to erase from the history of science the fact that it was in Russia that the steam locomotive and motor ship, the telephone, radio and airplanes, the electric light bulb and penicillin were invented. But despite such oppositional moods, it was during these years, Leif Landau received the Stalin Prize three times, 1946, 1949, 1953. So what is the slander against IV? Stalin which was erected on his good name by the evil tongues of the Zion wise men. L.B. Dot. On the balcony, two friends were dancing boogie-woogie. The strengthening of the weight of patriotic ideas was manifested in the moral condemnation of people who are too fond of modern Western pseudo-art and mass culture. In January 1949, Pravda scathingly denounced an anti-patriotic group of theater critics who, the newspaper wrote, have no sense of national Soviet pride. In March 1949, the magazine Crocodile published a feuilleton by D. Beli F. Stiliga. So they began to call young people who wore tight trousers, intricate hairstyles and clothes of eye-catching colors, lovers of bright, as they said then, foreign stickers. They were addicted to the infamous boogie-woogie dance. Most of them did not have a high intellect. Few of them could formulate their social positions and political views. What kind of danger did they seem to pose? But it was precisely at such narrow-minded, ideologically unstable young people that the poisonous arrows of the subversive anti-Soviet broadcasts of the Voice of America, Svoboda and BBC radio stations were directed. We owe today's unprecedented servility to foreigners both at the level of power structures, I recall the verses on fashion and the weather about a boy who came to his native collective farm dressed up, as in the picture, in everything foreign, but when it started to rain, light yellow shoes were asked to drink right away, a shirt in a cage spread, a tie turned into trash, before our eyes everyone's vest is falling apart at the seams, and this long poem ends like this, one of the authors of the anthem of the Soviet Union, Sergei Vladimirovich Mikolkov, wrote, quote, we know that there are still families, where our people are criticized and scolded, where they look with tenderness at foreign stickers, and they eat Russian fat. End of quote. Why are portraits of Stalin still found on Israeli kibbutzim? Number 3 of the Spartacist Bulletin for 1992 provides the following interesting data. While the United States refused to accept ships with Jewish refugees fleeing Hitler, and Britain sent them to concentration camps in Australia during the war years, the Soviet Union was the only country that opened its borders to fugitives from fascist terror on any serious scale. After the German occupation of Western Poland, 
About 500,000 Jews fled across the Soviet border. More than 2 million Soviet Jews were transported from the western regions of the Soviet Union to Central Asia in order not to fall into the hands of the Nazi invaders. None other than the far-right Zionist Menachem Begin, the former Prime Minister of Israel, admitted, I cannot forget, and no Jew should forget this. Thanks to the Soviet Union, hundreds of thousands of Jews were saved from the hands of the Nazis. In fact, the number of Soviet and Eastern European Jews who survived the Nazi genocide thanks to the Soviet Union was much higher, perhaps around 3 million. As you know, the USSR played an exceptionally important role in the creation of the State of Israel. The UN made this decision at the initiative of the Soviet Union, and our country was the first to recognize the young state in early 1948. All military equipment by order of IV. Stalin was taken to Israel from Czechoslovakia as our gratuitous military aid. Unfortunately, we have not received a new ally in such an important region of the world as the Middle East. And international Zionism is to blame for this, which did everything possible and impossible so that the Israeli Communist Party did not break through to power. It is precisely for this reason that VM Molotov lost the post of Minister of Foreign Affairs of the USSR and N.A. Bolganyan, Minister of the Armed Forces, I.V. Stalin wondered how these two experienced ministers could not understand where Israel would go. More than half a century has passed, but the Israeli old people gratefully keep the memory of the man who actually gave them their homeland. In some Israeli kibbutzim you can still find portraits of I.V. Stalin. As for the mood of the Jews in the USSR at that time, the nationalist Jews remained euphoric about the new state even after it became clear that Israel followed the path of Zionism and anti-Sovietism, and was completely focused not on the USSR, which was devastated during the years of the hardest war, but on America, fabulously enriched in the Second World War. Edward Rajinsky describes the meeting of the first Israeli ambassador to the USSR, Golda Meir, who solemnly arrived in Moscow on September 3, 1948. An unprecedented crowd of 50,000 people gathered in front of the synagogue, where Golda Meir came. There were soldiers and officers, old people, teenagers and babies, raised high in the arms of their parents. Our Golda, Shalom, Gold, live and hello, greeted her. These words inspired the nationalist poet to these lines, quote, We are slowly getting old, we are approaching the ashes, what can I say? I was a Jew at such a time on earth. End of quote. The meeting of Golda Meir at the synagogue was organized by the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, as it was established, associated with the Zionist organization Joint, which at one time collaborated with Hitler. On November 21, 1948, the Jack was dissolved, and a year later all its members were arrested, Lazovsky, Fifer, Yusfovich, Kvitko, Markish, Gofstein, and Sturm. On May 8, 1952, their close trial began. One of the points of accusation was their project of creating the Crimean Jewish Autonomy. I remind you that the Crimean Tatar Autonomy was abolished just two years before, on June 26, 1946. L.B. When I.V. Stalin was first informed about this, he said, back in the 34th year, we allocated national autonomy to the Jews as part of the Kubarovsk territory. What else do they need? According to Khrushchev, Stalin regarded the matter as follows. There is an action of American Zionists. The members of this committee are agents of Zionism who want to create their own state in the Crimea in order to tear it away from the Soviet Union and establish agents of American imperialism there. And then Khrushchev continues, but then we all fed on Stalin's reasoning and succumbed to his influence. Stalin's idea of espionage came about because Crimea is a maritime border accessible to foreign ships. He believed that this could not be allowed from the point of view of defense. After all, we have always stood on the point of view that it is necessary to strengthen the defense, and not weaken it. However, this issue has never been discussed in essence but only the point of view of caution and vigilance was expressed. It was then that Stalin showed vigilance, and he stopped the encroachments of world Zionism, its attempts to create a support in our country for the struggle of American imperialism against us. After the death of I.V. Stalin, Khrushchev, in order to permanently stop the encroachments of world Zionism, will tear Crimea away from Russia and give it to his native Ukraine, thus, casually, 
creating a source of serious showdowns between the two once fraternal republics after the liquidation of the Soviet Union. Jews, Jews, only Jews around. Soviet Jews actively participated in the peaceful creative work of our entire multinational people. The best exposure of the myth about the anti-Jewish nature of the Cosmopolitan campaign could be the lists of thousands of names of Soviet scientists, artists, writers and poets, athletes of Jewish nationality, awarded the highest state awards in these years. Let's listen to the memoirs of the poet Konstantin Simonov when they began to discuss the novel by Aurist Maltsev the Yugoslav tragedy by I.V. Stalin sharply asked, why Maltsev, and Rovinsky in brackets, what's the matter, how long will this continue? Last year, they already talked about this topic, they forbade nominating for the award, indicating double surnames. But, apparently, someone is pleased to emphasize that this is a Jew. Why emphasize it? Why do it? Why promote anti-Semitism? who needs it. This was said during a discussion of the works nominated for the Stalin Prize. So, in the 40s, including the period from 1949 to 1953, a third of all Stalin Prizes were received by figures of science and technology, culture and art of Jewish nationality. Among them are writers, Samuel Marshik, 1942, 1946, 1949, 1951, Ilya Ehrenborg, 1942, 1948-1951, Emanuel Kozakvich, 1948-1950, Mikhail Zakovsky, 1943-1949, and others. Film directors, Yuli Raisman, 1941-1943-1946, twice, 1950-1952, singers Mark Ryzen, 1941-1949-1951, Ivan Kozlovsky, 1941-1949, actor Igor Ilinsky, 1941-1942-1951, composers Dmitry Shostakovich, 1941-1942-1946-1950-1952, Rungold Glier, 1946-1948-1950, violinist David Oistrakh, 1943 cartoonist Boris Yefimov, 1950-1951, and many, many others, whose voice during the war years was perceived by children as the voice of Stalin, Juyuri Borisovich Levitan, whose voice was more harmonious for football fans from the 20s to the end of the 60s than any music, Juvadim Sviatoslavovich Sinevsky, who owned the world chess crown during the three five-year plans, from 1948 to 1963, as if personifying Stalin's demand, all world records must be Soviet. Jew Mikhail Moiseevich Botvinnik, who was one of the closest associates of I.V. Stalin, the last of the Mohicans, who died shortly before the liquidation of the USSR in 1991. Julazar Moiseevich Kaganovich, which of the Jews, except for L. Kaganovich, was a member of the Central Committee of the Party until the death of I.V. Stalin. These are Colonel General Lev Zakrovich Meklas and Colonel General Boris Lvovich Vekov, three times hero of socialist labor. Of the eleven members of the Politburo in 1949, how many were related to Jews? As many as nine. Comma including, by the way, Joseph Vissarionovich himself whose grandson and granddaughter from the first marriage of his daughter Svetlana Stalin were half-Jews. I.V. Stalin was not an anti-Semite, although Khrushchev in his memoirs tries to present him as such. Stalin included in his collected works a document which stated, anti-Semitism as an extreme form of racial chauvinism is the most dangerous remnant of cannibalism. Anti-Semitism is dangerous for working people like a false path that leads them astray and leads them into the jungle. That is why communists, as consistent internationalists, cannot but be irreconcilable and sworn enemies of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is strictly prosecuted in the USSR as a phenomenon deeply hostile to the Soviet system. Active anti-Semites are punishable by death under the laws of the USSR. Here you are. Zion wise men and state anti-Semitism. Zionism as a weapon of reaction. IV. Stalin knew that all anti-Semitic activity in the world is under the control of the most powerful Zionist organizations and that international Zionism will not fail to present the fight against servility and servility to the West, 
the fight against cosmopolitanism under the spicy sauce of the death of Jewish culture in the USSR as an anti-Jewish campaign, as aggressive anti-Semitism, kill the Jews, save Russia. This is also from the set of Witches of the Zion Wise Men, IV, Stalin, as a former People's Commissar, not only was not an anti-Semite, but, as we have seen, he did not know what discrimination on ethnic grounds is. The leader respected, appreciated and in every possible way encouraged people who were talented and devoted to the common cause, regardless of their nationality. At the same time, he saw a serious danger in international Zionism. In November 1939 IV, Stalin in a conversation with the Valkyrie of the Revolution, the legendary A.M. Ka Long Tai, he said prophetically, Many deeds of our party and people will be perverted and spat upon, primarily abroad, and in our country too. Zionism, striving for world domination, will cruelly take revenge on us for our successes and achievements. He still views Russia as a barbarian country, as a raw material appendage. And my name will also be slandered, slandered. Many evil deeds will be attributed to me. World Zionism will strive with all its might to destroy our union so that Russia can never rise again. The strength of the USSR lies in the friendship of the peoples. The spearhead of the struggle will be directed primarily to separating the border regions from Russia. Here, we must admit, we have not done everything yet. There is still a lot of work to be done here. Nationalism will raise its head with particular force. It will crush internationalism for a while. Many pygmy leaders will appear traitors within their nations. And yet, no matter how events develop, time will pass, and the eyes of new generations will be turned to the deeds and victories of our socialist fatherland. Dot. And may the words of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin come true, year after year, new generations will come. They will again raise the banner of their fathers and grandfathers and give us back in full. They will build their future on our past. Chapter 20 the bandit Tito is forever a bit card. Stalin, Khrushchev and the Tito clique. When Beria was tried in December 1953, among the accusations against him put forward by Khrushchev was an attempt to establish contact with the Tito clique. But six months later, Khrushchev himself takes a course towards reconciliation with Yugoslavia. And at the 20th Congress, Khrushchev, justifying his unprincipled course of rapprochement with Tito, accused IV. Stalin in tyranny in suspicion, in delusions of grandeur and other sins. And he spun, as if the words invented by him, Khrushchev, belong to I.V. Stalin, if I move my little finger, and there will be no Tito, he will fly off. Khrushchev met with the Yugoslav leaders Tito and Jilas in Kiev, where they were passing through, in March 1945 after they signed the Soviet-Yugoslav Treaty. This agreement will last only four years, and, ironically, will be broken on September 28, 1949, on the very day when Khrushchev, recalled by IV Stalin from Ukraine, will be elected first secretary of the Moscow City Party Committee and secretary of the Central Committee, LB. But then, in 1945, a feeling of mutual trust and sympathy arose between Tito and Khrushchev, and when exactly ten years later, in the spring of 1955, Khrushchev with Bulgon Yin, Mikoyan and Shipilov arrive in the capital of Yugoslavia, at the Belgrade airfield, at a meeting with Tito and his people, Khrushchev will make the following statement. We sincerely regret what happened and resolutely brush aside all the accretions of this period. For our part, we attribute to these layers the provocative role played in relations between Yugoslavia and the USSR by the now exposed enemies of the people, Beria. Abakamov and others. We thoroughly studied the materials on which the grave accusations and insults that were then leveled against the leadership of Yugoslavia were based. The facts show that these materials were fabricated by the enemies of the people, the contemptible agents of imperialism who tricked their way into the ranks of our party. We are deeply convinced that the period when our relations were overshadowed is over. At the negotiations, which lasted for one week, the Yugoslav side behaved defiantly arrogantly and with frank mockery, especially when the Khrushchevites spoke about the scoundrel Beria and at the same time praised IV Stalin. This is how the British ambassador to Yugoslavia described the reception of the Soviet delegation led by Khrushchev. A large group of Soviet diplomats came to the reception together with Khrushchev and Bolgonyi. They were terribly dressed, in some kind of wide, dangling trousers. The Yugoslavs 
who were very elegant, looked with horror at the fellow Slavs, who still harbored the hope of putting their country under the heel. But Tito was a tough nut to crack. Shevelev Vieninis Khrushchev. Rostovadon. P.141. Western journalists noted in their reports that Khrushchev was rarely sober during this visit. Ibid. Westar Yosef Braz Tito, The Power of Strength, Smolensk. 1997. And although he managed to create in the USSR the illusion of reconciliation with the ambitious Belgrade, it was not for nothing that it was said that Tito was a hard nut to crack, he did not even think of following Khrushchev's lead. Subsequently, Khrushchev recalled, I did not know everything about what caused the deterioration of relations between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, but I knew something. Stalin sent me some telegrams received from the Soviet ambassador in Yugoslavia. Khrushchev is lying, because such correspondence is conducted through diplomatic mail and is immediately classified. Yes, after a few lines, the reader himself will be able to verify this from the lips of Khrushchev himself. LB. In these telegrams. Our ambassador portrayed Tito's activities in a nationalist light and did everything to show that this is not a friendly country, that the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, under the leadership of Tito, is carrying out subversive work against our Communist Party, then I worked in Ukraine and did little on international issues, because I was, as it were, isolated in these cases and did not receive the relevant documents. But I.V. Stalin, nevertheless, allegedly sent him some telegrams from the Soviet ambassador to Yugoslavia. And why on earth? Who would have asked Khrushchev, what was the name of this very ambassador? It is unlikely that he remembered that the name of that ambassador was A.I. Lavrentiev, L. B. Dot. At the July, 1955, plenum of the Central Committee of the CPSU, shortly after returning from Belgrade, the causes of the conflict with Yugoslavia were discussed in detail. At the same time, Khrushchev noted a very unworthy role of Stalin. Because in the Yugoslav question there were supposedly no such problems that could not be resolved through a comradely party discussion. There were no serious grounds for the emergence of this question, it was quite possible. The political pygmy Khrushchev believed, to prevent a break with this country. However, as he noted, this does not mean that the Yugoslav leaders did not have mistakes or shortcomings. But these mistakes or shortcomings were simply monstrously exaggerated by Stalin, which led to a break in relations with our friendly country. CHR. Report. 1955. Speaking of this, Khrushchev does not yet suspect that events await him in Poland, Hungary, the Soviet Baltic states, when the dark nationalist forces awakened by him who did not dare to declare themselves in the Stalin era, will raise their heads there. Today, when both Yugoslavia and the USSR have been wiped off the map of the world as sovereign UN member states, and are designated by publicists and political scientists with the offensive word former, when the issue of joining NATO of a number of Eastern European socialist countries, where genocide against the majority is successfully carried out, has been decided people by bourgeois Democrats. Life itself confirmed the justice and foresight of I.V. Stalin, who knew that Tito's mistakes and shortcomings pose a serious danger to the cause of socialism, and not only in Yugoslavia, precisely because of their revisionist nature. It was with this revision of a number of fundamental provisions of Marxism-Leninism that Tito attracted the leader of international revisionism of the second half of the 20th century, Khrushchev. I.V. Stalin, as the head of the foreign policy of the USSR. In Khrushchev's report at the 20th Congress looks like this, Stalin's arbitrariness manifested itself not only in resolving issues of the country's internal life, but also in the field of international relations of the Soviet Union. So, according to Khrushchev, the entire leadership of I.V. Stalin's foreign policy of the USSR was arbitrariness, and the leader himself played an unworthy role in it. Let's see if it really happened. You have to be patient and know how to wait. One of the Yugoslav leaders Milo Vodjilos about his meeting with I.V. Stalin recalls, quite definitely, Stalin resolved the issue of rendering assistance to the Yugoslav fighters. When I mentioned the $200,000 loan, he said it was a trifle and that it would not help much, but that this amount would be handed over to us right away. And to my remark that we would return the loan and pay for the supply of weapons and other material after liberation, he was sincerely angry. You insult me. You will shed blood, 
and I will take money for weapons. I am not a merchant, we are not merchants, you are fighting for the same cause as we are, and we are obliged to share with you what we have. The events in Yugoslavia during the war, IV, Stalin monitored in the most attentive way. No matter how great the difficulties on the Soviet German front, IV, Stalin found it possible to provide then the People's Liberation Army of Yugoslavia, NOAU, over 800,000 fighters and partisans of Yugoslavia. LB took part in the fight against fascism, 155,000 rifles and carbines, more than 38,000 machine guns, 15,000 machine guns, 6,000 guns and mortars, 69 tanks, 41 aircraft, a large amount of ammunition and equipment. Andrei Van Yugoslav People's Army slash slash Red Star. 1956. 19th of September. The Red Army came to the aid of the Yugoslav partisans whenever a difficult situation developed for them. So it was, for example, in 1944, when the Fuhrer selected paratroopers landed in the area of the headquarters of the Noah in the Drivergorge and almost defeated him and captured Tito himself. In the midst of hostilities, at the direction of IV, Stalin, Soviet pilots landed in the headquarters area, and a special capture group led by Major General of State Security D.N. Shadron. He was one of the leaders of IV Stalin's personal guard in those years. L.B., under hurricane fire managed to save Tito from being captured by the Germans and take him to the Allied air base in Italy, for the salvation of Josip Braz Tito D.N. Shadron, A.S. Shornikov, B.T. Kalinkin. P.N. Yakimov was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union, and Marshal Tito, for his part, awarded them the title of People's Hero of Yugoslavia – Pound. The pinnacle of the military commonwealth of the Red Army and the People's Liberation Army of Yugoslavia was the Belgrade Operation, as a result of which Soviet and Yugoslav comrades in arms liberated the capital of Yugoslavia, the city of Belgrade. However, the help of the Soviet Union shortly after the signing of the Soviet-Yugoslav Treaty of Friendship in 1945 was forgotten, the Yugoslav political elite began to attribute all military merits in defeating the Nazis to Tito and his associates, who began to renounce Marxism-Leninism and carried out a revision of this great doctrine. Of course, IV, Stalin could not stand this, and he sent a letter addressed to Tito with the following content, we know, wrote IV, Stalin that anti-Soviet statements are being spread in the leading circles of Yugoslavia, such as the CPSU, B, is degenerating and great power chauvinism reigns in the USSR, the USSR is striving to enslave Yugoslavia economically, come in form as a means of enslaving other parties by the CPSU, B, etc. These anti-Soviet statements are usually covered up with left-wing phrases to the effect that socialism in the USSR is no longer revolutionary, that only Yugoslavia is the true bearer of revolutionary socialism. Of course, it is ridiculous to hear such chatter about the CPSU, b, from dubious Marxists like Gilos, Vukmanovic, Kardel, Rankovic and others. Dokuchev pp.345-346 Letter to IV Stalin was discussed at a meeting of the Central Committee of the CPY, after which an answer was given in which Soviet accusations were rejected as aimed at undermining the authority of the Yugoslav leaders, as pressure from a great power on a small country, which humiliates national dignity and threatens the sovereignty and independence of Yugoslavia. All members of the Central Committee, except for Zajovic and Hibarang, voted in favor of this litter, and Zuiovich and Tiborang were soon arrested and shot for treason. Mass repressions began in Yugoslavia against everyone who stood for friendship with the Soviet Union, especially among the military, including top commanders, who had recently fought shoulder to shoulder against a common enemy together with the Red Army and wished to continue friendship with the USSR. In the current situation, IV, Stalin again turned to the leadership of the Yugoslav Communist Party. His new letter said, We believe that the unwillingness of the Politburo of the Central Committee of the CPY to honestly admit its mistakes and consciously correct them is based on the excessive arrogance of the Yugoslav leaders. After the successes achieved, their heads were spinning. Comrades Tito and Kardelj say in their letter about the merits and successes of the Yugoslav Communist Party that the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks previously recognized them, 
but now it is silent. This is not true. No one can deny the merits and successes of the CPY. They are undeniable. However, the merits and successes of the communist parties of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania are no less, and yet the leaders of these parties keep themselves modest and do not shout about their merits, unlike the Yugoslav leaders, who buzzed everyone's ears with their indefatigable bragging. The successes of the Yugoslav Communist Party are explained not by some special qualities, but mainly by the fact that after the defeat of the headquarters of the Yugoslav partisans by German paratroopers at a time when the People's Liberation Movement in Yugoslavia was in crisis, the Red Army came to the aid of the Yugoslav people, defeated the German invaders, liberated Belgrade and thereby created the conditions for the coming to power of the Yugoslav Communist Party. The successes of the French and Italian communists, to whom, unfortunately, the Red Army could not provide such assistance as was provided by the CPY, were comparatively greater than those of the Yugoslavs. If Comrade Tito and Kardelj had taken this circumstance into account as an indisputable fact, they would have made less noise about their merits and would have behaved with dignity and modesty. Of course, Tito understood that he could not compete with I.V. Stalin. Therefore, at the V Congress of the CPY on July 21, 27, 1948, where he was again elected Secretary General of the Central Committee of the CPY, his last phrase was, Long live Comrade Stalin. Then in a narrow circle he will declare, This is not groveling. So it was necessary for our masses. Stalin's authority is undeniable. Of course, he saw that not one of the more than 80 communist parties in the conflict that had taken place supported either him or Yugoslavia. Everyone bowed before the authority of Stalin and agreed with his conclusions about the Yugoslavs. IV. Under these conditions, Stalin took a reasonable and correct position, aimed at the fact that time is needed for the Yugoslavs to understand their behavior. He said, for this you need to show patience and be able to wait. What Khrushchev did not have to know. On January 17, 1948, G. Dimitrov holds a press conference in Sofia, at which he declares the desirability of creating a federation or confederation of the Balkan and Danube states, including Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Greece. Since the West continued to accuse the Soviet Union of supporting the communist partisans of Greece, such a statement by the authoritative leader of Bulgaria caused an unhealthy stir in the world press. IV. Stalin sends a telegram to G. Dimitrov. It is difficult to understand what prompted you to make such careless and ill-conceived statements at a press conference. On January 28, Pravda denounces the idea of organizing a federation or confederation of the Balkan and Danubian countries, including Poland, Czechoslovakia, Greece and creating a customs union between them as problematic and far-fetched. VM. Molotov on behalf of IV. On February 1st, Stalin sent a telegram addressed to I. Braz Tito, Do you consider it normal that Yugoslavia, having a mutual assistance agreement with the USSR, considers it possible not only not to consult with the USSR about sending its troops to Albania, but not even inform the USSR about this in the subsequent order? For your information, I inform you that the Soviet government quite by chance learned about the decision of the Yugoslav government to send your troops to Albania from private conversations between Soviet representatives and Albanian workers. The USSR considers such an order abnormal. But if you consider such a procedure to be normal, then I must declare, on behalf of the government of the USSR, that the Soviet Union cannot agree to be confronted with a fait accompli. And, of course. It is clear that the USSR, as an ally of Yugoslavia, cannot be held responsible for the consequences of such actions carried out by the Yugoslav government without consultations and even without the knowledge of the Soviet government. Dot. And after another three days, VM Molotov on behalf of IV, Stalin sends a telegram to Sofia and Belgrade in which he accuses Georgi Dimitrov of disrupting the work of the USSR on the preparation of a number of treaties on mutual assistance, an unsuccessful interview with Comrade Dimitrov and Sofia gave rise to all sorts of talk about the preparation of an Eastern European bloc with the participation of the USSR. In the current situation, 
The conclusion by the Soviet Union of mutual assistance pacts directed against any aggressor would be interpreted in the world press as an anti-American and anti-English step on the part of the USSR, which could facilitate the struggle between the aggressive forces of the United States and Britain. February 10 in the Kremlin office of IV, Stalin, a tripartite Soviet-Bulgarian-Yugoslav meeting takes place. From Bulgaria there are G. Dimitrov, V. Kolarov and T. Kostov. From Yugoslavia, E. Kardel, M. Jalos and V. Bikarik. Josip Broz Tita refused to go to this meeting, citing ill health. During the rampant frenzied anti-Stalinism, when all sorts of filth could be written about IV, Stalin, and the newspapers printed it with pleasure. The hackneyed publicists thought up that in the right drawer of his desk, IV, Stalin kept a loaded pistol ready in order to personally shoot Tito, and all this was the result of what Khrushchev said at the 20th Congress that, having lost a sense of reality, Stalin even declared, to whom specifically? It is enough for me to move my little finger, and Tito will no longer be, he will fall I have, Khrushchev selflessly composes, there is information, though requiring additional study about specific measures to eliminate Tito, which Stalin proposed. Only why they were not implemented remains a mystery. L.B. V.M. Molotov, who listed all the actions of Bulgaria and Yugoslavia that were not coordinated with the USSR. When Molotov read out a paragraph from the Bulgarian-Yugoslav agreement on the readiness of the parties to oppose any aggression, no matter which side it comes from, I.V. Stalin reasonably remarked, but this is a preventive war, this is the most common commsomal attack. This is a common loud phrase that gives food to the enemy. Then he turned his righteous anger on G. Dimitrov. You and the Yugoslavs do not report on your affairs, we learn about everything on the street. You present us with fait accompli. Molotov summed up, and everything that Dimitrov says, what Tito says, is perceived abroad as having been said with our knowledge. The meeting continued the next day and ended with the signing of an agreement between the USSR and Bulgaria and Yugoslavia on consultations on foreign policy issues. On March 1, an expanded meeting of the Politburo is held in Belgrade, where Tito declares, Yugoslavia has confirmed its path to socialism. Russians see their role differently. The question must be looked at from an ideological point of view. Are we right or are they? We are right. We are not pawns on a chessboard. We must focus only on our own strengths. Tito agreed with the opinion of one of the members of the Politburo that the policy of the USSR is an obstacle to the development of the international revolution. Thus, the initiator of the break with the Soviet Union was the Yugoslav side and not I.V. Stalin, as Khrushchev claimed. Just as Goebbels brought the happy news of the death of Franklin Roosevelt to Hitler in the bunker, so the Yugoslav leaders experienced a feeling of deep satisfaction at the news of the grave state of I.V. Stalin. Yugoslav Vladimir Didier, biographer of Josip Broz Tito, describes the reaction of the Yugoslav top to this message, on March 4, 1953, Danny Ugg told me that Stalin was seriously ill. I called Zito. Milo Vangelos, LB. He also did not know anything. On a special phone, he reported this old man, nicknamed Tito, LB. Bevts, nicknamed Edward Cardell, LB, and Marco, nicknamed Alexander Rankovich, LB. I got dressed and went to Vukmanovich Tempo to tell the good news. I burst into his office, and we hugged for joy. Jido came. He told me. I am very glad that we beat Stalin when he was still in full force. And in gratitude for the good news, he gave me a gold watch given to him by Tito himself. Quoted from the book, Da Kuchev MS History Remembers. M. Sober, 1998. P. 379. And this was in those days when the whole world mourned together with the Soviet people over the death of I.V. Stalin. LB. The Yugoslav leaders never realized that their rash steps on the world stage, taken without the consent of the Kremlin and contrary to its intentions, in the conditions of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union did not have atomic weapons, were dangerous for the fate of the world. But IV. Stalin could not then publicly declare that Yugoslavia was challenging the imperialism of the West, and the USSR was holding it back because in this case the whole world would understand how much the USSR was afraid, and it was so, LB, nuclear conflict. This circumstance would only provoke the most aggressive Anglo-American circles into immediate action against the USSR, 
perhaps even with the use of atomic weapons, because the reactionary circles in the United States, led by President Truman, inspired by the experience of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, hatched insane plans for the one-time destruction of 300 cities of the Soviet Union. Khrushchev, the first secretary of the Republican Party organization, who simply did not have access to state secrets of particular importance, did not know all this, and should not have known. Chapter 21, Alexander Fadiev and the Thaw People, Ehrenborg, Tchaikovsky, Rom, Shostakovich, Tverdovsky, Bogodin, Kozakvich, Grossman. Khrushchev's Thaw In his memoirs Khrushchev writes, the word Thaw was put into use by Ehrenborg. He believed that after the death of Stalin, a Thaw began in people's lives. Deciding on the arrival of the Thaw and going for it consciously, the leadership of the USSR, including myself, was at the same time afraid of it, as if because of it, a flood would come that would overwhelm us and which would be difficult for us to cope with. They feared that the leadership would not be able to cope with its functions and direct the process of change in such a direction that it would remain Soviet. Blimey, here is a confession. Now let's imagine for a moment that Khrushchev didn't leave in 1964, and he rules safely for another seven years until his death in 1971, and that Mikhail Gorbachev, the delegate of the 22nd Congress, the first secretary of the Stavropol Regional Party Committee, immediately becomes his successor. Would we have achieved communism in 1980, as it was solemnly proclaimed in the program of the CPSU, adopted at that same 22nd Congress? Or would the bourgeois coup take place not in August 1991, but, according to the term of the reign of also Sergeyevich, in August 1977? And what, if not a flood? was Gorbachev's vile perestroika, the purpose of which was the robbery of public socialist property, and militant anti-Stalinism as an ideological weapon. But it was a direct continuation of Khrushchev's thought. And the flood could come then. Perhaps, this fear of a flood can explain the fact that, who spoke in February with sharp attacks on IV, Stalin Khrushchev in the summer of the same 1956 stated that the party will not allow Stalin's name to be given to the enemies of communism, and at the anniversary session of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR, dedicated to the 40th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution, he said, criticizing the wrong sides of Stalin's activities. The party fought and will fight against everyone who will slander Stalin. As a devoted Marxist-Leninist and a staunch revolutionary, Stalin will take his rightful place in history. Already on April 5, 1956, the Pravda newspaper published an article The Communist Party has won and is winning by loyalty to Leninism, in which those who, under the guise of condemning the cult of personality, are trying to question the correctness of the party's policy, were sharply condemned. And on April 7 in the same newspaper a reprint was given from the Chinese People's Daily. The author of this article, according to the historian Roy Medvedev, is Mount Sedong himself, L.B. The article on the historical experience of the dictatorship of the proletariat contained a virtual rejection of the course towards the Stalinization. And, finally, on July 2, Pravda publishes a large resolution of the Central Committee of the CPSU of June 30, 1956 on overcoming the cult of personality and its consequences, which historians regard as a step back from the notorious report. On May 14, 1957, Khrushchev spoke at a meeting with members of the Board of the Union of Writers of the USSR, where he said that among the intelligentsia there were individuals who began to lose ground under their feet showed certain vacillations and hesitations in assessing complex ideological issues related to overcoming the consequences of the personality cult. It is impossible to ride on a wave of criticism to a sweeping denial of the positive role of Stalin, to seek out only the shadow signs and mistakes in the struggle of our people for the victory of socialism. How then is it explained that Khrushchev abandoned the course he himself had declared in his closed report at the 20th Congress? As we later understood, this step back was just a tactical move by Khrushchev before taking two steps forward at the 22nd Congress, when the reburial of IV Stalin would raise a new wave of anti-Stalinism, LB. And yet there were reasons that forced Khrushchev to postpone his criticism of IV Stalin for a while. And these reasons were connected with the unprecedented activation of the entire anti-Soviet and anti-communist underground, both within the country and abroad 
with the enthusiasm of Khrushchev's speech at the 20th Congress. The events that immediately followed the 20th Party Congress in Poland and Hungary, and especially in Hungary, where tank diplomacy had to be used, radicalized the unprincipled youth, who lost all ideological guidelines after the death of I.V. Stalin. So, in 1957, the Central Committee of the Komsomol reported to the Central Committee of the CPSU that the entire group of the Seminar of Literary Translators of the Gorky Literary Institute, in response to explanations of the events taking place in Hungary, jumped up from their seats shouting, There has been a revolution in Hungary. We also need a revolution like in Hungary. Crushed. Thaw. S.280 How dangerous the delusions of the young dissidents of the late 1950s were for the cause of socialism can be judged by the program of the so-called Leningrad Organization Social Progressive Union, which aimed at overthrowing the communist dictatorship and creating a multi-party system under conditions parliamentary democracy. Then in Khrushchev's times, the best examples of high culture were replaced by bass dances rock and roll and boogie-woogie which did not require either mental or emotional stress. So-called dudes appeared in large cities, and even associations of dandies, they openly declared that they were convinced loafers and parasites and opposed themselves to the great plans for the construction of communism L.B. Alexander Pizikov, in his study of the Khrushchev Thaw, writes about the slogan hurry up to live that was popular in those years. This slogan reflected the emerging among a part of the youth primarily students, a tendency to move away from the enormity of plans, which was strongly supported by the authorities of the official image Soviet man. Part of the youth of the 1950s no longer wanted, like fathers, to live solely with the task of building a socialist society. She was interested in momentary, unnecessary problems, petty bourgeois questions, whether to dance in style or not, how to dress, what music to listen to. In 1957, a group of students from the Lithuanian Art Institute approached a local newspaper with a proposal to hold a discussion on the topic how to dance boogie-woogie, ignoring the planned study of the Marxist vision of art. These are the unhealthy, if not counter-revolutionary forces that Khrushchev awakened in the Philistine part of society with his notorious report. So it's not surprising that for some time he was forced to lick his own spit at IV. Stalin. Writer Ilya Ehrenborg. Let's see which of the writers and artists accepted Khrushchev's thaw, who did not accept it. One of the first writers who became a man of the thaw was, of course, the author of The New Meaning of the Beautiful Old Russian Word. Ilya Grigorievich Ehrenborg. He himself was not honored, despite all his past merits, to be present at the 20th Congress, but nevertheless left such a note for posterity. I am happy that I lived to see the day when I was summoned to the Writers' Union and given Khrushchev's report on the cult of personality to read. Why Ehrenborg did not please I.V. Stalin? Why was he not only outraged by the slander against the leader? But the very vile report aroused in him feelings of happiness. By the fact that Ilya Grigorievich was a member of a narrow meeting of the Committee for the Arts, Censorship Committee, which reviewed new works. Or the fact that I.V. Stalin always supported Ehrenborg, especially when his novels The Second Day, The Fall of Paris and The Tempest were subjected to sharp criticism. And he always gave the green light to his military journalism. Or the fact that shortly before his death, in January 1953, he personally presented this writer with the International Stalin Peace Prize. However, the diary entry of another Thaw man, Korny Chukovsky, dated June 18, 1954, throws light on the possible reason for this, in general, treacherous in relation to I.V. to Stalin of Ehrenborg's behavior, June 18. He corrects the transcript of his speech in honor of the Estonians. We started talking about Ehrenborg. I he says, was in the Kremlin at a reception in honor of the end of the war. Stalin stood up and made his famous toast to the Russian people, and er, suddenly he started crying. There was something offensive about it. According to Fedin, one of the writers on the sidelines of the Union called Ehrenborg the Patriarch of the Cosmopolitans, K. Tchaikovsky, from the diary dated June 18, 1954, Tchaikovsky K.I. Diary. M. 1994. However, being a smart and cautious person, Ehrenborg, unlike Khrushchev and others, did not actively slander the person to whom he owed a lot. The good doctor A.I. Bullet will heal everyone, heal everyone, 
in the journalistic Nick No. 3 for 1997, an amazing document was published, a letter sent to I.V. Stalin in 1943. It is striking in its callousness, cruelty and callousness, a vast group of children has formed in the country, whose moral decay inspires me with great anxiety. These decomposed children are a dangerous contagion for their schoolmates. Meanwhile, School groups do not always have the opportunity to get rid of these socially dangerous children. And examples are given. Seryosha Korolev, a student of the first grade B, was engaged in pickpocketing in the Novostidny cinema. School children during a children's performance, taking advantage of the darkness, began to shoot actors with slingshots. In the zoological garden, I saw 10-year-old boys who threw handfuls of dust in the monkey's eyes. What does the author of the letter propose to do with such children? For their re-education, it is necessary first of all to establish as many labor colonies as possible with a harsh military regime. The main occupation of the colony is farming. At the head of each colony you need to put a military man. A special department should be created to manage labor colonies. In the presence of colonies, it is possible to carry out a thorough cleaning of each school, remove socially dangerous children from there, and thereby save the main cadres of students from infection. Before I allowed myself to turn to you with this litter, I applied to various authorities, but decidedly achieved nothing. Knowing how close to your heart you take the fate of children and adolescents, I have no doubt that you, with all your titanic and enormous labors, will immediately take wise measures to radically resolve this formidable problem. Yes, although it is very difficult to imagine it, this monstrous project was put forward by none other than the author of Moidadir and the Good A.I. Bullet, a literary critic, doctor of philology, Korni Ivanovich Tchaikovsky, about how I.V. Tchaikovsky literally idolized Stalin, says his diary. Here in June 1930, G.I. Tchaikovsky, Diary 1930-1969, there appears an entry, in the historical aspect, Stalin, as the author of Collective Farms, is the greatest of the geniuses who rebuild the world. If he did nothing but Collective Farms, even then he would be worthy of being called the most brilliant man of the era. Here the writer describes how Stalin appeared with members of the Politburo at the 10th Congress of the Komsomil on April 22, 1936 where Korni Tchaikovsky and Boris Pasternak were invited as guests, what happened to the hall? And he, so in the text, L.B., stood a little tired, thoughtful and majestic. There was a huge habit of power, strength and at the same time something feminine, soft. I looked around, everyone had loving, tender, soulful and laughing faces. To see him, just to see him was happiness for all of us. Dimchenko. 24-year-old leader of the Ukrainian collective farm Comintern, initiator of the competition for a high yield of sugar beets, LB, addressed him all the time with some kind of conversation. And we were all jealous, envious, happy. Each of his gestures was received with reverence. I never even considered myself capable of such feelings. When he was applauded, he took out his watch, silver, and showed it to the audience with a lovely smile. We all whispered, hours, hours. He showed the clock, and then, dispersing, already near the hangar, they again remembered this watch. Pasternak whispered enthusiastic words to me all the time, and I told him, and both of us said with one voice, Ah, this Dimchenko overshadows him. We walked home with Pasternak, and both reveled in our joy. Tchaikovsky K. Diary. 1930-1969. M. 1995. P. 141. Yes, the refined Soviet intelligentsia was very far from the real needs of their country, from its great deeds and accomplishments. If all that two prominent writers could bear from this Congress was, clock, clock, he showed the clock and oh, this Dimchenko obscures him, and in the days when the whole country rejoiced at the crushing defeat of the Nazi hordes near Stalingrad, Korni Ivanovich was concerned about how comrade Stalin, whom he adored, would decide the fate of socially dangerous children and adolescents. And here is another entry from the same diary, June 16, 1962. I.V. Stalin had already been taken out of the mausoleum and buried near the Kremlin wall, L.B. From somewhere, a terrible book appeared on my desk, Ivanov Razumnik, Prisons and Exiles, a terrible indictment against Stalin, Yezhov and their henchmen, 
a campaign against the intelligentsia. All this scum wanted to eradicate the intelligentsia, hated all those who think on their own, not realizing that the intelligentsia is stronger than all of them, because if out of a million, here is another lover of lemons, LB, tortured by them, one escapes from their clutches, this one will curse their forever and ever, and his judgment will be recognized by all mankind. Tchaikovsky became an active man of the thaw and a staunch anti-Stalinist only because I.V. Stalin did not consider it necessary to answer his terrible letter and its inhumanity. That is why the refined intellectual Tchaikovsky allowed himself to call his former idol a scum, eradicating the independently thinking, oh, this Dimchenko, Intelligentsia, film director Mikhail Rahm. Another thaw man is film director Mikhail Ilyich Rahm, People's Artist of the USSR. 1950, laureate of the Stalin Prize in 1941, 1946, 1948, 1949 and 1951. The classic of Soviet cinema, who made such films as Lenin in October and Lenin in 1918, favored by I.V. Stalin, became one of his first antagonists, Nikita Sergeyevich's faithful lackeys in the fight against the cult of personality. It was he who Khrushchev who sharply criticized M. Kiorli's film The Fall of Berlin at the 20th Congress, instructed him to follow the progress of the withdrawal of the image of Stalin from Soviet cinema. Fortunately, there were not so many films at that time, but with I.V. Stalin and at all units. In addition to his two films, he had to work on the films The Great Glow by Kiorli, The Man with a Gun by Yudkevich, The Vibrick Side by Kozins van Trollberg, Yakov's Verdlov by Yudkevich. Valery Chikalov by Kolotizov, Alexander Parkomenko and Donetsk Miners by Lukov, His Name is Sukhbat or by Zarhi and Kiefitz, Defense of Zaritsyn by SNG Vaslev, Oath, The Fall of Berlin and The Unforgettable Year 1919 by Kiorli. I must say that in none of these films IV, Stalin did not act as the main character but appeared only in some key episodes. Rom had to pay special attention to revolutionary films in which the image of V.I. Lenin is revealed, so that even the spirit of Stalin would not be next to Ilyich, the third leader instructed him. And all the Stalinist episodes were conscientiously cut out by the director from the films, and Rom just wanted to throw them away, but then the directorate of the God's film Afond rose up, and no references from Rom to instruction from above helped. So. Thanks to the firm position of the leadership of this repository, the priceless Stalinist frames are alive to this day, and appeared only in some key episodes. Rom had to pay special attention to revolutionary films in which the image of V.I. Lenin is revealed, so that even the spirit of Stalin would not be next to Ilyich, the third leader instructed him. And all the Stalinist episodes were conscientiously cut out by the director from the films, and Rom just wanted to throw them away. But then the directorate of the God's film Afond rose up, and no references from Rom to instruction from above helped. So, thanks to the firm position of the leadership of this repository, the priceless Stalinist frames are alive to this day, and appeared only in some key episodes. Rom had to pay special attention to revolutionary films in which the image of V.I. Lenin is revealed, so that even the spirit of Stalin would not be next to Ilyich. The third leader instructed him. And all the Stalinist episodes were conscientiously cut out by the director from the films, and Rom just wanted to throw them away. But then the directorate of the God's film Afond rose up, and no references from Rom to instruction from above helped. So, thanks to the firm position of the leadership of this repository, the priceless Stalinist frames are alive to this day. At the same time, the intellectual Rom understood the true value of Khrushchev, recalling how he, during one of his many speeches, blurted out, Marx's ideas are, of course, good, but if they are smeared with pork fat, it will be even better. Rom sarcastically remarked, it would never have occurred to me, that the ideas of Marx can be smeared with lard. Composer Dmitry Shostakovich, the composer Dmitry Dmitrievich Shostakovich, a five-time winner of the Stalin Prize, 1941, 1942, 1946, 1950 and 1952, the author of many musical works, such as the famous Seventh, or Leningrad Symphony, Eleventh Symphony, did not stay away from the general line of Khrushchev's anti-Stalinism. 1905 an oratorio dedicated to the planting of forests according to the Stalinist plan for the transformation of nature, 
the solemn choir glory to Stalin, glory forever, in the film The Fall of Berlin, music for the film Unforgettable 1919. Having become a man of the thaw, Shostakovich in 1954 received the title of People's Artist of the USSR, and for the opera Karl Marx under Khrushchev he was awarded the Lenin Prize in 1958. Under Brezhnev in 1966, for the opera The Young Guard, he was given the Hero of Socialist Labor. For the sixth time, he received the state prize, as the Stalin Prize was renamed, in 1968. It would seem that the composer, favored by the Soviet government, had no reason to be dissatisfied with it. But, number now he is being raised as a fighter against totalitarianism, Stalinism. Are there any grounds for this? What was the civilian appearance of this? Of course, a talented person. Once glorifying I.V. Stalin in his musical works, Shostakovich in the era of Khrushchev hastened to disown his former idol and became in the forefront of the fighters with the shadow of Stalin. He left memoirs in which everything that he had created earlier, under I.V. Stalin, he explains completely perversely, it turns out that the 11th Symphony 1905 is a monument to Tukhashevsky, Meyerhold and other victims of Stalinism, and the 7th Symphony also not what everyone thinks, but something opposite. The Soviet writer Olga Fedorovna Bergholtz, by the way, who died the same year as the composer, 1975, L.B., left very heartfelt lines about Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony, the first performance of which took place in besieged Leningrad in the most difficult days. I apologize to the reader for the long quote, but I think it would be blasphemous to shorten it. August 9, 1942, after a long desolation, the white-columned hall of the Philharmonic was brightly, festively lit up and filled to overflowing with Lenin graders. The musicians took the stage. They hardly played in the winter. I didn't have enough strength. I didn't have enough breath, especially the brass ones. The orchestra was melting. Some went into the army, others starved to death. It is hard to forget the gray, winter dawns, when Yasha Babushkin, completely swollen like lead, dictated to the typist the next report on the state of the orchestra, the first violin is dying, the drum died on the way to work, the horn is dying. And yet those who remained selflessly rehearsed the desire of the orchestra to perform the 7th, Leningrad Symphony, here, in its homeland, in the besieged, half-dying, but not surrendered city, was almost unrealizable. Orchestra, almost a hundred people and 15 musicians survived. But still, Karl Ilyich Iliasberg stood at the conductor's podium. He was in a tailcoat, in a real tailcoat, as befits a conductor, and the tailcoat hung on him like on a hanger. He lost weight over the winter, a moment of complete silence, and then the music. And from the first strokes we recognized ourselves and our whole path in it, both the terrible, merciless force advancing on us, and our defiant resistance to it, and our sorrow and the dream of a bright world, and our undoubted future victory. And we, who did not weep over dying loved ones in the winter, now could not and did not want to hold back gratifying, soundless, burning tears, and we were not ashamed of them. And through this amazing music, the quiet, calm and wise voice of its creator, Dmitry Shostakovich, sounded all the time, coming from September 1941, when the enemy was rushing to the city of Lenin, I assure you, comrades, on behalf of all Lenin graders, that we are invincible and always stand at his combat post. Dot college works in three volumes. T. 2. L. 1973. S. 149 to 152. But what kind of explanation does Dmitry Shostakovich himself give? In memoirs the composer renounces all this. After all, just listen to how he lies. The Seventh Symphony was conceived before the war, and, therefore, it cannot be caused by Hitler's attack in any way. I was thinking about completely different enemies of humanity when I composed it, you know. Yes, who does he mean? L.B. In this symphony there is no mention of the siege of Leningrad, which was destroyed by Stalin. Hitler had only to finish it. Dot. Here's how, not Hitler, who pursued a policy of genocide against the Jews, not Nazism. But Stalin was the main enemy of the composer Shostakovich. Not fascists, 
but communists. What's it like? Poet Alexander Tvardovsky. Such a man of the thaw as Alexander Trifonovich Tvardovsky will remain a great literary opportunist in the history of world literature. He zealously praised I.V. Stalin, for whom it was no secret that the poet was the son of a dispossessed man, exiled to the Transural Taiga. Two older brothers of Tvardovsky, Konstantin, and Ivan, just two months later fled from the place of settlement and a month later the father fled from there with his fourth son, Pavel. With great difficulty, the father and his younger brother reached Smolensk, where the already recognized poet Alexander lived. Here is a father's story about a meeting with his son in August 1931, as presented by Ivan Tvardovsky. Pavlo Shaw and I are standing, waiting, but my heart is restless. However, I think differently. My own son. Maybe Pavloshaw will be sheltered. What has the boy done to him, dear brother? And he, Alexander, comes out, stands and looks at us silently. And then not a low, father, but how did you get here, Shura? My son, I say. Death to us there. Hunger, disease, arbitrariness is complete. So, they fled? I can only help in getting you free of charge to where you were. That's exactly what he said. I realized here that neither requests nor pleas will change anything. Dot street and risp. S.604. So, in the name of personal peace, Tvardovsky renounced his own father. I foresee an analogy that spiteful critics can bring in connection with the behavior of Alexander Tvardovsky, and I will answer that Pavlik Morozov had a completely different situation. He spoke out against his father in court to take you back to where you were for free. That's exactly what he said. I realized here that neither requests nor pleas will change anything. Dot street and risp. S.604. So, in the name of personal peace, Tvardovsky renounced his own father. I foresee an analogy that spiteful critics can bring in connection with the behavior of Alexander Tvardovsky, and I will answer that Pavlik Morozov had a completely different situation. He spoke out against his father in court to take you back to where you were for free. That's exactly what he said. I realized here that neither requests nor pleas will change anything. Dot street and risp. S.604. So, in the name of personal peace, Tvardovsky renounced his own father. I foresee an analogy that spiteful critics can bring in connection with the behavior of Alexander Tvardovsky and I will answer that Pavlik Morozov had a completely different situation. He spoke out against his father in court offender. Of course. The children of modern thieves in law will never go for such heroism. L.B. Tvardovsky reciprocated the leader. So, writing the poem Country and, the poet writes in his workbook, Stalin's speech deeply shocked. Digression, meaning lyrical digression, L.B. About Stalin unfolds under the direct impression of his speech, lit. Inheritance. M. 1983. T.93. P.372 And in March 1953, on the death of his beloved leader, Tvardovsky wrote the following lines, In this hour of greatest sadness, I will not find those words, so that they fully express our nationwide misfortune. But then Khrushchev came with his struggle with the shadow of Stalin, and Tvardovsky seemed to have been replaced. Now he is among the ardent anti-Stalinists. He goes out of his way to somehow please Khrushchev. In November 1963, while relaxing in Barvika, he meets among the vacationers the former personal secretary I.V. Stalin Alexander Nikolaevich Paz Kurbyshev. In his diary, he leaves such a mocking entry about this old man. Here, as a personal pensioner, a small bald man almost to the back of his head with a wrinkled, shaved old face, on which, however, a resemblance to a baby and a monkey appears. This man goes to the dining room, takes procedures, plays dominoes, watches bad movies in the cinema. The word rests here, like all old pensioners, and as if it were not even the same A.N. Paz Kurbyshev, the person closest to Stalin, his keykeeper and adjutant, and, perhaps, the uncle, and the slave, and the guard, and the advisor, and the confidant of his secret secret. Judging by the camp manuscripts, these were the guards, nondescript, inconspicuous, but vicious. Tvardovsky rushes about with his poem for the distance, as with a written bag, not daring to publish it even in his journal Novi Mir, where he worked as editor-in-chief, L.B., 
without the highest permission of Khrushchev. It is impossible to read without a feeling of disgust those humiliating entries contained in his workbook. Here, the repeated winner of the Stalin Prizes turns to Khrushchev's assistant V. Lebedev with the humblest request to transfer the chapters from the poem to himself, as well as an extremely sycophantic letter that ended with the words, Your kind paternal attention to me in the most difficult period of my literary and all kinds of fate which gave me the strength to complete this book, allows me to hope that this request of mine, dear Nikita Sergeyevich, you will not disregard. Even Khrushchev's assistant recommended to Tvardovsky to rewrite it. No, it's not that, you don't need to write all this. Then Tvardovsky writes another letter, Dear Nikita Sergeyevich, I really wanted to sincerely congratulate you on your birthday and bring you, on this occasion, as a memorial sign of my respect, what is most dear to me now, the final chapters of my ten-year work, the book Beyond the Far Distance partly already known to you and received your priceless words for me. Approval. Among these new, not yet published chapters, I allow myself to draw your attention to the chapter so it was, dedicated directly to the most difficult historical moment in the life of our country and the party, in particular, in the spiritual life of my generation, the period associated with with the personality of I.V. Stalin. It seemed to me that by means of poetic expression I was talking about what you had repeatedly expressed in political language. In any case, I think that this chapter is the key to the book as a whole, and I will be happy if you like it. I wish you, dear Nikita Sergeyevich, good health, long years of active life for the benefit and happiness of your native people and all the working people of the world. Yours Aid Vardovsky. And when, nevertheless, he receives the go-ahead and publishes his chapter so it was, in Pravda, he suddenly discovers that the reader's reaction is not quite what he expected. An entry will appear in his workbook, from some letters it is clear that the appearance in Pravda of this chapter is considered as a direct fulfillment of a certain order, an official poetic interpretation of a question, topic. An inclination towards a new cult is also seen, I mean the cult of Khrushchev. LB. For the first time I experience the impact of a previously unfamiliar wave, waves of condemnation, indignation, contempt, denunciation of venality, etc. Well, I took up the tug. Dot. Yes, indeed, it would be better not to take it. Remembering Tvardovsky, Khrushchev writes in his memoirs, just as everyone knew Demyon Bedny during the Civil War. So literally everyone knew Tvardovsky during the Great Patriotic War. Then whole books were written about his poems, and their heroes were depicted in paintings. Stalin looked with emotion at the picture with Vasily Turkin. When he first saw her, he immediately suggested, let's hang her in the Kremlin. She was hung there, in front of the entrance to the Catherine Hall. And now, in 1970, L.B., the creative path of Alexander Trifonovich Tvardovsky is ending without honor. And where was he to come from, honor something? Traitors are only now honored, and the Soviet people deservedly expressed their deepest contempt. Emanuel Kozakvich and Vasily Grossman. The list of writers who accepted Khrushchev's like could be continued, but I will focus on two, also Soviet writers. This is Emanuel Kozakvich, who, after the end of the 22nd Congress, obsequiously told Khrushchev, Dear Nikita Sergeyevich, the program of our party can only be carried out successfully if the criticism of Stalin continues. The complete elimination of the cult of Stalin is a vital necessity. Kozakvich, twice a winner of the Stalin Prize, 1948-1950, who had not written a single line for ten years, and just in 1961 published a story about V.I. Lenin really hoped that Khrushchev pay attention to him and give him the Lenin Prize. But no such luck. Khrushchev did not need the opinion of Kozakvich. And this is the writer Vasily Grossman, who has never been awarded any prizes under I.V. Stalin, nor under Khrushchev, but not only. And under Gorbachev, when this ardent anti-Soviet became in demand, he was not marked. Let us listen carefully to what this Soviet writer, too, said addressing Khrushchev, at the 22nd Party Congress. You unconditionally condemned the bloody lawlessness and cruelty committed by Stalin. Wow, not under Stalin, but by ourselves Stalin. The strength and courage with which you did this give every reason to think that the norms of our democracy will grow. After all, what was the result of the stupidities committed by Khrushchev? In any case, 
The point of view of our prophet Grossman was shared in Soviet society previously offended people, just as the norms for the production of steel, coal, electricity have grown since the time of the devastation that accompanied the civil war, it's like, at the behest of a pike they grew or were created by the heroic efforts of ordinary workers of the same age as Grossman, guided by the same IV Stalin, LB. After all, the essence of the new human society is even greater in the growth of democracy and freedom than in the growth of production and consumption. Without the continuous growth of the norms of freedom and democracy, the new society seems unthinkable. And they say there were no enemies. So the Grossmans have achieved their goal. There is freedom, the freedom to steal, freedom to corrupt, freedom from conscience. There is also democracy, at least shout, who cares about you. There is also production which is at zero, there is also consumption, depending on the cult of cash. Everything is there, except for the rights that the fighters for the rule of law have taken away from us, the right to receive free treatment, to study free of charge, to work conscientiously and to have a good rest. It's clear, Grossman's anti-Soviet story Everything Flows, published under Gorbachev, in 1989, written at the height of the Khrushchev era. 1955 to 1963, and the novel Life and Fate, published under Gorbachev, in 1988, written from 1948 to 1960 years, simply could not be published earlier, not only and not so much because of their weak artistic merits, but because of the counter-revolutionary essence of these works. The manuscript of the novel was arrested in 1961, just when Grossman, who, as it seemed to him, saw in Khrushchev a kindred soul, handed over his novel to him for consideration. And Khrushchev saw in this work the menacing signs of a flood, when the situation with criticism of I.V. Stalin could get out of control and destroy everything. The Big Encyclopedic Dictionary, ed. 1998, gives the following annotation about the novel Life and Fate, a multifaceted panorama of the era of Vel, Fatherland Wars, Battle of Stalingrad, Rear, Gulag. German concentration camps, Jewish ghetto, problems of confronting the individual with the violence of the totalitarian system, fascist and communist, psychologism in the image of a person, insight into the existential depths of consciousness. Already under Brezhnev, Grossman's story was smuggled to the West and published there in 1970, and the novel ten years later, in 1980. However, the memoirs of Khrushchev himself, the man who decomposed them all, who, out of base motives, threw the first and weighty clod of dirt on the good name of I.V. Stalin, also saw the light in New York in the 81st. There is no need to be surprised. Alexander Fadiev, who did not accept the thaw. The only writer who did not accept the new leader was Alexander Alexandrovich Fadiev, who committed suicide two and a half months after the notorious 20th Congress. Of course, Khrushchev also kicks the late A.A. Fadiev with great pleasure in his memoirs, distorting the motives for his suicide. During the repressions, heading the Union of Writers of the USSR, Fadiev supported the line on repressions, and the heads of innocent writers flew. It was enough to write to someone that the store sells bad potatoes, and this was already regarded as anti-Soviet. The tragedy of Fadiev as a person also explains his suicide, remaining an intelligent and subtle soul. After Stalin was exposed and shown that the thousands of victims were not criminals at all, he could not forgive himself for his apostasy from the truth. After all, along with others, the creative intelligentsia perished, and Fadiev perjured that such and such from its ranks opposed the motherland. I am ready to think that he acted sincerely, believing in the necessity of what was being done. But still he appeared before the creative intelligentsia in the role of a Stalinist prosecutor. And when he saw that the circle was closed, he cut off his life. Of course, we must also take into account the fact that Fadiev had drunk himself by the time and therefore lost many features of his former personality. Or such an explanation of A. Fadiev's suicide, he outlived his usefulness and, moreover, was afraid to meet face to face with those writers whom he helped Stalin drive into camps, and some later returned home. After all, he knew, Nikita Sergeyevich knew the true reason for Fadiev's suicide, after all, he had read his suicide letter to the Central Committee of the CPSU dated May 13, 1956, after all, it reached us only in 1990, 
why was it in vain to build on the deceased? Or did Khrushchev think that it would not come up? Here is an excerpt from this litter, literature, this highest fruit of the new system, is humiliated, hounded, ruined. The complacency of the nouveau riches from the great Leninist teaching, even when they swear by it, by this teaching, has led to complete distrust of them on my part, for one can expect even worse from them than from the satrap Stalin. He was at least educated, but these were ignoramuses. My life, as a writer, loses all meaning, and with great joy, as a deliverance from this vile existence, where meanness, lies and slander fall upon you, I am leaving this life. The last hope was to at least say this to the people who rule the state, but for the past three years, despite my requests, they can't even accept me. I ask you to bury me next to my mother. As you can see, Fadiev's last letter was directed against Khrushchev, the Khrushchevites and the general line of the party that was being pursued for total destalinization. No, Fadiev did not accept the thought. And by this act of protest he showed high civic courage. And when they buried A.A. A. Fadiev, in the Moscow Art Theater there was a play by N.F. Pogodin Kremlin Chimes, in a new edition. The author a man of the thaw, managed to correct it in just one night, cut it down and, dedicating it to the 20th Congress of the CPSU, invited delegates to the Congress, including Khrushchev, to the free premiere. The actor who performed in this play that season, the role of I.V. Stalin, that first evening he sat drearily in the auditorium, L.B. Korny Chukovsky, on the other hand, interpreted the suicide of Alexander Fadiev from the position of a thaw man, I am very sorry for dear A.A., in him, under all the layers, one felt a Russian nugget, a big man, but God, what kind of layers, all the nonsense of the Stalin era, all its idiotic atrocities, all its terrible bureaucracy, all its corruption and officialdom found their obedient tool in him, hence the zigzags of his behavior, hence his tortured conscience in recent years, ah 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 ah, Poor Korny Ivanovich, how wrong you were. Fadiev was not your man, not yours. By God, not yours. Chapter 22. Solzhenitsyn. Quote, page 24 of 28. People of the Thaw. Solzhenitsyn, aka Vetrov, an information the Gulag archipelago was invented by the enemy. Proverb of the Soviet people. It is no coincidence that the word liar is walled up in the very name of Solzhenitsyn. All his work is a complete malicious lie. And when he calls to live not by a lie, his call should be addressed first of all to himself. Judas life path. Poking around in his peasant pedigree, Khrushchev's favorite Solzhenitsyn writes in the book A Calf Butted in Oak, there were Solzhenitsyn ordinary Stavropol peasants, in the Stavropol territory, and he was born after the October Revolution. In December 1918, in Kislevodsk, before the revolution, several pairs of bulls and horses, a dozen cows and 200 sheep were not considered wealth in any way. It was considered, Isaiah, even as it was considered, L.B. History reference. According to the agricultural census of 1917, in 35 provinces of European Russia, including, of course, Stavropol, 3.3 million peasant households did not have livestock. In Ukraine, 1.1 million households did not have cows, and 1.3 million did not have horses. Due to the hunger and suffering of rural workers, the kulaks and landlords grew rich. The working peasantry fell deeper and deeper into poverty. This is what led to the growth of revolutionary sentiment among the millions of peasants who made up the majority of the Russian army. Professor Chunchulov. Economic History of the USSR. M. Higher School. p. 177. And about the ancestors on the mother's side, the writer gives the following information. Zakhar Strubak, his maternal grandfather, L.B., was a prosperous farmer. After the revolution, his former laborers fed him free of charge, L.B., for another 12 years, L.B., until he was arrested during the years of collectivization. And having such a dark social origin, the young boy Solzhenitsyn not only was not repressed under I.V. Stalin, as a cool lock offspring, but he successfully graduated from school, then without hindrance, the physics and mathematics faculty of Rostov University, and from the fourth year at the same time began to study in absentia at the Moscow Institute of Philosophy and Literature, which, however, could not finish due to the beginning of the Great Patriotic War. Since October 1941, 
he has served as a writer in the Stalingrad district, which was then in the rear, then, a school, and since May 1943, service in the air, artillery instrumental reconnaissance. Pyotr Polomarchuk, Solzhenitsyn's biographer, perhaps at the suggestion of Isaiah himself, decided that his hero should be engraved in the memory of future generations as the commander of an artillery battery, but this is not so because service in the air is just armchair espionage and requires only ability to accurately work with acoustic devices. Further, the biographer tells us that in February 1945, that is, just three months before the end of the Great Patriotic War, Captain Solzhenitsyn was arrested because of IV Stalin and sentenced to eight years, of which he spent half a year on investigation and transfers, almost a year in a camp at the Kaluga outpost in Moscow about four in a prison research institute, and two and a half years in general work in the Kazakhstan special camp. Sekzot special camp let us ask ourselves the question, being in the special secrecy parts, could Solzhenitsyn not know that all of his, and not only his, correspondence is being perused? It is clear that he could not know this. Could he criticize I.V. Stalin in correspondence? Or is it also a lie? Wouldn't dare. And why criticize something? After all, it was not a tense and hopeless June 1941, but a victorious February 1945. Yes, and Isaiah is not an enemy to himself, so that like this, you don't live well, put your priceless head on the chopping block. It's just that he deliberately allowed some political frivolities in his correspondence in the hope that he would be seconded to the deep rear. Well, for example, to guard some bridge on the Volga or on the Don, where he could indulge in speculative exercises, no more. But it was not there. Akla did not calculate, he missed and thundered. In the camp, Solzhenitsyn began to engage in denunciation, did not live in poverty, and received the operational nickname of the winds. In the Military Historical Journal No. 12 for 1990, an extremely curious document was published which allows us to appreciate the supposedly living not by lies Solzhenitsyn. Owls. Secret. Report. C. Ovetrov dated January 20, 1952. At one time, on your instructions, I managed to get close to Ivan Megal. This morning, Megal, meeting me at the sewing workshop, said semi-mysteriously, who is nothing, he will become everything. From a further conversation with Megal, it turned out that on January 22nd, Kozmal Kush, Kovlyuchenko and Romanovich were going to raise an uprising. To do this, they have already put together a reliable group, mainly from their own, Bandera, hidden knives, metal pipes and boards. Megal said that the associates of Romanovich and Malkusha from the 2nd, 8th and 10th barracks should be divided into four groups and start at the same time. The first group will release their own. Then the conversation is verbatim. She will also deal with informers. We know everyone. Their godfather pushed them into the penalty box to avert their eyes. One group takes a penalty box and a punishment cell, and the second at this time crushes the services and the Red Guards. That's it. Then Megal said that the third and fourth groups should block the checkpoint and the gate and turn off the spare electric motor in the zone. Earlier, I already reported that the former colonel of the Polish army Kanzerski and military pilot Tyshchenko managed to get a geographical map of Kazakhstan, the schedule of passenger aircraft and are collecting money. Now I am completely convinced that they knew about the impending uprising earlier and, apparently, want to use it to escape. This assumption is also confirmed by the words of Megal, but the Pole, it seems, wants to be smarter than everyone else. Well, let's see. I remind you once again regarding my request to protect me from the reprisals of criminals, who have recently been pestering me with suspicious questions. Winds. Correct. January 20, 1952. Beginning Department of Regime and Operational Work. Signature. As it turned out at the trial of the surviving conspirators, in fact, the prisoners of the Sandy Camp, which is located near Karaganda intended on January 22, 1952 to apply to the camp leadership with a request to improve the regime of detention. But because of the denunciation of Solzhenitsyn, Vetrov they were met with automatic bursts. Many of them were killed, the survivors received 25 years in prison. The author of the publication, who was in the special camp with Solzhenitsyn for treason during the war, handed over by the Danes into the hands of Smirsch and rehabilitated by Khrushchev. 
L. Sam Uden, reports that the witness Ivan Megal, who opened up too much in front of Vetrov, knowing for sure that this will be reported to the authorities and, obviously, pursuing some of his goals, well, for example, revenge for the harassment of the three Banderets, Malkush, Kovlyuchenko and Romanovich, L.B., was killed on the sly with a named shot in the head, so how he posed a danger to the exposure of the secret informer of the camp leadership, Solzhenitsyn. After spending time from start to finish, Solzhenitsyn was released exactly, there are such coincidences, on the day of I.V. Stalin, March 5, 1953. And here comes another shameless lie, and then a fierce cancer falls on me, when, according to the verdict of doctors, life remains no more than three weeks, however, I did not die, moreover, I still have not died, although half a century has passed since then. LB. With my hopelessly neglected acute malignant tumor, it was a miracle of God, I didn't understand it in any other way. And they also say that cancer is incurable. Either people are lying, or Isaiah is lying, or Isaiah, while chatting about the God's miracle, hides that he sold his soul to Satan. LB. Living a lie. And yet, Solzhenitsyn is grateful to his fate, as can be seen from his confession. It's scary to think what I would have become as a writer if I hadn't been imprisoned then. Here, for example, is how Solzhenitsyn falsely describes the behavior of I.V. Stalin in November 1941. Stalin leaves in fear for Kulbyshev and calls from the bomb shelter for a week. Has Moscow been surrendered? I couldn't believe they stopped. Well done, of course, well done. But many had to be removed. It would not be a victory if a rumor spread that the commander-in-chief was temporarily leaving. Because of this, on November 7, a small parade had to be photographed. Ah, Solzhenitsyn. As they say, there is no one to beat you, after all, something. But this small parade is a historical parade on November 7, 1941, and I.V. Stalin on November 6 and 7, 1941 which were broadcast by all the leading radio stations of the world, it would not be necessary to deny, this is already a fact of history, so tightly attached to it that it is simply pointless to refute it. And Stalin did not leave for any Kubyshev. To the question of F. Chuev, asked by V. Molotov, whether Stalin had any hesitation in October 1941, to leave Moscow or stay, Vyacheslav Mkhailovich replied, this is nonsense. There were no hesitation. He was not going to leave Moscow. I only went to Kubyshev for two or three days and left Voznesensky there in charge. Stalin told me, look how they settled there, and immediately returned. From a conversation between F. Chuev and V. Molotov. Op. Quoted from, Chuev F. S. 68. Only thanks to Stalin's refusal to leave Moscow did he save us from inevitable defeat. Why la la popular, Isaiah. Huh? LB. Dot. However, Solzhenitsyn himself has a whole philosophy on this matter, but I thought, let Stalin reap the sowing of his secrecy. He secretly lived. Now everyone has the right to write everything about him according to his own idea. Proceeding from this absolutely monstrous anti historical concept, Solzhenitsyn, contrary to the sober advice of Tvardovsky, to remove the chapter A Study of a Great Life, about Tsar Father Nikolai Romanov, L.B., from the novel The Red Wheel, left it unchanged, where I stated and tried to psychologically and externally prove the version that Stalin collaborated with the Tsarist secret police. So the Vetrov sexist, encouraged by the anti-Stalinist general line of the Khrushchev CPSU, decided to try on his dirty shirt on the dead Stalin. They say, Stalin was also a sexist. Godfather Isaiah, and this Isaiah was given to us by his godfather. Nikita Khrushchev, who saw, we must give him his due, in the graphomaniac Solzhenitsyn, not so much literary, Khrushchev, by his own admission, almost did not read books at all, more and more preferred to watch films, L. B. How much Saksat data, and was the first who gave the green light to his story, by misunderstanding called the story, one day in Ivan Denisovich, in his memoirs. Khrushchev writes, I am proud that at one time I supported one of the first works of Solzhenitsyn, I don't remember Solzhenitsyn's biography, I was told earlier that he spent a long time in the camps. In the mentioned story, he proceeded from his own observations. I read it. He's also lying. He didn't read it himself, but his assistant Lebedev, 
LB, Reed to Khrushchev and Mikoyan. It leaves a heavy impression, exciting, but true. And most importantly, it causes disgust at what was happening under Stalin. That's what was the main thing for Khrushchev, it turns out, in this disgusting opus. LB, Stalin was a criminal, and criminals must be condemned at least morally. The strongest judgment is to brand them in a work of art. Why, on the contrary, was Solzhenitsyn considered a criminal? And really, why? Yes, because the anti-Soviet graphomaniac Solzhenitsyn turned out to be a rare find for the West, which hastened in 1970 to undeservedly award the Nobel Prize in Literature to the author of Ivan Denisovich and several other stories and one article. An unprecedented fact, probably, Nobel himself would turn over in his grave if he knew about it. LB. As Alexander Shabalov writes in the book The Eleventh Strike of Comrade Stalin, Solzhenitsyn begged for the Nobel Prize, declaring, I need this award, like a step in a position, in a battle. And the faster I get it, the harder I will become, the harder I will hit. And, indeed, the name of Solzhenitsyn became the banner of the dissident movement in the USSR, which at one time played a huge negative role in the elimination of the Soviet socialist system. Most of his opuses first saw the light over the hill. The current technology allows you to type yourself, in our wilderness, also, as it were, some is dot, in exile. The text typed in this way is corrected for the last time and sent for printing to Paris. And from there the road leads straight to Moscow writes the contender for the great Russian writer of the 20th century very clumsily in the preface to the first volume of the collected works in 18 volumes, published in 1988. The most incompetent and chaotic Gulag archipelago occupies the central place among his libelous creations. Marshall A. M. Vasilevsky gives this assessment to this work, in both Soviet and progressive foreign literature, the opinion of Vlasov as an opportunist. Careerist and traitor has long been irrefutably established. Only the traitor Ray Solzhenitsyn, who went over to the service of the most reactionary imperialist forces, sings and praises Vlasov, the Vlasovites and other traitors to the Soviet motherland in his cynical anti-Soviet work The Gulag Archipelago. Such is the opinion of the illustrious Marshal of the Soviet Union, one of the main architects of the great victory. The history of the archipelago is as follows. The former editor of the Vlasov newspaper, L. A. Samudin, at the request of Solzhenitsyn, hid the manuscript of the book The Gulag Archipelago. Once, KGB officers came to his apartment and seized this manuscript. Three weeks earlier, their mutual friend Eve Orinyinskyo was summoned to the state security agencies, who hanged herself soon after. Samudin having made an analysis of all the circumstances of her death and his arrest, comes to the unequivocal conclusion that they were informed by the informer of the special camp Vetrov. He is Solzhenitsyn. Sam Mutin tells about this in the book Do Not Make Yourself an Idol, which was published in four issues of the Military History Journal in 1990, number 9 to 12. Having figured out that Solzhenitsyn was brazenly slandering and distorting reality, at the end of his life he managed to expose him. Die today you so I can die tomorrow. In the book The Murder of Stalin and Beria, Yuri Mukhin writes, If we take at face value all the books and memoirs about the NKVD, and then about the MGB, then the uncritical reader will get the impression that then everyone who got into these organs, from the very threshold they began to beat and torture with the sole purpose of making the poor victims incriminate themselves under torture. Of course, moreover, the innocent were tortured by NKVD investigators on the personal orders of Stalin and Beria. Such is the history of the terrible totalitarian regime. True, if you look closely, it turns out that information about torture comes from two very interested sources. Fiercely, from the convicts, who not only slandered themselves, which can still be morally forgiven somehow, but also other people who were also convicted because of this slander, that is, these criminals, because of the testimony of which, perhaps, innocent people died, there is nothing left to do but to claim that they gave their testimony, unable to withstand the torture. Secondly, information about torture comes from corrupt hacks and historians who, on the cries of these tortures, have made, and still do, their careers and money. However, our hero, Solzhenitsyn, surpassed all such hacks in describing torture in the Gulag archipelago. Refuting his slander, Sam Mutin, who knew about the methods of investigation firsthand, 
went through all this himself, writes, We all waited for the torture investigation. We had no doubt that we would be beaten not only by investigators, but also by specially trained and trained hefty fellows with rolled up sleeves. But again, they didn't guess, there were no tortures, no hefty fellows with hairy hands. Of my five comrades in trouble, not one returned from the investigator's office beaten and torn to pieces. None was ever dragged into the cell by the guards in an unconscious state, as we expected, having read over the years on the pages of German propaganda materials stories about investigations in Soviet prisons. A quarter of a century later, leafing through the manuscript of the archipelago, I will again see the description of the torture investigation, and even in the same words and colors that I remember from that German wartime. These are pictures that have descended almost unchanged from Hitler's newspaper articles and pages of propaganda pamphlets. Now they have taken up dozens of pages of the archipelago, a book that claims to be exclusive, objective, and flawless. Due to the wateriness, the lack of a strict organization of the material and the author's ability to cloud the mind of the reader, playing on his feelings, one obvious discrepancy slips somehow unnoticed at the first reading. Colorfully and dramatically drawing pictures of the torture investigation on others, which reached Solzhenitsyn in retellings, then on a good hundred pages he will talk not so much about himself in the role of a person under investigation, but about the situation in which life in the investigation prison flowed like prisoners read books, played chess, conducted historical, philosophical and literary disputes. And somehow it doesn't immediately occur to me that the pictures of fantastic torture do not correspond with the author's own memories of his safe stay in the cell. So, neither Solzhenitsyn, the author of the Gulag Archipelago, nor his neighbors in a prison in Moscow, nor me and my comrades in the basement of counterintelligence of the Fifth Shock Army in Germany, were able to endure torture. And at the same time, I have no grounds to assert that my investigation went smoothly and without trouble. Already the first interrogation the investigator began with obscenities and threats. I refused to speak in such a key and, despite the increased scream, I resisted. I was sent downstairs. I was sure, to be beaten, but they brought me home, that is, to the same cell. They didn't call for two days, then they called again. Everything started on the same notes, and the result was the same. The investigator called on the phone, the major came, as it turned out later, the head of the department. Looking at me with dry, unkind eyes and listening to the claims and complaints of the investigator, he asked, why don't you give the senior lieutenant the opportunity to work? Why do you refuse to testify? After all, we still know who you are, and we will find out everything that we still need. Not from you but in other ways. I explained that I did not refuse to testify and was ready to give them, but I protested against insults and threats. Honestly, I expected the major to throw me. What else do you deserve, you bastard? Are you expecting to be nursed here? But he looked at me once more dryly and made some kind of sign to the investigator. He poked his hand under the table, pressed the button to call the escort. Immediately the door opened and I was taken away. Again they did not call for several days. And when they called, they brought me to another office and I was met by another man with captain's epaulets. He offered to sit on the shameful stool, that's how we called the screwed stool at the entrance, on which the person under investigation is seated during interrogation. Then he said, I am Captain Galitsky, your investigator, I hope that we will work together. This is not only in my interests but also in your interests. And then he conducted his investigation in forms that are quite acceptable. I began to testify, especially since from the very first day of our conversation the captain seated me at a separate table, gave me blank sheets of paper and offered to write the so-called handwritten testimony. Only later, when he began to translate the testimony into the language of the investigative protocols, I, I realized that this person lays softly, but sleeps hard. Galitsky skillfully turned my confessions in the direction he needed and aggravated my position. But he did it in a form that, nevertheless, did not evoke in me a feeling of infringed justice, since after all, after all, I was really a criminal, what can I say? But the captain talked to me in a human language, trying to get only to the actual essence of the events. He did not try to give the facts and actions his own emotionally colored assessment. Sometimes, obviously, wanting to give me, and himself, too, 
the opportunity to relax. Galitsky also started conversations of a general nature. During one I asked him why I did not hear from him any abusive and insulting assessments of my behavior during the war, my betrayal and service with the Germans. He replied, this is not part of my duties, my job is to get from you information of a factual nature, as accurate and confirmed as possible. And how I myself feel about all your behavior is my own business, which does not concern the investigation. Of course, you understand. I have no reason to approve your behavior and admire it, but, I repeat, this does not apply to the investigation. Why I don't hear from him many abusive and insulting assessments of my behavior during the war, my betrayal and service with the Germans. He replied, this is not part of my responsibilities, my job is to get from you information of a factual nature, as accurate and confirmed as possible. And how I myself feel about all your behavior is my own business which does not concern the investigation. Of course, you understand, I have no reason to approve your behavior and admire it, but, I repeat, this does not apply to the investigation. Why I don't hear from him many abusive and insulting assessments of my behavior during the war, my betrayal and service with the Germans. He replied, this is not part of my duties, my job is to get from you information of a factual nature as accurate and confirmed as possible. And how I myself feel about all your behavior is my own business, which does not concern the investigation. Of course, you understand, I have no reason to approve your behavior and admire it, but, I repeat, this does not apply to the investigation. The time spent in the investigative basement stretched out for four months due to the extension of the investigation. I fought with all my strength resisted the efforts of the investigators to wind me as much as possible. Since I spoke sparingly about myself, and the investigation had few other materials, the investigators tried, according to the customs of that time, to attribute such actions to me and pile on me such sins that I did not commit. In disputes and fuss over unsigned protocols, I managed to hide a whole year of service with the Germans. My entire saga with Gill and his squad remained unknown. I can't say what would have been the consequences at that time if the exposure of this stage of my activity would have changed the course of things or everything would have remained the same. Here one can equally assume both. Nevertheless, that's it. If Sam Newton did not slander himself and others, as Solzhenitsyn and his heroes did, then he has no reason to lie that he was tortured and that he betrayed, unable to withstand the torture. Let's imagine for a moment that we find ourselves in the hall where the 20th Congress of the CPSU is taking place. We hear from Khrushchev that there was allegedly a telegram to the secretaries of the regional committees, regional committees, the Central Committee of the Communist Parties of the National Republics dated January 10, 1939, signed by I.V. Stalin. The Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks explains that the use of physical force in the practice of the NKVD was allowed from 1937 with the permission of the Central Committee. The Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks considers that the method of physical influence must continue to be applied, as an exception, against obvious and undisarmed enemies of the people, as an absolutely correct and expedient method. I do not undertake to state categorically whether there was such a telegram in nature or not. But you can take my word for it, I was closely involved in this issue, but no matter how many times and wherever I met the cipher text, there was always a footnote with it that referred to the same source, you guessed it correctly, to the report N.S. Khrushchev at the 20th Congress of the CPSU, at least once, for the sake of decency. An archive was indicated where even a single copy of the original of such a document of particular importance is stored. Never. There is no original, not even a fake. And this proves, Khrushchev blatantly lied. The further fate of the literary Vlasov. On February 14, 1974, all the Central Soviet newspapers published the following message, by the decree of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR for the systematic commission of actions that are incompatible with belonging to the citizenship of the USSR and detrimental to the USSR, he was deprived of citizenship and on February 13, 1974, expelled from the Soviet Union, Solzhenitsyn AI. Solzhenitsyn's family will be able to go to him as soon as they deem it necessary. In Frankfurt am Main, where he was taken by an Aeroflot plane, he was immediately picked up by the media hostile to the Soviet Union, 
for which the Nobel Prize winner expelled by the Soviets was then of sensational interest. But Germany did not suit him, and soon Isaac found himself in the United States, in Vermont, a state whose natural conditions resembled the climate of the central Russian zone. A week after Solzhenitsyn's expulsion, Literaturnaya Gazeta published a large selection of letters the end of the literary Vlasovite, where one writer expressed the following idea. If an individual citizen persistently opposes himself to the society in which he lives, then society, having exhausted measures of influence, has the right to reject him. But the outcast waited in the wings and returned to Russia, when the West, with its help, successfully completed its vile deed of liquidating the brainchild of Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin, the Soviet Union, lost all interest in the odious person of Solzhenitsyn. However, by this time, the elderly graphomaniac had completely written out, and all that remained for him to do under Yeltsin was from time to time to grumble with the air of a prophet on Russian television with his dissenting opinion that denounces the mafia Yeltsin regime, which is no longer anyone interested and absolutely nothing could change. The genetically damaged souls in it since play their destructive role, never realizing that they were simply used as goats provocateurs. Chapter 23 Truth and False About Alexander Dovzenko Alexander Dovzenko Dovzenko Alexander Petrovich, 1894-1956, Soviet film director and playwright, honored artist of the Ukrainian SSR, People's Artist of the RSFSR, twice winner of the Stalin Prize, 1941 and 1949, laureate of the Lenin Prize, 1959, posthumously, one of the founders of Soviet cinematography. The creator of film epochs imbued with poetry, reflecting the fundamental shifts of the era. He directed films according to his own scripts, Arsenal, 1929, Earth, 1931, Aragrad, 1935, Shkars, 1939, The Battle for Our Soviet Ukraine, 1943, Maturin and others, awarded the Order of Lenin. If there is war tomorrow. When in 1932 Alexander Dovzenko's film Ivan caused an extremely negative reaction in Ukraine, and the People's Commissar of Education of Ukraine even accused the film director of pro-fascist sentiments, Dovzenko urgently left the then capital of Ukraine Kharkov for Moscow in the hope of getting an appointment with I.V. Stalin. He writes a letter to I.V. Stalin, in which he asks the leader to listen to the script for the new film Aragrad and he accepts it exactly 24 hours after the letter was dropped into the mailbox, Party Okina. M. 1939-P.49. Here is how Dovzenko describes this technique, Stalin introduced me so warmly and well, in a fatherly way to comrades Molotov, Vogershilov, and Kirov, that it seemed to me that he had known me for a long time and well, and it became easy for me. I realized that he was interested not only in the content of the script, but also in the professional, production side of our business. Asking me about the Far East, Comrade Stalin asked if I could show on the map the place where I would build a city if I were not a director, but a builder. It seemed to me that the very idea of creating a completely new city in the Far East, even in the screen projection, seemed very tempting to my interlocutors. I left Comrade Stalin with an enlightened head with his wish for success and the promise of help. Ibid, p. 50. J. V. Stalin fulfilled his promise. He personally oversaw the filming of this defense film and ordered the Air Force to provide the director with all possible assistance. The leader liked this film, in which there were a number of romantic images, the partisan Glushk and his son Pilot, Korean peasants and a young Chukchi, who were opposed by Japanese saboteurs and their fist agents. After watching Aerograd, IV. Stalin made only one remark, only the old partisan speaks too complicated a language for you, the speech of a taiga is simpler. After the release in 1935 of this strong film, shot with great skill, IV. Stalin more than once invited Dovzenko to his Kremlin cinema hall to watch new films, was interested in his opinion about them, consulted with him as an expert. This amazing viewing place is well described in the memoirs of IV. Stalin's daughter. Svetlana Lilu Iva, in the Kremlin Chapev, trilogy about Maxim, films about Peter I, Circus, Volga Volga. In those days, before the war, it was not yet customary to criticize films and force them to be remade, usually watched, 
approved and the film went to the rental. Even if something was not quite to your taste, it did not threaten the fate of the film and its creator. It wasn't until after the war that the breakdown of almost every film became commonplace. The teenage girl was unaware that her father was not only the chief censor, but actually the supreme curator of Soviet cinema, interested and demanding, wise, benevolent and fair. And those remarks and instructions, as well as the help that came from him personally when making films, already predetermined the success of the films during the viewing and their further fate. In addition, the small number of films released before the war made it possible to keep the situation in the film industry under control. Give Ukrainian Chapev. Alexander Dovzenko was among a large group of cinema figures. It included S. Eisenstein, V. Pudovkin, Efremler, Brothers S. and G. Vaslev, G. Kozintsev, Eltralberg and others, who in March 1935, according to on behalf of I.V. Stalin, the main directorate of the film and photo industry awarded personal cars. Then, among the leading film directors, A.P. Dovzenko was awarded the Order of Lenin. When presenting him with a high award, I.V. Stalin said, Now you have a duty, the Ukrainian Chapev. It is known that the film of the Vasilyev brothers Chapev was one of the leader's favorite films. Many have written about it. But here is what A. Dovzenko himself writes about the same. Comrade Stalin suggested that I look through a new copy of Chapev with him. Undoubtedly, it was not the first time he watched his favorite film. But the fullness and warmth of his emotions, the perception of the film, seemed unabated. Some of the lines he said out loud, and it seemed to me that he did it for me. It was as if he taught me to understand the film in my own way, as if he revealed to me the process of his perception. Ibid, p. 47. In fact, having ordered A. Dobzenko a film about Shkars, Ukrainian Chapev, the leader told him, Keep in mind that neither my words nor newspaper articles oblige you to anything. You are a free person. If you want to make scars, do it, but if you have other plans, do something else. Do not be shy. I called you so that you would know. Ibid, p.51. The theme seemed interesting to the artist, and he took up its implementation with keen interest and great enthusiasm. Then the leader advised him to reveal the national characteristics of Ukrainians in the film, to show their humor folk songs and dances. When I.V. Stalin found out that Alexander Dovzenko did not have a gramophone, literally an hour later, as he returned from the leader, they brought him a gramophone. A. Dovzenko filmed Shkaras for four whole years, and the year 1938 was especially difficult for the director, when reinsurer Nikita Khrushchev became the first secretary of the Ukrainian Central Committee. Around the picture created an atmosphere of hidden hostility. The shadow on the creator of Shkaras was personally cast by Khrushchev, who signaled to Stalin the information that was voiced by the head of the film department S. Dukolsky, sending editor Imanovich to Kiev, giving an order to watch with passion all the film material on Shkaras, they say there is some kind of unbridled partisanship, not the Red Army. The main thing is that old man Bozenko blocked Shkars, walks around the screen in bast shoes. In general, the Maknovshchina, the picture is waiting upstairs, and such signals are received there. Look at the material. Learn the opinion of the Central Committee of Ukraine. Read, Khrushcheva, A Ladyshev. Trampled Sashko. Morning of Russia. 1994. 8 to 14 December. P. 13. However, in spite of everything, the film was released in 1939 and successfully bypassed the cinemas of the country, although it was accepted somewhat worse than Chapev. As the author of the book The Kremlin Censor Gregory Maryumov, who was in the Stalinist cinema hall while watching A. Dovzenko's tape, testifies, I.V. Stalin accepted Shkars with complete admiration, without making a single remark. After watching Shkars, I.V. Stalin took Alexander Dovzenko home, and they took a long night walk together along the empty streets of the old Darbat. A black armored car moved in the distance, following. It is clear that the outstanding Soviet filmmaker sincerely respected and loved Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin. In turn, the leader treated the creator of Shkars favorably awarding Dovzenko for this film in 1941 the Stalin Prize of the First Degree. Thunder Smells in the Air The magazine Art of Cinema, No. 4, 1990, cites such a curious episode. The next day after the publication of A. Dovzenko's story the night before the battle in the Krasnya Zvezda newspaper, 
On August 3, 1942, the secretary of the Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party called the editorial office, B, and said, Give Dobzhenko Stalin's gratitude for the story. He told the people, the army, what was now urgently needed to be said. But now, a year later, A. Dobzhenko is trying to publish in the journals Nimya a week. Obviously unsuccessful story victory. Censorship does not allow it to be published for five reasons. The military unit depicted by the author consists entirely of Ukrainians, which is untrue and artificially separates the struggle of the Ukrainian people from the struggle of all the peoples of the USSR against the Germans. It has too many deaths. The image of the general is completely absurd. The picture of the general flight of the regiment is unjustified. The story contains many exaggerated episodes, careless, ambiguous expressions. In the autumn of 1943, in the midst of the battles for the liberation of Ukraine, Kiev, as you know, was liberated on November 6, 1943, LB, the Supreme Commander-in-Chief finds time to get acquainted with Alexander Dovzenko's film story Ukraine on Fire. On November 26, 1943, the following entry appeared in the author's diary, Today I learned from Bolshakov, Minister of Cinematography of the USSR, LB, and bad news, Stalin did not like my story Ukraine on Fire, and he banned it for publication and for staging. In the same issue of the Art of Cinema magazine, we also come across Stalin's assessment, to whom, to whom, but Dovzenko. The facts of the actions of Petlerists and other Ukrainian nationalists on the side of the German invaders against the Ukrainian and entire Soviet people should be known. They are absent in Dovzenko's film story, as as if they don't exist at all. Through the mouth of his peasant characters, Dovzenko calls Bogdan Khmelnytsky a big villain, a famous executioner of the Ukrainian people, who strangled the people's revolution in 1600 some year. This is an impudent mockery of the truth. It is interesting that the Order of Bogdan Khmelnytsky was established precisely in connection with this criticized film story, which was nevertheless filmed, eliminating ideologically harmful moments, called the battle for our Soviet Ukraine. Rudina Magazine, 1992. Number 1. Point 93, contains a declassified document. Information on undercover data addressed to A.A. Jdanov from People's Commissar of State Security Merkulov, which describes the reaction of offended writers, Zoschenko, Chukovsky, Dovzenko, Gladkov, Leonov, Sergeyevtsinsky, Nilin, to fair criticism. Some have acknowledged this criticism, some have not. About Dovzenko, in particular, it is said that he is not offended by Comrade Stalin but speaks with hostility about Khrushchev. The hour of purification has struck. Alexander Dovzenko passed away in 1956, shortly after the notorious 20-party Congress, and in 1959 Khrushchev awarded him the Lenin Prize posthumously. What was the reason for such a step? Was it only a sincere recognition of his undoubted merits to Soviet cinema? or the faithful Leninist Nikita Sergeyevich was crushed by a toad of belated repentance for all the bad things that he had done against A. Dovzenko whenever their paths crossed. The veil over this secret was opened only three decades later, in 1987, when, perhaps, the most reactionary organ of the Soviet press of those years was Korodich's magazine Ogonyok, No. 43, which printed mountains of the most sophisticated slander against I.V. Stalin. The Bolsheviks and Socialism, published excerpts from the allegedly genuine records of the Soviet film director Alexander Dovzenko, in fact, Khrushchev sent to bury a fake, which at one time did not see the light of day due to the fact that it clearly contradicted not only the Central Committee resolution on the cult of personality in terms of that the role that the leader himself played in this episode, but also to common sense, and the likelihood of possible refutation of the then living witnesses for the defense. Now Dovzenko in his posthumous notes remembered, I remember the devilish face that Beria made when they brought me to Stalin for a harsh terrible trial about the unfortunate erroneous phrases that interspersed, according to Stalin himself, in my scenario Ukraine on fire. Staring at me like a fake bad actor, he, Beria, rudely barked at me at a meeting of the Politburo, at the beginning of the 44th year, we will set our brains. At the beginning of the 44th there was no fire in Ukraine, because she was released on November 6, 43, LB. Oh, 
I know you, menacingly poking his finger and just as viciously goggled, a friend of Beria taught me, meaning Ivy Stalin, LB. You felt sorry for the leader for some 10 meters of film, you didn't make a single episode for him, you regretted it, right? I didn't want to portray the leader. Pride has eaten you up, so die now. You, how to work in the cinema, you know. And what is your talent? Ugh, that's what your talent is, it doesn't mean anything if you don't know how to work. You work like me, think what you want, and when you make a film, scatter what you love over it. Here is a sickle, there is a hammer, there is an asterisk. The first maestro, meaning the same Stalin, LB, even began to show me exactly how to scatter hammers and sickles, from which I almost fell into the ground from indignation, despair and disgust. Scattering imaginary hammers and sickles, the maestro proudly stood up and raised his head and index finger that would be you as a man. And now my advice to you, disappear, it seems that you don't exist and didn't exist. Let us ask ourselves, could such an episode have taken place in the form described in Alexander Dovzenko's memoirs? Let us leave on the conscience of the authors of this fake their attacks against Beria, by the way, the surname Beria, according to the rules of Russian grammar, does not decline, just like the French surnames Dumas, Zola and the like. Dovzenko did not incline her either, and in the cited memoir suddenly began to persuade, LB, and we will only analyze how psychologically possible such behavior is on the part of IV, Stalin. The leader never, as we had the opportunity to make sure, did not address Dovzenko as you. And here, in a small angry, lordly scornful tirade, he allows himself to use the derogatory you, you, you're as many as eleven times, in order to cause a negative attitude towards Stalin. The author of the fake puts into Dovzenko's memoirs what was relevant in the year of the 20th Congress. At the same time, I remind you, this was also the year of the death of the film director, LB, comma, a false version of the active role Stalin in creating a cult of his own personality. You regretted the leader some 10 meters of film. You didn't make a single episode for him. You regretted it, right? I didn't want to portray the leader. The author of a kind and respectful article about I.V. Stalin, the teacher and friend of the artist, a man of high culture Alexander Dovzenko simply could not use such turns as threateningly poking his finger, evilly goggling his eyes, friend of Beria, first maestro. What is worth, for example, such a phrase, more befitting the language of a modern criminal authority, godfather, than the greatest statesman who exclusively cared about his historical image. My advice to you, disappear, it seems that you don't exist. But the sick, heated fantasy of the forger did not stop there. She invented and inserted into the mouth of I.V. Stalin's phrase, implausible in its anti-Sovietism, which made Dobzhenko feel such discomfort that he was ready to fall through the ground from indignation, despair and disgust. You work like me, think what you want, and when you make a film, scatter according to him what they love, here is a sickle. There is a hammer, there is an asterisk, and not only said, but also began to demonstrate. However, A. Dovzenko's unbridled style of memories is somewhat similar to the manner of self-expression of Khrushchev himself, in particular, remembering the alleged dispersal that was perpetrated by I.V. Stalin to the former Minister of State Security Semyon Ignatiev. Just listen carefully, disappointed Stalin told him directly. Do you want to be white? Will not work. Forgot that Lenin ordered to shoot Kaplan? And Jerzynski said to destroy Savinkov. You will be clean. I will fill your face. If you do not follow my instructions, you will end up in the next cell with a Bakhmov. In our presence, Stalin loses his temper, yells, threatens that he will grind him to powder. He demanded from Ignatiev, the unfortunate doctors must be beaten and beaten, beaten mercilessly. Shackled. Or here is a fact that Vladimir Sukhodiv cites in his book Stalin in Life and Legends, after the 20th Congress of NS. Khrushchev was sensitive to those who said something positive or wrote about IV. Stalin. They say that Khrushchev became aware that the aircraft designer A.S. Yakovlev continues to talk about his meetings with IV. Stalin, how he understood aviation technology, etc. Once Khrushchev called Yakovlev on the turntable and, without greeting, said, Yakovlev, you are not an aircraft designer, you are a storyteller about Stalin.
and he hung up. Dry P.293 For greater persuasiveness in who probably owns the copyright to A. Dobbs and Co.'s memoirs, I cite another aggressive op by Khrushchev himself, made by him on International Women's Day on March 8, 1963, during a meeting with writers in the reception house on Lenin Hills, when the young poet of the thaw, the faithful Khrushchevite Andrei Voznesensky, he besieged in this way, traitor, mediator of our enemies, you are not a member of my party, Mr. Voznesensky, you are not in a party position, for such, the most severe frost, wait a little longer, we will teach you, look what kind of pasternak you found, get a passport and go to the devil's grandmother, damn grandma, only the political pygmy Nikita Sergeyevich could scold so masterfully. This is the kind of nonsense that the Khrushchevs of all stripes fed us, and we silently chewed, swallowed and digested all this abomination. It seems, however, that the hour of purification and final enlightenment is at hand. The wind of history is gaining strength more and more, sweeping away the garbage that was applied to the grave of I.V. Stalin half a century after his death. Chapter 24 Ernst Unknown and others, Bacillus Carrier of Anti-Sovietism, the poorly educated Khrushchev, a man of low intellectual culture, possessed truly uncontrolled, one might even say autocratic power. His relationship with the intelligentsia was peculiar, on the one hand, seeing in the liberal intelligentsia his ally in the anti-Stalinist policy pursued by him, Khrushchev gave them what they were seeking, the opportunity to create within the framework of the thaw, but not the flood. But, with on the other hand, the impulsive Khrushchev stomped on them more than once, shouted and insulted the figures of literature and art more than once. At the end of his life, reflecting on this, he admitted that he was wrong when he tried to teach them, dictate something to them, shout at them, impose his tastes and preferences. You cannot direct the development of literature, art and culture with a stick and a shout. You cannot make a furrow and then force all artists to follow it without any deviation. Young poets and writers who were formed under the influence of Khrushchev's cult struggle, such as Yevgeny Yevtushenko, Robert Rajdi Svinsky, Andrei Voznesensky, Bela Kmadulina, Vasily Aksyonov, since 1980 Lives Abroad, Vladimir Voinovich, in 1980-1992, in exile in Germany, Georgi Vladimov, real name Volosevich, emigrated in 1983, were to some extent infected with the bacillus of anti-Sovietism, and, of course, anti-Stalinism. Khrushchev pretended to be fighting ideological looseness, but in fact he simply did not have enough common culture to make him listen to his words, as I.V. did. Stalin, who enjoyed well-deserved authority among literary and artistic figures, had no choice but to stomp his feet and brandish his club. The reader has already become acquainted with an example of such a dressing inflicted by Nikita Sergeyevich on the poet Andrei Voznesensky. Unfortunately, this was not the only case of hooligan behavior of the first secretary of the party. On May 19, 1957, party and state leaders met with cultural figures. Here is how the writer Vadim Tendryakov recalls this meeting. Heavy drunk Khrushchev saddled the theme of ideology in literature, varnishers are not such bad guys, we will not fuss with those who surreptitiously mischief us. He suddenly fell upon the fragile Margarita Elijah, who actively supported the Almanac Literary Moscow. You are an ideological saboteur, burp of the capitalist West. Nikita Sergeyevich, what are you talking about? Elijah, stunned, fought back. I'm a communist a party member. Lie. I do not trust such communists. Here I believe the non-party Sobolev. You don't. That's right, Nikita Sergeyevich. Sobolev helpfully agreed. Right. You can't trust them. By the way, for no apparent reason, to call the poetess Margarita Elijah, the author of the poem Zoya, dedicated to the feet of Zoya Kosmodemianskia, an ideological saboteur and the burp of the capitalist West and at the same time give the go-ahead for publication in the 11th issue Novi Mir for 1962, the most ideologically harmful and subversive little book by Solzhenitsyn, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, this can only be dreamed of in a bad dream. Solzhenitsyn recalls this moment, at the dacha in Pitsunda, Lebedev, Khrushchev's assistant, whom the editor of Novi Mir Tvardovsky asked to acquaint himself with this story. LB began to read Khrushchev aloud, 
Nikita himself did not like to read. Education tried draw from films. Nikita listened well to this amusing story, where necessary, laughed, where necessary, groaned and grunted, and in the middle he demanded Mikayan to listen together. Everything was approved to the end, and I especially liked, of course, the labor scene. How Ivan Denisovich protects the solution. This was later Khrushchev said at the Kremlin meeting. Mikoyan Khrushchev did not object. The fate of the story in this home reading was decided. The donkey smears its tail better. On December 1, 1962, Khrushchev, accompanied by Alyshev, Soslov, Palansky, Kozygin, Shilipin, Kirionko, as well as the court artist S. Gerasimov, B. Iogansin and V. Serov, who, having changed I.V. Stalin, they regularly began to serve the new master, without a twinge of conscience, blacking out the images of the giant on their canvases to please the pygmy. In particular, in the famous painting by V. Serov V. I. Lenin proclaimed Soviet power, copies of which were in almost every kindergarten, the place of I.V. Stalin was taken by a man in a skullcap, well, not yet in a Yarmulka, L. B., went to see an art exhibition in the Manege, well, admit where you have the righteous here, and where are the sinners, show your art, with these words, Khrushchev began his inspection of the exposition, on the ground floor, where the works of venerable artists and sculptors were presented, he did not utter a word, there was nothing to say, then Khrushchev and his entourage went up to the second floor, where the works of young abstract artists were placed, the artist Ilya Ibelutin recalled, Khrushchev, surrounded by a dense crowd, rushed around the walls. Time after time, his cries were heard, shit, scribble. Khrushchev was inflamed, who allowed them to write like that? All to filling, let them work off the money that the state spent on them, disgrace. What is it, a donkey wrote with its tail, or what? Another participant in the exhibition, Boris Zadovsky, said, when Khrushchev approached my last work, a self-portrait, he was already swaggering. Look better what self-portrait Lakshinov painted. If you take cardboard, cut a hole in it and attach it to the portrait of Lakshinov, what can you see? See a face. And attach the same hole to your portrait. What will happen? Women should forgive me, asshole. And all his retinue smiled sweetly. During a visit to the Manage, Khrushchev addressed the modernists, who is in charge here. Ernst Nyai's Vestny turned out to be the main one. Boris Zatovsky recalled. Ernst Nyai's Vestny stood in front of Khrushchev and said, Nikita Sergeyevich, you are the head of state, and I want you to look at my work. Khrushchev was dumbfounded by such a form and bewilderedly followed him. As soon as Khrushchev saw Ernst's work, he broke loose and began to repeat his idea that he did not have enough bronze for rockets. And then a Shilipin jumped out at Ernst with a cry, Where did you get the bronze? You're not going anywhere with me. But Ernst, an uncontrollable man, goggled his black eyes and, looking point-blank at Shilipin, told him, don't yell at me, this is my life's work, give me a gun, I'm here now, I'll shoot myself in front of your eyes, e. Nay eyes Vestendi said, Khrushchev said that I was eating people's money, but I was producing shit, I claimed that he did not understand anything in art, Khrushchev objected to this, I was a minor, I didn't understand, I was a political worker, I didn't understand, well, now I'm the head of the party and the prime minister, and I don't understand everything. Who are you working for? End quote. The most interesting thing, Nayai's Vestny wrote, is that when I spoke honestly, directly, openly in what I think, I drove him into a dead end. But as soon as I began to be a little hypocritical, he immediately felt it and took over. Here is just one example. I said, Nikita Sergeyevich, you scold me as a communist. But at the same time, there are communists who support my work. For example, Picasso, Renato Gutasso. He narrowed his eyes slyly and said, Does it bother you personally that they are communists? And I lied, Yes. If I were honest, I should have said, I don't care, I care that they are great artists. As if sensing this, he continued, Ah, that worries you. Then don't worry about it, I don't like your work, and I'm the number one communist in the world. End quote. In their reports on the visit of the first secretary of the Central Committee of the CPSU to an art exhibition, the newspapers wrote, during its inspection, Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, the leaders of the party and government expressed a number of fundamental provisions about the high vocation of Soviet fine art, 
which by various means should truthfully reflect the life of the people, inspire people for the construction of communism. After visiting the Manaj, Khrushchev held two meetings with figures of literature and art. They were called historic meetings with the intelligentsia. The first took place on December 17 at the reception house on the Lenin Hills, at which Khrushchev instructed Elishev, secretary of the CPSU Central Committee, to make a report. In his speech, the ideologist Elishev said, We must make it completely clear. There has not been and cannot be a peaceful coexistence of the socialist ideology and the ideology of the bourgeoisie. In ideology, the struggle with the bourgeois world goes on and does not stop for a minute. There is a struggle for souls and hearts people, especially young people, the struggle for what they will be, young people, what they will take with them from the past, what they will bring into the future. We have no right to underestimate the danger of sabotage by bourgeois ideology in the sphere of literature and art. The words are true. Yes, they were not supported by deeds. How much bitterness? For example, in a letter from a student of Moscow State University Shchgalkova Khrushchev in connection with the second meeting with the intelligentsia, which took place on March 8, 1963, I am now completely at a loss. Everything that I believed in, for which I lived, collapsing, the atmosphere that is being created now is an atmosphere of administration, violence, unfounded accusations, spitting, demagoguery and recitation of the highest words that an honest person utters at the most difficult moment. LB. It was at this meeting that Khrushchev described his impressions of a walk in the winter forest. Just look at these fir trees at snowflakes shining in the sun. How wonderful this is! Then he added indignantly, and now modernists, abstractionists want to paint these fir trees upside down. Director Mikhail Rom recalled, Khrushchev gradually somehow wound up and fell first of all on Ernst Nye's Vestny. For a long time he was looking for how it would be more offensive, to explain more clearly what Ernst Nye's Vestny is. And finally found, found it and was very happy about it, says. Your art is like this. Now, if a person climbed into the toilet, climbed inside the toilet seat and from there, from the toilet seat, would look at what is above him, if someone sits on the toilet seat, he looks at this part of the body from the inside, from the toilet seat. That's what your art is. And here is your position, comrade Nayis Vesny. You are sitting in a toilet seat. The reaction of Ernst Nayis Vesny in response to this insulting boorish attack is shocking. No. He did not challenge the offender to a duel, he did not commit a terrorist act against him. Arriving home after the public disgrace inflicted on him by Khrushchev, he, as befits an intellectual, sat down and wrote a letter of such a masochistic content, I'm afraid to seem immodest, but I bow to your humanity, and I really want to write you the most tender and warm words. Nikita Sergeyevich, I swear to you and in your person to the party that I will work tirelessly to make my contribution to the common cause for the benefit of the people. Interestingly, when the message about Khrushchev's death is published, it is Ernst Nyai's Vestny who will erect a monument to him at the Novodovicki Cemetery in Moscow. This monument is designed in a black and white version, which, according to the author's intention, was to express the balance of good and evil in Khrushchev. However, I don't know what about good, but, judging by his memoirs, there was enough evil in him for ten people, take, for example, such a cynical statement of his, well, we hear, of course, listen to you, talked but who will decide? The people in our country should decide. And who is the people? This is a party. And who is the party? This is us. We are a party. So, we will decide. I will decide, understandably. Chev.295 It is not surprising that a protest was ripening among the youth, sometimes expressed even in an extremist form. So, a member of the underground political group Alexander Ivanov, the future host of the TV program Around Laughter and the future author of the vile little book Lenin's Case is Deadly, a supporter of terror, proposed organizing an assassination attempt on Khrushchev, leading, in his opinion, the world to war. Ivanov's project was codenamed Cosmonaut and was timely uncovered by the KGB. Chapter 25, Postscriptum. My great-grandfather was friends with Stalin, proletarian Baku. By the beginning of the 20th century, due to the rapid development of the oil industry, Baku stood out among the largest industrial centers of the Transcaucasus. It was at that time that the story appeared, in Baku you can earn money, in Yerevan you can get dressed, 
In Tiflis you can have a spree. But Baku became not only the center of oil production, where cheap labor from all over the Caucasus, from the ever-starving Volga region, the North Caucasus, Ukraine and other regions flocked in search of work, but also the center of the proletarian revolutionary movement. It was here that the famous Baku strikes of 1903 flared up. 1904, 1914, which shook the reactionary Tsarist regime. Of these three strikes, only the December 1904 strike, which was led by I.V. Stalin, then known as Koba, ended on New Year's Eve with the victory of the proletariat and the conclusion of the first collective agreement in Russia between workers and oil owners. Subsequently, I.V. Stalin will say, three years of revolutionary work among the workers of the oil industry have tempered me as a practical fighter and one of the practical local leaders. In dealing with such advanced workers in Baku as Vatsk, Saratovitz, Fyoltov and others, on the one hand, and in a storm of the deepest conflicts between workers and oil owners, on the other hand, I first learned what it means to lead large masses of workers. Baptism of Fire Stalin called the Baku period of his revolutionary activity. One of the active participants in the general December strike of 1904 was my paternal grandfather, a cop. Yakov Balayan, oil worker, bourgeois Baku. The name of the merchant Savitai Mafievich Morzov and his relative, the owner of the furniture factory Nikolai Pavlovich Schmidt, are widely known as creditors of the Russian revolutionary movement. At the same time, when these names are mentioned today, they are called, as a rule, white crows. It seems that in addition to St. Morozov and N.P. Schmidt, no one helped the Bolsheviks. This is not true. So, for example, it is known that in the city of Alexandrov, Vladimir province, the sponsor of the RSTLP was the manufacturer Sergei Nikolaevich Baranov, in Voronish, the co-owner of the Association of Mechanical Plants, the former Narodnyevolia member A.N. Ivanov, in the Far East, the fisherman Kasyanov, in Kazan, the son of one of the owners of the trading house M. Tykhomernov with his sons V.A. Tykhomernov, in Kaluga the owner of the stationary factory Gontarov and timber merchant Gorbanov, in Kiev, widow Tereshchenko, in Baku. The Sava Morzov of Transcaucasia was my mother's grandfather, Irina Grigorievna, my great-grandfather, Petrzevich Begrov. As a young man, he came to Baku from the village on foot, tearing his legs to blood and without a penny of money. But he managed, as the English say, to make himself, starting from scratch, he took up commercial activities and gradually got stronger so that he began to establish ties with Warsaw. Then Poland was part of the Russian Empire, which produced cheap manufactory, which he sold in Baku. And by the beginning of the century, Pyotr Zavich Begrov already owned significant real estate in Baku, a meat slaughterhouse, and bought the circus from the Nikitin brothers, and the opera house from Mailev, now the Azerbaijan Opera and Ballet Theatre named after M.F. Akhundov. The first national opera Lely and Majnun by the Azerbaijani composer Yuzi Ragadzebekov was staged on the stage of this theatre in 1908. About my father, and my great-grandfather, my grandmother, Zinita Petrovna Begrova, loved to tell me. But I always felt that she was hiding something, did not finish speaking. And when I got my first tape recorder, and this was in 1959, I begged her to say something interesting on the tape, and she agreed. Her story impressed me so much that, after listening to it, I immediately took a pen and paper, wrote it down, thanks to which I can now reproduce it verbatim. My grandmother's story. I was six years old, and she was born in 1900, when Uncle Abel Yanukids appeared in our house. He visited us quite often. I remember him well, because he was always cheerful. He loved me, spoiled me and perfectly recited the fairy tales of A.S. Pushkin by heart. My father usually retired while talking with friends, but for me he made an exception. I silently, as if absent, sat in the far corner of my father's study and played with my toys. Without delving into the conversations of adults, I nevertheless drew some conclusions, perceived the names of their mutual acquaintances in my own way, trying to imagine what these people were like, the late lad though the late Alexander and Koba. For some reason, 
The latter seemed to me against the background of these two deceased immortal cowboy. I especially remember the last meeting between Pope and Uncle Abel. Both were excited and spoke in a Georgian language that I did not understand. Only 11 years later, in 1917, when I graduated with a silver medal from the St. Nina's Institution, which then existed for noble maidens, and we heard that a revolution had taken place in Petrograd, and V.I. Lenin and I.V. Stalin, the man we knew as Koba, I decided to talk to my father. My father told me that since the beginning of 1901 he had provided the Bolsheviks with significant financial assistance, in particular, in organizing illegal printing houses in the Transcaucasus, including the first Baku underground printing house, Nina, where the newspapers Berzola, Struggle, and Proletariatus were printed. Berzola, Struggle of the Proletariat, the latter being published in Georgian, Russian, and Armenian, and where the tasks of Lenin's Iskru were also carried out. Historical reference. In addition to the Baku printing house Nina, which existed from 1901 to 1906, P.I. Begrov financed illegal printing houses in Batum, Tiflis, Kotais, Kinchura, where proclamations, brochures were issued, as well as the newspapers Akulis Khavrba, New Life, Akuli Droba, New Time, Netobi, Light of Light, Chvnais Khavrba, Our Life, Dro, Time. All early theoretical works of I.V. Stalin were first published in these newspapers. Continuation of my grandmother's story. Father told how he met at the very beginning of the century, shortly after my birth, with Ivo Safronovich and new kids, Alexander Grigorievich Zulia kids, the late Alexander, and then with Iosif Vissarionovich Dugashvili, Koba, and Vladimir Zakaryevich Ketskovli, the late Lado. I asked my father to remember what they talked about with Uncle Abel at the last meeting. The Pope replied that just then the police covered the securely secretive Libari underground printing house, which was located in a cave dug in the side wall of the well of one of the private houses on the outskirts of Tiflis. And from 1907 to 1911, Joseph Vissarionovich lived permanently in Baku, and although he never visited us, but, according to his father, they maintained rather warm relations with each other. My dad helped Kobe to organize the publication of the illegal Bolshevik newspaper Baku Proletarian in Baku. In this newspaper, which was already called Baku Worker, by the way, I began my journalistic career in the 70s, LB, and also the newspaper Gudok. Historical reference, Gudok is the first legal Bolshevik newspaper, the organ of Baku oil workers. In the gloomy night of the Stilipin reaction, proletarian Baku presents an unprecedented spectacle. The proletarian struggle is unfolding, the voice of Baku's legal Bolshevik newspapers thunders throughout Russia. The last Mohicans of a mass political strike. This is how Vladimir Ilyich Lenin characterized the heroic struggle of the Baku workers in 1908. End of my grandmother's story, when I asked my father what made him, one of the wealthiest people in Baku, take such a step, he did not immediately answer. And after thinking, he said, you ask, daughter, why did I do this? I just saw that these people are serious and strong enough to solve the accursed national question, to curb the massacre in the Transcaucasus, to stop the bloodshed. For the sake of this, nothing is a pity. Dot. Epilogue. In 1918. The Baku Commune, cut off from Soviet Russia, surrounded on all sides by counter-revolutionary forces, lasted a little longer than the Paris Commune in its time. The counter-revolutionary government of the so-called Central Caspian dictatorship, having treacherously captured revolutionary figures, the legendary 26 Baku commissars, on September 20, 1918 they were shot by the socialist revolutionaries and the British in the sands of the Transcaspian Sea. LB surrendered Baku to the British, who were supposed to stop the Turkish offensive. They did not stop, they could not. Or maybe you didn't want to? A hasty evacuation began, and in fact, an escape. Trains, steamboats were filled with refugees, leaving all the property to the mercy of fate. The merchant P.I. Bagrov, with large funds, went with his second wife to America. The year before, according to family legend, 
he deposited a decent amount of money in one of the Swiss banks in the name of his children from his first marriage. But only the young wife made it to the United States. Piotr Zayrich himself fell ill with typhus raging in the Far East and died in Vladivostok, where he was buried. He died without knowing that his Kobe, Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin, ultimately managed to unite different peoples into a single family for many years, to establish peace and harmony between them. I am deeply antipathetic to those who, under the Soviets, for the sake of a clean profile beat on their worker peasant origin, and now they disown the great October Revolution and are poking around in the chronological dust, trying to unearth at least one blue blood or white blood in their pedigree bone. My parents were real communists and raised me in the spirit of loyalty to their country, their people and the ideals of communism. I am equally proud of both the worker ancestor and the merchant ancestor. And I do not forget that I owe even my physical existence to October. If not for the great proletarian revolution, the son of a worker would never have been able to marry the granddaughter of a merchant. Even such a progressive one as Pyotr Zayevich Begrov, who was friendly with I.V. Stalin himself. And let this book be the first seed of doubt for a young and inquisitive mind, which cannot be satisfied with ready-made, primitive answers to difficult questions of history, a mind that strives to have an independent judgment about the past, based on reliable facts, and not on the fabrications of foolish people sometimes forgetting that in the end the historical truth will triumph, and it is not for those who maliciously lie, pouring poison into fragile young souls. End of audiobook